Radio 4. The time is 3 o'clock. Afternoon Theatre. Thunder on Sunday, dead on Monday. Who's it gonna be? The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, or why not say all three? Noel Johnson, Rosalind Shanks, Duncan McIntyre and Simon Lack in Thunder on Sunday, the novel by Karen Campbell, adapted for radio by Betty Davis. Where shall I put your tray, sir? Here. You're new. No, sir. I've been with this line three months. What's your name? Claire Macefield. You haven't flown with me before. I haven't had that pleasure, sir. What's for food, Claire? Your favorite, apple pie. Have you got that position yet, Mr. Spence? Sir, I've got a position, but it can't be right. Well, what position was it? 1210 West, 50 miles east of where we should be. Yeah, that's what I thought. There's a hell of a wind down there, westerly 90 knots and dead on our beam. Give me a new course. 180 magnetic. Altering onto 180. Mr. Barrett, give me climb power. Climb power, sir. And now, Mr. Spence, call up control, give them my position, and get clearance to FL360. Oceanic Control. I put the seatbelt sign up in space. Field. Go and see that the passengers are strapped in. Yes, sir. <sighs> Reported that position yet, Mr. Spence? Nobody's answering. There's a hell of a lot of static and nothing else. I, I can't get a peep out of them. Stewardess, do I really have to put my cigarette out? You really have to, Miss Clayfair. I thought that sign meant that the pilot was just going to have his Sunday sleep. <laughs> so it does, but the smell of smoke disturbs him. Mr. Ainsworth. Oh, don't wake Jerry up. I like it better like that. Oh, oh God. God. hell, but I've got DTs or there's water in the carburetor. Jerry, come to and get yourself strapped oh, in. What's really? happening? What? Just a bit of turbulence. Let me fasten that for you. That. I promised my married daughter I'd send her one of your postcards. The table's been quivering like a Ouija board. You'll get it done all right before we get to Glasgow. Thank you. Hair, hug it on. Well, we are both with the seat belts correctly fastened. Yeah. Are you quite comfortable? Yes, thank you. My wife has just remarked on the smoothness of the fact. Not for much longer, I'm afraid. Oh? It's stormy ahead. Stormy? Oh, four. Uh, <laughs> sir? Four chariot drawn by two he goats. Four. The thunder god, god of the Vikings. He called this the sea of storms. Damn thunderstorms. Young man, you blaspheme. Your seat belt, sir. Mm, automation. Fasten your belt, unfasten your belt. Go to the toilet, come back from the toilet, eat, stop eating, open the door, bail out. Just do what the machine says. How, how do we know we've got a pilot at all? Mr. Philby, if you don't fasten your seat belt, you'll soon find out that we have got a pilot. Of course. When I'm asked nicely like that. Thank you. Thunder on Sunday, dead on Monday. Who's it gonna be? The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, or why not say all three? I've never heard such a load of rubbish as that young chap talks. Sit by old slass and get strapped in. You can get knocked around, same as rest of us. <laughs> He's been giving us a ride for our money. Oh, look, the lightning. Uh, somebody up there's taking our photo. <laughs> Oh, the lights have gone. Quiet, everybody, please. Stay where you are. It'll be all right. Uh, quiet, please. Damn, damn this bloody weather. Sir, starboard fuel tanks hold. And a port. What? A leaking kerosene like map. Mr. Spence, control. Well, there's still no joy, sir. Where's the nearest land? I'm checking. Hebrides? Too far. We've got to get down soon, sir. We're losing fuel fast. What's that on the map? Hold the torch steady. An island. A R D. I, I, I can't read it, sir. Gardner Beg, I've heard of it. Give me a course to steer. 110. Turning onto 110. How far away? 90 miles. It's it's very small. We can't worry about an airfield. Just a piece of dry ground. Bill, how long have we got? 15 minutes. Spence, give them my right position. Still trying, sir. And call Mayday. I'm taking her right to the sea. First sign of fire. I'll have to put her down. Mayday. Oceanic Control, this is Celtic Airways, Tango Foxtrot, lightning strike, we're losing fuel, turning easterly for Arthur Bay, may have to put down and see, Mayday, 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 Celtic Mountain Tango Foxtrot, Mayday, Mayday. To the south. Celtic Hospital Tango Foxtrot, Foxtrot. Mayday. Mayday, better than the Atlantic, Miss Mayfield, prepare the passengers Mayday. for dipping just in case, see they put their life jackets on, I will sir, about seven minutes fuel left sir, thank you Mr. Barrett, hear anything Spence, dead as a dodo, Burnt out, I reckon. Can you see anything? No, sir. 
When I put her down and out in the bag, there'll be a jolt. But at least we'll be almost out of fuel. No fire risk. Fuel tank's all reading dry. Uh, something ahead, sir. Look. See the coastline? Yes. And a hill. Beach below, sir. Look for the field. Looking? Field, sir. And, and a runway. Do you see it, sir? I see it. Old wartime station. Well, we're in luck. Give me the wheels. Gear down and locked. Hell of a crosswind, sir. Twenty flat. Losing starboard engine, sir. We're down. Partner Bay. Oh, well, at least we've arrived. I'll go to the back and have a word of the passengers. After landing, Jack Peter. Then go and rustle up some of the locals. We've been lucky. We're off track, but at least we're alive. Now we'll have to try to make contact with the people here and possibly telephone to the mainland. Yeah. Any luck, Peter? No, not much. There's a road of sorts, and I thought I heard footsteps. Footsteps? Well, I thought I heard them, but when I called, nobody answered. Echoes. The acoustics of an empty stage. They sounded pretty solid to me, Mr. Ainsworth. Uh, plenty of birds, and I heard sheep. Ah, there is a saying that the good shepherd is never far from his sheep. Right, Signor Borghese. And someone must have heard us. We made enough racket getting in. The odds are the island's inhabited, and the sooner we get to an inn or a farmhouse, the more comfortable it's going to be. Miss Maysfield, stow some flasks and food in a bag. Yes, sir. I thought you girls were supposed to wear sensible shoes. I've got some boots in my overnight bag. Well, put them on. And all of you wrap up warm because we don't know how long the walk will be. I'll give you ten minutes. Mr. Barrett, a word with you. Yes, sir. We'll uh, go through to the flight deck. Well? Oh, I could fix it if we had the equipment. Which we haven't. Uh, I always carry extra tools, but they may not be up to this lot. Uh, Glasgow will have to send a relief aircraft. Do you reckon they'd get in? Well, we did. Not many pilots could have. Well, marvellous what you can do when you have to. Might not be a bad idea if I had a look round. A lot of stuff got left in these old airfields. Might be something. Could be, but it'd be pretty decrepit, I'd have thought. Customers on their way up now, sir. Did they teach you anything about this sort of emergency? Well, I went on survival courses, but they just give you the two extremes, the desert and the open sea. <laughs> and this is bloody both. <laughs> Come on, let's get the ladder down. Wait till you're eating bannocks by some blazing hot fire. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one short. We should be... Thirteen, exactly. Mr. Philby, hurry up, please. May I bring this, Captain? If you don't mind carrying a guitar for a ten-mile walk, that's up to you. And, sir, provided you belt up when you're told. That's everyone, isn't it, Miss Maysfield? Uh, yes, sir. Right. Peter Spence and I will lead the way. You sir. and Bill at the back. Sir. No straggling, please. There may be peat bogs, and you can't see far in this mist. Listen. The wind? No, breakers. That's the sea down there. Careful, everyone. These airfields were built for takeoff over the sea. Should the wind not shout if there is a shepherd? Not a bad idea, Signor Borghese. Give the youngsters something to do. Right, everybody. One, two, three, shout! Hello! 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 Try again in a moment. What's that? The old guard room, sir. Not much left. Just a minute. Stop! Look at that. It's on the tarmac. Petrol, sir? Mm-hmm. Recently spilled, by the look of it. But then we're all right. Petrol means people. <gasps> okay, folks, don't get jumpy. Just keeping my hand in. Photographic study of model Dawn Playfair in Mink in the middle of the ocean. Real Sunday stuff stuff. Back page of the Times, if you don't do as you're told, Mr. Ainsworth. Keep up. Back page? Obituaries. Oh, hey, there's a dog's mess over here. What? On the road, over here. Yeah. West, south, west. Not quite the way we want, but the road's less overgrown that way. Try it. Let's shout again. One, two, three, shout. Hello. Oh, there are. Hello. Hey, I can smell coffee. I fancy a cup of coffee. Now hey, you're smelling what you want to smell. It's medical fact. Medical rubbish. The dog. And the shepherd. You're right. 
And that's Mrs. Crowther's coffee. He's got a spirit stove. Hello. Has he seen us? Yes, he... What's he doing? He crossed himself. Come on, we better talk to him. Good afternoon. We need help. My name's Richard Lampeter. I'm a Celtic Airways pilot. We've just made a forced landing on the old airfield back there. Duncan McDermott, it is. Good afternoon to you. We were flying from Iceland. And where would you be going? Glasgow. These are my crew and the passengers. Is there a village near here? Yes. How many miles? I cannot tell. There is also a castle and a lair. Well, what about a telephone? I have not over much of the English tongue. Brr, brr. Thank you, Mr. Philby. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Dundas has that sometimes. Well, can we speak to the mainland? We need to tell the families of these people that they're safe. Safe? Aye, there was to the mainland, that is so, but not now. This great storm, Mr. Dundas was telling me he could not get a sound from herself. Herself being the telephone? Yes. Hmm. Does the village have an inn? Yes. A poor place, Angus Mingus has, but an inn it is. And is there a road to the village? Aye, a fine road. She goes all around this side of Bay. The mountain? Aye. She was made when the Air Force field was made. Were you here then? I was. What sort of aeroplanes did they fly? Four engines, two? Uh, four. Very fat in the belly, as if in love. Uh, Shackleton's by the sound of it. Can you take us to the village? Yes. It is too long by the road. Uh, I know a path that will make the journey shorter. Uh, come. Come on, everybody. Mr. McDermott's taking us to the village. I'm surprised you didn't hear us overhead. I heard you. Well, didn't you wonder what had happened? Why didn't you look for us? It is a foolishness to venture yon when the sounds come. Sounds? Like yours. Lights also. Engine sounds. Aircraft engines. Like yours. But not like yours. They are not of this world. <laughs> Do you mean ghostly aeroplanes? The folk believe that is so. For myself, I know it is an evil place. It is unlucky. Did they have trouble with it when it was an airfield? Aye. It should not have been built there. The ground would not rest quiet. And after it came, the island began to die. The young folk went. The young folk are going away from all the islands. And those sounds. There'll be some mountain echo from aircraft miles away. We are simple people. We do not understand these things. The next time you hear engines, you should go up there and take a look. No one will be doing that. Unlucky it is to hear the ground sounding, but to see the shapes themselves, that is death. Oh, oh, stay here, Peter. Claire, what is it? I saw a man up on that path. Where? He's gone. He was there, though. Just standing watching us. I I'm sorry I screamed. I can't think What why. did he look like? Well, he had an orange jacket. And he was standing by that gorse bush. The one in flower. Yellow flower. Orange jacket. <laughs> That's it. Amazing what you think you see in the mist. But I... I suppose so. Right, everyone. Panic over. Coming, Mr. McDermott. This is the inn, sir. Oh, what a dump. The Ardner Beg Hilton. I bet it's full of sheep. Not to worry. One more won't make any difference. It is best to knock first, sir. I don't want to interrupt an orgy, do we? Is there anybody there, said the traveller. Someone's coming. Proceed. I don't know how much get him at. Ah, who in can go with Lochturish? Who are these travellers? They have come in an aeroplane. They say it is damaged by the storm. Why did they come here to Arnabay? They did not wish to come here. It was the storm. Well, this is where I must leave you with Angus Mingus. <laughs> 
Thank you. You've helped us tremendously. May we come in? Aye, uh, come. Well, it's, it's nice and warm. Mm -hmm. Oh, mercies. Hello, Jean. Marie Guinness, my wife, my duck, Telling his wife they've got a house full. Uh, uh, not exactly. I have a few words of the Gaelic. So what was it then? He said, um, he has come like I told you he would. Oh, but that doesn't make sense. Hey, a radio. They've got a radio. Oh, there it is, please. Claire, yes. see what the passengers want. Yes. Can we get everyone a drink? There is, there is too many of you. We'll be paying. Yeah. But that is not the concern. The islanders are well known for their hospitality. There is too many. That's uh, seven double whiskies, a port and lemon, and a pint of mild and bitter. Oh, and Captain, please, hmm? something to eat. Anything. Everyone's so hungry they could eat the sawdust off the floor. Yes, at this rate they may have to. Uh, what about you and the rest of the crew? Oh, whiskey, I think. Hmm. Ah, what about these drinks? Well, what is it you want? Eleven double whiskies, a port and lemon, and a pint of mild and bitter. And we'd like some food. My daughter will attend to you. The islands are well known for the grand hospitality and, and their whiskey. It's good. I earn a big whiskey made here at the distillery. Ah, the real McCoy. <laughs> a hundred and thirty proof by the look of it, so watch how you drink it. <coughs> it's a spot, all right. You watch your gut downing it like that. It's a medical fact. Oh, food. Oh, no. My daughter will see to you. Hot soon. The stuff thing is the truth. Ooh. Mm. Perhaps it's fresh and erod. Day to day. Mm, don't reckon much to the soup. Make you, but a drop of hot water. Oh, don't let it get talk in the mouth. Oh, a horse is right. It is a cooking lass, your mum. No, it is myself. Ah, I thought so. I can't put an old head on young shoulders. What's your name, love? Mary. Ah, oh, answer that now. Pretty name. Pretty lass, eh? <laughs> you have to be joking. And um, what does your mum do, love? She has been changed these many years. Anything for afters? Mm, I'm ravenous. Would you like a candy bar? Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We'd all like a candy bar. Oh, what's that, lad, God? We haven't. A candy bar? A genuine American candy bar? How'd that get here? The Icelandic people used to call this island the joining of the world. Oh, then stop the world. We all bloody well want to get off. Oh. <laughs> So it was the lightning that sent you here, Captain? Yes. Yes, it took you away from where you were going. Eh? Against your own will? Yes. We're bound to Glasgow. Once we've got the repairs done, we'll be on our way. I see you've got paraffin lamps here. Oh, yes. We'll need paraffin. Ah, well, she comes in from the mainland, you see, on the boat. Now, where can I get some? Oh, I don't know. The, the boat will come again before Christmas. It is not to stop. Oh, a landlord is allowed to see here, like fisheries and such like. Oh, the distillery, the island is well known for its whiskey. I suppose you can put us all up. Oh, yes, but it is a wee place. I wasn't prepared for such numbers. Try and get something sorted out there, uh, for the passengers anyway. Yes, sir. Having trouble? Oh, Mr. Dundas, sir. Uh, let me introduce myself. Captain Frank Dundas, laird of this godforsaken island. Ah, how do you do? You've heard what's happened. Yes, you gave my gilly the fright of his life. Uh, do the mainland know you're here? No, unfortunately. The radio burnt out. Yeah, it wouldn't have been much good anyway, our damned mountain. That's why I've never gone in for a radio telephone. Awkward, though, the telephone going. Yeah, it'll be weeks before they get round to mending it. Anyone have any ideas where you are? Most unlikely. Well, we'll have to get you off pretty quickly. We'll see what we can do. Uh, Slange. Hmm? That's uh, Gallic for good health. Ah, good health. So we could use some good luck, too. What we really want are tools and kerosene, I don't... Uh, leave all that to me. Uh, how did you make out with poor old McDermott? Uh, the shepherd. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Didn't he keep you entertained with his stories? Not very much. <laughs> Not even about the airfield? Did he take you all the way round instead of cutting across it? He might have done. It's a bit difficult to see. Uh, they're all the same. Won't go near the place. Uh, what was he seeing this time? Uh, hearing. Aircraft. Oh, that. The ground shaking. It wasn't a lucky airfield in the war, you know. Before my time here. They said it had been built on sacred ground and the mountain was angry. 
And since the war, things haven't been too clever here. The airfields there kick it. <laughs> Don't they say in America every home should have its kick it? Some of the villagers have seen people. And others besides. When you shone your torch on poor old Jamie Walker, I don't know which of you was more scared. <laughs> I've got some grouse up there. Walker was having a look at them. Why didn't he call out? Because he ran like a rabbit. They all half believe those stories about the airfield. Well, they've got no one else to listen to except old McDermott. No telly, not much radio. Oh, that reminds me. Have another try at that radio over there, Bill. Mm, will do. You know, funny thing was, there was a runway heading at Control Tower when we came in. Uh, was it the right one? Yes. <laughs> Proves my point. Hasn't been touched there since the war. When did you come here? Uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's a fine laird, is Mr. Dundas. Oh, I don't know about that. I've done my best to stimulate a bit of work. There's practically nothing. Fishing, a bit of weaving, the distillery. I've sunk a few bob there. Oh, no, I, well, I was after telling them about the fine distillery. They're wishing to see it. Oh, it's no tourist attraction. They'd be bored rigid. But it would keep them out of mischief while we got cracking on the aircraft. Well, if that's what you want, I'll have a word with Todd. He's the manager. Oh, dear, is that the time? I must get busy if we're to get you off tomorrow. I'll send a Land Rover in the morning. statement tomorrow. It is feared that there are no survivors... That's the news. Quiet, everyone. ...jetliner are now seven hours overdue at Glasgow. An Icelandic trawler has reported hearing a faint mayday signal and then silence. Search aircraft have found no trace of rafts or survivors. What did I tell you? We're ghosts. Oh, hello. Didn't hear you come in. You were asleep. I've been here hours. Oh, my rats, we room aloft is just that. A loft. <laughs> Are you comfortable down there on the floor? Mm. Tonight I think I could sleep in a gorse bush. Come to that, I think I am. These blankets. The others all fixed up? Yes. Mrs. Ewart, Mrs. Crowther and Frau Hagedorn are all in the girls' dorm. <laughs> the men have got two rooms between them. Truckle beds. Mingy's has managed the lot of us somehow. I don't like mine host much. I suppose he's all right. Must have been a bit of a shock. All of us descending on him like that. I saw his face when they said on the news that we were all presumed dead. He had a, a funny sort of grin. Perhaps it was a trick of the light. And that great lump of a girl. It was nice of her to give up her room. <laughs> Some room. The rain comes in through the fanlight. There are spiders' webs all over the place. And it hasn't been cleaned since last Christmas. <laughs> no, I mean, really. There's still a bit of mistletoe over the bed. The islanders are well known for their Christmas festivities. <laughs> but why does she need mistletoe up here? Bundling, perhaps. The Hebridean custom of courting in bed. Mm, hope it doesn't give Jerry Ames with ideas above his station. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Dawn. Mm -hmm. What is it? Can you hear anything? That's the sea. No. I thought I heard... Well? An aeroplane. Must have been dreaming. Oh, good night. Bill? Bill? Uh, 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 what is it? Uh, lad, uh, you, you, you're dressed. Is it uh, clocking in time? Oh, please yourself, sir. It's early yet. Actually, I was looking for Bill Barrett. Oh? Isn't he here, then? No. Did you hear him get up? No. I didn't hear him come back, neither. Back? From where? I don't know where to, to fidget about. The lad were a bit peckish, and there were a light on in the kitchen. So off he popped to see if he could get out to eat from the big glass. And you didn't hear him come back? No, but... Uh, I were off as snug as a bug, didn't know a thing after I shut my eyes, except when I fastened up the shutters, I saw the two of them, their shadows. Which two? The big lass, uh, the landlord's daughter, and your engineer, larking around downstairs. Larking? Playing. Oh, oh not wrong. Just a bit of horseplay. 
Oh, don't tell me I missed out on something. <laughs> what sort of horseplay? Did you hear Bill come to bed? No. When I went downstairs about two. God, that Louis prehistoric. Bill wasn't in bed then? No, not a sign of him. Did you hear him talking to Myrid? No. <laughs> Maybe they got past talking by then. Thank you. Time's getting on. I'd better get downstairs. What's this? The skipper. I've thought up a quick way of mending the tank. Borrowed my rat's bike and went up to the field. See you there, Bill. So, you got your friend's message, did you, sir? Uh, yes, thank you, my rat. It's not his writing. Who actually wrote this? Me, sir. His hands were dirty with the bike, you understand. Yes, of course. Quarter to eight. When did Dunbar say he'd come round? He didn't. Not specifically. He just said as soon as possible. Well, what time's he organized the distillery? Ten thirty. He's got to confirm it with the manager, but if we don't hear differently, we go then. It's still raining, I see. Ooh, what a climate. Oh, you look as if you slept well, anyhow. Oh, I did. Claire didn't. Bad dreams. What? I thought I heard aircraft engines. What time? I don't know. I might have dreamt it, of course. But I remember looking at the skylight and it wasn't raining. If it wasn't raining, it must have been a dream. Didn't you look at your watch, Claire? I didn't think to, sir. Uh, I think we can drop the sir. You've forgotten one place, lass. Only late for twelve. Superstitious, are you? Billy Barrett is not here. He's gone up to the airfield. How so? How so? What do you mean? Oh. How so is yon wee red man away to the airfield? How is it that he got there, eh? The laird hasn't come. I gave him my bicycle, so I did. You? I gave him my bicycle. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Don't you yeah. just do such a thing, you wee flat Shall let me be. You. Out. He'll take care, you mind, for my wee lass's bicycle. Of course. Well, it is just that I must have been anxious about the road. It's just full of pitfalls, you understand. Bill can look after himself. Well, I hope he can. I hope he can. Well, scenes from family life. Uh, Peter, sir? grab yourself some bread or something. Get your Mac. I'm not hanging around for Dundas to take us to the airfield. We'll start walking. Do you suppose Bill's been able to get cracking? Probably. So, all in all, the situation's bright up. I hope so. It's being incommunicado, I don't like. But if we get the tank mended and Mr. Dundas gets hold of kerosene and the weather clears a bit, well, then... Things will look a lot better, yes. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. What's that? Bike tracks, aren't they? Yes. New. That'll be Bill. Keeping well away from the cliff drop, I'm glad to see. I reckon my rad warned him. Maybe. It was a damn silly thing to do, though. Come on. Look at those tracks. They're flat through the muck. I hope Bill cleans up my rat's bike before her father sees it. After that performance of breakfast, I'll make damn sure he French polishes it. Nearly there, Peter. Mm. Yes, I remember that headland when we came in. I wouldn't like to come bombing round here with scotch in my tank. It's not really all that bad a place for an airfield. You could take off over the sea into wind. Will we do that, sir? If and when? No, oh, we'll see. Yeah, here's the guard room now. Miss Thickeny. Joe, I can still smell our kerosene. Sharp right here for runway 28. Should I give Bill a whistle? No, not yet. We're about 800 yards up the runway. It seems a long 800 yards, sir. Well, it certainly does. I suppose we couldn't be on the wrong runway. No, we couldn't. Well, she must be further up. Bill! Bill! Peter, come here. Look at that. Tire tracks. Our tire tracks. Right. There are our tire tracks. But where's our aeroplane? But how on earth 
Since God knows. She simply disappeared. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Well, I think your skipper's going to be quite pleased with my efforts. The kerosene's laid on, and I have a load of spares in my Land Rover that should gladden his eye. Uh, where is he, by the way? Uh, he... He started walking. Where on earth to? The airfield. He went with Peter Spence. They thought it was just as easy as waiting. Well, it takes time to gather the stuff Captain Lampeter wanted. I don't think I'm too late. I was up at the crack of dawn. It was just that our engineer had already gone up to the airfield. Not when it was dark. That road is very dangerous at night. He went by bike. I can't tell you how many accidents there have been on that cliff road. I wouldn't have thought there was enough traffic. You're a townsman. You can have accidents just walking. When did Captain Lampeter leave? About eight. Well, he certainly didn't give me long. I'd better nip up to the field and find them. They'll be at the aircraft. I expect so. It's almost at the end of what seems to be the main runway. I know the one. Uh, I mustn't hold all of you up. I can see that airline travel makes you very time conscious. <laughs> Mr. Todd, the manager, is expecting you at the distillery. It's just round the corner and down to the harbour. Uh, on the left, the only big building. Good morning, uh, Mr. Todd. That's right. The orphans of the storm, eh? <laughs> uh, come in, Miss... Uh... Macefield. Oh, can I introduce Herr and Frau Hagedorn? Herr manager. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crowther. I know. Mrs. Hewitt. Hi. Miss Playfair. Hello. Senior Borghese. How do you do? Um, Mr. Ainsworth. Hello. And Mr. Philby. Delighted. Hi. Come in. Thank you. I'm afraid we haven't much to show you, but the laird tells me you're at a loose end, and <laughs> what the laird says in Arden Bag goes. Well, I'm glad we came. Anything's better than hanging around in that inn. And he's dick. That black hair. <laughs> Bet it's a wig. The balder, the sexier. The medical fact. As you know, there's no electricity on the island. We have our own generator. Well, it looks like a prison. Ah, to keep people out, not in. Pilfering. Well, the islanders, then, are not noted for their honesty. Hmm? <laughs> that maniac Mingy's. What's he been telling you? Uh, no, they're not. For their poverty, perhaps. Ooh. Well, you don't have to be rich to be honest. In here, please. That vat, that's where we soak the barley in the steeps. Then it's spread out in the malting floors to germinate. Uh, do you grow your own barley? Not likely. Not enough sun. Uh, ships come in about two, once every two months. And I guess one's just been, huh? Great so. Admiring the scenery, Miss Macefield? Oh, I was just looking at that church out there. Is it very old? I wouldn't know. The minister is, though. <laughs> the church is hardly ever used and the old man never comes. There's not the folk. Besides, people here have other comforts. Like pilfering? Much more colorful than that. Well, tell us. Hmm? No, the laird is touchy about these people. If he hasn't mentioned it, I can't. The graveyard's very full. Oh, well, the graveyard's full, all right. Death at Ardnebeg doesn't wait for the minister. Yes, well, let's move on. These are the pot stills. Here are the wash is being distilled, first in the wash still, then in the spirit still. You could cook the lot on us in one go. The islanders are not yet noted for their cannibalism. <laughs> we hope. What did he mean by other comforts? Sex, what else? I was uh, going to suggest we adjourn now. There's very little else to see. We're not malting at the moment, and you don't want to go around a lot of old warehouses. Come to my office and sample the stuff. <laughs> Some of us are only here for the beer. We make pretty potent stuff. Sorts out the men from the boys. Uh, that means you can wait for us outside, Philby. In here. I see you're studying our chart, Miss Macefield. Interested in cartography? Uh, quite. Oh, that's an old one, I'm afraid. Uh, last war ops map. Someone found it at the airfield. I thought no one liked to go up there. Mm, they go there when they want to, believe me. Pelfering. And other things. The airfield's marked Cram Tara. Aye, Gallic for fiery cross. Oh. Your drinks. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah. slouch up. <laughs> I don't know what the folks at chapel would say to this drinking spirits. Folks at chapel reckon we are spirits for now. Yeah. It, um... Must be a very strange experience for you all to be alive, and back there they all think you're dead. Ah, uh, better than being dead and then thinking you're alive. Actually, it's not funny. It's a nasty situation. If we're already dead, anyone could bump the lot of us off. And it wouldn't matter at all. Well, it would to us, lad. <laughs> <laughs> Who would want to? <laughs> Quite. Well, I hate to break up the party, but we really must go. Captain Lambert will wonder what has happened to us. Hmm, well, if you must, you must. Uh, this door opens on the yard. Thank you. Oh, blast the wind. Oh, those white hits you. Now it's the hill that's gone. Oh. Well, a safe journey home. Hmm, the mountains disappeared in the mist. Do you still reckon you'll get off tonight? We're keeping our fingers crossed. Oh, thank you so much for a memorable visit, Mr. Todd. When I get back home to Montreal, I'll tell just everybody to drink nothing but uh, art in a bag whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> well, do that. Yes, well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye. goodbye. Mr. Todd. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, just a minute. I really have got something caught on my shoe. I trod on something. Oh, it's a nail or a bit of wire. There. Land sakes, where'd that come from? Oh, that's what Todd had called pilfering. You probably walked off with the most valuable piece of machinery in the distillery. Oh, should we should we knock on the door and hand it back? Yeah, let me see, please. Yeah. No, that is nothing to do with whiskey. <laughs> it's simply a very small fuel cap, no importance or significance, whatever. See? I have it off your shoe. Keep it for look. Oh, right, everyone. We'd better get back to the inn. Captain Lampeter may be waiting. Bill? Bill! Where the hell can he be? I've found something. Tire tracks. Well, they're Tango Foxtrots. Yes, but why up here? Oh, search me, sir. How far is it from where we left her? No, about 600 yards. Do you think Barrett taxied up here? Crazy thing to do, start up with fuel tanks leaking. Well, she couldn't have moved by herself. No, and there's no sign of a tractor. Well, Claire said she heard engines. Thought she heard. Might have been Tango Foxtrot taxiing. Or taking off. With that amount of fuel, come off it. Follow those tracks, if the mist allows. Building, sir. And a hangar! Eureka! What? I found her! She's in the hangar! Well, I'm damned. Bill! And let's climb up and have a look. There's Bill's stuff. Toolbox and soldering iron. He's been here. He's been busy. Look, he started on the repairs. Neat job. Yeah, that's Bill, all right. Oh, where did he get the extra stuff? He said he didn't have enough. Probably raided the stores here. I wonder where he put the bike. I wonder where he's put himself. Someone's coming. Better have a look. In here. Ah, oh, there you are. Found you at last. Why did you move the aircraft? We didn't. I thought your chaps might have done it. My chaps? Why should they? Well, who else? Uh, where's your engineer? Not here, but he has been. And he's done quite a bit of work. Oh. You'll be able to get off soon, then. Well, he's still got to mend the starboard wing. Well, the sooner the better. I've got all you wanted in the Land Rover. So where is the man? No sign of him. What about the bicycle? No sign of that, either. Oh. oh, it's lunchtime. After walking through the night, he'd be pretty hungry. Well, let's get this stuff unloaded and then get back to the inn. I bet we'll find him knocking back my rat's potato soup. Hello. Has Bill been back? Bill? Isn't he with you? No. We've searched the airfield. 
He's been up there all right, but now there's no sign of him. Not here, eh? What the hell do we do now? Oh, don't panic. He may well walk in this door before very long. But I think... Yes? I think we'd better organize a search party just in case. You've seen for yourself it's not particularly safe terrain. We mustn't ignore the dangers. Everything I have, cars, men, ropes, is at your disposal. And I know I can speak for Todd, too. We'll do everything we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll go and get hold of Todd and any equipment that we can lay our hands on. And this time, don't anybody move till I get back. That's settled, then. You, Captain, and Mr. Crowther will search the coastal section. Most likely spot. Hangar and dispersals. That's where he'll have gone nosing round. The most tricky, too. Cliff erosion. Now, take my head, Gilly Jamie. He'll see you come to no harm. Thank you. And you, Angus, will go with Mr. Spence, Mr. Philby, and Herr Hagedorn to search the shortcut. The road you all came on last night. Yes, Mr. Tendas. I think it's a good idea to have someone who knows the terrain in charge of each group. Uh, you, Todd, will go with Mr. Ainsworth and Senior Borghese to search the country between the shortcut and the coast road. Right. I'll take Miss Macefield and Miss Playfair in my car. We'll drive slowly along the perimeter track and search the small roads inland. Claire. Yes? Bring the rest of the food and blankets back with you. We may not get away from here for quite a time. What about the old shepherd, Duncan? He may have seen something. Oh, him. He's bound to have seen something. Well, he was after being around here this morning, asking about the strangers. Likely he only wanted a free drink. Very likely. Now, uh, let's see. It's 3.50. Uh, shouldn't we have a time to report back here, uh, collate our findings? Let's say 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll all be sitting on pins till you get back. Right. Uh, don't any of you do more than you've been given. And do what the local chap says. Watch it, Peter. Don't take any risks. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we'd best be off. Uh, you'll follow us on the Land Rover, Captain. Uh, Miss Maysfield? Uh, coming. Don't get your feet wet, lad. Trust me. We need a torch. Oh, thank you, Captain. What's that? Shine your torch over there. A soldering iron. Was that under the wing before? No. It was on the wing. Still warm. Thank God. Obviously, your friend's been back. And all this soldering wasn't done this morning. Only the port wing tank was repaired when we left. Now he's begun on the stubble. Still warm. The solder's still soft. Must have been done in the last hour. Bill's been back, but where the hell is he now? Up to us to find out, isn't it? Are you still carrying on with the search as planned? Captain? Hmm? Sorry? Yes, I think you're right. Up in the ladder's knocked off work and is on his way back home. Maybe, but I'd rather be sure. You'll take Jamie with you? Yes, we'll take Jamie. Better be off. Well, lass, I must love you and leave you. Mind how you go. Mr. Crowther, mm. keep close. You don't have to tell me. Jamie, you lead the way. The man we're looking for is about your height, reddish hair, in this uniform. Aye, the lair told me. Now, we've each got a torch and a whistle. If we get separated, flash your torch three times and shout and whistle like hell. Careful, Crowther. You can break your ankle in some of these potholes. It looks as if it's had a bit of wear around here. In the wind. And a dose of salt. We'll stop and shout. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Bye. Again. Wait. What's the matter? Did you hear something? No. But it is ill luck to cry a living man's name when yon bird is calling. We'll go on a bit. Ground eye soft, sir. You're right. Careful, Mr. Father. Was this where you were this morning? No, that's the other side of the hangar. Dundas is looking there. It's a sort of graveyard of old airplanes. Wellingtons, Liberators, a fortress, old derelict, skeletons. What's that over there? The ruddy shape. Fair put you off mutton, doesn't it? We will call again. One, two, three. Bad! No further. He'd never come round here, would he? We've got to look everywhere. Well, I bet you he's back at the pub. If he is, I promise you I'll kill him. There's a hut there and another hangar. See it, Jamie? There is marsh and a cliffs. Uh, not safe. You show us the way. I'm just going inside. See you at the other end. 
Bill? Damn rats. Bill! Let go. Captain! Okay, just coming. Were you getting worried? Where's Jamie? Well, I don't know. I left him with you. Huh? I must have walked on. Miss come down again, hasn't it? Jamie! And there he is. Good lad, Jamie! Wait! Lad! Lad! Watch it, lad! Where are you? Where are you? Here! Now watch it! There's a cliff drop! I nearly had my cards! Oh, my God. Hang on. I'll try and hoist you up. I, I, I can't hang on very long, lad. My feet aren't on anything. I've got you. I'm heavier than you. I have to pair of us over. It's hell of a way down. I, I, I can't. Uh, Jamie! Uh, give, give over. You need a rope. <laughs> Go get the other strap. I'll be all right. Take a breath. You'll need it. Save me. Oh, he hasn't gone over the cliff, too. Yeah. Let's have a look. How yeah. far? Far enough. Uh, can you hang on a while without me holding you? Yeah, of course I can. You going for help, then? No. I'm coming down. should not have gone to the airfield at night, young me red man. It is... Certainly. Forbidden, he means. Courage. Dangerous. The earth shakes. There are lights. They are not of this world. Folk have been lost, spirited away when the ground shook and the thunder came. With all. Uh, interesting, yes? I wish he'd shut up. Uh, the old gods remain very much here. The inn is called the Oak. There was mistletoe hanging. Bye. You get pubs called the oak everywhere. Oh? And mistletoe at Christmas. Oh. Hey, isn't that a track to the left? Only a sheep track. Well, still it's worth trying. There's somebody there. Bill! Bill! Is that you? Bill! Uh, oh. Duncan McDermott, so it is. Mr. McDermott, we've lost one of our party. Have you seen anyone passing here this morning? There has been no one. Have you been here long? Yes. Did you go up to the airfield today? Aye, and last night. Did you see anyone last night? The man we're looking for is shortish with red hair. I mean, find what he looks like. He was not there. But I saw them. Them? I heard the ground shaking. I saw many lights. I saw them. Oh, Lord, can we get any sense out of anybody? So he is gone, your wee red man. Likely he saw them too. That is likely. You will not find him now. You had best go home. I, I suppose we'd better get back. It's uh, late. I don't like it, though. Maybe leaving Bill stuck somewhere on his own. He will not be on his own. He has gone. He has been changed. There will be others. Come. Mark a dear, it's a loon, and you ain't your ain't your mark. Amen. What does that mean? Early rising on Monday gives a sound sleep on Tuesday. Interesting. In one northern dialect, the words for sound sleep and death are interchangeable. Hey! Careful! I'm okay. Not long now. Right. Oh, you're there. That's a marvel. Don't let go yet, for heaven's sake. I can't take a full weight for a bit. Uh, first going to sleep. Well, hang on. 
Okay. Ready. Now listen. Do exactly what I say. Yeah. Keep hold of that bush. Yeah. I'm going to guide your feet onto my shoulders. What? Uh, 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 there. Uh. Oh. Oh, that's that's grand. <laughs> Still a bit numb. Uh. We'll wriggle your toes. Uh. And when it comes to it, put your weight on your right foot. Don't let go of that bush. No fear. Now, relax your hand a bit. Yeah. Oh, how much do you weigh? Oh, 14 and a half stone. Yeah. Now, feel along the rock with your left hand. Yeah. Any hold? Uh, no, no doubt. Uh, hey, I've got something. It'd be a rock jutting out. Firm? Yeah, it's a bit high, though. That's good. Now, get ready to grab it. Yeah. When I say go, I'll give you a shove. Oh. Leave it up. Yeah. Pull with your left hand and grab that ledge. Yeah. Try to lever your chest over the top. Oh. If you can't make it, try to get your left foot on the ledge. Yeah. And if I miss it... I'll take your weight. Happen. Well, I've got to make it. Now, remember, kick off with your left foot. Sounds like I'm dancing. Uh. Oh. Might as well die laughing. Ready? Yeah. Take a deep breath. Yeah. Go. I'm here. I'm here, lad. Oh, now you. How can we get? Oh, you? that's easier. There's a firm footing here and. I'm not bad at climbing. You'll be a damn good anchor, man. Coming up now. This is a funny sort of pub. Opening time and no one's come in. Well, there aren't many people on the island. All the more reason to come in here. Do you figure they're all helping our boys? Uh, maybe. Where's that mayor at gone to? Would you like a drink or something, honey? A drop of whiskey would warm us all up. I'll wait that lass up. Anyone at home? Oh, she's a right lazy lass. Oh, maybe she's out. Not she. I'll get her off her backside. Hey, service. Service, please. Are you deaf, then? I was reading. Real life romance. <laughs> American trash. I was never let read stuff like that when I was a girl. That was a long time ago. Was it something you were wanting? Will you be ringing instead of the both of you walking into my kitchen? We have rung, honey. For the last ten minutes. Now, three double whiskers, you take your ass and look sharp about it. There is no need for that shouting. I will come. Did you see the date on that magazine? I saw a prize. One dollar. Well, the date was October 26th, two days ago. Can't have been. But it was. Oh, maybe it was from our airplane. They do carry magazines. But how did she get it? Her father? Mm. I bet he's been up there, and I don't like it. I wish them daft dads had come back. I've got a nasty feeling something's wrong. Oh, we were lucky. That's a nasty old place. Hey, you don't reckon that Jamie... Fell over? Yeah. No, we'd have heard him. Look, there's a torch. Jamie! Sir? Sir? Where have you been? Over there, where you wished it. The big... The hangar? I... Why? I, I thought I heard you there. I went in. There was nobody. Then something shut the door. I couldn't get out. You're out now? I. Duncan found me. That is so. It is an evil place, this. Come on. Let's get the hell out of here. It's time to report back. Well, he is not in our sector, and he is not here in the hangar. No. I suggest you collect the stuff your skipper wanted. And have a good look round the aircraft. Oh, mind if I come up as well? I've never been inside it yet. I'd like you to. Well, don't leave me behind on my own. This hangar gives me the creeps. Right. We'll all go. My goodness. It is all very plushy. Mm. Roomier than they used to be. 
That's the captain's seat, first officer on the right. Um, behind here is the engineer's console and panel. Mr. Barrett. Yes, sir. Oh, one of these days I shall tear myself away from Arnabeg and jet off to the sun. I'm sorry, you're still worried about your friend, aren't you? Yes, a little. Did you think he might be here, uh, having a nap or something? I did hope we might find him asleep somewhere. Oh, how's the time? Or would you get back? Well, take your time, it is just after eight. I'm in no hurry. You get the blankets Captain Lampeter wanted and I'll load them up on the Land Rover. Is that the lot? Blankets, food. Yes, that's all. Everything all right up there? Yes. Exactly as we left it. Right. Well, if you girls would like to get in the Land Rover, Fergus will drive us back. Getting colder. Still, a drop in temperature sometimes clears the fog. I let Fergus have his head here because he's got to watch it once we're on that damned road. I wonder if the others are still searching. I am sure they won't be long. No. Mind if I open the window, help Fergus to steer? Oh, no, do. Don't break too quickly, even if one of those damn sheep come out. We can't risk a skid. We're too close to the sea to take any chances. Uh, I think it is clearing. Once we're around the headland, we'll see the lights of home. What is it? There. In the headlights. Lying by the cliff wall. A bicycle. It's... Yes. It's a wreck. Where's Bill? My dear, I think we'd better take it back to the hotel. Who found it? We did, on the way back. How long ago? About 30 minutes. As you saw, it's a write-off. It was lying on its side by that low sea wall. By the drop? Yes, by the drop. Where's Dundas? He went off with Todd to organize a boat. Is there any chance Bill could have fallen on a ledge partway down? No. It's sheer. And the drop's concave. Fergus swung the car around to get the lights on it and we had torches. There was nothing. You shut it? Yes. But the sea was loud. It was just after high tide. Yeah, the worst time to fall. We carried out on the ebb. That's why Dundas went for the boat. If there's a remote chance... He said you were to get some rest and leave all this to him. Rest? No. Peter? Well, you and I should be able to manage the cliffs, sir. Huh? I think we'd all like to come. This old lad staying here. Of course. Well, no, no we've had, had a bad time. Come on. Ipers Krantara. Ipers Krantara. Um, the victim of the fiery cross. Not a sign. No joy for the boat, either. We've seen Dundas. What's the time? Just after one. The others have gone to bed. Ming is? He's gone, too. You both need a drink. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Oh. Very generous of Ming is to leave the bar open. Oh, it's not on the house. He left what he calls the honesty box. Yeah. And Marat gave me a slate with the prices written on it. Anyone want any more? No, thank you. We'll start a full-scale search tomorrow, but Peter and I are going to drive around the coast road just once more tonight. Don't wait up. <laughs> Mingus might charge us extra for the oil. <laughs> Don't worry. I won't. Put the money in for us, will you? Right. Beer, shilling, whiskey turn six, lemonade a shilling. What's this? Go. Killed else. My dad. They've all gone to bed. Tomorrow. Good morning, Marat. You are up early, so you are. I wanted to talk to you before there was anyone else about. 
Where's that slate? Marat, why did you write this? This? So you would know what it is to pay. Oh, not the prices. Please, Marat, what did you mean? Why did you write this? Whiskey, two shillings and six pence. It's gone. Someone's rubbed it off. The prices are very reasonable. Everybody says that this is so. Ah, that is an omen, perhaps. The first time since we arrived, the sun has come. And gone. Herr Hagedorn, quickly! No, not you, Claire. Stay back. What is it? We've found Bill. Oh, no. Keep back, Claire. Poor oh, chap. Let me, I was a medical student. And you... You've seen death before? Yes, but never like this. His eyes. And I'd say every bone in his body's broken. Yes, must have hit hard. Terribly hard. Rock or water? I don't know. But he's been in the sea a while, judging by his skin. Tide washed him up? And brought him back. Mr. Dundas! Is it? Yes. Oh... So the search is over. Poor devil. But at least it must have been quick. He'd have felt nothing. Is there a doctor here? Old McPhee. He's retired, really. I've got the car at the top of the cliff. I'll take yeah. you to him. And a constable. Well, I'm the special constable here. Not that I've ever much to do. Burial? You seem to be used to this sort of thing. Well, Philby was a medical student. Oh, were you? But you didn't finish? No, I prefer to see life. Shall we give you a hand with him? Thanks. Uh, uh, he's light. Yes, he was, he was always small and thin. Sad. Very sad. For him and for Arnabek. He uh, fell from the head. Yes, Doctor. Death would be immediate. Oh, uh, he wouldn't feel a thing. The head's 500 feet. Well, Mr. Dundas, you'll want a death certificate signed. If you please, Doctor. And the funeral? Ah, Gugrat, immediately. Shall we say the noon hour tomorrow? Tomorrow? The dead are always buried quickly here. The islanders are a superstitious lot. They won't rest easy till your friend is buried. The others have gone. Yes. And you say goodbye to your friend alone. He will rest easy now. I have put the earth over him. Yes. And you will all be going away now. In a couple of days. Oh, you must go before that, sir. What? You must go now. You walk a narrow path between life and death. What has happened to your friend will surely happen to all of you. Tell me what you know. I see death all around. I see the bird will rise and the bird will fall. Is that all you can tell me? Aye. What's that? On the grave? A wee bird. A wren? It's... It's crucified. Here, it is the custom. He's asleep. Don't wake him, Philby. I wasn't going to. There's probably nothing to it anyway. Maybe not. You can't really call yourself a medical man. Last spoke my masters at St. Thomas's. Mind you, those red eyes, they were terrible. You reckon that if he'd been killed instantaneously by the fall, the whites of his eyes wouldn't have been like that? Medical fact. Let it happen only if he died a number of minutes after the blow on the head. Otherwise, the blood wouldn't have time to flow into the eyes. Well, you're saying that he was dead before he fell from the cliff. I suppose I am. And that pink stain on his shirt? Couldn't have been blood. Well, then what was it? Ah. There you have me. I said not to wake him. I am awake. I heard. Well, if you ask me, it's a lie. I'm though. not so sure. Thunder on Sunday, dead on Monday. 
Which is it going to be? The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, or why not say all three? Murdered? Good God, man, are you saying it just on that? The boy is not really a doctor. There are other things. I had a look at the bicycle. Pretty badly smashed up. Very. But if it had smashed into the wall, and he had braked at the last moment, the front tyre would have been in a hell of a mess. And wasn't it? No. The handlebars were buckled and smashed as though they'd had sideways blows. Furthermore, the saddle was too high. But my rat's a tall girl. He probably hadn't bothered to alter it. That's not like Bill. Everything had to be just so. Well, you knew him. I didn't. Then, sir, one thing bothered Claire. In the plane. I thought everything was just as you left it. Exactly. Including the food. Bill apparently worked here all day and didn't eat. Or wash. Well, perhaps he was too busy. But if he had worked and not washed, his hands would have been covered in grease. And there'd have been marks all over the handlebars. Anything else you haven't told me? Yes. On the grave. The grave? Yes. A tiny wren, speared and nailed to a cross of sticks. Crucified. Oh, my God. Now, tell me. What is really going on? I wish I knew. As you know, I wanted you to get away quickly. I've tried... You've been most helpful, sir. For their sake, as well as yours... Then you think Bill might have been murdered? Perhaps. Did what I told you have some meaning? Some of it. The crucified wren and the broken bones. But the pink on your friend's shirt, no. Have you any ideas? All I can think of is hydraulic fluid. But Bill wouldn't have been soaked in that stuff unless he'd been in another aircraft. A bomber, perhaps. Bomb doors are opened hydraulically. The old bombers on the airfield, but why should he go in them? Well, they'd have no fluid left in them now, anyway. I hesitate to use the word magic, but it might have some magic significance. Such as? I don't know. When I came here five years ago, there seemed to be nothing but an odd legend about an airfield called the Fiery Cross. Only gradually I found out other things. Why didn't you leave? I nearly did. But I'd sunk a lot of money in the place and got fond of the islanders. It all seemed harmless enough. The islanders dying like a human being. They needed youth and the sun again. So Ardnabech tried to bring the sun back. It has gone back to the old Celtic ways. And they are? The worship of the sun. The secret tradition. Druidism, I suppose you'd call it. All this apart, why Barrett? I think they hold their ceremonies on the airfield. That's why it's taboo, sacred ground. The ready-made circle and the intersection of the runways, did you notice? Well, one runs east-west true, another crosses in north-south true, I noticed. I've only seen that once before. Ever. I think that's why they had to move your aircraft. And maybe your friend surprised them. Some secret ceremony. Who are they? I don't know. They have a high priest, but his name is secret. Surely they don't really believe this novel. Oh, yes, they do. They have the cup, a chalice, a litany. To them, all this is sacred. So sacred, they would murder? Or worse, what could be worse? Sacrifice. Human sacrifice. You mean that Bill... His bones were all broken. The druids used to drop their victims from a mountaintop. Or a cliff. They wouldn't dare. Why not? To the outside world, he's dead already. Officially, none of you exist. They might even think you are sent by lightning, sacred lightning, for sacrifice. That crucified wren meant sacrifice. The wren is the god of the winter solstice. He needs to be propitiated. And tonight, their old year ends. In Halloween? They call it the night of the hollow fires. The fires. The fiery cross. You see, 
You must get away. Your repairs, are they nearly done? Oh, pretty well, just checking and refueling. We can give you a hand. When can you get away? Before dawn, at first light, 7.15. Don't let it be any later, Captain. As far as the islanders are concerned, we'll all be here at the inn till first light tomorrow. But Peter and I will slip out tonight to make sure no one tampers with the aircraft. Claire. Yes? You arrange some sort of guard rotor, one person awake, through the night. Yes. At seven in the morning, bring everyone down in the Land Rover. It's waiting outside. Mm -hmm. We'll be in the hangar waiting for you. It's a pretty terrifying tally, isn't it? The wren, the mistletoe, and the moving of the aircraft. And something I kept to myself. The repairs to the port wing were neatly done, typical of Bill's work. The starboard wing was messy, an amateur job. I don't believe he touched it. And what about this, Captain Lamberter? Wouldn't you say this was kind of mysterious? A fuel cap. Oh, you've got cart around my hill in the distillery. Interesting, but uh, I don't see any connection. Would you like a wee bite of supper, Captain? You had a long day. Uh, no, thanks. I'm, I'm off to bed. Uh huh. A good night to you then, Captain. What did you expect to find, sir? I don't know, Peter. I don't know. The night of the hallow fires. You mean some sort of ceremony? Perhaps. Well, there's nothing here in the hangar, anyway. No. Everything's just as we left it. It's the time. 11.35. If anything happens, it'll be at midnight. In here? No. My guess is it'll be at the intersection of the runways. But why there? One runs due north-south. One that crosses it runs due east-west. It has a meaning in these rites. Come on. If they come, what'll happen if they see us? We must take damn good care they don't. Mm. Find cover of some sort where we can see without being seen. We must not take any risks. Can you see, sir? The intersection, yes. This is as near as we can get with any safety. These bushes aren't that much of a cover, but they'll just about do. I can't see a thing unless I stand up. For God's sake, don't do that. I'll let you know if anything happens. Stay put and we'll both stay alive. If they find us, I don't give much for our chances. What's that? I don't see anything. Yes. Keep down. They're coming? Yes. Who are they? and white robes and hoods. They're coming in procession down the runways. From the east, the north, and the south. The west? No. Just three groups. They've got stones and pieces of wood. They're, they're building... They're building an altar. Turn them on you like a pack of wolves. Would they harm you? They do not mind me. I see to the sheep, and when these strange times come, I herd them away. But there is always the foolish one. You saw what they did, John, with you. They wouldn't steal or kill except tonight. Halloween? Aye. They are burning the whole year. Sometimes they burn other things. What they call evil. 
to cleanse themselves and bring the sun and life. How long is this sort of thing gone on? Forever. The secret order was always strong in the island. But this is different. When did it start up again? In this manner, not so long. When they built the airfield, folks said she would be without luck, for the ground was sacred. Then the mountain claimed some aeroplanes for himself. And then this worship started? No, no, not so soon. It was after that. The hunchback. It's Todd. What? The wind blew the hood back. <laughs> Did you know, Duncan? I did not know, but I had it in my mind. How did he do it? The fire? I do not know. Divine fire, he'll be telling you. The big man who killed the sheep looked like Mingus. Aye, poor fool. That's all he is. A fool, no worse. Always hankering after being the seer, the fire. He wants the secret of the fire so one day he can be chief. Is there always sacrifice? Maybe, if the fire does not come without... Do you know what trick produces that fire? Aeroplanes. We know they are there, but few of us know how they stay in the sky. And them that come here... Ghostly airplanes? Yes. Mm. The whistlers from the west and north, with the fire behind them. Jet engines. Maybe... Hail to the fire! This boil is done. It is time we were all away. Go with care. Go, all of you, from this place while you can. And what about you? I shall not leave, ever. It is mine, this island. It is me. God protect you. Ah! What is this? I know how he does it. Flamethrowers. Flame? And the robe is a fuel cylinder. That's the humble. That fuel cap we found. Yes, They're going. And so is Todd. I'm going to follow him. I'll come with you. No, get back to the hangar. Sorry, sir. Anything else? Well, all right. But keep well away from him and obey orders. Sir. Where is the plane? That's his voice in the southerly hangar. There's someone else there, too. I'm going round the other side where there are windows. Maybe I can hear them better there. You stay here. Right. I know the other voice. So, it went smoothly. Fine. You know, Mr. Dundas, I'm beginning to get a kick out of it. A good general uses the local customs. He doesn't acquire a taste for them. Where is the flamethrower? I took it off. It's too damn heavy. It is a good one. Out of the Tinarat consignment. Where did you put it? Perfectly safe. It half skinned my back. Oh, there was bloody Arabs. Where? Behind a rock by the intersection. We'll pick it up later. And our guests? Still at the inn. All of them. Mengi's told me. Takeoff is at 7.15. Hmm? We don't want any more nosing about here. They're not all as daft as your engineer. And after moving his aircraft off the runway for him, who? I could have bashed him. <laughs> you did. <laughs> well, the star bomber had to get in. And he nosed around just when Jamie and I were refueling at the underground tank. We had to. There are things I have to do in my own initiative, you know. Like feeding that girl magazines and candy. Ah, using the bomb bay was silly. The pilot might have guessed the tide would bring him back. Without a body, we had have got them all away. <laughs> Isn't that just what we're doing? Getting them away? Far away? Thanks to me. I hope there won't be questions. Who from? The outside world has given them up. When do we start preparing? Two hours before the balloon goes up. Hmm? We had better get that flamethrower. Where is the last one I've got in stock? When's the next lot coming in? Tomorrow night sometime. Going to the same lot? Yes, Ben Youssef. Ah. Then there's a trawler coming into harbor from Murmans next week. I hope you're not flooding the market. By the way, what if Ben Youssef's in danger of winning? That is the whole point of supplying both sides. And what about further supplies? Ryan's organized that in Leningrad. Ah. Come on. You might as well come back for a bite and some sleep. Aye. Oh, it, it's still raining. Will that make it less effective? Not a bit. They'll never see it. 
Come along. What happened? Why have you come back? You're dressed. Oh, I couldn't sleep. Are you all right? Get what? the women up. Peter will rouse the men. Plan change. Right, but what? I'll explain later. But it's vital we go now. Everyone's strapped in, sir. You're sure there was nothing on the plane? Nothing they might have put there? No. Peter and I searched everywhere. What the hell are they planning? We'll soon find out, one way or the other. I thought I saw headlights just now, though. Moving. Which way? Hard to tell in the mist. Before starting engine check, complete, sir. Energize number two. Energizing two. Light two. Lighting two. Energize one. Energizing one. Light one. Lighting one. So far, so good. It's all too empty. I don't like it. Shine your torch over the wing, Peter. See, we're not losing fuel. No fuel leaks, sir. It's a bit too good to be true. Claire. Yes? Stay up front of Bill's seat. You're another pair of eyes. Yes, sir. Left, sir. There's a dirty great hole. Fine. A, a little right. Landing lights, Peter. We're set for takeoff. It's too late for it to matter. Right. Here we go. Look out! The runway ahead. Shimmering. My God, kerosene. Peter, do you see it? Pipes. Three pipes sending it down the runway. What the hell? All the underground fuel tanks. I saw them for a moment. Jamie, Todd, and Dan Dash. Blast. The bastards get our jets on that kerosene. Yeah. That was quite right. There wouldn't have been any trace. We've got to get the hell away from it quickly. Look, Mingy's. He's got a flamethrower. <laughs> He's picked us up. Flames went the other way, backwards to the fuel tanks. The whole lot went up. Down there? Not a hope for any of them. See how the passengers are, Claire. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to Mingus. Sir, he's still got that flamethrower. He might do anything. That's why I've got to talk to him. But he's simply got to pull a trigger the again. The captain knows best. I hope. Mingus. Who is that? So, you found the secret of the fire. Angus Mingus, you great fool. You found your fire, so then let it clean. You didn't mean all that, I know, fine. Give it to me. Let me help. No. So, Angus Mingus, I have your fire. The marsh will bury it, sir. Help me. Yes. Throw it there. <laughs> no. It is over. When the fire is down, you may go in peace. Quarter flap. Quarter flap, sir. Booster pumps on. Booster pumps on, sir. If the repairs hold up to that abort, they'll hold the trip home. So, Dundas had it nicely worked out. Yes. Hard and a big. The island of the joining of the worlds. Illegal arms from all over the world. China, Russia, America. Coming to this deserted place for transmission to all sides in the Middle East. To keep the war on the boil. All under the cloak of ancient druidism. Superstition is a powerful thing. Passengers all strapped in and ready, sir. Hundred and twenty knots, sir. Undercarriage up. Sunlight. Look, isn't it 
beautiful. Yes. Strange. At last the sun has come back to Ardnebeg. In Thunder on Sunday, the novel by Karen Campbell, adapted for radio by Betty Davis, Lampeter was played by Noel Johnson, Claire by Rosalind Shanks, Duncan by Duncan McIntyre, and Dundas by Simon Lack. Philby, Anthony Hall, Bill Barrett, Nigel Graham, Peter Spence, John Forrest, Crowther, Hayden Jones, Mrs. Crowther, Joyce Latham, Herr Hagedorn, Michael Kilgariff, Dawn, Gail McFarlane, Jerry, John Sampson, Mrs. Ewart, Sandra Clark, Mengies, Tom Watson, Myrat, Sheila Grant, Todd, John Graham, and Jamie, William Slay. The guitar was played by Steve Garner, who also composed the music for Thunder on Sunday. The play was produced by Betty Davis. Noel Johnson is now appearing in Crown Matrimonial at the Haymarket Theatre. Way to spend a honeymoon. No. Golly, don't joke about it. I know what this boat means to you. Meant to me. I doubt we'll ever sail this wreck again. Darling, we'll, we'll know better after day breaks. Now, have you any idea where we are? I have a pretty good idea. You don't sound overjoyed. I hope the natives are friendly. There won't be any natives on this island. From our last position before the storm, there can only be one place. Well? We've managed to get ourselves wrecked on Inawitok Atoll. Inawitok? Where we exploded our hydrogen bombs, remember? Hydrogen bombs? Radiation? Let's move, love. Better a hot beach than getting caught on this wreck by another wave. Theater 5 presents Miss Betsy von Furstenberg in Any Port in a Storm. Wake up. It's morning. Look what I've got. I speared us a fish for breakfast. Now, if I can find the makings of a fire. 
<sighs> what am I doing on this beach? Be like a piece of driftwood. Any we talk. Sammy! Finally awake, huh? I can't find a blasted thing to make a fire with. Everything's either green or soaked by the storm. Why do you want to bother making a fire? To cook the fish. What fish? Right there on the sand beside you. Ain't he a beauty? Sammy, you caught... You caught this out in the lagoon? <laughs> well, darling, it wasn't flown in from Singapore. But we can't eat this. We can eat it if I can get a fire going. I'm going to get some gasoline from the wreck. No! I'm getting rid of this. Marion, you threw him back. It took me an hour to catch that fish. Oh, Sammy, contamination. Everything on or around this forsaken place will be saturated with nuclear contamination. Have you forgotten? The hydrogen bomb was exploded here. I'm sorry. It looked like a perfectly healthy fish to me. Well, there's plenty of tin food on the boat. We don't need to live off this land or the sea around it. And while we're about it, we'll see if it's not possible to stay aboard, wreck or not. Marion. Oh, come on, darling. Marion, you don't sound like you anymore. I don't sound like... Sammy. <laughs> You're right. I sound like an old harridan. Forgive me? Oh, I mean, you're the girl who thought honeymooning on a 50-foot catch would be a great idea. You went through a whizzer of a storm like an old salt, but now we're relatively safe and you seem to be cracking up. Oh, darling, you know how some girls were afraid of mice. Mice? Well, sure. Oh, I'm afraid of mice and radiation. Come along, darling, come along to the boat. <laughs> Five feet of the bow stove in. Well, can't we patch it somehow? Enough to float her upright? We take a week to rig a makeshift bulkhead behind the hole. The search planes ought to find us before that. Well, we can't be sure they'll find us. Let's get aboard and see what goes. Up you go. Oh, I don't need pushing. Well, then take your foot off my face. Oh, I'll throw your leg over the rail. Fall in board. Oh! <laughs> Now move over. I'm coming up. Oh, my. Oh, I'll be a mass of bruises. The rigors of sailing. The rigors of being hoist by a heavy hat. It only seems that way. Now, let's see what we can find in the cabin. <laughs> How do you walk on a boat when the deck is perpendicular? Same way you walk on a gable roof. <laughs> How's that? With difficulty. Here, you want a hand? Not again, thanks. You go ahead. I'll follow somehow. Right. Here, grab my arm. Pull yourself up. Oh, everything in this cockpit is slippery. Well, get get hold of the hatch, Comey. All right, all right. I can brace myself in the hatchway now. Brace yourself for a shock. Poke your head through the hatchway and have a look inside the cabin. It's half underwater. Good heavens, everything looks totally smashed. You stay here in the cockpit. I'm going down. Sammy! Sammy, now don't slip and fall. I could never pull you out. Sammy! Will you stop going off like a fire alarm? I'm okay. But I just noticed. I just noticed the radio. See? Huh? On the bulkhead, it's out of the water. Ah. It's been in the water. There's salt crust on it. Yes, but it's all transistors. We could dry it out. Possible. We'll see. And Marion. What? Next time something gets your attention. <laughs> you made your point. I shall whisper. Good. I am now heading for the food lock. Okay? Sammy! Oh, are you all right? Uh, except for a battered chin and a plug <coughs> full of this foul water. What did you hit? Uh, the generator. 
totally submerged and too heavy to move, which answers your question about the radio. Oh, no. Oh, Sammy, does that mean we haven't... we haven't any chance of making contact with the mainland? I'm afraid not. Now, once more, let us see about the food locker. Ah, uh, locker door jammed. What are you doing? Breaking open the locker door. Huh. Now, let's have a look inside. Yes, you'll be glad to know the food tins are wet, but in good shape. We are not going to starve. Yes, but the, but the generator. Out. Not a chance for contact with anyone. All right. I'll stand back and you toss the cans past me into the cockpit. What about the water? You can see the tank. Didn't break loose. Should be okay. Good. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to make some kind of, of level platform out here in the cockpit. Maybe with the hatch covers. And here we are going to stay until they come and find us. I'm afraid not, darling. Sammy. I am not going back on that contaminated beach. But we've got no choice. Sammy, did you hear what I said? I'm trying to tell you this cabin is soaked to the ceiling. At a high tide, the whole boat is underwater. get the bag to make that bundle. It's my shirt. Oh, darling, you'll sunburn horribly. Well, I hope you get the shirt back after you've unloaded the tin stuff in it. What are you bringing? Cans of water. You start for the beach. I'll follow. Oh! What? Nearly lost the bundle. Well, watch it. Here I come. What is it? Oh! Oh! Did you see that rat? One old rat? Is that what you're carrying on about? If there's one rat, there'll be dozens, hundreds. Oh! I can't stand rats. I can't stand the sight of them. Well, let's take a closer look at this, my darling. That rat was scared silly of us. Didn't you hear him screaming? Sammy, I have been bitten by one of those horrid creatures. They're, they're the most dangerous when they're scared. I'm sorry, Sammy. I'm sorry, but we've, we've got to get away from this beach. Oh, easy, easy. We're going to work this out. Sammy, do you realize, do you realize what it would mean to be bitten by one of these rats? They must have survived the blast of the hydrogen bomb. Imagine, imagine what it would be like to be bitten from... Marion, one... Marion, we've got to keep our heads over the sun. Now, look, I'm going to bring in a sail from the boat and rig a tent. No! It's only a question of holding on for a day, maybe two. Do you think I could possibly sleep on this beach tonight knowing that those those rats are all over the place? A day, maybe two. I tell you, we've got to get away from here. When they try for radio contact with us today and don't reach us... Any place but this, even the open sea. They'll have word about the storm and they'll notify Air Sea Rescue. Now, Marion, listen. If we just sit tight, the search planes will be along in no time. A raft. A raft. We could make a raft out of the hatches on the boat. And another thing, I'm not one bit sure we have to worry about this nuclear contamination. You say we don't have to worry. When was the bomb exploded? Back in the mid-50s? I don't care when it was. We are going to build a raft. Marion. I said we are going to build a raft and get away from here fast. Find the small compass? Yes. And the fishing gear? I found it. Just bring it along. It could be our survival kit. I've also found a wet pack of cards in case we get tired of staring at each other. Uh, 
You know what those hatch covers are nailed to? Well, small, small logs, aren't they? Wet, green wood. What does that mean? It means they'll float submerged. We'll always be awash out there, night and day. Well, there's the metal trunk. They'll keep some things dry. But not us. It also means we'll have small chance of fighting the currents. The sail won't be worth anything but shade. The sail will be a marker. Make us easier to see from a plane. Not by any means as easy to see as that 50-foot boat, which isn't going to move from this lagoon. Sounds as though you're getting ready to back down. Could be. Well, think again. We now, are going. This business about Enoetok being hotter than an atomic reactor... Now, Marion, I've been thinking that one over, and, and it doesn't quite add up. Now, look at that foliage behind you. Yes? A good ten feet high and thriving. Any sign of mutations? Any, any twisted, cancerous-looking growth you can see? None that I can see, and I'm not going to look for it. Did you really look at that fish I caught in the lagoon? Sammy... Healthiest fish I ever saw. The rat that scared you half to death was fat and sassy. The land crab... Land crabs? Oh, all, all right, all right. I didn't mention them for fear of scaring you. There were some on the beach early this morning. Looked fine, not sick at all. Now, and? look, there's no chance that a couple of days here will do us any great damage. We'll be found by the search planes. We'll be picked up. On the other hand... On the other hand, there is the raft. A waterlogged raft. And you want to take your chances on it in the middle of the South Pacific. Would you rather I went alone? Well, there's still no direct radio contact. That doesn't mean anything. Lots of things could go wrong with the radio. Has there been any news at all while I was taking my nap? Captain McComber calls. No word from the search planes. Imagine taking a nap while our boy's out there. Heaven knows where. Oh, it's the best thing you could do. Now, we won't start to worry yet, my dear. Trying to sail all the way out there in that 50-foot catch. I told Sammy and Marion it was perfectly ridiculous. Now, they're both good sailors, and the Falcon's a stout ship. But it's one of the worst storms in years. And the weather service reports there's more coming. Well, it's evidently calmed down out there now. So, so let's take a calm look at the possibilities. Now, here, here on the map. I've marked Sammy's last reported position, see? Hundreds of miles from any sort of land. Yes, but the whole area's been laid out in a grid. The search planes are covering it square by square. Look here. Huh? What's this dot on the map? Oh, that's, uh, an we talk at all. Where all the hydrogen bombs were set off? Well, the storm was blowing in a direction that would carry them there. That, in fact, is what I'm hoping. Hoping they land on that terrible place with all the nuclear radiation? Yes, that's what I hope. Oh. Although they may feel the same way that you do about that radiation. Well, the fact is, a team of scientists went back there found a stand of new foliage, normal fish in the lagoon, and healthy life on the land. The radiation was reduced to almost nothing. Then they would be perfectly safe there? Perfectly safe and easy to find, so long as they stay there. Now, Sammy should know that. That's what I'm banking on, really. I'll take it. Yes? It's... It's good of you to keep us advised, Captain McComber. Thank you. Another storm is forming southeast of the Philippines. Now, now, now. We'll assume they made any we talk. And they're going to sit it out there till they're found. All right, Mother? <laughs> Sorry, darling. There's no logic to it at all. The two of us are staying right here to wait for the planes. I've decided. So, you decided. Do you no good to talk? I am not foliage and am not a fish. The sail gets rigged into a tent. Neither am I a rat or a land crab. So, you had better listen to me. I have been listening, and the final decision has been made. Now, stop that. Leave that stuff on the raft. Now, what are you doing? 
I've never seen you like this. Darling, I want you to remember something. All right. You remember that night at the yacht club when we decided to marry? A beautiful night it was. And so were you. Darling, do you remember what we talked about in particular? Where we live, what we do. In particular, we talked about... We talked about the kind of family we might have and how we'd, we'd bring them up and educate them. Do you remember? Yes, of course I do. Very well, then. Consider this. I am not foliage, fish, nor rodent. I am a healthy young wife, your wife, Sammy Darling. Honey, if you think I've stopped loving you just because I got my back up... I don't think that for a moment. I do think I know you are being arbitrary and unreasonable. Me unreasonable? You flatly refuse to leave on the raft. Marion, I have to take the long view. Now, look, look at that sky. The storm could build up again. Now, look, honey... I want us to get out of here alive, and our best bet is to stay right here. Well, so much for us. Now, about those children we want. Well, that's really taking a long view. Exactly. If we stay on this island, darling, do you guarantee that the effects of that radiation won't harm our children? Come on. Answer that one. What? Well, who can answer it? All right, Marion. Climb aboard the raft. I'll push off. Theater 5 has presented Any Port in a Storm, written by Don Lamb, produced and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Betsy Von Furstenberg, George Petrie, Ethel Remy, and John Griggs. Audio engineers Marty Folia and Peter Sarantopoulos. Script editor Jack C. Wilson. Sound technician Ed Blaney. Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. <laughs> This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Edward G. Robinson... Claire Trevor and Edmund O'Brien in Key Largo. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's recipe for your enjoyment is melodrama. That spine-tingling compound of mystery, murder, and romance, Key Largo. It brings back to this theater a famous star of melodrama on both stage and screen, Mr. Edward G. Robinson. And Key Largo gives Eddie the kind of part he made famous in the days of Little Caesar. Co-starring with him are Claire Trevor, who repeats the brilliant performance which won her an Academy Award in the picture, and Edmund O'Brien, an actor with a fine talent for action drama. Maxwell Anderson was the author of the stage play, 
and Warner Brothers repeated the Broadway success with their screen version. You know it takes just the right ingredients and the playwright's know-how to make a successful drama. And it takes just the right ingredients and scientific know-how to make a product like Lux Toilet Soap. But women everywhere recognize its quality. And like nine out of 10 screen stars, choose Lux Toilet Soap as their own complexion care. It's curtain time, and here is act one of Key Largo, starring Edward G. Robinson as Johnny Rocco, Claire Trevor as Gay, and Edmund O'Brien as Frank. <laughs> At the southernmost point of the United States are the Florida Keys, a string of small islands connected by a concrete causeway. Largest of these remote islands is Key Largo. Key Largo has very few visitors this time of year. It's midsummer, and the old wooden hotel is drowsing in the heat. But there are guests in the hotel. A few men and a girl gathered at the little bar just off the lobby. And now, a newcomer walks in. Okay, Jack, what do you want? I just got off the bus. Uh, is the proprietor around, Mr. Temple? He ain't here. The hotel's closed. When will he be back? I don't know. Oh, it's awful hot. How about a beer? Bar's closed. That's right, Jack. Everything's closed in the summertime. Give him a drink. You heard me. Give him a drink. Oh, thank you. Oh, please. Think nothing of it. Wake up, Toots. The buzzer. I hear it. Mr. Brown wants his drink. Oh, his drink, he does. Oh, put plenty of ice, plenty of ice. Uh, listen, I I'll take it up to him. When he wants you, he'll send for you. I know he will. I know that. Well, turn on the radio. It's almost time for the races. You just wait and see that first race. This, uh, uh, uh fancy freak. That's the one. He'll just walk away with it. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know why? They've been holding him back his last two. Today he wins. Hey, uh, fella, what do you think, hmm? Hmm? You play the ponies? Me? No. Why not? Well, I haven't got the money. This is what I want to tell you. I play the long shots because, you see, well, betting on the favorite, what, what do you win? Now, for instance, take, the, take this fancy free. You know the odds? 20 to 1. Real long shot. Say, what's her name? McLeod, Frank McLeod. Oh, I'm Miss Dawn. Miss Gay Dawn. Okay, Miss Dawn, he wants you upstairs. Oh, oh, he wants me. I better, uh, I better, uh, excuse me, please. Look, mister, if you're thinking of putting up here, the hotel's closed. Well, I don't plan to stay here. I just want to see Mr. Temple. Oh, why'd you say so? He's outside, not at the dock. Yeah, by the boathouse. Thanks. I'll go see him, That's right, brother. I'm Mr. Temple. My name's McLeod, Frank McLeod. McLeod? Frank? Major McLeod? Nora! Nora, come here! When would you get here? A few minutes ago. I'm on my way to Key West. Nora! Look who's here! This is Major Frank McLeod. And this is Nora. Uh, this is George's wife. Your husband and I were in the same outfit overseas. <laughs> As if she didn't know. <laughs> I wrote you a letter, Major, but it came back. Well, I haven't been staying put very long. Ever been down here before? No, sir. Uh, she cools off some come November. Right livable then for about three months. How long are you going to be with us? Oh, for an hour or so till the next bus. An hour? Why, you you could spare us more time than that, surely. Well, Overnight, at least. So you will. He can have George's room, Nora. Yes, Dad, of course. Oh, it looks as if we have more company. Hi. Oh, uh, local police, Major. They're looking for a couple of Indians. Afternoon. Any sign of the Osceola brothers? Uh, sorry, Ben. No sign of them around here. Uh, I want you and Clyde to meet my son's commanding officer. This is Major McLeod. I see you, Major. Hi, Major. If you don't mind, Mr. Temple, we'd like to have a look around. If was I you, I'd save myself the trouble. They'll give themselves up by morning. Well, Clyde, if Mr. Temple says they ain't here, they ain't here. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Temple. Such a fuss over a couple of harmless Indians. Nora's right, Major. They just got a little snootful and started to take Florida back for the Seminoles. <laughs> Well, I sent word for them to come here and give themselves up. Not that I'm supposed to know where they are, you understand. 
Well, let's get inside and cool off. You mind giving me a hand? Be glad to. George told me how you were sort of crippled up. Yeah, my legs. A tree fell on them eight years ago. Hurricane. Been no good for anything ever since. I'll go on and see about your room, Major. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hiya, Mr. Temple. I see the fellow found you okay. Yeah, Major McLeod here, he was my son's commanding officer overseas. Yeah? yeah they were in the Italian campaign together. My uh, boy, George, was killed at casino. Yeah? <laughs> What's going on up there? Nothing, Mr. Temple, nothing at all. Nora, what is it? It's Miss Dawn. Case of one too many, Pop. Miss Dawn drinks too much. You had no right to hit her. If you people can't behave yourselves, you gotta leave. Don't worry about it, Pop. She'll behave. You got the room ready, Nora? Maybe the Major would like to wash up. Yes, it's ready. This way, please. Up the stairs. Thanks. Say, uh, these other guests, how long have they been here? Three days. That's their yacht you saw off the pier. Mr. Brown's yacht. Which one is Mr. Brown? Oh, he's in his room. Rich, I guess, from the way they all jump when he lifts a finger. He's a lady killer, or he thinks he is. Anyway, they'll be leaving soon. Well, here's your room. Major, were you with George when he died? Yes, I was. Did he... Did he suffer a lot? No. No. No, he never knew what hit him. I was afraid he might. Can I come in? Yeah, sure. Come on in. Come down to Dad's office when you're ready, Major. So you're staying the night, huh? I'm Curly Hoff. Uh, I uh, I hope you're not sore. I mean the way we handle you downstairs. No, I'm not sore about anything. I guess you're wondering what we're doing here, huh? I don't suppose it's any of my business. Uh, we come down from Milwaukee, the four of us, deep sea fishing. More than a year we've been planning this trip. So what happens? The blind shows up. If she isn't drunk and crying, then she's got a hangover and argue. And now I ask you, can you blame us for not being nice and polite? No, I don't blame uh, you. Uh, you, you're going downstairs. Let's have a little drink. Well, not right now, thanks. Well, come on, Jack. Just to show there's no hot fit. Hey, miss. Was you just talking on the telephone? Yes, the Coast Guard called. Oh. I thought maybe it was for one of us. The storm signals are up. Hurricane's on its way. <laughs> you see what I mean, Mr. Hurricane's yet? Dad's in here, Major, in the office. Sit down, Major. Sit down. The war's over, Mr. Temple. I'm not a Major anymore. Well, I guess you want to know about George. He was a good soldier, Mr. Temple. You can be proud of him. I always was. George was a born hero, I guess. It's a wonder he lasted till casino. But when you believe like George believed, maybe dying isn't very important. Well, he talked a lot about both of you. You'd be surprised how much I know. What's it like with... Where... Where George is buried. Sort of pretty and peaceful. Crosses on a slope and high up what's left of a church. You can see a river from where George is. I'd like to pay a visit to that place. Maybe someday we can, Dad. Go to Italy and see where George is buried. Dad, there's a storm warning. I'd better see to the boat. Maybe Frank would like to go with you. Yeah, sure. Tell me something. What brought you down here? Oh, I like the sea, and I thought I'd like to make my living at it. Doing what? Doesn't matter. Life on land's getting too complicated for my tastes. What'd you do before the war? Circulation manager for a newspaper. Good job. Didn't you go back to it? Yeah, yeah but I couldn't stick to it. I've done a lot of things since. Anything to make a dollar. Well, this is our boat, the Santana. Not much you can do when it starts to blow like this. Just hope for the best. How's your ground tackle off stern? Oh, plenty heavy. I'd better double up in these bow lines. <laughs> Where'd you learn about boats? Oh, my first sweetheart was a boat. Say, uh, that yacht out there, that's his, huh, Mr. Browns? I think he charted it. She'd better get away from the reefs. Oh, there's a skipper aboard. He ought to know what to do. Hello, Miss Nora. What? Tom. Hello, and John. Well, come here. Frank, this is Tom and John Osseo. Oh, How do you do? We're bad Indians, huh, Miss Nora? Well, we give ourselves up to police. I'm glad, Tom. Dad says it's the best thing. We do whatever he says. He's a good friend. Well, did you come here alone? Oh, no, miss. All Indians on Clawfish Island come. Best thing when hurricane blows. It's all right, Miss Nora. The family stay on Hotel Porch and not make any bother. Of course it's all right. Where are they all? At Cove, miss. We'll go tell them. Well, I'll tell Dad. He'll telephone the police. Well, yes, miss. Very good. They'd do anything at all for Dad. 
As far as they're concerned, he's the United States of America. You're very happy here, aren't you? Very. Never lonely? No, not anymore. Before George, my life hadn't made much sense. I never had much of a home and didn't like what I had. Well, George... George gave me roots. When he went overseas, I came down here to stay with his father, and the roots took hold. Now I... I'm like one of those men. Well, I guess that answers my question. Oh, here it comes. Come on, before we get soaked. <laughs> well, I just talked to the Osceola brothers. We're going to wait out there on the porch. I thought you said the police had come back. Cars down the road, all right, but no sign of Ben or Clyde. Wonder where they went. Where'd those people go, Dad? Up in their rooms? They're all in the bar. Well, this is going to be an experience for them. Real Florida hurricane. I'll get it, Dad. It's okay, Miss. I'll take it. But I... I said I'll take it. Hello? No, Mr. Temple's not here now. Of course I'm here. Who is it? Me? I'm a guest at the hotel. No, we haven't seen him. Give me that phone. You heard her. Give her the phone. Take it easy, soldier. Put down that gun. What do you think you're doing here? Shut up. All of you. Okay, Sheriff. If Sawyer shows up, I'll have him call you right back. That was Ben Wade. Yeah, I guess it was. He's looking for his deputy. Then Clyde Sawyer must have come here alone. That's his car down the road. Is it? Well, I'm calling Ben right back. You're not phoning anybody, Pop. Who are you? Pack of thieves? Put that gun away. Come on, toots. Let's take him upstairs and see Mr. Brown. Angel, keep your eyes open. Curly's got him across the hall, boss. The old man, the girl, and the soldier. Well, what happened? Who's on the phone? Yeah, the law, sheriff, looking for the deputy. Well, that means it won't be long, then. Oh, you think this rain would cool things off, but it don't. Gonna have a hurricane, huh? Yeah, that's what they say. I want to talk to you, Mr. Brown. Open that door and come out here. Well, now, what's all this about? No, oh, good evening, Mr. Temple. Who's the young man? My name's McLeod. I want some answers, Mr. Brown. You want money? Is this a robbery? Now, look, Pop. Let's be nice and sensible, huh? Now, forget the questions. What you don't know won't hurt you. I'm expecting a friend. He ought to get here in a couple of hours now, and then we'll get out of here. Now, try and put up with us that long, huh? Well, sister, what are we going to eat tonight? Pompano, maybe? Am I to understand we're prisoners? Well, put it this way, Pop. You're going to be my guest for a little while. <laughs> you know, back in Chicago in the old days, we used to pay eight or ten dollars for an order of Pompano. Used to fly it in. And the way they served it. <laughs> yes, sir, all done up in the brown paper bag. Oh, uh, got any champagne, miss? No champagne, boss. I looked before. Oh, well, that's too bad. Champagne and pompano. <laughs> they really go together. Hey, boss. The cop's starting to come around. Sawyer! You've got Sawyer in there. Yeah, that's right, Pop. Oh, Mr. Mr. Temple, call, call Ben Wade. Tell him I need help. I happened to run into him, Pop, about ten minutes ago down on the beach. Well, look at him. He's all beaten up. Why did you hurt that boy? He's a cop, that's why. And who are you? Answer me, who are you? He's Johnny Rocco, Mr. Temple. Yeah, that's right. Johnny Rocco. Please, let me help Mr. Sawyer. He's badly hurt. Okay, go on in. Uh, Curly, let her help him. Rocco. I know that name. Johnny Rocco the gangster. The one and only Rocco. But they threw you out of the country. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. After living in the USA for more than 30 years, they called me an undesirable alien. Me, Johnny Rocco. Like I was a... Dirty red or something. Well, how can you be here? Well, maybe I'm not, Pop. You know, this ain't real what's happening. You're having the dream. Here, yeah, wake up, Pop. You're snoring. All right. You shouldn't have been deported. You should have been exterminated. I'll show you. Rocco. Rocco. I apologize for Mr. Temple. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Or who to? Sir, Johnny Rocco was a king, an emperor. His rule extended over beer, slot machines, the numbers racket and a dozen other forbidden enterprises. He's a master of the fix, 
whom he couldn't corrupt, he terrified. Whom he couldn't terrify, he murdered. You filth! You city filth! Mr. Temple, please. Welcome back, Mr. Rocco. It was all a mistake. America's sorry for what it did to you. Hey, on the level, boss. Were you that big? Yeah. Yeah, that's me, sure. That was all of those things and more. When Rocco talked, everybody shut up and listened. What Rocco said went. Nobody was as big as Rocco. I'll be back up there one of these days, and then you're really going to see something. Now, what's with you, wise guy? Well, give. You were in the war, huh? Yeah. Get any medals? Couple. Brave, huh? No, not very. Why'd you stick your neck out? No good reason. Frank, what do you say? I believed some words. Words? What words? Well, it went like this, Mr. Rocco. But we are not making all this sacrifice of human effort and human lives to return to the kind of world we had after the last world war. We are fighting to cleanse the world of ancient evils, ancient ills. What's all that about? I remember those words. That makes two of us. We rid ourselves of your kind once and for all, Rocco. You ain't coming back. Who's going to stop me, old man? If I wasn't all crippled up, I... <laughs> you wouldn't be talking this way. Right, Bob? Filth! You filth! <laughs> oh, that's it, Bob. Go on, get him. Go on, sick him. <laughs> Go on, keep swinging, Bob. Come in, hit me, will you? Oh, you're not quitting, are you? <laughs> My boy George never quit, and I ain't quitting. I ain't never quit. Dad! I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> Little wildcat, huh? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Got claws, huh? Want to scratch, huh? Hey, boss. Boss, telephone. Miami wants you on the phone. Okay. You stay here, sister. I'll be back for some more in a few minutes. It's all right, Nora. He won't touch it. Not as long as I'm alive. Ah, you're a real man, Pop. Boss, there's a whole bunch of people out on the porch. Look like Indians. What do they want? They want in the hurricane. Well, keep them out. Where's the blonde? How come she's missed all this? I guess she's still in the room, sleeping it off. Yeah. Hand me the phone. Hello? Yeah, this is Mr. Brown. Oh, hello, Ziggy. How are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's well hearing for you again. Well, how's every little thing? <laughs> he was at the door. What'd you say, Ziggy? Maybe it's the law. Well, show him in. Uh, look, uh, when you when you coming down here? What hurricane? Is that right? Hey, it's the guy from the yacht, boss, the skipper. Well, so what, Ziggy? You're only a couple of hours away. No, no, no. It's got to be tonight. Well, that's more like it. Yeah, see you in a couple of hours. How you doing, skipper? Storm warning. Big blow on way. So what? If this reef not safe, senor, got to make for deep water right away. Well, the boat stays right here. No, too dangerous. Boat bust up on reef. I tell you when to move that boat. I am skipper. I want you to do, you do as I say. Please, senor, I got to move my boat. Angel, give me a rod. See this? Now you try to move that boat and I'll blow your brains out. I will be out of here in a couple of hours. Si, senor. All right, get back to the boat. Angel, that cop's car, drive it off the road. Bring it around back. Sure, sure. Hey, boss, think he's coming, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Just two more hours. Then what, huh? <laughs> then what? Then Johnny Rocco is back in business. <laughs> In a few moments, we'll return with the second act of Key Largo. And now, our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, with news about the stars. Isn't it good to have Betty Hutton back on the screen again, Mr. Keeley, after a two-year absence? I should say so. You know, Betty is just the girl to put over a madcap musical like Paramount's Red, Hot, and Blue. Oh, there's no one quite like Betty. She's her own slam-bang self once again. Victor Mature plays her boyfriend in the picture, and I must say they make a wonderful pair. There's also a new twist, Libby, having the villain of the picture played by Frank Lesser, composer of the four song hits in Red, Hot, and Blue. You know, it's his first screen role, and he enjoyed it as much as he did hearing Betty sing his songs. Looks lovelier than ever, doesn't she? Oh, yes, indeed. Of course, you know she's now the mother of a second adorable daughter. Well, that makes three beauties in the family. All Lux girls, I'll bet. Yes, John. You can be sure those little girls will get the right start on complexion care. Betty has used Lux soap for years to protect her lovely complexion. You know, Libby, Lux toilet soap just has to be good when nine out of ten famous stars depend on it for daily beauty care. There couldn't be a finer soap. 
Women love the softer, smoother look Lux soap facials give their skin. And these facials do make skin lovelier. Tests by skin specialists prove it. In actually three out of four cases, complexions improved in a short time. A Lux soap facial is so quick and easy. Just smooth the creamy, fragrant lather well in. Rinse. Pat with a soft towel to dry. That's all. But it works. Why not take a tip from Hollywood? Try this fine product of Lever Brothers Company, the gentle complexion soap that screen stars recommend. You'll be delighted with the fresh new beauty Lux Toilet Soap gives your skin. Now, here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Key Largo, starring Edward G. Robinson as Johnny Rocco, Claire Trevor as Gay, and Edmund O'Brien as Frank. It's a few minutes later. On the porch of the modest hotel, a cluster of Indians patiently observe the increasing fury of the hurricane. Inside, the lobby and bar are deserted. Johnny Rocco is going up the stairs. Can you talk, Clyde? Are you feeling better? Well, uh, I guess I'm all right now, Mrs. Temple. What happened? Go ahead, copper. Tell him. I drove back here alone. I was sure those two Indians were around here somewhere. I was near your dock when somebody slugged me. Uh, Whose room is this? A very famous man, Johnny Rocco's. Rocco? You heard him, deputy. What did Miami have to say? They're on their way. Well, how you feeling, copper? <laughs> you gave your left eye to nail me, wouldn't you? Local deputy captured Johnny Rocco. Your picture in all the papers, huh? <laughs> well, listen, Hick. That was too much for any big city police to handle. They tried, but they couldn't. That's right, Mr. Sawyer. It took the United States government to get Johnny Rock. Yeah, and I'm back again, ain't I? They threw me out, but now I'm back. And before you know it, I'll be pulling the strings again. I'll be electing mayors and governors before you ever get a ten-buck raise. Yeah. How many of those guys in office owe everything to me? I made them. I made them like a, like a tailor makes a suit of clothes. I take a nobody seat, teach him what to say. I pay for his campaign expenses, dish out a lot of groceries and coal, get my boys to bring the voters out and then count the votes over and over again till they add up right, and he's elected. And what happens? Does he remember when the going gets tough, when the heat's on? Oh, no. All he wanted was to save his own dirty neck. Yeah. Public enemy, he calls me. Me, who gave him his public all wrapped up with a fancy bow on it. Now, what am I getting mad about? Kelly, lay out my clothes. What suit, Johnny? A gray on and a white shirt. Nora, huh? <laughs> Your name is Nora, huh? Some little wildcat. What are you sore about, honey? Keep away from me. Ah, wait till I'm dressed up. You like style, I can tell. Keep away from me. You know, I knew one like you a long time ago. Scratched, kicked, bit. Even stuck a knife in me once. <laughs> Little and kind of skinny she was with a, a real fireball. Her name was Maggie Mahoney. And then, for professional reasons, I had to change her to Gay Dawn. She was sure some knockout in those days. Yeah, just like this one, eh, Curly? Just yeah. like this one, huh? Look at him. The great Johnny Rocco, slapped by a girl. Oh, shut up, old man. You hillbillies. There's nothing to stop me from wiping you all out. Give her a smack. Get it out of your system. That might be right for you, Curly, but not for Johnny Rock. I need your advice, soldier. I ask for it. No, smacking her isn't enough for such an insult. He'd have to kill her, and he'd have to kill the rest of us because we witnessed it. But he needs your help, so he's going to forget it. Yeah, wise guy, huh? Regular wise guy. Unlock the door! Unlock this door! I want out! It's the blonde Johnny sounding off again. I'll let her out. Get out, all of you. I've got to get dressed. I'd take off my hat to you, soldier. It's a good thing you said what you did. I know, Johnny. He just started shooting. Hey, where is everybody? Downstairs? Oh. Hi, everybody. Where's Johnny? In his room. I need a drink. What's everybody doing upstairs? Miss Temple. Hey, what's wrong, honey? You've been crying. Has somebody been mean to you? Oh, him, huh? 
Did you make her cry? I may be partly responsible. Well, you ought to be ashamed. Come on, downstairs. Downstairs. Come on, let's go to the bar, honey. Hmm? Have a little drink. A little chase the blues away. No, thanks. I think... I think I'll have one. The boss said that... I don't care what he said. I need a drink. I don't feel well. How many times do I have to tell you? Johnny says no more drinks. This is a free country. If I want a drink, I can have one. I can buy my own, see? Yeah. Well, it's money, isn't it? Take it. Sorry, baby, the boss The boss, the boss. Tell the boss he can... Hello, darling. (laughs) How come it's hotter at night than in the day? When it's raining than when it ain't. Well, wise guy? I don't know. You don't know? I thought you was a wise guy from way back. You got a million dollars? No. How much? Nothing. But you're a wise guy. Johnny, why don't you talk to me? Well, wise guy? You see, Mr. Rocco, I was educated only in impractical things. With you, it's just the opposite. Johnny, I'm afraid of the storm. I, I hate thunder. Hey, Pop, uh, this is a hurricane, huh? A real thing. It's the beginning. Oh, I'm afraid. Can uh, cars get through during a hurricane? Maybe, maybe not. I think I'll have a, a scotch and soda, please. No, no, no. Oh, no. please, no. darling. Uh, you, McLeod. Yes, sir. You know, I can see right through you. You're saying to yourself, I'm better than Rocco. He's felt, like the old man says here. Right? Right. You say to yourself, Rocco's got a gun, and I have You figure it's a gun. Well, listen, soldier. Thousands of guys got guns, but there's only one Johnny Rocco. How do you account for it? He knows what he wants, Mr. Sure. Fink. What do you want? Tell him, Rocco. Well, I, uh, I want, uh... He wants more. Don't yeah. I? Yeah, that's it. More. I want more. Will you ever get enough? Well, I never have. No, I guess I won't. You. You know what you want? I had hopes once, but I gave them up. Hopes for what? A world in which there's no place for Johnny Rocco. Okay, soldier. Here's your chance. Give me a gun, Curly. Now you take mine, soldier. Go on, take it. That's it. All right, you can make your hopes come true. But you gotta die for it. See what I'm aiming? Right at your belly. Go ahead, shoot. You got a gun now? You gonna use it or not? Kill him, Frank. Kill yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, kill him. Go ahead now. Show him how you're not afraid to die for your hopes. No. One Rocco, more or less, isn't worth dying for. Give it to me. Give me the gun and the same chance. Oh, no, Pop. I'm afraid you'd use it. What's the matter? What's the matter, Nora, honey? You look like you lost somebody near and dear. A live war hero. Well, now I know how you did it. Hey, uh, Curly. Gay. Anybody want a hero? Here's one for sale, cheap. All right, Rocco. Let you and me play that game. He got the gun. Clyde's got the gun. Kill him, Clyde. Kill him. You can stop me from going out that door, Rocco. But I'll shoot you first. And if your friends shoot me, you'll still get it. Now then, stand away from that door. I said to stand away. The gun wasn't loaded. He didn't have a chance. Murderer. Well, I had to do it, old man, or he would have been out that darn gun. Hey, sure gone now, Johnny. You were right, little lady. That gun wasn't loaded, but the brave deputy didn't know it. But you knew the gun was empty, didn't you, Frank? You could tell by by the weight. No. No, I didn't know. Oh, but you were smart, fella. I always say it, it's better to be a live coward than a dead hero. Oh, I, excuse me. I, I guess I was talking too much. You weren't afraid, son. We know that. I was afraid. That's not why I didn't pull the trigger. What do I care about Johnny Rocco? Whether he lives or dies. Rocco wants to come back to America, let him. Let him be president. I fight nobody's battles but my own. No, Frank, no. Yeah, say, that's good. Rocco for president. If I believed your way, I'd want to be dead. It's true you are a coward. Hey, Tuts, get rid of the deputy. You and Curly, uh, get rid of him. And as for you, sister, I want something to eat. Our best is none too good for Johnny Rocco. Yeah, well, now you're talking, sister. Only, uh, you go to the kitchen with her, Angel. I ain't ready to die yet. Uh, not from cockroach poison. <laughs> he's on the phone, boss. Ziggy, why ain't he here? Why ain't he coming? Oh, he's coming, all right. Give me that phone. Hey, what's the idea, Ziggy? Why ain't you starting yet? 
Well, we got a hurricane here, too, so what? Now, now look, look, wait a minute. Now, keep quiet. You... Look, I make the run from Cuba. I risk my neck, and you won't come out in the rain. Now, I give you two hours to get here. You ain't here by ten, the deal's off. Hello? 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 Well? Phone's gone dead. Ah, so what? He heard what I had to say. Gay. Didn't I say no drinking? Oh, please, honey, just one. There are some people at the door, Mr. Rocco. They, they want to come in. It's them Indians, boss. Getting kind of blowy out there, I guess. I'll send them away. Get rid of them. No, you have no right. So he has no right. I'm going upstairs. You're not going anywhere, honey. Well, Mr. McLeod, ain't you got any conversation left? I've said my piece. Yeah, you sure did, wise guy. Well, let's talk about her, the lady on the bar stool. You know, one thing I can't stand is the dame that's a drunk. What I mean is they tear my stomach. No good to themselves or anybody else. Drunk? I haven't even had one drink. She's got the shakes, see? So she has a drink to get rid of them. That one tastes so good, she has another one. You gave me my first drink, Johnny. Oh, so it's all my fault now. Everybody has their first drink, don't they? But everybody ain't a lush. Oh, if I'd have known you were going to act this way, I wouldn't have come here. You know, eight years since I seen her, Pop. You wouldn't know it was the same day. Oh, gee, honey, you're as mean as can be. Mean as can... Now, what does that remind me of? Don't you remember, Johnny? In a song, she used to sing it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, me to... You know, I gave her a first chance. Took her out of the chorus, made her a singer. Mention that while you're at it. Gee, Johnny, I didn't mean anything. Yeah, she could have had a future. That's right, she had everything. Yeah, voice, looks, plenty of class. Yeah, yeah, I was the rage. Gee, honey, I've never... Now, look, uh, look, Gay. Hmm? Why don't you give us your old song? Come on. You mean right now? Yeah, now. I can't. Ah, sure you can. Please, Johnny, don't make me. Now, look, if you were nice, if you sang your song for us, you can have a drink. Well, can I have a drink first? No, no, the song, then the drink. Without any accompaniment? Now, look, do you want the drink or don't you? Okay, okay. Well? <laughs> You should have seen me then, Miss Temple. <laughs> See, my gowns were gorgeous. Only the best. And yet I hardly wore any makeup. Just some lipstick, that's all. And no lights when I came out. Just a, a baby spot. They, they'd play the intro in the dark, and then the spot would come on, and, and there I'd be. <laughs> well, uh, go ahead. Go ahead now. Sing for the people, honey. Keep oh. quiet, everybody. Go ahead, Gay, sing. Uh, uh, Moaning low, my sweet man, I love him so. Though he's mean as can be. He's the kind of man, needs a kind of woman like me. Gonna die, my sweet man should pass me by. If I die. Johnny, Johnny, the drink. Give me the drink, no. Johnny. Johnny. No. Did you promise? Now you were lousy. You, you couldn't even finish that number. Here. Here's your drink. Thanks, fella. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, let him alone. No. Yeah, no. you're right. Let him alone. He ain't worth slapping around. Hey, uh, old man. Uh, the storm. How how bad can it get? How bad? Back in 35, 800 people washed out to sea. Yeah? Well, how far away was that from here? Oh, a few miles. Oh. Yeah, well... Uh, I want a drink. Fix everybody a drink, Angel. Oh, everybody except her. Frank, I'm sorry about the things I said before. Forget it, Nora. You gave her a drink. He was ready to kill you for that, but that made no difference. You had to help her. Your head said one way, but your whole life said another. The other thing, maybe they're true. Maybe it is a rotten world. But a cause isn't lost as long as someone is willing to go on fighting. Only I'm not that someone. You may not want to be, but you can't help yourself. What do you know about me? A lot. From the way you look and talk. From the things George wrote me. Come on, come on, break it up over there, will you? I don't like people whispering. Why is everybody so quiet? Well, go on, talk, why don't you? 
You, Curly, say something. Uh, 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 what do you want me to say, Johnny? Well, anything, anything, just so it's talk. Go on, go uh, ahead, well, go ahead. Well, uh, I'll bet you two, three years we get prohibition back. Yeah, go on, well, go on. Th- th- this time we make it stick. Yeah, yeah. I bet you two, three years prohibition comes back. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I bet you. The trouble was, before, I mean, too many guys wanting to be on top. Yeah. One mob gets to massacre and the other. The papers play it up big, big, yeah. see? So what happens? So? Look, uh, look, Bob, I don't believe it. 800 guys getting washed out of sea. You're a liar, old man. 200 miles an hour, that wind blew. A tidal wave 12 feet high went right Right across the keys. Ah, For months liar. afterwards, bodies were found in the mangrove swamp. You don't like it, do you, Rocco? The storm. Show it your gun, why don't you? If it doesn't stop, shoot it. So the public votes out prohibition, and that's the end of the mobs. Next time it'll be different, though. Yeah. We learned our lesson, all right. Next time the mobs will all get together. I'm asking God Almighty to make a big wave now. Now. Send it crashing down on us. Destroy us all if need be, but punish him. Shut up, Papa. I'm warning you. Shut up! Hear me! Hear me! I'll kill you! Mr. Temple, don't. He will shoot. You don't have to stand in front of me. Let him shoot me. Make a big wave, Lord. Send it against us. Take us all, but destroy him. I guess we both forgot, Mr. Rocco. Your gun, it's empty. No, it ain't empty now. I'm loading it. See, wise guy? Johnny, we'll all be killed in this place. The storm is getting worse. It's blowing down. The whole place is blowing down. Outside, Johnny, and take off. Destroy him, Lord. Destroy him. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll present the third act of Key Largo. I believe our guest tonight, Miss Debbie Reynolds, has established a record. You must be the youngest starlet on the Warner Brothers lot, Debbie. Well, I'm 17, Mr. Keeley, and I was lucky enough to be signed even before I graduated from high school. Mm, Wonderful. Had time to catch your breath yet? Not quite, Mr. Keeley. There's so much to learn. I never miss a studio showing of a new picture. One that especially impressed me was The Hasty Heart. Ah, yes, a most unusual story starring Ronald Reagan and Patricia Neal. That's right, Mr. Keeley. And in addition, there's Richard Todd, the new British actor. I'm perfectly sure he's going to make a hit over here. And moviegoers will applaud Patricia Neal as an army nurse. You know, she plays her role with great charm and conviction. Isn't she lovely? Ronald Reagan is the American soldier who falls in love with her. Well, now, Debbie, who could blame him? She's mighty easy on the eyes. Oh, yes, a gorgeous blonde. And in her nurse's uniform, she's simply dreamy. What a complexion. She's a Lux girl, Mr. Kennedy. Never neglects her daily Lux soap facials. Like most screen stars, she knows it's a care she can depend on. A gentle, protecting care that's right for delicate skin. Well, it certainly works for me. It's a real beauty soap. And I'd like to recommend Lux Soap Care to any girl who wants a nicer complexion. Thank you, Miss Debbie Reynolds, for that very sound beauty hint. Nine out of ten screen stars, you know, use Lux Toilet Soap for daily complexion care. Try it for your precious complexion soon. You'll discover that this fine white soap with the delicate fragrance really makes skin lovelier. Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of Key Largo. Starring Edward G. Robinson as Johnny Rocco, Claire Trevor as Gay, and Edmund O'Brien as Frank. On Key Largo, the little hotel still stands. It's weathered another hurricane, and now the storm is passing out to sea. It's nearly ten o'clock. In the lobby, Johnny Rocco stands before a window peering out into the night. I don't mind telling you, Pop, that storm had me a little scared there for a while. I'm sorry it's gone. I'm sorry you're still alive. Well, keep praying, Pop. Maybe something will happen. You think mm-hmm. Ziggy's going to show up? I sure is show up. Oh, we'll get out of here then, won't we, honey? I'm all packed. I'm ready to leave any Well, let's get upstairs, Curly. We'll get the stuff ready for when Ziggy gets here. Oh, Angel, stay there, will you? Watch him. Yes, yeah, sure. You'll be leaving too, Frank? Yes, I guess so. Will we ever see you again? Well, I hope so. Why don't you stay right on here with us? You're most welcome. Go on, tell them, Nora. You tell them. 
Have you any folks? No. I'd be proud to have you regard us as your family. Maybe that isn't what Frank wants, Dad. Maybe... Hey, boss! Boss! Hey, where is he? Upstairs. What's the matter? Hey, the boat's gone. Not a sign of it. Gone, huh? How you done it? Hmm. And Skipper. I told him I'd kill him, but he took the boat anyway, just the same. <laughs> hey, what's the joke? <laughs> no boat. It, it strikes me funny. Well, there is a boat. All ready for us now to the dock. Pop, we're going to borrow your boat. Who's going to run it for you? Answer me that. That's right, Johnny. We don't know nothing about boats. He's going to run it. The soldier. The wise guy. He knows about boats, don't you? Yeah, some. His first sweetheart was a boat. I heard him tell her. Well, you're taking us to Cuba. Why should I? Because you know it'll happen to you if you don't. Besides, one Rocco, more or less, ain't worth dying for. Ain't that what you said? Hey, boss. It's the law, boss. Sheriff. Okay. One wrong word out of anybody, and he gets it, and he gets it now. Mr. Temple. You understand me, old man? All right, sister, let him in. Just a minute, Mr. Wade. Good evening, miss. I'm looking for Clyde Sawyer. He... He's not here. You been here? No. Not tonight. That's funny. Put in a call for me from here about 7 o'clock. Good evening, Temple, folks. Pretty good blow, huh? Yeah, a regular hurricane. How's the road? Passable. I'm trying to find my deputy... By the way, uh, on the telephone, who answered? Uh, nobody was around, so I answered. I guess Mr. Sawyer must have got stalled along the road. Oh. Seen anything of the Indians, Mr. Temple, those Osceola brothers? No. Chip! Hmm. Get up, you dog! I'm talking. I guess the storm upset him some. Well, I don't mind saying it. it had us all a little upset. That's funny. Chip! He's found something out there. I know that bark. Uh, you, uh, you got a flashlight? Let's see what it is. Yeah, yeah, he's found something all right. Let's go. Well, that's some dog he's got, Mr. Temple. He, he found something all right. A dead man. It was him, Temple Clyde. He'd been murdered. Well, uh, I don't like to say anything, Sheriff. Uh, after all, it's not my business, but, uh, those, uh, those Indians you were talking about. They were here before. The Osceolas? Yeah, they were out there all during the storm. Left only a few minutes ago. I'll get them. I'll get them Indian if it's the last thing I do. No, Ben, no. You lied to me, Temple. Your Indians murdered Clyde Sawyer. Watch yourselves all. You're one peep and I shoot. <laughs> Said you hadn't seen the Osceolas. You lied, didn't you? No, ben. They murdered Clyde. The Indians thought they could hide his body, but the storm tore it loose and threw it up right out there, right in front of your door. And that's where the crime belongs, right at your door. Ben, they're, they're, they're shooting just now. Well, they tried to get away. I killed them both. Killed them. You. What's your name? Killed them? Me? Uh, Howard Brown. Address? Uh, Hotel Central, Milwaukee. Haven't I seen you someplace before? No, no I don't think so. Oh, these other men, uh, they're friends of mine. We're all here from uh, Milwaukee, Sheriff. Deep sea fishing. See that you all stay here. I'll be back in the morning. Yeah, you did a great job, didn't you, hiding that body? Boss, how did I know the storm would... Now, shut up. Ziggy. Yeah, if Ziggy don't come now, where... Ziggy's here, boss. Him and his boys, they're here. What are you talking about? They drove up in the back while the sheriff was out hunting Indians. <laughs> That's Ziggy. <laughs> all right, Pop. Uh, you and the soldier boy and the dame inside. Get in your office. Come on, you too, Gay. No, but... I honey... said inside. Angel, you stay with him. I don't want no more trouble. All right, bring him in, Curly. Ziggy and his mom. Bring him in. <laughs> well, look at him. <laughs> Ziggy. Well, 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 well. <laughs> you sure are a sight for sore eyes. Sure great to see you again, Johnny Pal. Hey, put on a little weight, huh? Uh, now, look who's talking. <laughs> Say, uh, guess who's here? Huh? The blonde. Remember? Gay, gay dawn. Gay? Here? Oh, you think I'm kidding? Gay! Come on, come on, get in here. <laughs> hey, yeah. I'm pretty as ever. Yeah. Where you been, honey, all the time Johnny was away? Yeah. All around. If I'd have known that, I'd have tried to be Johnny's yeah, toy. The same old Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, baby, all right. Come on, step aside. Why don't you go over there, fix yourself a drink? A drink? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Well, Ziggy, the uh, stuff's all here in the suitcase. Open up. Let's see it. Hey, Lou, Lou, come here. 
Who is he? Lou, just about the best expert there is on counterfeit dough. Yeah. Take a look, Lou. Yeah, the paper feels good. Lathe works okay. Portrait's good. No breaks in the lines. Serial numbers check out? What do you think? I'm an amateur? Back cover's okay, Ziggy. Looks like high-class merchandise. Okay, huh? So far, yeah. Now bring out the engraving. Now, wait a minute. Now, just don't stall, Ziggy, will you? I'm in kind of in a hurry. You don't have much time, Mr. McCloud. They'll be leaving soon. What are you going to do? Not much choice, is there? I'll run the boat for them. Oh, no. No, don't. Don't go with us. They'd, they'd wait till you got inside of Cuba, and then they'd kill you. She's right, Frank. Tell them you'll go. Then when you get outside in the dark, make a break. Run. Try to get away. Yeah, it's your only chance, fella. Out there in the dark, make a break. Run. Yeah, that's what my head says. He ain't gonna make a fight of it. I don't know. Not that one Rocco more or less makes any difference. What I said still goes. But it's just They'll that I... kill you. If a man's a fighter, he can't walk away from a fight. That's the answer, I guess. I know how he feels. Oh, listen, they're leaving. They made their deal. Yeah. Well, we, we just wait now and see what happens. Hey, you, McLeod. Come in here. All of you, come in here. Your friends leave? Yeah. Are you coming with a soldier? Yes or no? I'm in a hurry. You win, Mr. Rocco. Yeah, I thought you'd change your mind. Well, Nora, want to come along, sister? Hmm? Want to come along? Where are my things, Johnny? I better get my things. Oh, I uh, forgot to tell you, you're not coming. Johnny! Let go of me. Will you get off me? Please take me with you. You got to, Johnny, you got to. Oh, please, I'll stop drinking. Get out of my way. I'll kill myself, I will. Johnny, please, please listen. I'll be good like I was before. I won't let you go without me. You got to take me with you, you've got to. Johnny, we're wasting time. Uh, Get away from me. Now, stay close to the soldier, will you? If he tries anything, let him have it good. Now, so long, old man. Next time you have a hurricane, think of Johnny Rocco. Frank. Goodbye, Frank. Good luck, son. Thanks. Johnny! And they're on the dock. I can see him. He's starting the motor. Oh, he'll make his break now. He'll run away. He's got a gun now. He'll be able gun? to... Gun? What gun? Yeah, Rocco's. I took Rocco's gun and gave it to him. You? Yeah, why doesn't he run? Run, fella. Run! Why doesn't he run? He's in the boat they're casting off. He had his chance to run. His only chance. And he didn't take it. No answer. The phone's still dead. I'll take the car, Dad. I'll drive to Palm Grove, the Coast Guard station. Yeah. Coast Guard. I'll hurry. I'll be back as soon as I can. How we doing, McLeod? We're on our course or close to it. Just see that you keep us that way. Hey, Toots, how you feeling? Uh, I told you I could never stand a boat. I I feel awful, all this bouncing up and down. There's a bed down there. Yeah, it's too hot down there. Hey, what time is it? A little after four. Not halfway there yet. Watch McLeod. If he tries anything, shoot. Yeah, yeah, sure. Everything all right up there, Curly? Yeah. What's the matter with Angel? No, I'm sleeping. He'll take over for Tuts after a while. <laughs> you know, they've been talking about us on the radio just now. <laughs> they got boats out looking for us. <laughs> Coast guard. We got too much of a start for them. Yeah, fog like this, they couldn't find a Queen Mary. <laughs> got some cards? Let's kill a little time. Hey, you, Tuts. What do you want? You try anything Take a look over the stern. See if we picked up any kelp. Any what? Seaweed. You can foul up the shaft. You better look. Okay. No. No, I don't see any. Help! Help! What's the matter? What's going on up there? Your friend, he fell overboard. You did it. When you revved the motors just now. Yeah, when you swung the wheel, you made him fall over. Johnny! I got a gun. Stay where you are, Curly. Johnny! Watch it. He's got a gun. Curly. Curly, what's the matter? Curly. He don't answer. Nobody answers Toots and Curly. Curly! The steps, Johnny. Blood coming down steps. Well, it's him, McLeod, the soldier. Curly killed him. Go on, uh, go up there. Get up there and see. Well, don't you hear me? 
I'll get killed. You're going to go up there, are you? There's nothing to be afraid of. Curly shot him. He's dead. Then you go, Johnny. You go up. Nobody tells me what to do. Nobody. Johnny. Johnny. Hey, soldier. Soldier, listen to me. I know you're up there. Say something. Curly's dead, huh? Well, I saw his angel. Just me now. Me down here and you up there. From now on, we'll be partners. Everything will be 50-50. I got a hundred grand down here. A hundred grand. Well, what do you say? Can you hear me? What do you say? Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You'll get rid of me and have all the money for yourself. Is that it? Is it? Well, suppose I say the money is yours. Yeah, I'll, I'll toss up the suitcase. I'll throw it up there on deck. There! Now, do you believe me? It's yours. And plenty more when we get to Cuba. Do you hear me? I'll make you rich. Soldier. Soldier. You're not big enough to do this to Rocco. I'll kill you. You'll never bring me here. Never. Now, look. Uh, look, soldier, look. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you figure that I got Angel's gun, that you can't trust me, right? Okay. I'll throw the gun up there, too. There. There's a gun. The money in my gun. Now, what else have I got? I'm leveling with you, soldier. Okay, you believe me now? Look, I'm... I'm... I'm coming up. I got no gun, and... I'm coming up. Where are you? Dark up here. Get back to the stern, Rocco. Nobody gives me orders. Some wild guy, huh? That was a deputy's gun I threw away. You don't think I... Go ahead, Santana. We lost you. Come in, please. We lost your signal. Come in, please. Over. Sorry. I was calling Coast Guard. This is the Coast Guard. Please identify yourself. Over. My name is Frank McLeod. I'm about 12 miles off Boot Key Harbor on my way in. Over. Are you all right? Are you all right? Over. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. But I'll need medical attention. Over. Continue on course. Stand by on this frequency. I'm standing by. Uh, will you put me through to the Largo Hotel? Stand by, Santana. We'll try to put you through. No sign of them, Ben. No sign of them at all. I checked the Coast Guard ten minutes ago. Nothing yet, Mr. Temple. I, uh, I'll have to take you in, Miss Dawn. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, sure. Take me in. They all get away, huh, Ben? Saw you... Dead, those poor Indians dead. McLeod as good as dead. But Rocco and his gang get away. You get one woman who didn't have anything to do with it. They didn't all get away, Dad. The state police picked up that man they call Ziggy. Yeah. They want all of you to identify him. Mr. Temple, I'm mighty grateful to you for saving my life and all, but those two boys, the Osceolas, well, I... I'd rather been killed than have innocent blood on my hands. I'm the one to blame. If they hadn't trusted me, they, they wouldn't have turned up here. They'd still be alive. Oh, no, Mr. Temple, it wasn't you. It wasn't the law or, or anybody. It was only Johnny Rocco. Nobody in the whole world is safe as long as he's alive. We better go, miss. I'll take it, Dad. Hotel Largo. Yes, it's the Coast Guard. Yes, yes, I'll hold on. Frank. Oh, thank God. Yes, yes, Frank. Yes, we'll be waiting. Nora. He's all right, Dad. He's coming back to us. The curtain falls on Key Largo, and the spotlight turns to our stars as you meet them in person. Edward G. Robinson, Claire Trevor, and Edmund O'Brien. 
Claire, it's easy to understand how your performance in Key Largo won you an Academy Award. Well, thank you, Bill. And speaking of awards, Eddie Robinson won a very important one in Europe recently. The famous World Award for Acting, presented to him in Cannes, France. Our congratulations, Eddie. And it's certainly good to have you back after so many well, months abroad. Good to be back, Bill, and learn all the news, such as Edmund O'Brien being the father of the prettiest daughter born in Hollywood this year. Well, what's her name, Edmund? Bridget Eileen. What else could an O'Brien be named? <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, I hope you know there are certain things a daughter should be taught very early, things like the uh, right complexion care. Lux soap has been mine for a long time. Mm. What are they saying about that in Paris these days, Eddie? Well, the uh, same idea, only slightly different words. Le savon luxe et le soin préféré pour mon teint. You know, Lux soap is my favorite complexion care. Well, that's the perfect way to <laughs> express it, Eddie. <laughs> By the way, what was the high spot of your summer in Europe? Well, I think it was the day I spent in the House of Commons in London to listen to a debate between Mr. Churchill and Mr. Bavan. Uh, now, uh, won't you tell us about next week's play, Bill? Next week's play was a smash hit on both stage and screen. It's the paramount success, Dear Ruth. And we'll have the original stars of the picture, Joan Caulfield and William Holden. This is a comedy made to order for family entertainment, so I know you'll all want to join us next Monday night. Oh, it's a delightful play, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and come back soon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Winter is the most dangerous time of the year on the highway for those of you who have snow, ice, and fog to contend with. For everyone, there are fewer hours of daylight driving, so extra care on the highway may save your life or another's. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Joan Caulfield and William Holden in Dear Ruth. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Edward G. Robinson will soon be seen in the London Films production My Daughter Joy. Claire Trevor will soon be seen in the Universal International release Borderline, starring with Fred McMurray. Edmund O'Brien will next be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Backfire. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Join us again next Monday night to hear Dear Ruth, starring Joan Caulfield and William Holden. Spry is a new spry, a better than ever spry. You'll be a better cook when you use spry. Spry in your baking pan, spry in your frying pan. You'll be a better cook when you use spry. Talk about glorious cakes. They're better than ever made with new spry. Lighter, finer, richer, supremely delicious. Why? Because new spry contains a superior new cake improver you'll find in no other type of shortening. For better cakes than ever and for all you bake and fry... Try new, better-than-ever Spry, another fine product of Lever Brothers Company. You'll be a better cook when you use Spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Dear Ruth, starring Joan Caulfield and William Holden. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Roddy McDowell, Preston Foster, and Rita Johnson in Thunderhead, Son of Flicker. Ladies and gentlemen, 
your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In this turbulent, fast-changing era, the ways of man are often hard to understand, and equally so the way of a man with a maid. But unchangeable is the way of a boy with his horse. Mutual sympathy and understanding. That loyal friendship is the basis of tonight's Lux Radio Theater play, Thunderhead, Son of Flicker, from the studios of 20th Century Fox, with the same stars who made that screen hit so endearing to American theater goers, Rita Johnson, Roddy McDowell, and Preston Foster. Three years ago, we introduced Flicker and her master to you in the play to which this drama is a sequel. Your many letters received since then, asking to hear Thunderhead, are answered now with a story that holds all the action and excitement, all the warmth and color of its predecessor. Our background is the mighty forests and prairies of the Northwest, which brings back to me many treasured memories of months spent in that unforgettably beautiful region filming God's Country and the Woman. Among those memories are the many remote logging camps where our location scenes led us. Simple, picturesque communities where life is rough, but the standard of cleanliness is high. And it was a common occurrence to see those stalwart woodsmen laundering their own clothes in long wooden troughs. I might add a common sight to see that friendly package of Lux Flakes beside them. A reminder to the fair sex in our audience that Lux Flakes are just as important in a man's world as a woman. We raise our curtain now on Act One of Thunderhead, Son the Flicker, starring Roddy McDowell as Ken, Preston Foster as Rob, and Rita Johnson as Nell. It's a late spring afternoon, and above the lofty meadows of the Wyoming Rockies, ominous thunderheads reverberate between towering mountain peaks, still capped with snow. Below, in the far distance, is the Goose Bar Ranch, from whose sheltered confines a boy named Ken has gone in search of his horse. Dwarfed by the landscape and buffeted by the approaching storm, the boy struggles over rocky ledges in answer to a familiar sound. Oh, there you are. Hiding in a gully, huh? Horses are supposed to have horse sense. Don't you know there's a storm coming up? You should be home in the barn. And if you... I think what's the matter? Come on, girl. Come on. Why, why in the... Why, Flicker, you've had your cold. You've got a baby horse. Oh, come... But it's white. Your coat's white. It can't be white. Oh, I'm sorry, Flicker. It's a beautiful coat. Honest, it is. Hello, baby. How do you feel, huh? Scared? Well, I- I'm not going to hurt you. Just got to get you out of here, though. Both of you, before the storm breaks. Come on, Flicker. Don't worry. He'll follow you. He's getting up. But please hurry, Flicker. Hurry or we'll never get home. Dad! Dad! Father and mother ain't home from down yet, Cam. Gosh, it's, it's happened. She's had a cold. Who has a cold? Flicker. Yeah? Who? Sure, it's, I, I mean, no, it isn't. She's down in the gully, Gus, and, and the coat's got stuck in the wash. I can't get him out. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on. Gus, if we don't get there before the storm breaks... Nothing to worry about. They've been born in cold thunder rains a long time now. Listen. Yeah? Gus, that gully will be a river. Gus, hurry. The coat will drown. He's stuck there. He'll drown. <laughs> Oh, 
How is he, Scott? How's my cold? Morning, Jamie. Oh, he's over there. Morning. How are you, baby? How do you feel? The fella had a pretty hard night. Oh, he's beautiful, isn't he, Gus? Looks like a horse. I'm going to train him, Gus. I'm going to run him myself. He's a racehorse. Oh? You think the little fella can run, eh? Sure he can run. He's going to be the greatest racehorse in the world. That's nice. You've got it all figured out. Well, I hope you're right. We can use the little good luck around here, I bet you. Can. Oh, that sounds like my Hildy. Can. What is it, Hildy? You want to say come in for breakfast right this minute. Thanks, Hildy. Oh, you're welcome. Gosh, sir. You, you didn't tell Dad about the cold. Why, no, Kenny. You said not to tell him that. Well, why don't you want anybody to know? Well, because... Well, he's a very special cold, and I want to surprise Dad. Oh, well, I won't tell him, Ken. Oh, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, say, there's your pop now, Ken. Are you going to surprise him now? No, and, and gee whiz, Hildy, can't you ever mind your own business? Oh, I guess so. But it isn't much fun. Hello, Dad. Morning, young fella. Going into breakfast? Yes, sir. Oh, Dad, um, what would you do if you had all the money you wanted? <laughs> all the money I wanted? Well, I guess I'd buy your mother a fur coat and a diamond ring and take a cruise to South America and see what kind of horses they really raise down there. Then what would you do? You mean there's some left? Oh, Sure. Well, if you really want to know, I'd buy some more brood mares. Make this just about the best ranch in the West. Say, what's this all about? Well, I have an idea that's going to make us a lot of money, Dad. You have, huh? Well, that's fine. Well, now, it may take a couple of years, but... Oh. Well, that's Charlie Sargent. Charlie, how are you? Morning, Rob. What's your visitor? Who is it, Dad? Looks like Major Harris. Hello, Kenny. Morning, Mr. Sargent. Major Harris. Glad to see you again. Thanks. I'm on another buying tour, McLaughlin. Hello, young man. Hello. Well, uh, let's get on in the house. How's the road? Uh, storm too much damage? Only got stuck once. Well, good morning, Charlie. Hello, Nell. Major Harris, what are you doing Hello. out here in the wilderness? Oh, just wondering if your husband has any more horses to sell. Afraid not, Major. You got the cream of the crop last time. We were just going to have breakfast. Won't you join us? Wouldn't think of it. Not much, he wouldn't. He can smell home cooking 20 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> You're not kidding. Well, come on. It's all ready. Watch up, Ken. Oh, we'll need an extra chair. I'll be right with you, Nothing more to sell us, McLaughlin. Those horses you sold us last year were the talk of the fort. They should have been. Who ever heard of selling hunters and polo ponies for 200 bucks a head? Well, that's standard army prices. Well, I wouldn't have taken a loss like that. You're just sore because those would-be races of yours aren't good enough for the army. Not good enough? What about Appalachian? Oh, Charlie, not Appalachian again. And why not? Sixty generations of race horses behind him and every one of his colts is a winner. Can I help it if my stallion's the best in the country? Better than the albino? The albino? Who'd he belong to? Nobody. Oh, oh, excuse me. Oh, that's all right, son. No, Bajor, nobody owned the albino. He drifted over here from Montana and nearly drove the ranchers crazy. He was wild. Never could run him down. Every summer for six years, he came out of the hills and raided our herds. He'd drive off as many mares as he could, and only the best. Any stallion to try to stop him was in for a battle. He killed several of the finest horses in this country. Yes, sir, a robber baron if there ever was one. Cost us ranchers thousands of dollars. And what became of him? Nobody knows. Just disappeared four years ago. Sounds more like a legend than a real horse. Oh, he was real enough. Oh, yes, Major. My mare Flicker is his daughter. May, may I come in, Miss McLaughlin? Of course, Hildy. Here are the eggs you wanted, Miss McLaughlin. Thank you, dear. Oh, you're welcome. Here, I'll take them. Can't, do they know about the surprise yet? Hildy, I told you. But I didn't say a word about the cold. Cold? What cold? Well, Dad, uh... Well, Flick has had a fall. Oh, Ken, that's wonderful. It's down in the barn. Well, uh, let's go see it. Come along, Major. I'll show you a cold even Charlie here to be proud of. Well, Dad, here he is. Flick is cold, this? Yes, Dad. Ah, that's ridiculous. He's white. <laughs> What's the matter, Rob? I thought you said your stallion Banner sired this colt. Banner's always sired two before. A white colt. But there's nothing wrong with a white colt, Dad. He's just as good as any other. Of course he is. Watch it, Ken. He's breaking. <laughs> Scott, Scott, get him. He's running away. <laughs> Come back, you. Come back. Don't worry. I got you. Look at him, Ken. He's a goblin. He looks just like a goblin. You keep out of this. Mr. McLaughlin. Ken, let Hildy alone. Well, he's not a goblin. He's a thoroughbred racehorse. Racehorse? By Banner, out of flicker. No, son. It takes a racer to sire a racer. He was sired by a racer, Mr. Sergeant. Huh? You mean that Banner's not his father? No, sir, he isn't. Well, then who is? Uh, uh, Appalachian. Appalachian? What? That jug-headed colt by my Appalachian? Honest, Mr. Sergeant. Now whose horse doesn't sire true? Ken, what's this all about? Well, Mom, you know I've always wanted a race, and... Well, Mr. Sergeant said what a wonderful horse Appalachian was, so... 
Well, I took Flicker over to his ranch and I... You what? Yes, sir. Uh, don't you know what it costs to have a colt fired by a famous stallion? Well, Dad, I, I was figuring to pay Mr. Sargent out of my winnings. He says Appalachian's colts always win and I... I guess he's got <laughs> you there, Charlie. Ah, oh, me and my big mouth. Okay, son. You don't owe me a cent. What's more, I'll give you a certificate. Oh, gosh, thanks, Mr. Sergeant. But how come that colt's pure white when my stallion's coal black? Maybe he takes off his grandfather. The albino? Yeah, that's it. He's a throwback to the albino. You know what that means, Kent? Huh? It means that if he inherits any of the traits of that wild devil, you'll never make anything out of him. It just can't be done. Yes, Dad, I... I understand. Ken, there they are. Our whole herd. Yes, sir. You know, boy, if I were a horse, something inside me said this was a season to head for those mountains up there. Well, I couldn't ask for a finer day. And if I was a horse, Dad, I, I guess I wouldn't want anybody to leave me but Banner there. Look at him, Dad, rounding him up just as if he was a cowboy. Sure, Banner knows he's got a job to do, and he's all for doing it. That's it, Banner. Get them together, boy. Take good care of the herd now. Understand? Dad, look, there they go. Goodbye, Banner. Goodbye. But it seems strange around here, those empty corrals. I've still got Flicker and Goblin. And I still think they're places with the herd. But, Dad, you said I could keep them. They're your horses. You do what you want. Yes. Hello, Flicker. What's the matter, girl? I know you hear Ban on the herd running off to the mountains, don't you? You want to go, too. All right, girl, you can go. See them out there, Flicker? Running and dancing and... Go on, Flicker, go catch Banner. Hey, what's the matter with you, Goblin? Aren't you going with your mama? Go on, beat it. Now, look, Goblin, you may be a horse, but you sure act like a mule sometimes. Now, get out of here, go on. That's it, Goblin, go with your mama. So long, Flicker, goodbye, Goblin. See you next spring. Yeah, we'll see them all next spring. Oh, Dad... That was nice of you, Ken. Letting Flick and the cold go. Well, I I guess I don't in that exactly need him. And that goblin's tough. He'll get along. But he isn't like other colts. I'll say he isn't. All the colts I've ever seen act like they're tied to their mothers. But that young fella, he'll want to investigate everything for himself. Won't make any difference whether it's a coyote or a rattler. When the storms come down from the hills and the herd takes shelter, that little fool horse will want to stick his nose right into the wind and fight back. But old Banner won't stand for any nonsense. Goblin may be the grandson of the great albino, but the banner is just another nuisance of a colt. Well, son, I wonder what he'll look like in the spring. Oh, he'll be beautiful, Dad. Bet you wait and see. I I only wish that... What? But I only wish spring wasn't so far off. Don't bother me now, Hildy. I'm counting goblins. Oh. Hey, look. Fine, boss. Fine. Yeah, get on those gates, Gus. Hey, Ken. Coming. Well, son, what do you think of your horse now? Oh, he's great, Dad. Say, how far is it to the top of that knoll? Oh, a couple of hundred yards. Oh, that's wonderful. Why, why he made it in almost nothing flat. Look, 15 seconds. What a race horse. Seconds, Mom. Fifteen That's seconds. Fine, here. Now eat your lunch. And Mom, Dad put Goblin in the corral all by himself. That means I can. Excuse, uh, boss. Yeah, Gus. Boss, we're missing three mares: Taggart, Sky High, and Brownie. They ain't with the herd. Oh, Rob, our prize mare. Maybe the wolves got them. I'll bet it was Cougars. Oh, you here too? If it was, we would have found signs. Then what could have happened to them? Oh, they probably just strayed. We'll find them tomorrow. No, boss. 
Him and me looked everywhere. You sure? Yeah, boss. Well, I guess that settles it. Yep, that settles it. Thanks, Gus. Come on, Hedley. Oh, Rob, the hurt's so small now, we can't afford to lose those mills. Well, we just have to buy some others. They're so expensive. Send schooling and Gus and Tim to pay and the taxes. Well, uh, we'll have to figure it out some way. I don't start to worry, honey. We'll find a way. I haven't got time to explain. You're going to try to put a rope around Goblin, aren't you? Look, if you've got to sit on the corral fence, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. But don't bother me. Oh, I won't, Kenny. I'll just look. Okay, Goblin, you can quit your fooling now. The way things are going on around here, it's about time you and I got down to some business. That's the boy. Smell the rope. See? It, it won't hurt you. Now, I'll just put it around you. Hey! Hey, come back here, Goblin, gone, you. All right, run. I can run, too. Not as fast as he can. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Go on, run. I'll show you. You won't like that, but I'll have to do it. I'll bet you miss. See, I knew you'd miss. Get out of here, Hilda. You want to get yourself killed? I bet you Do as I tell you. See, you miss him again. Well, I won't miss him this time. There. What I... Kenny, look out. Hold, Goblin. Hold. Kenny, he's Get down. It's hooked, Kenny. Stop on your hold. Kenny, get up. I'm trying to get up. Hey. Just a little more time, Dad. Just take it easy, Goblin. I'll be around to see you tomorrow, boy. We got work to do, son. Lots of work. Morning, Kenny. Can't I ever do something without you having you tagging along? That's a holder you've got, huh? Going to put a holder on Goblin, huh? That's exactly what I'm going to do. Hello, Goblin. Here, boy, look. It's, it's sugar. Good, isn't it? Yes, sir. You and I are just going to get along fine. Uh-huh. And if you'll listen to reason why, well, you'll be a racehorse before you even know it. Now, this is only a halter, Goblin. It, it won't hurt you. It, it's only a halter. <laughs> Oh, now, now, don't tell me we have to go through all this foolishness again. Now, you know who's boss around here, so behave yourself. Hold, doggone you. Hold, cut it out. Want me to take this horse shank to you? Now, Goblin, I'm trying He's to be taken... Hold, hey, stop it, you crazy bro. Come back here. Come back. Well, you're right about one thing, Kenny. He sure can run. Okay. Okay. Let him be like his grandfather. See if I care. Of all the mean-tempered, stubborn idiots I've ever... Losing your temper is no way to train a horse, son. I'm not going to train him, Dad. You started this thing, and you're going to see it through. I can't teach Goblin anything, Dad. What's more, I... I think he hates me. If he hated you, he'd never let you step inside that corral. No horse is going to be broken without putting up a scrap. I know, Dad, but... Well, one minute, Goblin's as gentle as a kitten, and... And then just when I think I'm getting somewhere, he turns out law. That's because Goblin has a problem, too. He can't make up his mind whether he wants to be like Flicker or like the albino. Fighting himself, like most of us do. What he needs is a little patience and understanding. Now go and find that horse and bring him back. Yes, sir. The herd's on the upper pasture. Tend to one, that's where they'll be. I'll find him, Dad. Flicker and I. We'll bring him back. Oh, 
been back an hour ago. Oh, stop worrying now. Chances are Goblin took off into the hills. Well, I don't think we should let Ken go on with this. Goblin's too wild. Ken will handle him. He broke Flicker, didn't he? Goblin isn't like Flicker. This is no time to discourage him, just when the boy's beginning to take an interest in the ranch. Besides, we want to send him off to military school, don't we? I don't know what that's got to do with it. Breaking Goblin's very apt to make a man out of him. He'll need to be a man when he... Now, wait a minute. That you, Ken? Dad, Dad. In here. Dad, the albino's come back. What? He's waiting to hurt. The albino. Well, it couldn't be. The albino hasn't been around here in years. But it's true, Dad. I saw him. He was running like the wind, fighting Banner and singling out the mares. Oh, and... that's what happened to our mares. Banner's all cut up, Dad. I, I didn't know what to do. I... Get Gus and Tim. Tell them to saddle up and bring their rifles. You mean... You mean we're going after the albino tonight? That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> Our stars, Preston Foster, Roddy McDowell, and Rita Johnson, will return in a moment with Act Two of Thunderhead, Son of Flicker. Tell me, Libby, is it true that most movie stars have pet superstitions? Oh, yes, indeed. Very special ones, and often. Now, there's Maureen O'Hara, 20th Century Fox's auburn-haired beauty. She insists she lost an important role because she looked at a new moon out of a window. Judging by the great part she has as a Broadway actress in Sentimental Journey, it didn't hurt her screen career... She has another amusing superstition. She wears a pet slip when she starts a new picture. She bought it for a gift several years ago, but liked it so much she kept it herself. Several years ago? And she's still wearing it? Oh, yes, and it's lovely. I saw it when she was being fitted for those stunning, curvaceous clothes she wears in Sentimental Journey. She takes good care of that slip, says it brings her luck. And it always gets Lux care, Mr. Kennedy. Any slip is lucky that gets Lux care. Remember those famous lingerie tests we've talked about, Libby? Slips and nightgowns washed with strong soap, hot water, and handled roughly soon looked faded and drab. But identical under things, washed the luxe way, stayed lovely three times as long. And that's important these days, Mr. Kennedy. You know, it's hard to find pretty undies in the stores. So we girls are being thrifty. We're just insisting on luxe care. And if you don't find luxe in the store, ask for it again. It's certainly worth waiting for. Another way I found to be thrifty, Mr. Kennedy, is this. After I luxe my undies, I use the same suds for stockings. Lux makes such rich suds, a little goes a long way. A good suggestion. These days, nobody should ever waste soap. Back now to Mr. William Keeley. We continue with Thunderhead, Son of Flicker, starring Rita Johnson as Nell, Preston Foster as Rob, and Roddy McDowell as Ken. Our curtain rises on Act Two. All night long, under a bright moon, an unsuccessful search for the wild albino horse continues, through canyons and up to the timberline, across swollen streams, and finally to the edge of a vast range called the Buckhorn. He came this way, all right. Look at those tracks, Tim. These two, boss. That albino took plenty of company with him. That's fine. More of our mares. Dad, look, Goblin's gone with the albino. Goblin? Sure, here is his tracks. I, I told you how I knocked his hoof. I recognize him. That fool Goblin get near the mares and the albino will cut him to pieces. Ah, uh, wait, there's no sense going any further. Yeah, he's taking him clear into Buckhorn Range. But, Daddy, he just can't disappear off the face of the earth. There's a million canyons in Buckhorn. It would take us weeks. Ah, uh, we're going back home. Hey, down there, look. Dad. Well, I'll be... It's Goblin, Daddy. He didn't run away. It's Goblin. Hey, take it easy. I'm coming, Goblin. Wait for me. I'm coming. Uh, what do you think of that? Sure, it's Goblin. Hello, boy. Gosh, I'm glad to see you. Dad, look, he's hurt. Look at his fangs. Jimmy. All cut up. By a hoof. And a mighty big one. The albino. But, but Goblin will be all right, won't he, Daddy? It won't keep him from running. I don't know. He's pretty badly shaken up. My guess he's going to be all right, though. Oh, gosh. Put a rope around him, Tim. We'll take it easy going back. Yes, boy. Ken, uh, you're pretty determined to run, Goblin, aren't you? Yes, sir. You'll be going away to school soon. But, well, well, he won't be ready to run for a long time yet. Another year, anyway. Uh, you've got lots to learn, the two of you. And uh, I guess we don't have much money, do we? Been taking quite a licking, son. It's all your mother and I can do to get you into the academy. I know. 
And there's just not enough money for both. Keep you in school and spend what it takes to turn a jug-headed colt into a racehorse. Well, Dad, I, I'll do whatever you want. Thanks, Ken. You know? Yes, sir? Next year, just about this time, you'll be coming home for spring vacation. Yes, sir? And just about this time next year, Goblin here should be ready for a serious workout on a racetrack. Oh, Dad, Dad, thanks. <laughs> I don't know how we'll manage it, son, but, uh, well, we'll manage. The horse looks great, Rob. So does the boy, too. Uh, it's great to have him home again, Charlie. And how he's looked forward to this day. Oh, it's wonderful of you, Charlie, letting him use your track. Oh, I'm as interested in that horse as he is, Nell. Well, this is as good a place as any to watch him work out. Take him around once, son. We'll clock him. Okay, guys. Who's that other horse down there? Southern Bell. Rob and I figure Goblin needs a pacemaker. Goblin needs more than a pacemaker. Still too factious? Well, look at him. See? See what I mean? Rearing and jumping oh, and... Oh, Rob, he's still a cold. Oh, he's too unpredictable. You here? I didn't notice you. Oh, yes, I'm here. We're all set, Ken. Break together now. I wouldn't miss this for anything, Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> when I drop this handkerchief, go. Southern Bell can run. If Goblin can catch her, we'll know he's good. All right. Here we go. Run, Goblin, run. Ken. Oh, for Pete's sake. Look at him standing there. Uh-oh, left at the post. No, he's going now. And look at him go. Run, you goblin, run! Whose horse are you for? I'm for any cold of Appalachians. He's catching up. He's catching up. Come on, goblin. Ride him, Kenny, ride him. Come on, Ken. Let him out, boy. Let him out. Goblin, goblin, goblin. Look at him pull away. Eight lengths. He's beaten Bell by eight lengths. A stopwatch. You got the stopwatch? I've got it He's all right. Whoop! Hey! What do you make, Charlie? What do you make? Look at the watch. A half mile and 47. Half mile and 47 seconds. He did it, Kenny. He did it. Well, I'll be jiggered. Mr. Sergeant. Ken, you did beautifully. Sonny, you're going to enter Goblin in the Multnomah County races. But, well, that's not till next May. You want to win that race, don't you? We'll wait for the Multnomah. Okay, Mr. Sergeant. And I'll help you get a jockey license so you can ride him yourself. Ken, a jockey? Oh, sure, Ma. Oh, dear. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. I think we're all a little too excited. Now, let's get down to earth. First place, we know we can't depend on Goblin. He's proved that for one whole year. But you just saw him run. Being able to run isn't enough. He's got to run when you want him to, not just when he feels like it. Oh, he'll be all right, Dad. I'll train him. I'll make a real racer out of him. Well, I'm feeling confidenter and confidenter. Goblin's a racer. Goblin? No, let's not call him that. He isn't a goblin anymore. He needs a new name. You name him, Mom. Oh, Ken, I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Well, now, uh, let's see. Uh, we could... Rob, look at the sky. Yeah, rain again by evening. Well, Sunday is. They're like white horses in the sky. Well, my goodness, that's it. How about calling him Thunderhead? Oh, I like that. That's a fine name for him. Thunderhead. Yes, Thunderhead. Ken, I swear every time you come back from school, you've grown another foot. You mean even more than last time? Well, look. The last time you were home, by the very day we named Thunderhead, I made you for this jockey shirt. And look at you. You can scarcely get into it. Oh, it looks great, Mom, on it. <laughs> well, I suppose I can lengthen the sleeve. Ken, I want you to promise me one thing. Sure. I want you to promise not to take any foolish chances in that race. You're not a professional jockey, you know. I can ride, Mom. You know that. Oh, I know. But you will be careful, won't you? Sure, but... But what about Dad? The Dad? Oh, he's been working awfully hard lately, Jim. We've just about been able to get by, you know that. Yes, Mom, I know. He's been pretty nervous and irritable. I've been letting him have his own way in everything. But, Mom, if, if we let him have his own way about the race... Now, you let me worry about that. Just get out to report. When Dad comes home, I'll talk to you. Hello, darling. Sorry I'm late. Tired, dear. Oh, little... How'd the sale go? Well, I changed my mind about keeping my thoroughbred. I spoke to Sir Harris. He bought the whole lot. Here's the check. Oh, Rob, they're all gone? That's all right. All I'm sorry, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. 
I'm not. Nobody's interested in jumpers and hunters these days. We'll be able to concentrate now on cavalry horses. There's nothing wrong in that. And take a look at that check. It's enough to last us the rest of the year. We might even be able to buy a couple of good brood mares. Rob, that's uh, wonderful, but do we have to buy them right away? Well, we ought to. Why not? Oh, nothing. Come on now. Out with it. Hello, Dad. Well, Ken, when did you get here? This morning. I, I couldn't wait. I took the bus. Well, you look fine, boy. Say, that's uh, some snappy uniform. And stripes. You got your stripes. Yes, sir. Academy Corporal. <laughs> Dad, and, and that's not all. Here. Oh, report card. Well, look at it. Mathematics, uh, 94. Latin, 92. <laughs> Composition, 100. Now aren't you proud? Proud? I'm dumbfounded. Ken, this is wonderful. <laughs> what happened? Well, <laughs> well, Dad, I... Go on, dear. You might as well tell him yourself now. Well, Dad, I... Well, I thought if I made good in school, well, well you might lend me the money to enter Sunderhead in the Multnomah County races. Races? Nell, I thought you wrote... Ken but, that Dad, I... I... Ken, it isn't just the entry fee. It's that horse. You can't depend on it. But, Dad, I've had him out all day, and he's fine now. And he might win. He will win. I know he'll and win. if he does, it'll mean $5,000. Nell, I'd like to see that horse run as much as anybody. But with incidentals and everything, it would cost close to $500 to get him entered. The way things are, I, I just can't afford to take the risk. But, Dad... I'm sorry, son. Oh, Rob, he's been counting on it. He's worked so hard. Now, wait a minute. Would somebody please tell me what this is? That? Oh, it's just a jockey shirt. Jockey shirt? I made it for him. And, uh, what's this thing? The, uh, design sewed on it? Oh, just our brand, Rob. The goose bar. I thought Kim might like it. Oh. And uh, that jar, what's that? Uh... Furnace marble hoof luster, Dad. I I bought it to shine Thunderhead's hooves with. Hoof luster. Jockey shirt. What chance do I stand around here? Okay, you win. Thunderhead enters the race. Oh, oh gee, Dad. Now, just let me out of here before I change my mind. Well, Dad. I... Well, son? Thunderhead looks pretty good, doesn't he? You don't look so bad yourself. Checked everything? Everything. I don't want you doing a nosedive in the middle of the track. Oh, I'll be all right. Sure you will. Be just like a workout at Charlie Sargent's ranch. Six race, jockey's up. Six race, uh, jockey's up. I guess that means me. Yep, jockey's up. Let's go, Thunder. Ken, don't let that crowd bother you or the jockeys either. And don't let them get you in a pocket. I won't, Dad. Just remember, there's not a better horse on that track or a better rider. Thanks. Good luck, son. Your mother and I will be cheering for you. The horses are now approaching the starting gate. This is the victory handicap for three-year-olds and upwards. On the way of the streetway is Buddy Farnsworth. Number two is Molly R. with Jackie Connolly. Happy Days is number three, written by Claire Jennings. Number four is Thunderhead, written and owned by Ken McLaughlin. There he is! There's Ken! Yoo-hoo, Ken! Well, Mrs. McLaughlin, what do you think of your son now? Oh, Rob, he looks so small down there. There's no time to start worrying. He can take care of himself. And that Thunderhead, Rob, he looks like a million. I'll settle right now for 5000 Who owns that black one, Charlie? That's Fleetway, the Johnson stable. Yeah, and he's liable to be a good horse. Not as good as Thunderhead, I bet. Only the favorite, darling. Well, what are we? Just 30 to 1. Is that good? Well, Hildy, I'll let you know in about five minutes. The horses are all in the starting gate. Number four is acting up down there. Thunderhead is refusing to enter. He's trying to break out. Oh, no, wait, wait. Well, they've got him all right. He's settling down now. Thunderhead is being led into position. They're all in there now. And there they go. Thunderhead refused to break. He's still in the stage. He's jumping and bucking. He's so There he goes. It's Molly out in front. Cut it back for you. Second by one thing. Swinging the wrist first. Happy days is fourth and the fleet way. Thunderhead is trailing the field by 20 lengths. Around the first turn, it's Molly Iron in front by a hit. Swing oh, boss. Dead last year. Dead last. Uh, 20 lengths. All because he wouldn't break. 20 lengths, nothing. That horse is moving up. Kenny, don't be last. Not last. Come on, Thunderhead. Come on. He is moving. Where are those last? Swinging Dora is second by a hit. Molly Iron is third by one length. Stepmother is fourth, and on the extreme outside is Thunderhead. The horses are all closing ground. Into the stretch, it's Fleetway ahead by one length. Molly R between horses is second by a half a length. Swings are in third and Thunderhead. It's Fleetway in front, Thunderhead is second. The head and head now, Thunderhead is taking the lead. Fleetway is second by two lengths and Molly R. It's Thunderhead by two lengths and drawing away. Fleetway is second and... 
Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Buckley top of the front ahead. He's slowing down. The field is going past him. It's Fleetway going across the line of finish. And Thunderhead is leaping the rail into the infield. He's running away. It's Fleetway the winner. Baleari second by three lengths and swinging down third in front of Stepmother. Thunderhead is still running across the infield. The lead ponies are attempting to head him off now. Uh-oh. He's fallen. Thunderhead has fallen. The jockey's on the ground. They're not moving. Looks like a serious accident. It's difficult to tell from here. But oh, good luck, man. Getting up. Stay here, darling. Wait for me here. You good for nothing, loco coyote. Why did you do it? Why did you throw that race, Thunderhead? I, oh, I told you we were counting on you, and, and now you've ruined everything. Ah, uh, stop it. I, I don't care if you are sorry. The last of that, that whole grandstand. Come on, let's get out of here. I said, let Thunderhead, your leg. What's the matter with your leg, boy? Thunderhead. Hey. Ted, are you all right? Dad, I'm fine, but it's him. Thunder hit his leg. Well, Doc, can't you tell us anything? Well, it's hard to say, McLaughlin. Swollen like it is. Just keep that leg bandaged till you get the horse home. Then have your own vet look at him. Thanks, Doc. He, he's going to run again, isn't he, Doc? Doesn't look like it, son. Old tendons can never be depended upon. At least it won't cripple him, Ken. Why, he'll be as good as ever, son. He'll make a great saddle horse. Perhaps. But he'll never be able to put on that burst of speed a racehorse needs to take him over the finish line. You see, Kenny, Thunderhead's racing days are over. Thunderhead, it... it's all right. It's all right. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll be back with Act Three of Thunderhead in just a moment. Thousands of people contribute in many different ways to your enjoyment of motion pictures. From the stars and the producers to the usherette who shows you to your theater seat. Tonight we have as our guest 18-year-old Gloria Tucker, petite blonde usherette at Hollywood's famous Egyptian theater. Have you any screen ambitions, Gloria? Yes, I have, Mr. Keeley. My job helps pay for my dramatic lessons. Hmm, and gives you a chance to study the acting technique of our leading stars, eh? <laughs> yes, that's true. When we're playing a picture like Metro Golden Mare's Adventure, I find it hard to keep my eyes on the seats instead of on the screen. Well, Clark Gable and Greer Garson certainly make a wonderful team. You know, it was Mr. Gable who started me dreaming about a screen career. Hmm, when was that? Twelve years ago. My parents were making a tour of the Metro Golden Mare studios, and we met Mr. Gable in the commissary. And Clark offered you a role at the age of six? <laughs> oh, no. But he told me what a wonderful career the movies are. And he's right. And from the crowds I've seen, everybody wants to see Gable's first picture since his return to the screen. Oh, adventure certainly keeps us busy. It seems as if I walk up and down those aisles a thousand times a day. I imagine that's tough on stockings, Gloria. <laughs> yes, it is, Mr. Kennedy. But I hardly ever get runs. Maybe that's because I use luck. Every night when I get home, I toss my stockings into lukewarm Lux Suds. It's not surprising, Gloria, that you get such good care. Stockings washed with Lux Flakes last twice as long as those rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. Scientific strain tests prove it. What do you do in your spare time, Gloria? I don't have very much, Mr. Keeley, but I like sports and go bowling whenever I can. Well, what's your average? <laughs> not very good. My stocking average is better. Do you know why Lux Care gives you that high score, Gloria? It's because Lux save stocking elasticity. Threads stretch under strain, then spring back into place without popping into run. I never knew the scientific reason, Mr. Kennedy, but I certainly know that Lux is good for stocking. Thank you for telling us your experience, Gloria, and thank you for coming here tonight. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We hope you'll join us after the play 
to hear about Roddy McDowell's latest, rather fascinating hobby. Here's Roddy now as Ken, co-starred with Preston Foster as Rob, and Rita Johnson as Nell, in Act Three of Thunderhead, Son of Flicker. A couple of weeks have passed since Thunderhead's is disastrous race. His leg is almost well, but the big, half-wild horse will never race again. In front of the corral, Rob, his face lined with worry, talks with a hired man, Gus. Well, Gus? Oh, he's coming along good now, boss. A couple of weeks, he'll be like new. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, Gus, I was speaking to Charlie Sargent. Yeah. He tells me he's got quite a lot of work at his place. He's short-handed, and he, uh... What's the matter? Oh, this corral gate, the sack. Hell, has been swinging again, I bet you. You know, uh, things have been pretty slack around here. He got the gate all loose. Mr. Sergeant tells me he could use a couple of good hands. Yeah. He's hanging, he's taking up, too. Will you hold her up just a minute, boss? That's it. Well, I, uh... I thought you and Tim might like to go to work for him. A uh, little higher, boss. That's yeah. With the herd as small as it is, I can uh, pretty well handle it myself. Now, I, uh, besides, I, well, I, I just can't afford to pay after the first of the month, Gus. Well, the hanger all fixed now. Yeah, I think that's better, huh? You didn't hear a word I said. Sure, boss. You said you couldn't pay us after the first of the month. Well. Don't make no difference. Jim and me wouldn't be happy any place else. Yeah, the gate works pretty well now. Thanks, Gus. Mom! Breakfast! Coming! Where's Ken? Upstairs. He said he wasn't very hungry this morning. I think I'd better have a little talk with him. Rob, be nice to him. He goes back to school Monday and, well, he's been taking it pretty hard. I know. I'll, uh, I'll be down in a few minutes. Son, hurry up. Big day ahead of us. Got to get the hay in. Bringing $40 a ton this season and, uh, Ken. Yes, sir. I know what's on your mind, but, well, oh, we took a chance and we lost. That's all there is to it. I'd counted so on Thunderhead winning that race. I know. Now he won't ever run again. Ken, it's all part of growing up. Losing races of one kind or another. You know, there's lots of ways you can grow up. You can grow up to be cocky if you get what you want, and bitter if you don't. You can also grow up to take both success and failure in your stride. Now, that's what I want you to do, son. What happens isn't important. What is important is the way you meet it, how much courage you have. You see, it takes a mighty big man to pick up the pieces and start all over again. I'm sorry, Dad. I I guess I have been acting kind of like a baby. Now, what do you say we have a little breakfast, huh? That's for me. You know, uh, now that his leg's better, Thunderhead's getting kind of restless out there. Well, you know he wants to get out. He, he can't stand being shut up in a corral that way. Maybe I can ride him later. Sure, he could stand some exercise. Oh, can you come down? Tim's here. Coming. Boss, as if we hadn't had enough bad luck. Now what? The albino's great at us what? again. Banner's hurt pretty bad. Banner? Oh, Rob. Get the medicine kit, Kenny. We'll have to skip breakfast, Nell. Get Gus and the rifles, Tim. We'll try to find that robber again. <laughs> He is, boss. Banner, all that's left of him. Dad, look, he's big. Yeah. We won't need the medicine kit. Put it back in the saddlebag. Dad. Banner's been too good to me. Can't let him suffer like this. Go back to your horse, Ken. Yes, sir. Let me have the pistol, Gus. Yeah, boss. The best stallion I ever owned. Poor old Banner. Yeah. One thing, boss. The poor banner got it so bad that albinos as good as dead, too, I bet you. It must have been some fight they had. Yeah. Well, let's try that trail. We may still run him down. How's Thunderhead's leg holding out, Ken? Look fine to me, Dad. Ready to go all day. Well, he may have to, because I'm finding that murdering albino. Getting dark, boss. 
You and the boy turn around now, you could still make the ranch. No, it won't worry. She knows what we're after. Gus and I stick right after him, boy. We're all sticking. We'll make camp at the lake. We'll get some sleep and see what sort of a moon we get. If it's bright, we can start out again after midnight. Good, boss, good. We give that white devil no rest, you bet. <laughs> Dad, did you call me? Dad? That's funny. I, I thought I heard a noise. They're asleep. They're all asleep. I, I must have been dreaming. I guess. Thunderhead. He's gone. He slipped his tether. Thunderhead. But where would you go, boss? You're him and the horse. That's all right, Gus. Look, Penny left a note. See? Thunderhead got away, didn't want to wake you, so I'm going out after him myself. Don't worry, I'll be back. Yeah, but when? Boss, you think he's all right? Oh, he can take care of himself. Go on back to sleep, Gus. We'll stay here till daylight. He'll be back by then. Thunderhead? Thunderhead! All right. Don't answer me, you stubborn fool. I'll show you I can be stubborn, too. I'll take you all night long. I'll climb my last mountain after you. Just wait till I get to the top of you. Just wait. You're not there. I'm going back. Daylight, see you I'll just get one good look and then I'm... Oh. Oh, what a view. A whole valley. I, I never knew there was a valley here. I... Thunderhead? A herd. A herd of horses down there. Dad's horses. I look, there's... There's Brownie and... And Sky High and... And Taggart... Dad's mad. I just... It's him. The albino. The albino. I'm getting those mares. Albino or no albino. I'm getting those mares. Brownie. Brownie, come here. You... You know me, Brownie. Don't you want to go home, Brownie? I... The albino! He's coming after me! Thunderhead! Help! Thunderhead! I, I can't run anymore! Get him, Thunderhead! I can't! Get him, boy. His hug. Watch his hug, kind of head. Get up and fight. Get up and fight. There. You've got him, boy. There. You've got him. He's fighting, kind of head. That. He's fighting, boy. He's fighting. Dad! Penny, we've been looking for you for hours. What's happened, boy? What have you been... The albino. Yes, Dad. And Thunderhead. He killed the albino, Dad. Thunderhead killed him. He saved my life. Killed the albino. Easy, boy. Easy. You don't have to fight anymore. It's all over now. Boss! Boss, look! Down there, the end of the canyon. The horses. The whole herd. And they're our mares. That's where he kept him, Dad, the albino. When I found him, he, he started to charge me. I, I was so tired, Dad, I, I couldn't run anymore. And then I fell, and, and then he saw me. Thunderhead. He headed him off, and he, and he fought for me, Dad, until he killed the albino. Thunderhead. Yeah, yeah, man. He was a thief and a killer, that albino. But still, he... He was a great horse, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. One of the greatest. Thunderhead! You see, boy? He's all right. 
Look at him run. He's calling that herd together down there. They're coming this way. He's driving the herd, boss. Rounding them up. You better get up on my horse, Ken. Dad, he's bringing them to us. Why? He wants to take the herd home. Well, I'll be... Me too, boss. He will. Let's help him do it. Ken. And Thunderhead, Mom. And Thunderhead. He saved my life, Mom. He, he killed the albino. Oh, well, that means more than if he'd won a hundred races. Come to think of it, I... I guess it does. Dad? Dad, can you come here, please? Just a second, Kenny. Oh, boy, easy, easy. What's wrong, Thunderhead? What is it, boy? Well, Ken. Dad. Dad, what's wrong with him? He, he acts as if I was a stranger to him. Oh, uh, it isn't that, Ken. Thunderhead brought the mares here because this has been his home. But it's still his home. But don't forget, son. Thunderhead has taken the albino throne away from him. He's king now, and he knows it. I'm afraid that neither corrals nor fences, no matter how big, ever hold him again. Oh, Sonny, easy, boy, easy. Now look, he's trembling, lifting the air, looking at the sky. Don't you want to stay, Thunderhead? All right, boy. You can go. Free as the wind. Darn near it's fast. Look at him, Dad. Straight for the mountains. I... I've lost him. Yes, dear. Mama, the albino is one at last. Goodbye, Thunderhead. Goodbye. stars will return for their curtain calls in just a moment. Do you remember those New Year's resolutions you made not so many weeks ago? Has something like this happened to them? One, go through closets for the clothing drive. Oh, I can't be bothered until I do my spring cleaning. But the need is now, Mrs. Smith. Let's see. Two, keep a can for used fat on the stove. Save some every day. Well, rationing's off, so... Saving used fat can't be very important now. Oh, yes, it's still very important if you want that new vacuum cleaner and radio and car, and especially if you want more soap. Supplies of industrial fats and oils are still far from enough to go around, and soap makers have to share the supply with thousands of other industries. So you can't have more soap unless there's more fat for industry. Manufacturers are depending on the housewives of America to help them get the fats they need to make the things you want. So, ladies, put that good resolution into action. Save every drop of used fat from table scraps, gravies, stews, frying pan, and broiler. Turn your full can of used fat into your dealer at once. He'll give you four cents for every pound. You'll be surprised how fast a container fills up. If you keep it in plain sight, add some every day. Remember, every time you throw used fats away, you're contributing to the soap shortage. If you want to see your favorite brands on the shelf more often, save used fats. Turn them in regularly. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Our spotlight again falls on Rita Johnson, Roddy McDowell, and Preston Foster, who return for a well-deserved curtain call. Roddy, I understand you have your own producing company now. That's right, Mr. Keeley, but it's still on paper, but it's very real to me. Well, what do you call it, Roddy? Well, it's called Imperial Eagle Productions. 
I, I've given it about four square miles in the heart of Hollywood. You mean you have it all mapped out? Oh, certainly. With sound stages, administration buildings, dressing rooms, commissaries, cutting rooms. Mm, must run into a lot of money, even on paper. Yes, Mr. Keeley, but of course we only make very successful pictures and with big stars. <laughs> well, who are some of the stars, Roddy? Well, Janet Ludlow is our Academy Award winner. I'm afraid I've never heard of her. Well, I, I'm afraid she's still on paper. <laughs> but I've cast a lot of real stars in my pictures, too. I've even got Greta Garbo in production. Greta Garbo? Well, this sounds like a very interesting hobby. Where do you release your pictures, Roddy? I have my own chain of theaters, Mr. Keeley. Just the other day, Gregory Peck applied for the popcorn concession in them. <laughs> you don't have Preston Foster and Rita Johnson in production, do you? Yes, I do, sir. Preston and Rita, though you may not know it, they've been in production for the past four weeks on a picture called The World's Illusion. And who's the director? Well, uh... You are, Mr. Keeley. Oh, you know, I've been feeling a little bit worn out from pressure lately. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, Roddy, does this hobby of yours mean that you'd really like to produce pictures someday? I'd love it, Preston. Well, for a future producer, that's a very excellent hobby, Roddy. Maybe someday we'll be doing Imperial Legal screenplays here on Lux. What are you doing here next week, uh, Bill? Well, next week we're bringing our audience Universal's tender and delightful screen hit, The Amazing Mrs. Holiday. And our welcome mat is out for three fine stars. Jean Tierney, Walter Brennan, and Edmund O'Brien. Jean plays one of the most touching roles I know, as the young girl posing as a rich man's widow to provide a home for eight war orphans. What happens when she discovers that the rich man has an attractive grandson of her own age? Well, um, uh, you'll find out when you tune in Monday. We'll certainly be with you in the audience. Good night. Good, Good night. night, and thanks for being with us. Our sponsor, the makers of Lux Flake, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Tierney, Walter Brennan, and Edmund O'Brien in The Amazing Mrs. Holiday. This is William Keeley saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. drive against infantile paralysis, which has enlisted the aid of Hollywood studios and leading stars, the motion picture industry this year has collected and donated more than six million dollars. This is the greatest amount ever solicited by the industry in its annual campaign to help protect the children of America. Said the state chairman of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, in expressing our gratitude for this fine contribution, I wish to add that it is in keeping with the generosity of your industry, which has always been among the strongest and most zealous supporters of the fight against infantile paralysis. Roddy McDowell appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of the psychological thriller, Shock. Preston Foster will soon be seen in the universal picture, Tangier. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear The Amazing Mrs. Holiday with Gene Tierney, Walter Brennan, and Edmund O'Brien. The Spry Treat of the Week. Crispy, tender-crusted fish fillets fried to full-flavored perfection in pure all-vegetable spry. For foods dependably delicious and digestible, rely on Spry. That's pure all-vegetable shortening at its creamy best. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Amazing Mrs. Holiday with Gene Tierney, Walter Brennan, and Edwin O'Brien. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Saturday Night Theater. Don't forget the grocery list, Aaron. Sure. Make it a dead sir. Don't forget. So long, Georgie. Bye. Bye, sir. Who was that? What is this grocery list? Don't you know? That was Major Owen Evans. He only happens to be the son of the new Minister of Munitions. Well, cut yourself a slice of cake, Major. <laughs> We present William Squire as the Minister in Storm Lantern, a play adapted for radio by Morris Mizeovich from the book by Richard Earl Lloyd George, with Noel Hood as the Minister's wife, 
David Buck as the minister's son, Lawrence Payne as the minister's secretary, and Ira Heath as the minister's statistician. The time is the First World War. Storm Lantern. Owen! Oh, Owen, darling, how lovely to see you. We sent the car to the station. I got a lift from London. Well, let me look at you. You're looking well, Mother. How long has you leave, darling? I've got a week, a whole week. It was supposed to have started at midnight on the 4th, and I was tangled up with a whole mob going to Victoria when I saw a friendly face with a large, familiar cigar stuck in the <laughs> middle of it. So I got a lift down. Oh, that was nice of him. Well, the place looks wonderful. Oh, what a relief. Have you eaten, Owen? Well, I have, but I can always eat again, of course. <laughs> How's the old man? Your father's in great form. It started to rain, so he said he'd go out for a walk. But, of course, he's expecting you, and I'm sure he'll be back soon. Owen! Oh, hello, Jason. How are you? Oh, you're looking well. You've got that in first. Don't you think he's looking well? He's looking fine. Not too thin, but there are lines around there. Uh, I think it suits him. Um, Mrs Evans, the generals have arrived. I've told them the minister was expecting his son and asked them to wait in the study. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Two top brass waiting their turn after an infantryman. Now I know I'm at home. Darling, I think I'll go and arrange about a nice hot bath for you and tea. Ah. Scott, Owen. Ah, thanks, Jason. How is Father? Are you keeping him in order? Oh, nobody can do that, but I'm very, very proud of him. Uh, this new job, munitions. Yes, he gave up the exchequer for a new ministry. An absolutely unknown quantity, can you imagine it? Giving up the most important post to that of the Prime Minister for a purely technical job which had to be built up from scratch. We started off with a desk and two chairs, but later in the day one of the chairs was requisitioned because they said it belonged to another department. <laughs> well, how's it going out there? Well, I'm glad Father's taken over munitions. It's bad, is it, Owen? It just doesn't seem to make sense. We've got the men, of course, and we're supposed to be a great industrial power. But how can you explain the awful sense of inadequacy? We're absolutely outclassed. Everything's needed. Howitzers, grenades, machine guns, rifles, barbed wire, trenching kits, shells, landmines, lorries. But I, I've made a whole list here. Oh, splendid. Let me have that, will you? I, I can see different handwriting here. Oh, half the battalion had a hand in this. It's what you might call a petition... You'd better let me have it back. I'll make out a clean copy for you. This was written with a pencil stub in the dugout. No, 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 no. It's fine as it is. Owen, oh, my dear boy! Hello, Father. Oh, it's wonderful to see you. My word, but you've grown tough. Hard as nails. A real man, Jason, eh? How are you, Father? He's looking fit, isn't he, sir? Um, I've got the generals Brewster and Crump in the study for you. I've told them you'll be able to see them later on. Later, Jason, later. How long? A week, starting the morning of the fifth. Splendid. They'll give us a chance to have one or two talks. Are you feeling tired? Well, it was very noisy out there. And most of the noise was being made by them, I suppose. All right, you don't have to tell me. Uh, excuse me, sir. A special branch man to see you too, sir. Mm. I've, I've told him to wait. Mm. For the moment, perhaps you'd kindly leave us, Jason. Yes, sir. What's up, Father? Is it really difficult? And there are two wars, my boy. And as far as I'm concerned, the principal one is here in Whitehall. <laughs> General Red Hot Brewster. They get promoted not on merit, but on a basis of senility. <laughs> Seniority. <laughs> like cheese, the older they are, the higher. <laughs> That's Brewster. Crump. <laughs> well, Brewster promoted Crump as his second in command. It's been the most ridiculous appointment since Caligula made his horse a proconsul. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble? All the good generals in the past never had enough equipment. They're always complaining about shortage of armament and troops. Our generals are different. They tell me they don't need any more equipment. But do they believe this themselves? Can they possibly believe it? No, but the suggestion originally came from me, a civilian. What an insufferable nerve. What business is it of mine, anyway? The job of government is to provide the war, isn't it? Do you mean to say that they actually refused equipment? Well, can you imagine it, Owen? It's like a soldier refusing a free sample in a Maison Tolere. <laughs> Excuse me. You mean you can actually supply this stuff and they won't have it? It's absolutely terrifying. I have to think up schemes to outwit them into accepting more equipment. Well, they leave this to me. I can handle them. I'll be praying for you, Father. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir, but Mr. Owen's bath is now ready and Mrs. Evans says she will have tea for him as soon as he's had it. Hello, Jessie. Oh, welcome home, sir. Thank you, Jessie. 
I think you'd better go, my boy. No, don't worry about what we've been discussing. Uh, in fact, I think I've got a bit of news that might cheer you up. Good news? I think so. So does Winston. Uh-huh. <laughs> what have you two been cooking up together this time? It's top secret. I've given my oath of allegiance. Mm, with you talk in your sleep. If you let this one out, you needn't worry about the Germans. I'll personally conduct the firing squad. Well, it must be something. Well, uh, for security reasons, we call this thing a... a tank. It's a mechanized cavalry charger. Oh, no, that's been thought of before. It won't work. No vehicle on wheels can go through barbed wire past dugouts and pillboxes. It doesn't run on wheels. No? How's it mobile, then? (laughs) Well, I can't play guessing games with you about our top-secret inventions. Now, go along and have your bath. I've got a big meeting. Well, good luck, Father. Have this, Uh, shall I tell the general you're ready, sir? Mm. Oh, by the way, um, this is a, a grocery list the boy brought home. Mm, so we'll look. It's rather crumpled. Crumpled and not very clean. What's all this different handwriting? It was written in the dugout by several of Owen's comrades. I'll make a clear copy for the general, shall no, I? No, 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 no. I want this particular piece of crumpled, grimy paper. I suppose this uneven handwriting can't be attributed to uh, shell shock, can it? Mm, Mud from the trenches, Jason, eh? No little red stains? eh? I suppose it'd be going a bit too far to experiment with a little red ink. eh? (laughs) Well, perhaps not. However, I can trust you to hand it to me at the psychological moment. Indeed, sir. How long have they been waiting? About half an hour, but they're all right. I've explained about Owen, and they've got halfway through a bottle of brandy already. Well, there's this other chap. He's from Scotland Yard, I believe. Any idea how long it'll take? Oh, well, perhaps you'd better see him first. The generals will take up the rest of the evening, won't they? Yeah, well, tell Chief Detective Inspector Taggart that I can give him two and a half minutes. He's just outside, sir. Come in, Inspector. Thank you. You have exactly two and a half minutes. Inspector Taggart, sir. Sit down, will you? Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, now, uh, what's this confidential matter you wish to see me about? Uh, How are you, Mr. Evans? Taggart. Aye. <laughs> Taggart? Do I know you? There's something familiar. Ah, you were a young MP and we were going on a midnight expedition into the underworld. Bless me, Jack the <laughs> Ripper. <laughs> That's right, you've got it now. And my <laughs> word, what a night. <laughs> Here, Inspector, have a cigar. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes. We never did catch him. I'm sorry it turned out to be a wasted night for you. Wasted? Well, we found no trace of the criminal. Mm, I found something all right that night, Inspector. It wasn't altogether a wasted evening. No criminal was caught, and you couldn't find clues of any crime. <laughs> what about the gin houses, the doss houses, the stinking alleys and grimy cellars, the rickety tenon, disorderly houses and thieves' dens? All this in the capital of the richest country in the world. I set out to investigate a crime that night. I found evidence of 10,000. Yes, sir. Well, I don't want to keep you. You must be a busy man, Inspector. Now, what do you want to see me about? It... Uh... This is a security matter, Mr. Evans. We're rather concerned about your safety. Yes, yes, yes. Now, what is it? There's a young woman on your staff, a Miss Caroline Bishop. You know her, of course. What about her? She joined your staff last March. If you say so. A statistical expert, I understand. Well? We've just discovered that she's in the inner circle of the militant suffragette movement. Caroline? Yes. Now, I don't have to tell you, Mr. Evans, what happened to you in the past. You'll dismiss the girl, won't you? It's dangerous to have her here where she can take a pot shot whenever the mood's on her. Mm, well, we'll see what a little finesse can do in this situation. A woman is a highly susceptible organism, Taggart. I don't know what you're up to, sir, but I don't like well, it. If you don't know what I'm up to, you don't know whether you like it or not, eh? Now, be a good chap and let me handle it my own way. Now, highly intelligent and capable statisticians are not to be dismissed lightly. Oh, please be careful. Statisticians are not to be dismissed lightly. Oh, please be careful, sir. Yes, it was very friendly of you to call, Inspector. Oh, good day to you, Inspector. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Jason. Sir. Uh, before you call these chaps in, uh, have I got my production charts? Uh, they're in your desk, Minister. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. Now, two things. That little bit of paper. Do I hand it to you, or does Owen? Owen, brief him. Sir. Now, Jason, tactics. This is a crucial meeting. I'm going to use everything I know to break through their stonewalling tactics. Now, what have you found out? Uh, Brewster. Brewster. Nothing in his private life. No vices, no financial involvements. But there is one small thing of interest. Do you know he's afraid of spiders? General Brewster. It may sound incredible, but he'd rather face a rhinoceros at full gallop 
than a spider. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> All right, I'll try to remember. Now, you've got me the other material I asked for. Uh, yes, I've put it on your desk. Brewster's second cousin married a man called... Thomas Alfred Baverstock, who is a shareholder of Hamilton's The Small Arms People. And I've got the names of others. All right, fetch them in. Oh, I hate to use this sort of stuff, but heaven help us, what is there to do? I'm sure you're right, sir. Gentlemen, the minister will see you now. Uh, 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 Gentlemen, I'm sorry you were kept waiting. How do you do, minister? Uh, How's your boy? Uh, Major Limbry. Mm. Splendid, sir. Mm. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. Oh, there you go. There you go, there you go. Now yes, then, I take it we've <coughs> left our revolvers in the cloakroom, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, I've talked it over with my colleague, Minister. We're quite ready to settle our differences and start a fresh page. After all, there's teamwork called for. If we all pull together, we'll knock Jerry for six feet. Mm, die on, die on. What's that? Oh, uh, yes, I don't have to remind you, Minister, that we have our boys at the front, well, too. There's no need to make any protest about that, General. Uh, we would uh, like to speak... Very plainly, however. Splendid. Now, you've got some figures about equipment, Minister. Now, before you start firing the matter, say, <laughs> let me give you just one statistic that we've computed while we were waiting for you in the study where you made us uh, so very comfortable. Me. <laughs> very good. Between us, General Brewster and I have 67 years of military experience. Uh, what my colleague means to say is that we, too, have worked out certain figures of our requirements. Yes, you see, you must consider, Minister, the question of mobility. Now, in the old days, troops were strengthened with great quantities of protective armor, and armies vied with each other in providing heavier and heavier armor for their soldiers. And in the end, this defeated uh, the whole purpose of defense by slowing down maneuverability. Uh, now, gentlemen, I'm not dismissing mobility, maneuverability, and general agility. I don't want to bog you down with unnecessary material, but ah, surely, surely this is not a proposal to equip your cavalry with 15th century armor. Oh, but, gentlemen, this has become an engineer's war. All our national genius for inventiveness and organization in the machine age is at your disposal. More than 600 industrial firms have agreed to turn out weapons. Yes, sir. Here is the raw material of victory, gentlemen, and we offer it to you to hammer into practical military shape. But who are these firms, Minister? What do they understand about producing weapons? They're the top men in the country. Hard-headed manufacturers of commodities ranging from locomotives to sewing machines. Oh, uh, yes, but they've had no experience producing arms, Minister. We are professional soldiers. We must know that our weapons are up to standard. Yeah, yeah. We can't equip our fighting men with machine guns produced by sewing machine specialists. Uh, this war isn't a sewing circle, you know. Eh? Minister, <laughs> Minister, you, you must appreciate that it is only a selected number of industrial firms who have had the experience to produce weapons to the required standard. Yes, yes. I, uh, I have a list here. Yeah, now, now, these are old traditional firms whose experience goes back some... 200 years. But, General, they made javelins then. If I needed pikes and bows and arrows, I'd be delighted to place an order for them with these fuddy duddies. Oh, oh. Oh. What's going on? Hmm? A favored firm policy? Hmm? Is there any nasty nepotism going on between the war office and these ancient armorers? If there is, I'll get to the bottom of it. Oh, sir, are you suggesting that? Uh, no, no. I'm not accusing anybody, but every situation which encourages the favoured firm's policy spews out its opportunists, its adventurers and practitioners of corruption. Go look at it, then! I've been accused of this sort of thing myself, and through very ugly experience, I've learned how these things function and create misunderstanding. Well, I'm only telling you all this to explain the dangers of a favoured firm policy. It creates jealousy, and jealousy is the father and mother of scandal-mongering. When it rains, gentlemen, when the heavens open, we all get wet. Oh, I, I think you're exaggerating the danger of this, Minister. Yes. Trust my experience, General. You're in my territory now. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to intrude. Well, that's all right, my boy. Your intervention might be quite timely. Come in, come in. Gentlemen, I'd like to meet my son, Owen. General Brewster, Hello. Lieutenant General Crump. Hello. 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 Now, sit down, my boy. My son was in the tropics when war broke out, and he traveled three or four thousand miles to fight in your war, General. Oh, I know you're rich and well, young man. They're a credit to us. Mm, he's just come back from the front on leave, and by pure coincidence, he was telling me about the sense of insecurity he felt about German shell fire. Uh, well, it's just that we feel we'd like to chuck just as much of the stuff back at them. Mm, when Owen heard that I'd been made Minister for Arms Production, his comrades um, made up a little grocery list. Grocery. Am I right, Owen? Grocery list? 
Oh, you yes, don't sir. happen to have it on you, my boy, do you? Uh, uh, let me see, Father. Um, keys, lighter. Uh, oh, the secret dresses. No, that's not it. There. Ah, oh, there it is. Yes, I've got it, Father. There you are. Ah, yes. Yes, it's all that different handwriting. Mm. Oh. I suppose most of your comrades are a hand in this. Mm. Uh, yes. Some of this is almost undecipherable. Mm. They were written in the front line, weren't they? Uh, yes. The word howitzers is written with a very shaky handwriting. Uh, Jackson was suffering from a bit of shell shock, I'm afraid, sir. Yeah, yeah. What are we going to do about this gentleman, eh? This crumpled bit of paper, grimy from the mud of the trenches, eh? written with a stub of pencil on a soldier's knee by the light of a guttering candle. Hmm? Look for yourself. Uh, quite, yes, sir. Yes. I shall deal with it. No, 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 no. Don't file it. I want to keep this little piece of paper. I've got a meeting at the Albert Hall on Sunday, and I'd like to be able to tell the people in that audience that this is the order I've received and to say that the good shall be delivered. Huh? Oh. They shall be delivered, gentlemen. I'll, uh, I'll tell Mother you're still engaged for the time being. You are doing. Well, gentlemen, shall we study these production charts? We've already seen them. How many machine guns do you think you need for each battalion, Brewster? Four as a maximum. I've marked 16. Now, do you seriously think that this is going to hinder your strategy? Oh. Now, no, don't tell me. Before you present me with any arguments, I think I ought to give you the benefit of one piece of strategy that I have acquired in my experience. Now, draw closer, gentlemen. Closer, huh? please. What is it? Now, this is what I want to tell you. You're doing this all wrong. Don't you see, if you put in an order for more equipment than I can supply you with, you can always blame me for your defeat. What? what? <laughs> I'm telling you something that you can use against me. Now, well, Brewster, how many machine guns do you want to order? We've based all our tactics on standard weights of equipment, Minister. Four. When you march, General, go forward, for God's sake. Yes, sir, we just don't trust those other firms. Do we trust them? No. For no, no. God's no, sake, man, you heard my son say we need more shells. Shells that may explode in our own trenches. Exactly. All right. I'm sorry to have to do this. Let me see that list of favoured firms, the old faithfuls. Well, we've given them to you. Uh, here, here's our copy. No, Brewster, you yourself have no personal interest in any of these firms, of course, but uh, do you happen to have a relative called Batherstock? Tom! Oh, him! Oh, yes, yes. Relative on my wife's side. Oh, let's see, I, I don't, don't, don't suppose I've seen him for a couple of years or so. Mm, I see the name Hamilton's listed as one of the firms we've been placing contracts with. Don't you feel it a little indiscreet for your relative to buy shares in that company? Damn it, man! What's it got to do with me? How do you think it would sound if there was a rumor to the effect that you resolutely refuse contracts to other firms? Oh. The one in which your wife's relative invests his money is favored by the war office. You're a bloody That's a wicked commander! I've got a thousand of shares in the Hamiltons. My sister's got shares in it myself. I'll oh. deal with you in a minute. Now listen. I know there's not a shred of connection between your favored firm policy and your wife's cousin's husband. But even if you two beat me up so that I have to crawl on my hands and knees to get there, I'll still get up in the house and tear every stitch off your backs. Now, uh, apologize. Uh, don't move. Why oh, are you talking to me? Don't move. It might run up your leg. What? what? A spider. Oh, no. Oh, well, well. Uh, oh, don't flap. It's gone oh, now. Oh, well, 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 down, well, Sam, for goodness sake. Don't you see he's pulled a flanker? There's no spider. No, no, uh, crap. Uh, are you sure? Oh, sit down, man. He's made a fool. No. Oh, I, I, uh, right. Gentlemen. <clears throat> You insisted on four machine guns, and I suggested 16. Let's compromise. 20. Ah, I'm setting our production targets at the same ratio. 500% increases. You'll have fortnightly reports as to our progress. All right. But we're placing a firm order for this slot, and if you're late with delivery, we'll nail you to the poles. I said, don't bother to see me out. Thank you, Father. And good day to you, too. <laughs> Success, Jason. <laughs> Agreement. Oh, Jason, what a villain I am. Sometimes I succeed in frightening myself. <laughs> I worked the spider. <laughs> Poor old Brewster. <laughs> oh, they deserve it, sir. <laughs> Congratulations. Good. <laughs> now, another thing, Jason. Caroline Bishop. Sir. Why did you engage her? Well, she had first-class qualifications, sir. Is anything wrong? Do you know she's a militant suffragette? Lord, no. 
Are you sure about that? Good heavens, I'll have to get rid of her at once. You think she'll want to stick a knife in my back, eh? Or was it uh, Charlotte Corday who butchered Mara when he was taking his bath? Well, I don't necessarily see it taking place on quite such an intimate occasion. Touché. Anyway, let me uh, have a look at the girl. I really think you shouldn't take such chances, Minister. Now, don't worry, my boy. I'll deal with her. Well, she's she's been waiting in the anteroom, sir. Mm-hmm. The uh, young lady, sir. Thank you, Jason. That'll be all for the moment. Hmm. Miss Bishop. Mm -hmm. Sit down, please, young lady. Jason told me that you're uh, an excellent statistician. Yes, sir. Mm. Send an official memo to the Director General of the Arms Production Committee. Mm. Sir. I am pleased to inform you that agreement has been reached with the general staff about our production targets. 500% increases in all categories of weapons to be delivered by yesterday, but earlier will be appreciated. Oh, congratulations, sir. Uh, Thank you, my dear. It is exciting. All categories of weapons? Everyone. What about ambulances? Ambulances? Uh, We'll send those to Kaiser Willy. I'll settle for guns. No. There's something I'd like to ask you, Miss Bishop. What is your opinion of women's role in the war effort? You know, we've plans to have the young women and housewives working in the factories. Do you really want to know what I think? I think it's a very fine mess you men have got us all into. And now, I suppose, we're being asked to show our appreciation and and loyalty by doing work that we've never been trained to do for wages far below what would be paid to the men. And afterwards, when we've helped to get you out of this mess, we'll be bundled back into the kitchen and the nursery and told that we're not really fitted to have a voice in our future and the future of our children. And then the whole thing will start all over again. Oh, my dear, you'll see that it will not be the same. (laughs) Mm. You know, last week I visited the old village where I was brought up... I wandered through the woods familiar to my boyhood. Now I saw a child gathering sticks for firewood, and I thought of the hours I spent in the same pleasant and profitable occupation. For I also have been something of a backwoodsman. And here is one experience taught me then, which is of use to me today. I learned as a child it was little use going into the woods after a period of calm and fine weather, for I generally returned almost empty-handed. But after a great storm, I came back with an armful. We are in for rough weather now. We may even be in for a winter of storms. It will rock the forest, break many a withered branch, and leave many a rotten tree turned up by the roots. But when the weather clears, you may depend on it there'll be something brought within the reach of the people that will give warmth and glow to their grey lives, something that will help to dispel the hunger, despair, the oppressions of the wrongs which now chill so many of their hearts. And women, who have so nobly rallied to our help, will share our right to lend their voice in the highest councils. Yes, Mr. Evans. And when women have the franchise, when that golden day breaks, I only hope that they will not lose their taste for wearing a pretty petticoat. Hmm? I hope he won't insist on the right of being a cement mixer. On the subject of femininity, some of my views are uh, decidedly old-fashioned. How are you going to do it? Mr. Evans. We're going to do it with a stiletto. Pills or a homemade contraption of glycerine and nitrates. Well, I don't understand you. How did you find out? When were you going to time it for? Derby Day? Michaelmas or Halloween? You knew all the time. Why didn't you have me arrested? <laughs> oh, you're not oh. such a desperate character after all, are you? Oh. Here, give your nose a good blow. Oh, now don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you. You mean you, you won't arrest me? Mm, I suppose you were determined to prove yourself a heroine. <laughs> I wasn't really going to blow you up. It, it was to be a demonstration of a suitable occasion. <laughs> I was the inside woman. But why did you calmly send for me when you knew that... Are you really a dangerous woman, <laughs> Caroline? How fascinating. Eh? Tell me, have you ever stood on top of Vesuvius? Hmm? 
I was in Naples when Vesuvius started getting lively again. All my hotel friends made a beeline to the nearest railway station, but I climbed <laughs> to the top of Vesuvius and stood at the mouth of the crater, listening to the rumblings and watching the black smoke and little spurts of fire like a huge angry cat licking its lips. <laughs> I think you'd have enjoyed it too. It was one of the most exhilarating moments of my life. Standing there singing Welsh hymns. Clever girl. I suppose that's why you love storms. Ah. Yes, of course. I've seen you go out in the rain, waving your shepherd's crook, with your cloak flying in the wind, looking like some terrible villain from Italian opera. But that's exactly what I am. <laughs> you know what I think, young lady? Instead of some noisy mob demonstration, you should try to make your point with feminine strategy. Did uh, Cleopatra tie us off the railings, eh? Did uh, Pompadour go on hunger strike? No, oh, they waggled their pretty bottoms once or twice, and before you could say hello, money, they had their hot little hands on everything they wanted. This isn't a personal opinion. Uh, Everybody knows about Cleopatra. Yes, sir, but please. Oh, don't you think the role of Mark Antony suits me? But please, Mr. Evans. I have to go now. Mm, yes, of course. You know, perhaps I'd better have some figures from you. Come to my study after dinner. Yes, Minister. Hello, Morgan Evans here. Um, may I speak to Sir Beerbohm Tree? Uh, Herbert? Yeah. Look, I want your advice. I'm speaking at the Albert Hall on Sunday. You know that damned echo. <laughs> Well, I want to project my voice so the words going out don't hit the words coming back. Yes, it's a barn of a place, I agree. Well, how would you cope? Hey, what do you know? This is all our stuff. Hey, I what have we got here? And I step foot! Sir. Yes, Jason. We've had a phone call. Just this minute. Yes. It's all over, sir. The campaign worked. Oh, I knew it. News from the palace is that the PM's resignation was handed in early this morning. <gasps> Thank God. At last, my hands are free. I had to do it. You know I had to do it, Jason. Yes, that's true. You're the only man for the job. You mean that? I swear it. You had to do it. I didn't do it alone, you know. No, I had tremendous allies. I think I can say we're all entirely disinterested. The proof is that they were from every party, right, left, and center. We had to form a united front. Fleet Street, that's where the power is. Friends in Fleet Street. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's easier to get rid of a prime minister than a general in wartime. That's a lesson we mustn't forget. The real work is before us. <laughs> well... I suppose I shall get a summons to the palace any time now. Uh, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, too. What is it? Uh, a newspaper man has got hold of the story of your affair with Caroline Bishop. Oh, damn and blast! Oh, never mind, it's not serious. Nobody will dare attack me now. I know, I know, but this newspaper man is stupid. He's a, a Welsh Anglican, and his editor is a Welsh Anglican. Oh, heaven help us! What am I to do? By the way, who is Caroline Bishop? You must remember, sir. Last year. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the suffragette. <laughs> Goodness, I took all the ginger out of her crusade, didn't I? <laughs> yes, you're right. It's no laughing matter. <laughs> Did I tell you that story about my feud with the Anglican bishop? <laughs> One night, our party planned a counterblast, and I appeared on the platform, and the chairman introduced me. He said, we all know that the Bishop of St. Asaph is the greatest liar in creation. But thank goodness, yes, we have in Mr. Morgan Evans a match for him tonight. <laughs> oh, these Anglicans. What are we going to do? Who is this writer? I thought it best to let you see him. Have a personal word. He's just arrived. Well, how much can he prove? Well, I don't suppose he can actually produce a photograph of you in bed with her. That's it. Brutal but true. Well, I had a word with him and he's certainly got some proof. 
Enough to write a piece, anyway. Do you think you would really dare do this to me at the present time? Oh, don't forget, sir, there's a whole army of VIPs in your own party, in the Tories, among the Labour backbenchers, who would be delighted to see you embarrassed, to say nothing of the general staff. Scandal brought down Parnell, Dilk. You haven't forgotten. Oh, what a curious world we live in. Here am I, the foster son of a shoemaker, who is about to become this country's war leader. I could only have achieved this on the simple grounds that I'm the only person fitted for this job. But because I relax after an 18-hour spell of work with a little slap and tickle in my study, social foundations tremble. The journalist, sir. He's 36, pompous, self-righteous, and a bit of a fool. He works for one of the Cardiff dailies. He seems to be flattered to be summoned to see you, but he won't easily be shaken. Mm. 36. Mm. And if he's a reporter and able to travel from Cardiff, he's uh, able-bodied, isn't he? What does the army have to say these days about an able-bodied young man of 36, Jason? Yes, sir. I didn't think of that. No, we'll have to do this very carefully. We'll have to cope with it with the hot and cold technique. You'll do the threatening, I'll do the bribing. I've got to be the hero, of course. All right. All right, that's one. Now, tell me as soon as there's any news from the palace... What else? Uh, oh, the generals are here, sir. Crump's brought his plans for the offensive. Yes, now, what's my opinion about that? Uh, well, I think it's a crackpot scheme, but then, of course, I'm only an amateur. Why do you say that? Well, he... He wants to attack through a reclaimed swamp. And in August, at the time when there's been regular monsoon weather for the last 30 years. Mm, he says that summer is the best time for an army to attack, and we're supposed to have the advantage of surprise by attacking through a reclaimed swamp... I mean, if you think it a crackpot scheme, then the Germans will probably think so too. Well, we've got the ordnance requirements all worked out in any case, haven't we? The departments have worked out all the requirements for supplies in every detail. Mm. Now, uh, listen carefully. I want you to make a mistake in them. A mistake? Yes, an unimportant one, but a mistake. In what, sir? Anything. Gumboots. Hmm. How many pairs of gumboots have you on order? Whatever it is, stick a knot on it. Very well, sir. And uh, when we discuss the figures in your presence, you'll have to draw my attention to it. I see. Well, <clears throat> yes, sir. All right, that's all, I think. Now, we'd better deal with this young fellow. What's his name, the reporter? Uh, his name is Hughes. Mm, and his first name? Hugh. Hugh Hughes. Mm, no jokes, Jason. If there's any jokes to be made, I'll make them. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> Morgan, you know you have these visitors again, the generals... Shall I give them a meal, or are you going to be busy with them? Oh, Catherine. Uh, I'd like to have a chat, my dear. Uh, yes, Lita Jason. Uh, let me know when you need me, sir. I have something to tell you, Cathy. What is it? What's wrong this time? My dear, there's nothing wrong, at least nothing serious. But there's something wonderfully right. The Prime Minister has handed in his resignation, and I expect a courier from the palace any time now. The Premiership? Darling, I think the King is going to ask me to form a new government. Oh, Morgan. You see, darling, all our years of struggle to be crowned, and I want you to know that I could not have done it without you. Morgan, my dear. Mm, it's not quite settled yet. You understand there are still difficulties and problems. I mean, some of the Prime Minister's friends in the Cabinet have sworn that they won't serve with me. What have they got against you? Oh, against me personally, nothing. But we come from a different background. I mean, these are old school friends of the Prime Minister. We are faced with jealousy and caste solidarity. But I can overcome it, and I shall. With your help. How can I help you? You can help. I'm going to be absolutely frank with you, Catherine. My enemies have tried to find every way to discredit me. They stopped at nothing, even to fabricated scandal about me. I mean, you know very well, my dear, how vulnerable a public man is. I mean, I've only got to exchange a polite word with a woman at the reception and tongues start wagging. I mean, how many times has that happened in the past? Oh, Morgan, not again. Now, don't misjudge me. You know, I only have to smile and those damned hussies start boasting that they made a conquest of me. What's happened this time? Well, there was a young woman on my staff. I haven't seen her for months now. She left at the beginning of this year. In fact, I could hardly remember who she was, and I was told about it. What uh, are they saying? Well, they're linking my name with hers. They've absolutely no proof whatever. All that happened was that when I was working late, as you know I have to, my dear, she invaded my study one night on the pretext that she wanted some letters signed. I went through the correspondence with her, and then she had to check something in one of the letters, so I took a short nap. I mean, you know how it happens. I can sleep anywhere. Well, I just put my feet up for five minutes, and... When I woke up, I found my tie unfastened and my shirt unbuttoned. I mean, she said she was making me comfortable. Well, I'm afraid that's how we were found together by another member of the staff. Oh, Morgan, what a terrible liar you are. 
Give me the Bible. No, no, I won't have you blasphemed. Give me the book. I shall swear by all that's holy. I won't have you adding any more sins to your conscience. All right, my dear, believe it or not as you will. But I've been in the front line for two years now. I fought the battles at home as well as those in France. I've had to fight every kind of bitter opposition. I've worked 20 hours a day. I haven't slept. I've gone without rest and every solace. Why? Am I a war profiteer? Am I a poster hero who basks in his artificial glory? Others have made millions out of the war or live with the sound of perpetual applause in their ears. I've just done a job of work. The king wants me to form a government. Am I doing this for ambition? Was it ambition that prompted me to give up the chancellorship for a new unknown ministry and involve myself in technicalities for which I had to go to school all over again? But I willingly made this sacrifice, and I ask as my right for sacrifices from you. Yes, my dear, sacrifice your pride, stifle your jealousy, forget that I'm a husband, and remember that I'm a pilot trying to navigate a storm never before experienced in the history of our country. You don't have to make speeches to me, Morgan, spare me your eloquence. I'll do what I must for Owen's sake. He's told me what we owe to you. Oh, my dear. What is it you wish me to do? Well, nothing, almost nothing. Well, there's a young man waiting for me in the study. Um, after I've interviewed him for a few minutes, all I want you to do is to uh, well, come in with a tray of coffee. Hmm? No. Oh, no, Morgan. Please. Don't touch me. Mr. Hugh Hughes. Oh, sir. indeed. From the Cardiff Echo, Minister. How... Uh, how do you do, sir? Oh, busy, very busy, Mr. Hughes, as you see. <laughs> we have to keep the pipelines flowing, don't we? Still, I always have time for my friends from the press. What can I do for you? Uh, no, 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 don't go, Jason. Mr. Evans, sir, this may sound like impertinence, but my editor has asked me to interview you about a certain matter of importance... In connection with your own personal life. My editor feels that in these days particularly, our leadership shall give an example of righteousness and uprightness. So many of us forget today when our physical well-being is in danger that it is our immortal soul which is important. Mr. Evans, sir, have you always followed the true path? Mr. Hughes, the minister isn't here to protest his honour. If you know anything to suggest that he is not an honourable and upright man, it is for you to prove. Otherwise, you must understand that that question is a damnable piece of impertinence. No, no, Jason. The young man is earnest and zealous, and obviously he's only doing his work as a good journalist. <laughs> There's nothing personal in all this, of course, Mr. Hughes. Oh, of course not, Mr. Evans. But I have my duty as a citizen and professional man to ask you this question. Well, my young friend, as you ask me, on behalf of your Welsh readers, you obviously have a right to know these things. And the answer is that there is nothing whatsoever on my conscience. Come to the point, Hughes, of what are you accusing, Mr. Evans? I'm afraid it is immoral behaviour with a certain young lady formerly a member of Mr. Evans's personal staff. Have you any proof? I regret to say yes. We have corroborative information from another member of Mr. Evans's domestic staff. Oh, he's talking about Caroline Bishop, Minister. She was on our staff, that is true. Caroline Bishop? Mm. Uh, do I know the girl? Well, she left our employment almost a year ago, Minister. I doubt whether you will even remember her. Mm. Who's the other person? Oh, somebody else we had to dismiss. She was directed from a rather redundant sinecure post to uh, factory work. Well, Mr. Hughes, that doesn't amount to very much, does it? <laughs> How well do you know these people? Well, it is true I've, I've only known them a short while. Ah, you mean since they brought you the story. Do you know that that woman, Caroline Bishop, was a militant suffragette and a sworn enemy of Mr. Evans? Do you know that the suffragettes tried to murder Mr. Evans in his own home, that they planted a bomb? And as a result of this criminal piece of folly, members of their organisation were sentenced at the Old Bailey to terms of imprisonment? Oh, but that wasn't Miss Bishop. I've checked her background and know nothing against her. She has no criminal record. Nor all. have many other sworn enemies and opponents of Mr. Evans. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't stoop to all sorts of devices to prevent him from doing his indispensable work effectively. You know, this matter is really more simple than it may seem. I have a large staff here. Yeah? Because of the war, it is predominantly feminine. But Mrs. Evans has never seen fit to object to the presence of these ladies in my home. Oh, I think you'll have to find some rather stronger proof than what you've told us about. If you don't prove such an accusation up to the hilt, Mr. Hughes, 
I can promise you that both you and your paper will have the biggest libel damage claim in the history of Welsh journalism. No, no, Dresden, my boy, there's no need for any of this. I'm sure Mr. Hughes is a reasonable man. He's entirely disinterested. All he wants is to see that justice is done and the high standards that one expects from our leaders are maintained as an example to the community. I'd like to have it clear from you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Evans has denied this accusation in respect of Caroline Bishop and this other person. Do you give us your assurance that you accept this? I shall report what you have said, Mr. Evans. But naturally, I am not authorized to give any assurance that my editor will not print my article. I understand, Mr. Hughes, that you are 36. Uh, yes. And you obviously seem to be able-bodied. Oh. Well, Is there any particular reason for your military deferment? Jason. No, no. Really? Excuse me, Minister, but I must insist on this. Mr. Hughes has questioned your character. Mm, that's true. Well, what's your explanation, Mr. Hughes? I don't have to give an explanation about that. I've already appeared before an official tribunal and satisfied them about my objections to fighting in the war on uncertain religious grounds. Mm. Let me see. Fighting in the war. Uh, Jason? Yes, sir. Aren't we forming a special corps of stretcher bearers? Oh, quite right, Minister. Brave fellows. Genuine pacifists, but honorably serving their country in an entirely non combatant way there. Amid flying shrapnel and whistling bullets, they succor their wounded comrades in the heat of battle. Oh, no, no. That should satisfy your immortal soul, Mr. Hughes. Uh, no, no, Jason. I think this must be left to Mr. Hughes's conscience. Nevertheless, I think I'll drop a line to Mr. Hughes' editor about this special corps. You know, Minister, how often you've been reproached about protecting young, able-bodied men when middle-aged family men have been called up. Mm. Yes, it is a problem. Nevertheless, if I have genuine proof of this accusation, Mr. Evans, I feel honor bound to do my journalistic duty. Well, exactly, Mr. Hughes, if you have genuine proof, but what does that amount to? I mean, are we going to take as gospel the gossip of two rather disgruntled females who've been directed from rather comfortable jobs to factory work? I approve of your high journalistic standards. It is a rare and refreshing thing these days. And I'd much rather see you carve an honorable career for yourself for the future. Oh, I don't want to send you into battle, Mr. Hugh Hughes. I'd rather have you in who's who. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Mum. Oh, please don't get up. I am sure you would like a hot drink after your long journey, Mr. Hughes. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, my dear. Thank you, ma'am. I'll leave you, gentlemen. Uh, no, 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 Cathy, my dear, don't leave. Uh, I'd like you to stay and meet Mr. Hughes. He's from Cardiff. Oh, really? We have many friends there, Mr. Hughes. We always welcome our friends when they're in foreign parts. <laughs> Mr. Hughes has asked me a rather personal question, Catherine. It's in connection with a young lady who was on my staff about a year ago. Do you remember her? A Caroline Bishop. No. No, no, I don't. I, I'm afraid I know nothing about her. But Mr. Hughes seems to think that I do. Well, come along, Mr. Hughes. You had a certain accusation to make about this young lady. Well, would you kindly repeat it? I... Uh... Milk and sugar, Mr. Hughes? No. Uh, yes, two lumps, please. Well, Mr. Hughes? No, no, Minister. I, I've decided I, I, I've nothing to ask you. Uh, th thank you for granting me an interview, Mr. Evans. I have a long journey... And I, I... I think I ought to be on my way. Oh, I do understand. Now, look after yourself, young man. The slush on the roads is very treacherous. This way, Mr. Hughes. Oh, Catherine, uh, no, let me help you. No, no, I can manage. Uh, Leave me be, Morgan. There's nothing more for us to say to each other. Just open the door for me. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Evans. May I help you with that? No. 
Next case, Jason. Uh, don't forget, gum boots. Yes, sir. What are you grinning at? Mr. Hugh Hughes, I'd much rather have you in who's who. <laughs> yeah, all right, sir. Gum boots. Now, that's it. Now, one other thing. If the king's messenger arrives, interrupt us. And I want full drill with fanfares, general proclamation, and a ten-gun salvo. Yes, of course. You won't hear their groans for bursting rockets. This way, gentlemen. <coughs> Good day, Mr. Good day, Good day Minister. Minister. Gentlemen, gentlemen, now please be seated. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you. Now, I understand there's only one thing on the oh. agenda today. Crump's offensive project. It's about time we had your approval of that, uh, Minister. Yeah, well, well, I've given you the guns, and so now you're anxious to use them on me. Oh, we've got to get out of the doldrums, Minister. This stalemate must end, or we'll be defeated by sheer boredom. Well, I must tell you frankly, gentlemen, that I'm sceptical about our capacity to launch an offensive. I don't like the idea of launching it in a reclaimed swamp where the irrigation system can be smashed up after a few gun barrages. Uh, We've been over all that, Minister. Yes, the whole beauty of the scheme, <clears throat> if I may say so, is that no one will expect us to launch our attack at that particular time and place for the very reasons you've given and we'll have the inestimable advantage of surprise. Exactly. Mm, let's see, Brewster. As a matter of interest, do you recall how many machine guns you said you needed as a maximum? Oh, that's not oh that was some time ago. Mm. And I remind you, four, you said. Four. And I had to trick you into agreeing to 20. How many machine guns are we equipping our battalions with these days? Forty-eight. <sighs> Need you feel surprised, gentlemen, when I point out to you that I have good reason for thinking that you tend to underestimate your requirements, particularly for an offensive. And you, sir, are the better judge of military problems than we are. Do you really want me to answer that? Ah, uh, come, gentlemen, no, let's bicker about past differences. We've acknowledged our great indebtedness to your work in the arms ministry. All we're saying now is that the wonderful flow of arms has made it possible for us to crack down on the enemy and smash him. You sir. think that the Germans haven't been able to match our flow of arms? What assurance can you give me that we have an advantage in weight of armor? It is not necessary to have a total preponderance of weapons. Right, the whole sir. point about the strategy, if I may be allowed, is to have the initiative in attack. And for that, local superiority of firepower is all that's required. We don't have to break through the entire front, Minister. No. Look here, let me show you, sir. Now, now, look here. There, there, and there. Now, these three parts of the front are the only ones at which it is necessary to achieve a breakthrough. Now, in 48 hours, Minister. Hmm? Yes, that's what I said. In 48 hours, our concentrated bombardment and infantry attacks will achieve the rupture. Before the irrigation districts are churned up and before the weather bogs us down in the mud, our cavalry will be through and then... Havoc! Hmm? We will roll the Germans back into the North Sea. General, <laughs> if wars could be won by making speeches, then I'd be confident that with your assistance we could make rings around the Germans. Uh. But we are dealing with the lives of our countrymen. Oh. It's no good. I told you it was no good, Samuel. No, no. It has to sink in. Got to be digested. Digest is no good. He'll never agree. We're wasting our time. What's all this? Good day to you, Minister. This is the last you'll see of this little scheme. But I promise you it won't be the last you'll hear of it. What's up, General? What are you trying to say? Don't use tactics with me, if you please. You had several weeks to make your mind up about this. My view is that you are not able to make a decision. Not able to make a decision? No, Minister. Out with it. Out with it! What are you trying to say? I've said all I want to. What's he getting at? If I may speak plainly, Minister, this is no reflection on you personally. Please don't think that we're questioning your moral courage, but the general feeling at headquarters is that a war minister with your strong bias for peace and humane consideration will never give us our chance to launch a necessary offensive. Right. You mean my anti-war campaign during the Boer War, is that it? Damn it, man, I took more personal risks to myself in my peace campaign than you're ever likely to meet in conducting your war. This is not a criticism of your personal courage. No, 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 I'm not calling you a conscious, sir. All I'm saying is that you're so damn mixed up in your humane views that you're totally unfitted to make a decision which involves total war. 
You over-identify yourself with the man on the front lines, Minister, which may be damn good humanity, but is thoroughly bad soldiering. He's quite right, sir. The back of your mind is the fear, the sensitiveness to loss of life. It's not that we don't personally respect you for this, but uh, as a war minister, we think you'd make a damn fine minister of health. <laughs> That's the best thing he said his week. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I'll put my cards on the table. I am afraid. I am frightened, I admit it. When this war started, I had a tussle with my conscience whether I should retire from politics altogether. I have imagination. I dream of bloodstains on my pillow. Is that bad? Is it bad to fear responsibility for millions of lives? Is it really better to be like you, to play with the lives of men like pieces on a chessboard? Which of us is better fitted to make a decision? The answer is very simple. It's a question of arithmetic, isn't it? Better to lose 30,000 men in a single, bold, constructive offensive than to fritter away 100,000 lives in useless stalemate. Right, right, That's right. the decision you are faced with. But you can't stand up to its logic. Uh, well. well, there it is, Minister. I don't think there's any further point in staying. 30,000 men. Is that your estimate of our losses? It's not merely my estimate, Minister. 30,000. Three divisions given a ration more or less. These are the pieces. And for that, a complete breakthrough. A couple of pawns for a queen, to use your comparison. There's no need to search your heart any longer in these circumstances. We've consulted every expert, Minister. Every field technician, eh? You give me your word that your statisticians are entirely in accord with this? Absolutely. I'll get the files. <sighs> Let's see the figures. I want everything. All the reports, every computation. Oh, certainly, yeah. I have the papers here. Now, Jason, <laughs> I want the ordnance and logistics file for General Crump's operation. Yes, sir. Uh, here you are, Minister. Yes, it's all very neat, very reassuring. I want to make one final appeal to you. For the sake of our men at the front, for the sake of their wives and mothers, I put to you for the last time, are these the true estimates of our requirements to achieve a victorious offensive against the Germans in France? I've given you our assurance. No collective promises. I want yours and General Brewster's, and I want the signature of every man who had a hand in this report. You have my assurance, Minister, and you shall have all the signatures you ask for. A breakthrough in 48 hours and no more than a loss of 30,000 lives? I've already said so, haven't I? Brewster? Yes, I agree with that estimate. The file of the operation, sir. Mm. On the question of supplying your needs, gentlemen, we haven't been altogether indecisive, as you will judge for yourself. These reports have also been ready for several weeks. Ordnance, munitions, transport, kit, down to the last roll of lavatory paper. Oh, splendid. Jason, they've been checked, of course. Yes, sir. By you two. Uh, more than a week's work, sir, if you remember. No errors, no miscalculations. No, sir. Uh, well, there was, there was one slight error, uh, but it only concerned gum boots. Gum boots. <laughs> Uh, Gumbo? Yes, sir. A, a minor matter, a mere typing slip, which I've since corrected in ink, as you can see here. A typist made a mistake in the noughts. A mistake in the noughts? Yes, sir. In the noughts, Jason? Sir, Fire! Uh, sir? Fire the whole department! Minister! Every able-bodied person to the front! But they're all over 50, including the women! I don't care if they're great-grandfathers! Do you know what it means to make a mistake in the noughts in time of war? Well, what do you suppose the Germans would do? They'd call it sabotage, treason! Yes. It would mean the firing squad! Yes. A mistake in the noughts? Yes, 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 yes sir. Uh, excuse that uh, touch of irritability, gentlemen, but I'm sure you'll agree that it was necessary. Uh, there is no margin for error in these times. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, we shall make a last uh, thorough check before we... Uh, you can pour me a stiff one too, Bristol. Yes, of course. Uh, are you, Minister? No, thanks. Now, have a quiet drink, gentlemen. I'm sure we have plenty to think about. I am compelled to interrupt you, Minister. Something important? Sir, will you be attendant on the King's messenger, if you please? Mr. Franklin Brown, 
Courier of His Majesty. Gentlemen. Come in, sir. I am pleased to receive you. Mr. Morgan Evans, His Majesty has ordered me to hand to you this personal document and requested me to await your answer. At once. Would you convey to His Majesty my compliments and inform him that I shall be privileged to attend on him at Buckingham Palace at 1 o'clock p.m. tomorrow, Thursday the 18th, as requested. Thank you, sir. Jason, offer this gentleman the hospitality of my home, and when he is ready to do so, speed him on his way. I am obliged to you, sir. Well, of course, it's an open secret by now... You've heard that the PM resigned this morning? So that's it. That's it, gentlemen. I don't think I'm speaking too optimistically, but I think that next time we meet, it may be at number ten. You? Well, I... Yes. Well, we have plenty to do. Yes, you, know, you won't stay to dinner? Well, another time, if not now. Uh, goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye, goodbye sir. Yes, sir. Ah, Owen! A break on this. I've just heard that little reception. Our congratulations in order. How does it feel to be the son of a prime minister at a time when history with a capital H is being made? Well, it's it's impossible to appreciate or, or believe that it's really taking place. Yes. Ah, oh, thanks. Better days. Better days. <sighs> Do you remember when we lived at number 11? I think so. <laughs> I was an engineer working at Tilbury in those days, remember? I do. I used to come back to Downing Street in my working clothes. And one day I was just turning up from Westminster Underground when I was confronted by a barrier of police. The whole of the traffic was held up because of some VIP do. I tried to get past, but the cops wouldn't let me through. But I'm Owen Morgan Evans, the son of the Chancellor. I live at number 11. <laughs> And I'm Mary Pickford, said the cop. <laughs> <laughs> it was no use. No one would believe me. After a while, I began to doubt it myself. Mm. I always doubt it. I'm the son of a village shoemaker. I'm told that this humility is no good. Power, high office, should be ruthless, confident. What do you think? That it's only those frightened of power who are fitted for it. I suppose we ought to celebrate. After Thursday, that is. Yes, you ought to Invite one or two people. Yes, of course. A quiet at home, but a small circle of select friends. James Barry. Uh, Melba. Yes, of course. I suppose I've got a company here on the piano. And that lovely dancer they're all raving about. What's her name? Uh, Pavlova. Yes. yes. And Dan Lino for the fun of it. And Beerbum Tree. <laughs> Do you like power, Father? A little. No, a lot. But it frightens me, too. And that's good. I'll go and tell Mother. Or, or would you rather tell her yourself? You can tell her. But pretend that I don't know that you told her. She'd like to hear it from us both. Put your feet up while I go and tell her. Who's that? Oh, Mr. Evans, may I come in? Oh, who is it? Oh, it's you again, Inspector. What are you doing prowling about in the garden? Yes, come in, come in. Well, what is it? What is it this time? Sir, you don't happen to have on your staff a young female by the name of O'Connor. O'Connor? I only know their Christian names. What about her? Middle height, nice build, red hair, speaks with a slight Dublin accent. She's not. Sir, I have reason to believe that the IRA secret tribunal have sentenced members of the British <laughs> government to death by assassination, and it is my duty to warn you. <laughs> Janie, Janie, I'm here. Owen. Oh, you're a brick to mix with this mob here. I could have met you at Scott's. Oh, I couldn't wait. Let's have a look at you. Oh, oh. Janie. Will you be staying over in town before going to Checkers? I've got tickets for the show at Daly's and the table is booked too. First, let's take a quiet spin in Hyde Park. I'd like to get some London air in my lungs. Is it just bad out there, as they say? Then let's talk about it. I say, isn't that old Tom Williams on that soapbox? He's a dreadful man. He makes all those anti-war speeches. He was one of my father's staunchest chums in the old days. He used to face all the broken bottles on the platforms of the pacifist meetings. Oh, let's drive on, please. You must be tired of war and politics. Oh, 
Hello there. Jason. Owen. Where is everybody? Uh, well, your mother has gone for a short rest to Wales. We hadn't heard about your leave before she left. How are you? Where's the old man? Uh, well, he's having a short leave, too. While smothers away. What's going on? Where is he? Oh, he's here, but I don't think it's possible to disturb him. Upstairs? Let's take it easy. Now, you can't make any rules about a man like your father. He, he's got to be a law unto himself. A fine bloody home, Cousin <coughs> Owen, sit down. Now, there's no point in wearing yourself out over this sort of thing. I'm not preaching. I'm, I'm just plain damn frightened. Does he know what's going on out there, the bloody mess we're in? Of course he does. Much better than you do. Well, then it makes it mucking worse. That's all I can say. Mucking worse. Listen, listen. The old man's got everything under control. Everything. He's been working 20 hours a day. He's not a machine. He's got to relax in his own way. <laughs> How long has he been on leave? Two nights and a day. I suppose the traffic on the staircase has been worse than bloody Piccadilly. He can handle it. He's as strong as a buffalo, Owen, and you know it. He's seen Crump in a little while... He's due to arrive at any time, and I can promise you this. He'll be ready for him. This is the crisis. You say he's as strong as a buffalo. But a time will come when even his strength will pack in. These 40-hour jags of his would half kill a normal man. It's, it's frightening. Forget your blind love of a man and see it straight. I, I wanted to see him, to talk to him. I've been making up my mind what to say. Do you know what the men call it? Crump's flypaper strategy. We're up to our eyes in it, stuck there in the mud. Sitting bloody clay pigeons for everything Jerry can throw at us. Why don't they put a stop to it? We've been fighting 50 days and we've advanced two miles. At this rate, it'll take us 60 years to get to Berlin. We know all about that. Your father's been to France. He's seen everything. He's been everywhere. Talk to privates in the line as well as the French general staff. There's nothing he hasn't done. Has he got rid of Crump? That butcher's cost us the lives of hundreds of thousands of men. A year ago I told Father to get rid of him. Don't you suppose he knows about Crump? Don't you know that he's fought everybody in the cabinet about getting rid of him? Everybody. They're all scared stiff that it would, it would bring down the government and lead to a military junta. The press are behind Crump. Even the old man can't sack the whole of Fleet Street. And Crump's even got friends in the palace. How does one get rid of a, a soldier hero in wartime? What's your formula for that? Why in God's name are the press behind Crump? Don't they know what's going on? Are they blind? Are they no war correspondents? Crump has told them we are killing more Germans Trump than... Crump and his phony statistics. What's happened? Has he been able to arrange an exchange of chartered accountants with the Hun? How can anyone believe such bloody lies? Don't you see? They want to be blind. They have to be. This has got to be a victory. We can't admit all these sacrifices have been in vain. <laughs> well, that's it then. To maintain the bloody myth of General Crump, our boys have to drown in the mud to get butchered on the barbed wire by the thousand every hour on the hour. Owen, Owen. I swear to you, the old man's doing everything humanly possible to put an end to it. Crump has been summoned here. There's going to be a battle royal. I don't know what your father has up his sleeve, but I know it's bound to be one of his master strokes. <laughs> don't take any notice of this, this interlude upstairs. He'll give General Crump the fight of his life. Yes, if he has any strength left. Well, this is fine. Wonderful. I'm famished. Jason, meat, ring for Jesse. Yes. Give me a good rare beef steak. Owen, oh, my boy, another leave, splendid. Take your coat off, Father. Good. Your jacket, take it off. I want to prove something to you. Ah. Sit down. <laughs> now, give me your hand. You're going to put my hand down this time, eh? Well, maybe... <clears throat> Three years in the fighting services may well have put snap in your braces. Uh, Jason? Sir? Crump arrived yet? Not yet, sir. That's it, my boy. Press on. I want to see him directly he arrives. Yes, sir. Messages, phone calls? Uh, Northcliffe phone, sir. Mm. I told him you were 
Resting. <laughs> oh, a grip of iron the boy's got. Infantry life, eh, son? But your strategy isn't much good, no. You never make your all-out effort at once whilst I'm fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been beaten at this yet. Winston was champion of the cabinet, but I was champion of the house. <laughs> Old John Burns, the docker, used to wrestle like a bear. Never did him any good. Oh, Jesse, uh, yeah. the master wants a good meal. Quickly, he's hungry. Uh, yes, sir. What will you have, Mr. Everett? Ah, now, let's see. Uh, one infantry general, well-grilled, <laughs> and a couple of ripe cavalry colonels, rare for entree. As for pudding... Uh, how about you, my dear? Oh, no. Yes, sir. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, I'll get you something. Yeah. What did Northcliffe want, Jason? I, uh, I told him you couldn't come to the phone, and he said, All right, you'll do. Just give him a message from me. Say that I heard he's been trying to interfere in strategy. If there's any more of it, I'll break him. Damned insolence. <laughs> the king of Fleet Street. <laughs> Crump runs to him every time he's in trouble. Now, oh, in my boy, would you like to try again? Like a rock. Like a damned ruddy rock. Hey. Uh, anyone waiting for me? Uh, Tom Richards is in the library. Oh, Tom. Wonderful. I thought he was in jail. Well, if you remember, sir, you told Tom when he was put in jail for his anti-war speeches that you hoped when he came out he'd have breakfast with you. I said that? Yes, sir. Well, there you are, then. Put out an extra plate. Got oh. you, Owen. <laughs> I think I've pulled a muscle. Oh, it, it's a trick. No one can be as strong as that. How did I do it, then? Uh, I, th I think it's, it's the way you hold your arm at an angle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's it. So that the, the harder I press, the more firmly I push your elbow against the desk, the old cantilever principle. Good boy, you spotted it. <laughs> See, they always tire themselves out after a while, and then I make my counterattack. You seen Crump. Mm. What about a bit of psychology there? Put his hand down. <laughs> Challenge him to a duel across the desk with his jacket off. <laughs> what do you make of that, Jason, eh? If they stare on me long enough, some of it wears off on them, doesn't it? <laughs> I've got to take my bath. Uh... Stay for a while, my boy. Your uh, mother isn't here at present. You're not feeling lonely, father. Would it surprise you to know that I always feel lonely without your mother in the house? Uh, Minister, I, I think I'll go and get on with the paperwork. Yes, my dear. Well, Owen, I don't have to ask how you are. You've given me the toughest contest since old Docker Burns. Are you going to get rid of Crump? That's my contribution to the war effort, my boy. But can you, with, with Northcliffe, with the palace? I got rid of Brewster, didn't I? Yes. Father, why did Mother leave? Why did she go this time? Don't lecture me, for God's sake. Don't question the way I fight my own private war against tiredness and every bone in my body, against frustration and fear and sheer nausea. It's my way of getting drunk to forget. Besides, the temptation is rather too much for me. And wasn't it Oscar who said he could resist anything except temptation? <laughs> and if you protest, I think you're jealous. As they all are who vilify me. Is it my fault I'm absolutely irresistible to women? They're all jealous of my success with the ladies. Are you sure you're successful with women? Isn't it they who are successful with you? What do you mean? Now, what the hell do you mean by that? Is it you, Morgan Evans, the man they really fall for? Not the legend, the myth, the powerhouse of Whitehall and Downing Street? How long can you carry on like this? How much can your physique stand? Five years? Ten? You don't see me through for what I have to do to help win the war. And afterwards... It'll all be in the melting pot by then. You'll be needed. All your experience and guile and drive and imagination. Every man must fight his own private war with himself in his own way, Owen. That's what we have to do. We always have to fight on two fronts. On two fronts. Father, you look all in. Hmm? You're not worried about me? I'm going to have my bath. 
How are you feeling, sir? Oh, I'm all right. What's on your mind? Well, come on, let's have it. What trouble's been brewing whilst I've been away? What's the latest crisis? Yes? Oh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Just a moment, please. It's you know who. Hmm? Hello? Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, I'm offering you the post. No? <laughs> Not good enough, eh? <laughs> All right, I know it's a junior job. What can you expect? They're all dead against any sort of job for you. What? what? Look, if you take that cigar out of your mouth for a couple of minutes, I'll be able to hear it. All right, all right. Eh. What about the Ministry of Armaments? Will that satisfy you? Good. <laughs> Leave it to me. You meant to offer him that all along, didn't you? Oh, now, Jason, let's have it. What's been happening? Just list the danger spots. Sir, I don't know if you're fully aware of the extent of the opposition to having our friend here back in the government. After the Dardanelles... Don't give me history lessons, I Jason. remind you that you've canvassed every member of the government. A coalition, sir, that includes all parties, and even your staunchest friends oppose the appointment. And within the last day or two, more than a hundred members have put questions on the order paper. The Albert Hall has been hired for a mass meeting of protest. Dozens of others are being organised all over the country. The generals and the admirals are also dead against it, sir. Dead against it. Now I know I must be right. Finally, sir. Finally? May I contribute my view to this? I don't see how I can possibly stop you. Besides, everyone else has. Well, may I say this then, sir? There's no one in the government who could possibly challenge your leadership... But if he joins the cabinet in your old job, armaments, you'll have a dangerous rival. I know that. Well, then, sir, if you know all that, then, for heaven's sake, why? For a very old-fashioned reason, but one for which I don't propose to apologize. He's a friend who's proved his friendship and loyalty to me. Mr. Evans... See. Is that all, Jason? Yes. I suppose that is all. The, oh, the uh, the general has arrived, sir. Good. Show him in. Sir. Now, what is it? I've known you for more than ten years. And I realize that I've never really understood you. Till now. May I take your hand? How do you do, Jason? Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. General Crump, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister. My apologies for the delay, but His Majesty was kind enough to ask me to uh, stay at lunch. Well, sit down, sit down. Don't fuss. I wanted you to see this. Latest reports from HQ. Mm, an expert <coughs> sale executive general doesn't immediately produce his samples. A bad joke, Prime Minister. Not in the best of taste. If I may say so. Um, you don't make me lose my temper so easily. I'll choose my own time to have a row with you. Sit down. You don't want to see these reports. I don't want to see your stories. I can read all the fiction I want in Lord Northcliffe's rags. You're being offensive, sir. In that case, I hope I succeed better than you do, General. I haven't come here to suffer your insults. Now sit down. Ah. I have something important to tell you. Uh, very well. I sent for you, Crump to tell you that the War Cabinet has approved my plan for a supreme Allied Council representing all our Allied nations. All strategy is to be coordinated by them in future. You, you are a supreme war command run by foreigners? Is that the idea? It will be run by generals best fitted to command, irrespective of their nationality. Has it been approved by the War Cabinet? Yes, it has. It will... Then why the devil wasn't I told about this before? Aren't I entitled to know about such schemes? And why wasn't I invited to, 
to give my views of the cabinet. You're not a member of the war cabinet. This concerns me, my work, my campaign in France. You're not a member of the war cabinet. You have deliberately gone behind my back, sir, and presented me with a fait accompli. That's typical, my goodness, typical of what I, I've had to put up with. A supreme command created over my head without my knowledge, without, without a chance of... Give my views. You're not a member of the war cabinet. So that's it, sir. Yes. You think you can you can build a pontoon over me and bypass all my efforts? Mm, that's well put. That's very well put, General. And where does this leave me, do you think? I'm supposed to be head of the armed forces of the Empire. Are British fighting men to be at the mercy of foreigners and their schemes? If there's anything you seriously disagree with in the supreme allied planning, you have the right to appeal to the British government. To you? Uh, fact will help very be to me. I am the elected constitutional head, General. No, no, I will not put up with it. I demand a right to sit on this council myself. Well, uh, that's possible. Mm. You, uh, you agree to that? Uh, then, then I don't want it. Oh, yes, I, I see it all now. If I, if I go and sit on the Allied Council, you'll appoint a new field commander, and he'll have the real authorities. And your approval to reject my strategy. If I remain in the field, then those damn frog eaters will clamp down on everything I want to do. Yes, that's it, isn't it? You create a, a special military house of lords to kick me upstairs into it. If I won't go... You'll give them the real authority. It's diabolical. That's what it is, sir. Diabolical. You're a schemer. Well, I won't stand for it. You may not be aware, but there are still one or two people who have confidence in me, sir. Two can play at this sort of game. Let me tell you this. At lunch today, the king said to me, Francis, he said, Francis, I was deeply moved by the press announcement of the latest success in the field. You dare threaten me? Threat, sir? I am merely reporting a private conversation about the latest communiques announced in the press. You think you can frighten me with your Fleet Street friends? How dare you? How dare you, I say, threaten the head of government? But you'll find that I, I, I don't make idle threats. Mm, one of your friends from Fleet Street was good enough to warn me not to interfere in strategy. I'll show you how I deal with threats. Jason! Now, what will you do to my friends, eh? Will, will, will you fire him, create a supreme allied editorial board, I suppose, for delinquent newspaper editors, eh? Or, or, or do you really think that you can fight the very public opinion which you were good enough to explain was responsible for your appointment as Prime Minister? Sir. Got your notebook, Jason? Mm. Yes, sir. Mm. General, your friend from Fleet Street left a message telling me that if I don't watch out, he'll break me. Such insolence, I think you'll agree, needs to be punished. Your friend must be taught a lesson in future, not to leave such messages. Jason, we won't be too severe this time. Six of the best will suffice to impress the lesson. I send a memo to the Ministry of Supply. I think we've discovered that we need quite a lot of wood pulp for the war effort. What does one need wood pulp for militarily? Cartridge paper, sir. Splendid. That will do splendidly. Devilish devil. paper. Mm. Tell the Ministry of Supply to divert half the tonnage that goes to the paper mills to the Ordnance Department. The gentlemen of the press will have to do with rather smaller news sheets from now on. I think this may have the unfortunate effect of cutting down their profits from advertising revenue. Mm. How much do you think Lord Northcliffe would lose by this general? Five million a year? Ten? No. Oh. An expensive message, wouldn't you say, Jason? Yes, sir. You were saying, General? Oh, all right. All right. You're strong enough to twist Northcliffe's arm, eh? You're head of the government. But, but I would remind you that we are a monarchy. You haven't heard the last word in all this. Oh, no, Prime Minister. I seem to recall that Cromwell was a Welshman. Prime Minister! I How will... dare you threaten me with your palace intrigues? Why in God's name don't you use some of that strategy of yours to fight the Germans instead of the French general staff and me? Do you think I'll be your Judas goat forever out there? Forty-eight hours, you said. Forty-eight hours and we'll break through the German lines and start rolling them back into the North Sea. That was more than forty-eight days ago. Where's your breakthrough? 
30,000 men, you said. Less than three divisions will be sacrificed to achieve victory. We've lost 300,000 men so far, and we are still floundering in the mud. I remind you that two of the fighting men out there are my sons. A father is a tiger general. Victories. Victories. Lies. Lies. I warn you to speak softly and think carefully from now on. You've still got your job. You're still the great soldier hero. I won't take the glitter off your Wellington boots. But remember what I tell you now. When you go to war, General, pick your enemies very carefully. Someone you have a chance of beating. Because I fight dirty. I never went to Eton. My game isn't cricket. I know a few holes and low tackles you never dreamed of. Now pick up those papers and leave. The interview is over. I'll send you the war cabinet's new orders tonight. Damned upstart. Damned upstart. Minister? Minister? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, it's you just... Mm. He's gone, sir. Please don't stand out in the garden in your slippers. It's wet. It's all right. Just sit down and rest a moment. Must have been a tough meeting. Uh, your meal is ready. Shall I arrange for a tray here? <sighs> You're shivering. I'll fetch you a shawl, shall I? No, 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 no. You mustn't let them see me like that. Look, Mr. Evans, old Tom Richards is waiting to see you. Now, why don't you, why don't you have a drink with him for old Lang Syne, eh? He, he always had the trick of... Taking you out of yourself. I'll be all right in a little while, Jason. Well, if if you don't feel like eating now, how about a snort? Eh? Oh, you're a good fellow, Jason. I've I've cleared the decks. No more appointments at all for the rest of the day. I've stopped all incoming calls. After what you've been through today, there can't be anything important. How did it go? Crump looked as though he'd collided with a tank. I wanted to tell him to explain what I'd seen out there. What happened to me out there. But I was afraid to. Afraid I might lose control. Misery. Grey hell. Quicksand. The tattered, bleeding corpses on the barbed wire. Like bait on a hook. I said to the young soldier who was showing me the battlefield, Good God, can it be true? Is it really like this? And he said to me, It's worse further along. <laughs> it's worse further along. Sir, old, uh, old Tom has some very funny stories about his rest cure in Brixton. <laughs> How do they treat him there, eh? Oh, good old Tom. We used to be on the same platform at one time. <laughs> Remember my pacifist days during the Boer War, Jason? The peace meetings, great stuff. Yeah. Pitched battles in front of the town hall in Birmingham and Bristol. Broken bottles, knuckle dusters. <laughs> <laughs> but you beat them, remember? <laughs> yes, I was a pacifist in those days, and the broken heads didn't matter because I believed in that fight with all my heart. Why are people like that, Jason? I wanted to save them, bloodshed in a useless war. Them and their brothers and their sons. And they turned on me like wolves. If only I could be sure. You're sure, Jason, that it is a threat to our homeland. and Not like the other one, for a share of empire loot. If only I could be certain... You see, Jason, there are always two conflicts, not one. Every man has to fight a war on two fronts, and the hardest enemy to defeat is the one you can't see. What's that? Sounds like gunfire. Another air raid on the coast, I should think. Yes, a raid, all right. Open the French windows, Jason. Yes, sir. 
funny. All that gunfire. And the birds are still singing. I can hear them still in the rookery. Sir, I'd like to open the champagne. Champagne? You got champagne, have we? Yes. The French Premier sent us a case with his compliments after your last visit to France. Well, that's nice. That's nice of him. I'll open a bottle for you. <laughs> Give it to old Tom. He's earned it, I think. <laughs> they don't get very strong tea in Brixton, I'm told. That caviar for the Tsar of Russia. Ooh, it does sound formidable. <laughs> for old Tom. <laughs> Shall I tell him you will have dinner with him later? <laughs> I'll prepare him for some blistering anti, anti-war arguments. <laughs> Splendid, isn't it, sir? Our French ally sends us champagne, our Russian ally caviar, and we dine on them with a pacifist. <laughs> I'll tell Tom it will be war to the knife and fork between you. Fine, fine. <laughs> and now, uh, Jason, I'd uh, like to be alone for a little while. I understand, sir. Father, I brought you this old lantern. Huh? I knew you'd want to go out and watch the raid from the hilltop. Uh. It's even more exciting than a storm at sea. You writing to your mother tonight? Mm, yes, probably. I'd write too, and it's been a bad black day, and she can always tell. Uh, send her my. Uh, send her a message from me to cheer her up. It's been a bad day, Father. I've had a theoretic success against Crump. Erected a war command to bypass his authority. Slung a pontoon over his head. History will know me as some sort of committee juggler extraordinary. Political chess grandmaster. But I know it doesn't always work. Trying to guide Crump from above is like backseat driving. He's still at the wheel. The murder will go on. On and on and on. Until they've all had enough. And all been drunk and sated. And sickened. And history will tell us it was a splendid victory. Mine and his. All right. The fever must run its course. There's nothing we can do but try to apply a few cold poultices. Look, I want to say this to you, Owen. You can come on my technical staff. You've had three years of it out there. I don't care a hang what anyone thinks or says. Enough's enough. Uh, no, thank you, sir. I'd rather remain with my friends. Oh. No, I didn't mean it like that, Father. I only meant just that. It was kind of you to suggest it. I understand. Well, well, it's a private battle. You must fight for yourself. Oh, it hasn't been all bad and black. You couldn't get rid of Crumb. Not altogether, and not yet. But you faced another storm bravely and well today, sir. You reached out a hand and helped a friend out of the wilderness. Someone with the sort of leadership people might need one day. And perhaps history will be grateful to you for it, if it remembers. Go up on the hill and watch the raid. It's better than Beethoven. Yeah. What's the lamp for? Have we no torches? Uh, I thought this would suit you better. It's a ship's storm lantern. It's rather old, somewhat battered. There are a few rents in it. But it will give enough light to show you the way. Yes. The road's steep and there are some treacherous places. But it might do. And the view from the summit... The view from the summit, Owen... Doesn't that make it worth a journey to the end of the night? In Storm Lantern, which was adapted for radio by Modest Mazeevich from a book by Richard Earl Lloyd George, the part of Morgan Evans was played by William Squire, Mrs. Evans, Noel Hood, and Owen Evans by David Buck. 
Jason was played by Lawrence Payne, Hugh Hughes by Hayden Jones, and Caroline Bishop by Ira Heath. General Brewster was played by Walter Fitzgerald and General Crump by John Justin. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Nobody knows. And the child? Nor her. 
Though both are familiar to me. I must have passed them more than a hundred times on near as many routes. Without ever exchanging a word? Not a word. In the beginning, he used to stop and inquire the way to Boston, even when he was traveling directly away from the town. But since he never seemed to follow my directions, I have ceased communication with him. So that was the reason for the strange, fixed look he turned on you. It could be. And now he's gone. Disappeared as if neither he nor that frail, shivering child had ever been. Does he never stop anywhere? Never longer than to inquire the way to Boston. I see no signs of this promised storm. Look in the direction from which the man came. The storm follows him. I guess you're right. There is a little black cloud speck in the east, but not much more than the size of my hat. Aye, that there's the seed storm. With luck, we may reach Polly's Tavern before it strikes. But to mark my word, the wanderer and his child will go on through rain and thunder and lightning to Providence. To the town we are coming from, you mean? Yes, sir. I would guess the real Providence is as far out of his reach as the Boston. He never seems able to find either. Wrap that saddle blanket about you. But here it comes. Hey! Blackness of the cloud. No matter, perhaps as well for you. The whole past, we go full out. Hey! Get you up! Move then! Move! Within a few minutes, we had broached a rise, and sliding and slithering came down into the hollows of Polly's tavern. In spite of the summer weather, a steam of damp arose from our clothes and those of other travelers. And the whole common room seemed to be awash with discussion of the storm breeder, whom almost all of them seemed to have met on the road. Ah, the name is Darlington of Boston in the import-export trade. Uh, Jonathan Dunwell, recently seated as judge in our circuit courts, bound from New York to your fair city. Well, sir, my pleasure and privilege to meet so distinguished a gentleman. I'm afraid your city is fast surpassing ours in credit and notoriety. Not entirely, sir. I'm afraid a citizen of your city is the focus of all conversation tonight. The storm breeder. Ah. Did you chance on him? No, as it happens, not today. But too many times. Too many times? I could wish to see neither that man nor his horse again. For they seem not to belong to this world. Well, how's that? I saw them plain, father and daughter, passing us on the road. Uh, did you speak? No. I have seen him wet and weary many times before tonight. And no one who has ever once seen him can ever be deceived again as to his identity. You know him by name? Yes, sir. Peter Rugg. Peter Rugg. But who is this mysterious man? Ah, that is more than anyone can tell exactly, save that he is a famous traveler, though held in low esteem by all inholders, for he never stops to eat, drink, nor sleep. (laughs) But why does the man never stop anywhere, long enough to speak to anyone at least? By those who know the most about him, say the least. It is asserted that sometimes heaven sets a mark on a man for judgment or for trial. I'm thinking of the one time Rugg spoke to me. I was in Connecticut at the time on a winding road. My horse was weary as myself. It was toward dusk. And all of a sudden, from behind me, traveling at that reckless clip for those roads, 
A fiery black horse pulled in an open chaise, caught up to me from behind. Will you tell me how far it is to both? One hundred miles. One hundred? How can you say so? I was told last night it was but fifty, and I have traveled all night. Problem is, sir, you are traveling from Boston. You must turn back. How can you tell me so? It is all turned back. Boston shifts with the wind. One man tells me it is to the east, the other west. Even the guideposts all point the wrong way. I think perhaps you're tired, and your little girl, too. Why not stop and rest? You're wet and weary. Yes, foul weather since I left home. Stop then up ahead of the inn and refresh. No, no, I cannot stop. Do you see what follows me? I must ever stay ahead of it. So I must reach home tonight. I... I pray you are mistaken in the distance to Boston. I wish I were... May I, uh, may I make some bold to inquire if you are Peter Rugg? I think we've met before. My name is Rugg. I meet so many... Uh, I have lost my way. I am wet and weary. I would take it kindly if you would direct me to Boston. Where do you live in Boston? On what street? Why... Middle Street. Everyone knows the house with the great shade maple across from the cemetery. When did you leave, boss? I, I... I cannot tell precisely. It seems a considerable time. What, sir? How did you and your child become so wet? It has not rained in these parts today. Uh, the shower caught me back on the road a piece. It, it always catches me. Unless I keep moving. Mm, moving. Uh, would you advise me to take the old road or the turnpike? Oh, why? The old road is over 120 miles. The turnpike for 97. You impose on me. It, it is wrong to trifle with a traveler. You know it is only some 40 miles from Newburyport to Boston. But this is not Newburyport. This is Hartford. Well, do not deceive me, sir. Is not this river I have been following, the Merrimack? Oh, no, sir. You are just outside Hartford. And this river is the Connecticut. Have the rivers changed their courses? Has the cities their places? Am I forever? But again, the clouds are gathering and the storm is at my heels. God curses me for that... He will talk no longer. His impatient horse leaped off, his flanks rising like wings. That's the last time I saw the ill-fated Mr. Rugg. Amazing. But you say he gave his address as Middle Street. That is correct, Mr. Rugg. Uh, I should say, Judge Dunwell. The house with the great maple shade tree across from the cemetery. So he said. Do you know Boston well enough to locate it? Oh, no, sir. And my business seldom carries me that way. But mine does. I think for curiosity's sake I must go to Peter Rugg's home. I tried to find out why it is so difficult to return to. Twenty years, you said, you've been seeing him on the road. Oh, all of that. And the last was the only time we spoke. I should like to meet the man face to face. If for no other reason than to find a better fate for that little girl long since turned woman. When I get to Boston, I shall make it my first order of business. Which is exactly what I did. It was not easy, for the maps were inaccurate. And there was more than one middle street. But finally I found it. The great tree smothering the house so that it lay in a shadowy gloom. The paint was peeling. The windows cracked and cobweb ridden. But the path to the door was cleared. And I was sure that someone or something still lived there. 
It was with a strange trepidation I walked through the weeds and lifted the heavy knocker. At last, with a deep breath, I let it fall. Then, in utter silence, bathed in the shadowed gloom, I waited to meet whatever waited behind that door. The house abandoned by its master for countless years. Is it possible that any evidence of him has remained or his family? Does some heartbroken woman still wait for that lost child? Or even for the storm breeder himself? Who and what is Peter Rugg? Phantom? Or reality? Or legend? We shall have to await those answers with Judge Dunwell until I return shortly with Act Two. Judge Dunwell was never fated to have an answer to his knock on the door. For in the very moment that something old stirs and rustles within the house, outside it, the small noises are smothered by the arrival of the familiar black chaise and the snorting, prancing steed that draws it. Whoa, Lightfoot! Whoa! Don't you recognize home at last? At the sound of the arrival, instinctively I have withdrawn deeper in the shadows, finding perfect concealment behind a clump of overgrown rhododendra. Twilight was just upon us. As a confident and somehow younger man than I remembered Peter Rugg to be, strode up the path, just in time for the door to open. The little girl sat timid and immobile on the seat of the carriage, as if knowing the hopelessness of it all. Somewhere, low thunder grumbled. Mistress Rugg, your husband is sorry to have been delayed, but circumstances beyond... Uh, I... I beg your pardon, madam, but I am looking for Mistress Catherine Rugg. Who? Who did you say? My wife, madam. The Mistress Rugg. Oh, Lord bless you, sir. She ain't here. Ain't been here or in this world for 50 years. What do you mean? I mean she's dead and gone like all birds. Dead and gone and buried and lost. But that can't be. I'm... Uh, I'm tired and worn, but... <laughs> This, uh, I know my own house. I live here. Oh, no, you don't. Not now you don't, whoever you are. I can show you deed and title which says that it's mine. It is true. It seems as though it might be on the wrong side of the street. I I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to... Uh, uh, forgive me, madam. I'm confused. Everything seems misplaced. The streets change. People change. The town change. What is strangest of all? Catherine Rugg has deserted her husband and child. Oh, pray tell me, has John Foy come home from sea? Who? John Foy, my kinsman. He could give me some account of Mrs. Rugg. I never heard of John Foy. Where does he live? Just above here on Orange Tree Lane. Oh. Oh, bless you for a stranger. No such place in this neighborhood. Mm, but that can't be possible. The street's gone. Orange Lane is not the head of Hanover Street near Bamberton Hill. There is no such lane now. You, you cannot be serious. Woman, you mock me. The next thing you will tell me is that there is no King George. However, be that as it may, you must see, madam, that... Both my daughter and myself are wet and weary. I, I must find a resting place. Can you direct me to Boston? But this is Boston. The only city of Boston I know. But not the one I know. <laughs> yes, like what? Coming. Coming. I am wrong, of course. I don't know how I could have mistaken it, but... 
This is a much finer city than Boston. Um, Boston must lie at a distance, uh, my good woman, since you are ignorant of it. Yes. It's the same old story. No home tonight. I must away. No. Mr. Ross, wait. Wait. Who are you, sir? Oh, a thousand pardons, Mistress Croft. May I... May I present myself, Judge Jonathan Dunwell of the Circuit Courts, but recently come to Boston. A judge? Have you some business with that man? Not legal business, but I had hoped to meet him here and question him. I am obsessed with a desire to know exactly who and what he is. I'm ashamed for allowing you to stand so long in the rain. Come in and warm yourself by my fire. May I offer you some more sherry, Your Worship? No, no. You are more than kind to have given me what I have against the chill. Heaven help that poor man in an open carriage. And that child beside him. And the child. That a man named Rugg once owned this house is all I know. The factor who arranged for my father to take it over is supposed to have made sure all papers are legal. How I wish I could have stopped him, learned more about him, tried to solve the mystery of him. The mystery of him? Well, I cannot help there, but I should think the factor who sold us this house should know more of him than anyone, if he is still alive. Could you give me his name and address? I shall not rest till I have followed this strange affair to its depths and its beginnings. In the hour, he's late, Judge. Yes, I, I do indeed, Mr. Felt. You you know the history of Peter Rugg, sometime of Middle Street in this district? Uh, yeah. I, I will be brief. He rented a property of mine in his youth. He was married to a fine young woman who bore him a, 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 a daughter, as I remember. Jenny. So I believe was the name. With no matter, an offspring, and then without so much as a by your leave, he ran off with the child, leaving the wife to die, as I believe or remember. Yes, 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 yes. She, she died. Why? Well, damn it, she was deserted. Fortunately, Rugg left no creditors. He owned his horse and chaise and... After she died, it was all soon forgotten. Yeah, soon, soon forgotten. I suppose, suppose he died. No. To the best of my belief, he is now alive and living. I have lately seen him and his horse and chaise, and his child. Oh, is that so? That's so. Well, now, I wouldn't presume to argue with a man of your standing that Peter Rugg could still be alive I. I will not deny, but Jenny Rugg, if you saw her, let's see now, the, the, the Boston Massacre was 1770, was it not? I fortunately avoided it, but history records that thing. So, on that date, Jenny was ten years of age, and if living, that would make her, let's see, 60, 60 now. Give or take a year. Do you know what you're saying? <laughs> if Peter Rugg is still alive, which I take is possible, he could be only ten years older than myself. And I was only eighty last March. It was obvious that Mr. Felt was in his dotage. So despairing of gaining any further intelligence from him, I returned to my lodgings at the Marlboro Hotel. If Peter Rugg, I thought to myself, has been traveling since the Boston Massacre, there is no reason I can see now that he shouldn't travel to the end of time. And I might have left it there had I not descended to the tap room for a nightcap and there encountered Mr. Derwin. I ran up against a man whose grandfather knew our elusive friend, Mr. Rugg, and can now tell you the whole story. 
such as it is. Then by all means begin. It seems that if my informant is worthy of credit, Peter Rugg, a man in comfortable circumstances, with one daughter and a wife, lived in Boston on Middle Street. He was a man generally esteemed, save for one thing. Oh, don't keep me on tenterhooks. What? An ungovernable temper. So violent that the wig would rise from his head. And while his fits were upon him, he had no respect for heaven or earth. A sorry spectacle. Some of it hard to believe. Less hard to believe than his punishment for it. Well, what does that mean, sir? Well, whilst visiting in Concord one day late in autumn, with his daughter in the chaise drawn by his favorite horse, a great black beast named Lightfoot, a tremendous storm overtook them, driving them for shelter as dark fell under the roof of a friend of his, a Mr. Cutter, who urged him to tarry the night. Which any man in his right senses under the circumstances would do. And he did not heed his pleas? Far from it, Judge. Instead, the vein standing out on his neck and at his temples, he screamed to high heaven, Let the storm increase! Let God and the devil wreck their worst! I will see hope to life, or never see it more! disappeared into the raging night. Never to return home? Never. Incredible. Eh, wasn't that supernatural? Why? The man is a cursed. Whether by God or, or by the devil, I know not which. Still 50 years of wandering in search of his home. How could it be possible? Well, now, as to that, there are two theories. One I had from my informant. His grandfather said that on the day after he left Concord 50 years ago, his friends and neighbors started inquiries. But it appeared that Peter Rugg had stayed no place in Boston. And his wife had a strange tale. What tale is that? Sitting by the window, waiting on that wild night, there was a sudden sound like an earthquake. And indeed the whole house rumbled underneath her as if about to cave in. Peering out through the storm, she saw a strange sight. What sight was that? Coming hell for leather down the street was Peter Rugg in his carriage, straining back on the reins in a vain effort to stop his horse and crying, No, I could no! wanted to leave his wife and never come home at all. That there was another woman somewhere. That scarcely fits the facts as we know them. Well, then, there is the other theory. Which is? Perhaps best told by the woman who had the experience. Now, she's the wife of the toll gatherer on the Charlestown Bridge. Would you care to hear her tale for yourself? Well, sirs, it's many years ago by now. My old man has gone to his rest. Lord save him who could spare me out. In those days, we were both young and spry, and many the evening I used to keep him company here for Tollgate. Those days were when? Oh, I under 50 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to have interrupted. Go on with your story. But I, I remembered how annoyed Ethan was by this big black horse and the chairs and the 
man and the little girl used to tell me how they continually were in contempt of the race crossing the bridge without stopping or paying. And were they always followed by bad weather? Why, bless you, sir, that is the truth. My Ian used to say they brought bad luck. And you say you saw them? One evening we heard them thundering up, and I said, this time they ain't going to take it out on you, Ethan. You're too easy going. So when he called them to halt and they kept on, I had grabbed up a three-legged stool, heavy it was, but I was young and strong, and I hurled it square into the horse's belly. And tell the judge what happened then. Passed right through that horse as if it were a shatter. He never even broke stride as a stool went skipping across the bridge. No, sir. That was a haunt. A ghost rider with bad luck right in the dust of his wheels. So, Judge Dunwell. What is your judgment? I don't know. Neither explanation fits the pattern of my mind. And I have a feeling that I am not yet done with Peter Rugg. Nor will be till his fate is truly revealed to me. And the judge's instinct was right. Neither he nor we are yet done with the haunting tale of Peter Rugg, the man or ghost who wanders so hopelessly in search of home and rest. I'll return shortly with Act Three. It was to be five years before Peter Rugg's and Judge Dunwell's paths crossed again. For some time, the judge had tried to track down the sometimes elusive person or legend, whichever he was. Then, being only human, Peter Rugg had almost passed from his mind until... until the rest of the judge's story, which you are about to hear now. In the autumn of 1825, I attended the races at Richmond and Virginia. There was great excitement and the races were well attended, for it was a match race between two recognized champions, a roan called Dart and a light gray mare called Butterfly. At a signal, the gun sounded, and they were off. I was glued to the race to see no way of choosing which horse might win. When suddenly there was an extra wave of excitement from the already madly cheering crowd. To my open mouthed astonishment, appearing as if from nowhere in the rear, was a majestic black horse of unusual size, drawing an old weather beaten chair. Effortlessly, as if this heavy non racing vehicle, encumbered as it was by two occupants, didn't exist, he overtook the racing horses shortly before the winning line. And in concert, both Dot and Butterfly, as the horse passed them, lay back their ears and pulled up short, so that no contest was called. And the winning black horse and his carriage passed the finish line and faded away over the hill. In the clubhouse later, I was fortunate enough to have an introduction to one John Spring, the owner and rider of Butterfly. Jimmy, sir, that was no horse that overtook my man. No one can outrun Butterfly. No horse, that is. Why, I had bet all I have she would show her heels to Dorf. No doubt she would if the Good butter... horse, make no mistake. Good horse is not a great one. But not to outrun my Butterfly. That, that ox or whatever animal it was that frightened off our horses. Why, that, that makes no contest, sir. No contest. And yet it looked like a horse. In no fashion, sir. Nor was it. In no fashion. And that I can prove. How is that, Mr. Spring? By my own observation and countless others, sir. Would you like to see? I would indeed. Well, then, follow me. Now, you remember, 
Just about here, both of them pulled up and let that interloper go by and disappear. Yes, the the view is unfamiliar from this point, but I, I do remember it was shortly before the finish line. Exactly, sir. Both horses have to pull them up, walk deliberately to this spot of soft ground. Butterfly dropped her head and then lifted it, wickering and fried. Dart followed by doing the same and snorting in a sort of anger. So all of us looked to what they had examined. See you then there for yourself, Judge. I was looking at the hoof marks of the black horse which had carried on to the finish line and beyond. Horse? From the evidence of my eyes from the stands, yes. From the same evidence as I looked at the soft ground, Mr. Spring's strange claim had real validity. These were not the marks of a horse's hooves, but the evidence of another breed of animal or being. The hooves were cloven. Judge Dunwell. Mr. Derwent, your business takes you far afield. In the nature of things. Not like what happened today at the races. You saw? Oh, yes. I was stunned, weren't you? I thought Peter Rock had vanished. Oh, no, not either. In the years since we met, I have come across him time and again. And gotten soaked to the skin because of him. In New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts. And the last time, but shortly, in Delaware. Have you spoken? The last time only. Tell me, if you will, what took place. Well, sir, on his throat, he checked his horse with some difficulty. More beautiful horse I'd never seen. Sir, your face seems familiar. Perhaps I may engage your help. If you are, as may be, traveling to Boston, I should be glad to accompany you, for I have lost my way. My little girl here is weary, and I must reach home tonight. Ah, that would be impossible, sir. For you are in Concord, in the county of Sussex, which is in the state of Delaware. But Concord, that is only 20 miles from Boston, and my horse Lightfoot could carry me to the Charlestown Ferry in less than two hours. Uh, you mistake, sir. Uh, you are a stranger here. I am well acquainted with Concord, and this town is nothing like it. Because this is Concord in the state of Delaware. Huh? Uh, what do you mean by state? Why, one of the United States, man. Uh, states? Do you mock me? Because my heritage is Dutch? Now, I know well I am not in Holland. As a gentleman, I beg you not to mislead me. Tell me, quickly, for pity's sake, before my horse swallows his bit, he is so starved. Set me on the right road for Boston. If I could, and I did, it would be 500 miles from here. 500 miles, you say? Next. Nee. I will to no more. This beats the Connecticut River. Get up, my foot. Get up. I can explain his last remark. I met him, as you may remember, outside Hartford, when he persisted in mistaking the Connecticut River for the Charles. So our wandering homeseeker is still abroad. Man or spirit, I shall not rest until he can. But how to help him? The courts were closed until the winter session. It seemed to me that the judgment on Peter Rubb was too great, too inhumane, too unreasonable for the extent of his small crime. I made it my business wholly for once to try to catch him again. But I always seemed fated to be just too late. At the toll gate on the turnpike between Alexandria and Middleburg, he had passed and paid no toll. But the toll gatherer was grateful, for he brought rain behind him to relieve a drought. 
back in Virginia at the toll bridge, an irate gatekeeper told me that annoyed by the number of times Rudd had passed that way refusing to pay, he had stood in the way of the vehicle and it had passed right through him or over him without so much as touching him. On the ferry boat across the Hudson, a Mr. Hardy who collected fares showed me a fare that a man had given him, insisting it was 30 shillings. It might have been once. It was a half crown, coined by the British Parliament, dated 1649. Then I knew I had caught up with Peter Rugg again at last. I found him in his rig at the bow of the boat. Greetings, Mr. Rugg. Huh? Oh, yes. You seem familiar, sir. Judge Dunwell, we have met on the road before. Mm, that could be possible, sir. May I say that since you are a stranger here, my house is your home. Uh, Dame Rock will be happy to see her husband's friend. Mm. Step into my chair, sir, if you will. Uh, move over, Jenny, for the great man. We shall be in Middle Street very shortly. For many reasons, I will take advantage of your kind invitation. I sneaked a glance at my companions. Both were dressed in incredibly old-fashioned garments of fine cloth, but showing great wear. Rug himself, at least in the face, was little more than skin drawn over the skull and cheekbones. Jenny was so bundled up she suggested only to my sad and horrified eye what her wizened, dried-out face proclaimed. A small Egyptian mummy. Only Lightfoot looked bigger, sleeker, and more magnificent than ever. Uh, this is not Boston, sir. Then, mayhap it is New York. <laughs> How can it be New York, sir, when that place is 200 and more miles from Boston? But I, I thought I was home. Mr. Rudd, look to the west. Only the size of a blackberry now, but that looks like an angry storm on our trail. Ah, it is in vain to escape. I know that cloud. It brings new wrath to spend on my head. Go now, kind stranger, whoever you are. Leave me to my fate. No, not this time, Peter Rudd. Give me the reins. This time, perhaps we can outrun the storm. I took them from his slack hand sliding over him and pushing him back to huddle with his daughter. And it needed only one flick to send that strange horse on his way like the wind. As we careened around the first corner, I noticed that his front hooves had been split on some hard road somewhere, but were healing. So Mr. Spring had been at least half right about the cloven hooves. I remembered little of that nightmare ride for Boston. How many days passed, where we stayed, or ate or slept. I only know that no matter how fast we traveled, that mushrooming black cloud stayed on our heels every step of the way. And then at last, we were in Boston, on Middle Street. A crowd was gathered. The great elm still stood, although barren now of leaves, fire blackened. And all that remained of the house was a heap of rubble. All else burnt to the ground, as I knew it to be, for the fire had taken place Two years I before. Tell you men of the North End, this is holy ground. The city needs this land. And let not the name of Peter Rugg dampen your ardor. No! I hold renting title to this place. No, hush, Mr. Rugg. Listen for a moment longer. Let no man tried to tell you that Peter Rugg is long since dead and gone to his reward. No, 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 no. Clear. But how can this be? Who has burned my house to the ground? And who are all these strange people? I, I thought I knew every man in Boston, but I do not recollect at this moment that I ever saw one of these. Who are these strangers? Listen to me, Peter Rugg. The only stranger here is you. You have suffered many years under an illusion. Look, look behind. The cloud, the storm. Your nemesis is gathering. Then I must flee. Away from home again. Oh, if you do, you have no home. If I stay, 
there is none left. Don't you see that for over 50 years, the tempest which you so profanely defied at monotony has driven you before it like a straw in the wind. And now it is too late. Your wife, your house, and all your neighbors have disappeared. You have no home left here. You've been cut off from one age, and you can never be fitted to the present. You can never have another home again in this world. You or your daughter, unless... Yes. Quickly, for the storm is almost upon us. Unless what? Unless you stop fleeing it. Let it catch up with you and perhaps pass you by. Then mayhap at long last you can find rest. Oh, rest. Sweet, blessed rest. Oh, my father, forgive me. And take me and Jenny home. The great black clouds and teeming rain engulfed us all. My last view of Peter Rugg was standing with his arm about his daughter, his face lifted to the rain. And wonder of wonders, at last the child's head, too, was lifted. In the intensity of it, they were lost. And suddenly the storm passed. For a moment, in its last fringe, I saw the two of them, eyes on heaven. And then, as if they had never been, chaise, horse, harness, Father and daughter were gone. Where? I do not know. I can only hope home at last. Judge Dunwell lived out a long and fruitful life, dying quietly in his bed one night. We do not know what his last thoughts were, but certainly one of them must have been that in all the last 40 years of his life, he never again met or heard of Peter Rugg. Then the soul condemned to wander, lost, alone, cut off. And I do have to wonder a little if Peter Rugg didn't make his own penance. What we fear in life we should not run from, especially if we can't outdistance it. Turn and meet it face to face. It's surprising that the reality is never as bad as the imagined. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Fred Gwynn, Ann Petoniak, Arnold Moss, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the vivid world of your own imagination, to the miracle of your own mind's eye. We have all of us found ourselves at times in one predicament or another and wondered how in the world we got there. Our mystery drama, Hurricane, was written especially for the Mystery Theater 
by George Lothar. That stars Joseph Julian and E.V. Juster. Imagine yourself now in a beach house on the eastern shore of Florida. It's a wild and isolated part of the shore. And right now, the savage wind and rain of a hurricane are bludgeoning the house. In the living room, two men are playing Scrabble by the light of a kerosene lamp. One of them is quite young, in his 20s. His left eye is badly bruised, half closed. The other man is old, in his mid-thirties, perhaps. He is wearing a shoulder holster with a thirty-eight caliber revolver in it. Turn the radio on, Ronnie. Let's get the latest on the hurricane. Ronnie. Yeah? Don't get any fancy ideas. Don't make any sudden moves. What ideas? What moves? You could put a bullet in me before I get halfway to the door. I don't think I would, Mama. And Hurricane Donna roared out of the Atlantic, heading north by northwest up the Florida east coast. Winds up to 90 miles per hour have already been clocked at the Weather Bureau station in Miami, which warns that they are expected to reach a velocity of 110 miles per hour. I told you, no oh, sudden moves. Minute, Get I away from that down. window. I thought I heard a car. I did. The of the overland highway have been Joe, there's a car in the drive. Two underwater. people, a man and a woman, getting out. They're coming in. Damn. Shut that down. thing off. And in some Let me handle this. Don't give me any trouble, understand? Whatever you say, Joe. Yeah? We're sorry to trouble you, but will you let us in, please? I'm sorry, lady. We, the Overland Highway's underwater up ahead. We can't go on. We can't go back. You've got to take us in. There's a beach house about a half a mile. There was. It's been washed away. Oh. Well. Look, look, you can't turn us away. Not in this. Yeah. All right. Come in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Halliday. This is my wife, Fran. And you? Joe. Joe Carrington. And I'm Ronnie Prentice. You uh, may have heard of my father. He's All right, so... they don't want your life history. Pleasure meeting you. Say, that's quite a black eye you've got. Yeah, I We got went down it. to the dock uh, to secure our boat. Ronnie slipped. Oh, that's too bad. I can't help noticing, Mr. Carrington. He's gone. What about? Well, a little unusual, isn't it? I mean, wearing a shoulder holster and a gun in a house... Makes me feel as if I'd walked into a Humphrey Bogart movie. Maybe you have. Oh? What do you mean, Mr. Prentice? He didn't mean anything. Making a joke is all. Hmm. Where are you from, you two? Siesta Key. Uh, yes, we have a little beach house there. Shack, really. A kind of get away from it all place. Get away from all what? We're school teachers. Jacksonville. Fran teaches English, and I'm what you call a student counselor. Oh, you, uh give advice to kids? Well, they're not exactly kids. Not at 17 and 18. High school, yes. But at that age, adolescents have lots of problems, believe me. And uh, you straighten them out. Well, let's say I try. My husband has a degree in clinical psychology. Oh, very interesting. Well, I'll be back in a moment. Where are you going? Well, to heat up the coffee, Joe. They look like they could use some. No, well, what, well, what they need is a drink. Forget the coffee. Well, I don't need a drink. I... I'd rather have the coffee, thank you. Yeah, me too. Well, I'll get it. Uh, no, wait. Uh, excuse me, I'll give him a hand in the kitchen. Martin, there's something funny going on here. Yeah, I noticed the way Carrington, the one with the gun, kept watching the younger one like, well, a cat watching a mouse. I noticed that too, but what I mean, the younger one, Ronnie, he seemed to be trying to warn me about something. What do you mean, warn you? I don't know. I could be wrong, but there was something, seemed to me, something in his eyes. As if he were trying to warn me with his eyes. And speaking of eyes, I don't think he got that shiner in a fall. Neither do I. I'll come and get it, hot and steaming. Oh, I can use a cup of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we are. There's cream and sugar. You can help yourself. Oh, thank you. How do you take yours, Mr. Prentice? Uh, black. And it's runny. Oh, well... Fran, then. Okay. There you are. Mr. Carrington? Uh, none for me. Uh, you play Scrabble, Fran? I love it. Well, have it a game with me. Of course. 
You know, come to think of it, maybe I'm biting off more than I can chew, taking on an English teacher. <laughs> what do you want, a handicap? <laughs> this is a nice place you've got here, Mr. Carrington. I've been admiring some of the paintings on the walls. Who's the artist? A friend of mine. A distinctive technique. Mm, he's got talent. And uh, problems. You think so? Oh, no offense. No, I... no, no offense. I'm, I'm interested. What makes you think he's got problems? Well, there's something curious about the way... The way... Yeah? It's hard to put into words. See, here in this landscape, that distant farmhouse is only partially finished. And here, here again, these trees are only half painted in. As if, well, there's something wrong. As if the artist, for some reason, went just so far and no further. As if something stopped him. You shrinks are all alike. I beg pardon? Your wife said you were a psychologist. So? So right away you got to read something into this painting. Like the artist has problems because he didn't finish painting this or painting that. Maybe he ran out of paint. Did he? What? He's a friend of yours, you said. You know him. Did he run out of paint? Or does he just not finish what he starts? Hey, now, take it easy, Joe. Why pull a gun on us? I just accidentally upset the Scrabble game, that's all. Oh, I thought you were going to shoot me. You're pretty edgy, Carrington. Sorry. You're practically a nervous man. But all that happened was Ronnie upset the Scrabble game. I said, I said gun, I was I... sorry. Now, uh, here, let me help you pick up the pieces. <sighs> then maybe we could all sit down and play. How about it, Mr. Halliday? Sure. Sure, help pass the time. Oh, you count me out. I'm going to lie down for a while. A few minutes ago, you wanted to play. Well, I don't now. Nonsense. You like Scrabble. Not when I'm up against an English teacher. She was beating the socks off me. We'll all play. Now, sit down, Ronnie. Uh-uh. I'm sleepy, Joe. Uh, I'm going to catch you now. It looks like we'll have to play three-handed. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I get back. I won't be a minute. Martin, that boy's in trouble. Where'd you get that idea? He didn't upset the Scrabble game accidentally. He did it deliberately. After he spelled out the words, help me. Help me? Yes. I looked at the words then, at him, and he looked in Carrington's direction. Martin, that boy's in danger. Maybe we are, too. Joe, no, please, don't handcuff me to the bed. You're up to something out there, Ronnie. I'm not taking any chances. I swear, I wasn't up to anything at all. You think I haven't noticed the looks between you and her? You think I haven't seen you trying to tell her something with your eyes? And why did you upset that Scrabble game? It was an accident. Yeah, some accident. And all of a sudden you're sleeping and you want to take a nap. Do you think you're kidding? Next thing I know, you'd be out that window trying to escape. With a hurricane raging out there, how far do you think I'd get? I don't think, I know. You're not getting beyond this bed. Not with these handcuffs on, you're not. We've got to do something. Fran, I warn you again. Don't rush into something you'll be sorry for. But we've got to help that boy. For all we know, we've got to help ourselves. Martin, he's got a gun and he's... Uh, more coffee before we start playing? No, thank you. Change your mind about a drink, Halliday? Why, uh, yes. Yes, I think I will. Uh, and on second thought, I, I, I'll change mine about the coffee. Help yourself. Scotch, bourbon, rye, what'll it be? What? Oh, uh, bourbon, thanks. Coffee's cold. Mind if I heat it up, Mr. Carrington? Oh, of course not. There's a gas stove in the kitchen. Lucky we don't cook with electricity. It all went off hours ago. Kitchen's through that door. I'll just be a few minutes. Hey, what the push? Keep your voice down, Ron. Fran, you're soaked to the skin, drenched. I pretended I wanted to heat up the coffee. But I really wanted to get to you. I went out the kitchen door and came around to this window. Ronnie, what's the trouble? He's holding me for ransom. Ransom? He wants a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred? My father is Garrett Prentice, the millionaire. Oh, I've heard of him, yes. Phil Carrington, if that's his name, phoned my father yesterday. The money is on the way, but what worries me is I'm sure Carrington's going to kill me once he gets it. But if he gets the ransom money? I don't think it'll make any difference. He knows I can identify him. So he hasn't much choice. He has to kill me. You and your husband, too. Yes. We could identify him. You've got to do something. We've got to do something. But what? 
That's the question, Ronnie. What? Your wife, she's taking her own sweet time about heating that coffee. Oh, here she is now. Where have you been? And your clothes are soaking wet. How did it happen, Fran? While the coffee was heating, I went to the kitchen door and opened it. I... What for? Well, to see what it was like out there. The wind caught the door and yanked it open. I went out to try to close it and... You're lying. What have you been up to? I haven't been up to anything. You I... went out the kitchen door and around back, didn't you? You made your way to the bedroom. No, I swear I didn't. Well, I'll soon find out. I'll go see. Uh, uh... Fran, have you gone crazy? You hit him with that candlestick. You knocked him cold. Get his gun and the key to the handcuffs out of his pocket. Handcuffs? Ronnie's handcuffs are the bed in there. Oh, Lord. Hey, here, take the gun while I hunt for the key. Oh, not this pocket. Yeah, here. Keep him covered, Fran. I'll release Ronnie. Mr. Halliday. It's okay, Ronnie. I don't know what this is all about yet, but I'll soon have these cuffs off you. Oh. Carrington's out cold. There. Oh, good. Where's his gun? My wife's got it. Keeping Carrington covered. Come on. He's still out, huh? Yes. All right, I'll take the gun, Fran. Yes. Here, I don't want it. I don't even like the feel of it. Where's my husband? Well, still in the bedroom, I guess. What in the world is he doing in... Martin? Martin, what are you doing in there? Coming. I stopped to have a closer look at this. Well, what is it? It was hanging on the wall. In his bedroom. But what is it? A straitjacket, Fran. A straitjacket? Ronnie, what would a straitjacket be doing in your... Oh, my God. That's right, Fran. You see, I'm insane. Joe used that straitjacket to keep me quiet when I got violent. Really violent. (laughs) But he won't be using it on me anymore. Not anymore. Thanks to you. As I said, we sometimes find ourselves in predicaments and wonder how we got there. Well, Fran and Martin Halliday needn't wonder how they got into theirs. They know. who say we cannot escape what the fates have ordained shall be our future. Others contend that we create our own destinies, masters of our fate, captains of our soul, and all that. I don't know. Seems to me there's such a thing as luck, good and bad. And as Fran and Martin Halliday stare into the barrel of a gun held by Ronnie Prentice, I'd say they're just victims of circumstance. Wouldn't you? Joe uses his straitjacket on you when you become violent? He did. But as I just told you, he won't anymore. Thanks to you, dear impulsive Fran Halliday. Uh-huh. Carrington's coming around. I'll see if I can help him. Leave him. He could be seriously hurt. Let's hope so. My head. My head. Ronnie. How did you get that gun? She gave it to me. After she took it away from you. Oh, maybe you made a big mistake. He told me you'd kidnapped him. We're holding him for ransom. And you swallowed that? I'm afraid I did. Well, don't blame yourself too much. Ronnie's con smarter people than you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Anna, you shouldn't have said that, Joe. You've offended her. She's an obvious narcissist type. You should have realized that. As you did. Well, of course. That's why I went after her sympathy instead of his. I knew she'd be a pushover. Well, quite the amateur psychologist. Amateur? I love a lot better psychologist than you are, Halliday. I'm not wasting my life as a kid counselor. And what's that supposed to mean? Ronnie, give me the gun. Oh, you got to be kidding. Oh, Ronnie. One more step, Joe, and I'll kill you. No. Not me. Not after all these years. How many, Joe? I've lost count. Nineteen. In four months and 27 days. Oh, that's a long time. You'll never know how long. The gnawing tooth of time. Well, it's over now, Joe. End of the line and no transfer. No transfer for you either if you kill me. I'll put you in the asylum, Ron. Not me. Too clever. Well, would you all like a drink, or uh, is the situation sufficiently intoxicating? Your friend? No, thank you. Halliday? Not me. 
How about you, dear brother Joe? Dear, dedicated, generous, self-sacrificing, moderate brother. Dear, gentle, understanding, all-suffering keeper! Hit me just once again, Ron. And... And what? Skip it. <laughs> I'm going over to the bar to make myself a drink. Now, all of you stay right where you are. Don't move. Not an inch. I said not an inch. Well, I was only going to sit down in this chair and... Oh! oh my jaw. I'll do more than count you with this gun if you disobey me again. Now, don't move. Not an inch. Martin. Oh, Martin, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Oh. Are you sure you don't want a drink? Anyone? It's your last chance, you know. Well, suit yourselves. And now, who's first? You, Halliday? Yeah, why not you? Just one bullet through the head. Painless. So don't be afraid. Ron, don't do it. Are you afraid, Halliday? I... I don't think so. No. Not afraid of death? How come? Oh, I, I don't know. I guess if you believe in God, and I do, I guess you... Well, you can't be very much afraid of anything, really. Well, many people who believe in God are afraid to die, wouldn't you say? No. I don't see how they could be afraid if they did. Oh, provocative speculation. Give me the gun, Ron. Oh, you're afraid, aren't you? When I point the gun at you like this and you don't know whether I'm going to pull the trigger or not, you are afraid, aren't you, Joe? I certainly don't want to die. Yet you believe in God. Maybe I do and maybe I don't. You do? You do? You told me you did. I remember a long time ago, you told me that you did. You did. Okay, I did. Now you're trying to confuse me. He, 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 he does it all the time. He keeps making me think I got things twisted, all mixed up, that I'm, that I'm not thinking straight, that I'm crazy. Now, don't start that with me, Joe. Now, I'm warning you. Don't start. All right, Ron. And then don't take that tone either. You know I can't stand that tone. Ron. I will not be treated like a child in a tantrum. I will not, Joe. I will not. Then why don't you stop behaving like one? Halliday, don't cross him. Why not? Go ahead, Halliday. Cross me. Say anything you like to me. Anything. And see what happens. You won't? Well, then how about you, Fran? You say something. You, you cross me. Well, won't you please let us go? Please. We have nothing to do with all of this. We just happened to come in here out of the... Save it. You can't reason with a homicidal maniac. He... He really is? Yes, Mrs. Halliday, he really is. Liar! Liar! Oh, clever. Oh, oh, yeah, clever. But not as clever as I am. You see, he wants my father's money all for himself. There's enough for both. More than enough. When my father goes to that great hunt club in the sky... Yeah, marvelous huntsman, my father. Red coat, breeches, top hat, oh, the whole bit. Da -da 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 hunting we will go. No, fall down and go smash. Smash! Come on. <laughs> but not for him. Oh, I'll never smash for him. For me. <laughs> for me. What do you mean, smash for you? Would you like... Would you like to know? Would you... Would you really be interested? I would. Yes. No, we... <laughs> we never tell about it, do we, Joe? Never have, never will. What would father's friends say? Garrett Prentice, father, the maniac? That's what they'd say. Garrett Prentice would... shrivel up with shame. Well, who exactly is Garrett Prentice? Who is... Well, Joe, here, here's a man who never heard a father of a wonderment. A well, Avis. My dear man, where have you been? Everyone has heard a father. I'm afraid I'm not in that category. Oh, then let, let, let me tell you about him, all about him, and about Joe and me. No, no, don't, please. Oh, it's no. the last stop, Joe. Final destination. Why not open the luggage? You won't be taking it with you. You see, Joe's mama married my dear papa after his papa died. Now, in, as you might say, the ordinary course of biological eventuality, I appeared on the scene. And alas, poor Joe's mama left it. Joe hated me for killing his mama. No, Ron, I never... You're dead. 
You did. If you didn't, why did you hit me and knock me down and make me hurt my head? I didn't mean to. You were two years old, almost two. And you always wanted whatever I had, a toy, a game, whatever. That day, well, I wouldn't give up what you wanted, and I pushed you away. You knocked me down. You knocked me down, and you hurt my head, Joe. I did injure him. I am responsible. When I pushed him and he fell... Knocked down? All right, Ron. When I knocked him down, he struck his head on the metal corner of a bed. He was unconscious for more than an hour. And when, when... When... Go on. When the doctor brought him around, he seemed all right. Except for headaches that bothered him from time to time. But otherwise, all right. Then when he was about four, he tried to kill his governess. At four? Yeah. He wanted her to give him something. I don't remember what. And she wouldn't. And he, he flew into a rage. He bit. He clawed. He kicked her. Small as he was, she was no match for him. And he'd have killed her if other servants hadn't come in time and dragged him off. And then, a year or so later, he attacked a playmate. Boy his age. And, and he would have killed him. If there hadn't been other boys who pulled him away. Good heavens. From then on, he couldn't be sent to school. He had to be tutored at home. He'd fly into these sudden, unexpected rages, attack his tutors. He nearly murdered one with a pair of scissors. The psychiatrist who examined him, did they have He's any... never been to a psychiatrist. Well, oh, you can't mean that. That's true. But that's... It's senseless. Garrett Prentice, senseless? Wealthy financier, handsome playboy, beloved darling of the jet set, senseless? Oh, no. Heartless, yes. Oh, God, yes, heartless. He couldn't bear the shame, the notoriety of others knowing. But, Carrington, Joe, you can't mean that all these years you've taken care of him alone. It was my fault. So you took on the burden of... Wouldn't you? You've dedicated your entire life to him. Oh, it isn't as bad as you make it sound. Most of the time, he's rational enough. Our lives are quite ordinary, except... I have to keep watching for the signs, the symptoms that warn me that another attack is coming on. I try to give him as much freedom as I can. Still, I do have to keep an eye on him. And you know I hate being watched. If you only know how it feels to have someone's eyes glued on you all the... Why are you looking at me like that, Holiday? Like what? As if... As if you're studying me. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. Answer me. Answer me or I'll put a hole in your head. No! Take that gun away from me, Temple! Easy, Fran, easy. All right. I have been studying you. Why? There's something... I can't put my finger on it, but something... <laughs> I've known kids, well, young men and women, really, high school seniors who who seem rational at times. It's only the calm before the storm, Halliday. It's one of those symptoms that I mentioned. The silence before the volcano erupts, eh, Joe? Something like that. And then? Boom! I erupt! Well, better to do that than to hold it in and let it eat you alive inside like most people. Like you, Halliday. Me? Nothing's eating me. Liar. You're all but eaten up with bitterness, frustration. <laughs> you, you, you couldn't be more off base, believe me. Am I? Ask her. Ask Fran. She knows. Am I right, Fran? <laughs> well, answer him, Fran. He's right. Uh, you see? Oh, come on, Fran. He is right, Martin. You know it. I know it. We just never talk about it, that's all. Talk about what? Nothing. Forget it. No. You just said that he's right. That I am eaten alive inside with frustrations, regrets. You are? Darling, you know you are. You never mention it because... Well, because you're you... Good Lord, Fran. Are you... Are you talking about what happened at State College? Is there anything else we don't talk about since it happened? What in heaven's name, Fran? That's 12 years ago. It makes no sense. Doesn't it? Oh, Martin. Dear, darling Martin. Doesn't it? You know, maybe it does. Maybe it does at that. If all these years you've been thinking that I... Because I never talked, thinking you ruined my life. I did. You know I did. Ruined it? Fran, dearest, you made it. How could you have lived with me all these years and not know that I... I oh, what a fool I've been. 
you. Yes, me, a so-called psychologist, not knowing you'd feel guilty, that you'd... But, Martin, you've kept silent about it all these years. Kept silent? Nothing. I haven't kept silent. I just haven't talked to you about it because I scarcely ever think about it. And when I do, I'm glad it happened. You're just saying that. I'm not saying anything. I'm telling you the truth. Too late. Too late. Just too late. Because I'm sick of all this talk. The time has come to erupt. To to strike. And I think... No, I'm sure. I'll strike at you first, dear friend. (gasps) Oh, yes. I'll kill you first. Surely a twist of fate. An ironic twist. When in the very instant, Martin Halliday discovers that, all unknowingly, he and his wife have misunderstood each other over the years, the homicidal maniac Ron Prentice kills Fran Halliday. Remarkable, isn't it? That no matter how intimately our lives are bound up with another's, we never really know what he's like underneath, what he truly thinks, truly feels. It's almost inconceivable that Fran Halliday would believe that her husband Martin has been eaten up with bitterness and frustration over something she did 12 years ago, when actually the reverse is true. But no matter now, it seems, because Ron Prentice has just fired point blank at Fran. Fran! Uh, Fran! uh, I'm all right, I think. He he missed. Yeah, lucky Uh, you, Fran. You jerked your head up at the right moment or you'd be dead with a uh, bullet between your eyes right now. uh, Fool, you crazy fool. Yeah, my dear brother, you won't think so when I finally decide to kill you, too. If you kill any one of us, it'll be the end for you, Ron. Oh, no, not an end. A beginning. I'll put you away behind bars. In an asylum for the criminally insane. You could never bear that, Ron. I've borne it for nearly 20 years. 19 years, 4 months, 27 days, as you said. What are you talking about? You've lived an almost normal life. I've seen to that. Yeah, never a day out of your sight. The feel of your eyes always on me. Waking, sleeping. You were always there. Never alone. Never. Handcuffed. Straightjacketed. Chained. Chained to you. Chained. You think I have never wanted to be alone? To live my life, to fall in love, marry, have kids, even to go for a walk by myself? You think it's been any easier for me, chained to you? You made the chain, not me. You. Well, now I'm going to break it, Joe. Once and for all, break No, don't shoot. Run, please, I beg you. Don't. Hey, look. Ah! I thought we were finished. You are. What? The house can't last. They said on the radio these winds would hit 110, 120 miles an hour. And that's what they're starting to do. And we damn well better ought to get out of here. Where can we go? To the beach. There are caves down there. We can make it. No, dear brother, not you. Me. What do you mean, you? Fran, go into the bedroom and get those handcuffs my brother used on me. What are you up to? You'll find a second set in the top bureau drawer. Joe always kept a spare. Bring the straitjacket, too. I, I, I don't... Do as I tell you. And don't get any fancy ideas, or it'll be the end of these two. Do as he says, Mrs. Halliday. All right. What rotten scheme have you dreamed up now, Ron? Well, not me. The hurricane. The hurricane dreamed it up. What the hell are you talking about? That. Just that. Those winds are getting worse. The house can't last. It'll be ripped apart. Torn asunder, smashed, the kindling... All three of you will be smashed to kindling, human kindling with it. Ah, here's impulsive Fran with the handcuffs and the straitjacket. You, Halliday, put that straitjacket on, Brother Joe. Ron, Ronnie, you can't do this. I'm not. You are. Get that jacket on him. Now! He means what he says, Halliday. He'll kill you if you don't obey him. Come on, now. Get this jacket on me. 
Halliday. If I could only be sure. Of what, Martin? Sure of what? That he won't, that he can't shoot to kill. Try me, Halliday. I'm going to count five. If you haven't got that straight jacket on Joe, I'll put a bullet through your head. And he can do it. He's a crash shot. Then how come he missed Fran? I missed because... Don't give me that. Fran couldn't have jerked her head fast enough to avoid the bullet. You missed. Deliberately missed. Why? Halliday, you're pushing your luck. Maybe. I'm not saying I couldn't be wrong. No one ever really knows what's in another man's head. But if I'm right... Martin! Give me the gun, Ron. I warn you, put that straight jacket on Joe or I'll kill you here and now. I don't think so. If you were going to shoot us, you'd have done it instead of talking about it. Halliday! I've been sizing you up, Ron. The way I size up high school kids sent to me when they're in trouble. They do a lot of talking, too. A lot of bluster, a lot of bluff. Half the time, not knowing it is nothing but bluff because nobody's called them on it. Well, I'm calling you. Here and now. Calling you, Ron. One more step. Halliday, in heaven's name, you're not dealing with a high school kid. You're dealing with a maniac. That's the chance I'm taking, Joe. That your brother is no more insane than I am. Well, you are insane if you think he isn't. I've been with him night and day all his life. I tell you, he's mad. I don't believe it. He believes it. Oh, yes, he believes it, all right. Right now, this minute, he believes he'll shoot to kill me. But I'm gambling that when the chips are down, he'll throw in his hand. Oh, you seem very sure of yourself, Halliday. I'm anything but sure, Ron. But what have I got to lose? If I don't take that gun from you, we'll all die when the hurricane destroys the house. And even if you do shoot to kill... And do kill me. It'll give Joe a chance to get that gun away from you. Joe? Yeah? Get ready. If he shoots me, you'll have a split second to jump him. Okay? Okay. Martin! Take it easy, Fran. All right, Ron. One more step and you're dead. Not if I'm right about you, Ronnie. I'm willing to take a calculated risk based on what I've learned about you in the past hour. Learned? About me? You nearly killed your governess, Joe said, when you were a child, but didn't. I was stopped before I could. Were you? Or or could you have killed her before anyone came to save her, but held off until they came? What about the playmate you tried to murder? Somehow you didn't succeed there, either. Or the tutor you nearly killed with the scissors. Or my wife, Fran. Those pictures on the walls. You painted them, didn't you? What of it? None of them. Not one is finished. That's what of it. Why? Because you don't finish anything you start. You want to know the truth as I see it, Ronnie? I don't give a damn what... As I see it, when you were a child and Joe knocked you down, yes, you were knocked unconscious. But when you came to, you felt a a, a warmth, a security you'd never felt before. Because for the first time in your life, you were the center of attention. Especially your father's attention. You felt it. Loved it. Wanted more of it. Wanted to shoot. You, you, you... As time went on and you got no more attention, you missed it, yearned for it. Then one day, as I see it, when your governess refused to give you something you wanted, you flew at her in a childish tantrum. A tantrum, Ronnie, that's all it was. But again, you got attention. And again, you found it pleasurable and wanted more. And had found a way to get more. Am I right? You can't be. Ron, if I'm right... For nearly 20 years, you've been playing at being insane without knowing you were playing. You've told yourself a lie, the same lie, so often you came to believe it. But the fact is, you're not insane at all. Ron, for the last time, give me that gun. All right, then. I'll take it from you. We won't need the straight jacket now. All right, Joe, handcuff her to the water pipe. Move! That's right. Yes. Oh, my. All right, now handcuff yourself to her. Run. They'll come after you. They'll put you away. Do as I say. All right. All right. And now, goodbye, Joe. In a little while, the house will be gone, and you with it. 
<laughs> I'll be free of you. <laughs> free of you. <laughs> At last. At last. Martin. Martin. Miss Halliday? What? The hurricane's getting worse. We can't last long. I just want to say, I'm sorry you got caught up in all this. It was my fault. No, no, no. If I hadn't released your brother, I... Oh, oh. I... Martin! That was Martin! He just moved! He isn't dead. Oh, dear Lord, how can he be alive? He's dead! We didn't get a chance to look at him oh. close up. That bullet could have only creased his skull. Oh, oh thank God, thank oh. God. Oh, Martin. Here, look over here. Huh? We're handcuffed together. Oh. Here. What? Man. Oh, my. Man. Joe. What, what happened? Ron shot you. Oh, here. Here, my... Oh, my head. He went to the caves on the beach. He left us handcuffed to this pipe. Oh, gotta, gotta get out of here. There's no way, Halliday. We're handcuffed to this water pipe. He got the keys? Yes. Not, not if I was right. What about Ron? You were wrong. He shot you, didn't he? Yeah, but didn't, didn't kill me. He, he could have. Crack shot, you said. But... He didn't. And uh, that means... That means... What, Martin? Oh, it means what? He'll be back to save us. Oh, you're nuts. He, he can't go through with it. He never has before. He won't now. He'll be back. The question is, will he come in time? There isn't much. Oh, this could be it. couldn't stand, they fought their way to the caves on the beach, even as the house exploded into flying wreckage. Our cast included Joe Julian, Evie Juster, Jack Grimes, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown, E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... W.R. Mystery Theater. Mystery Theater program is furnished by the CBS Radio Network. This is W.O.R. New York, an RKO General Station. At the W.O.R. time signal, exactly 8 o'clock, here's John Scott with the news.
the Graymore Friars Monastery, is located on Atonement Mountain near Garrison, New York. Adjacent to this famous monastery, one sees St. Christopher's Inn. Homeless men from all walks of life come to this famous inn. These men are fed and sheltered by the Graymore Friars, and no distinction is ever made of race, creed, or color. You are invited to listen to another chapter of the dramatized story, The Life of Christ, brought to you transcribed each week by the Graymore Friars, who offer this series with a prayerful hope that this vivid portrayal of the life of Christ will help to awaken in you a deeper personal love of God and a firm determination to strive to prove that love in your daily life. Now, Chapter 14, The Storm at Sea. Give ear, O my people, to my doctrine. Incline thy ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth to utter parables. I will reveal the secrets of long ago. What we have heard and known, and those things which our fathers have told us, we will not hide from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the praises of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. And Jesus continued to speak to them in parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were asleep, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the blade sprang up and brought forth fruit, then the weeds appeared as well. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said to him, Wilt thou have us go and gather them up? No, he said, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will say to the reapers, Gather up the weeds first and bind them in bundles to burn. But gather the wheat into my barn. Master, explain to us this parable. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed, the sons of the kingdom. The weeds, the sons of the wicked one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. But the harvest is the end of the world. And reapers are the angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered up and burnt with fire, so will it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all scandals and those who work iniquity, and cast them into the furnace of fire, where there will be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Then the just will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Have you understood all these things? Yes, sir, we, we understood. understood. So then, every scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings forth from his storeroom things new and old. To what shall we liken the kingdom of God? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seed upon the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than any herb, and puts out great branches so that the birds of the air can dwell in its shade.
with these words, Jesus completed the parables to his disciples as evening came to end a day of heartbreak. But a brief time before, he had given the people the Sermon on the Mount and departed on a tour of Galilee. On his return, he found some of his followers anxious to seize him because they thought him mad, and the Pharisees charging him with being in league with the devil, and the crowds pressing in so closely his mother could not speak with him. And now it was growing dark, and still the people besieged his house and clamored for him. They come seeking thee, Master. Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. Yes, Master. There we can be alone with you. James, Andrew, run ahead and make the boat ready. We'll follow in a few minutes. very tired. I've fixed a cushion here in the stern. Won't you lie down? Thank you, Simon. Sleep if you can. We'll awaken you when we reach the shore. Course south by east, Andrew. Steer for the valley of Jarata. We were about to sink. Oh, you of little faith. Are you still without faith? Master. Where is your faith? To wars. We must row to reach Daraza by morning. What man is it? Even the sea obeys. And the winds. Who then is this? I who? Get back where you belong with the others. Hello! You on the cliff! What's that? Who calls? from Capernaum during the night. What, during the storm? Yes. I can't believe it. Our fishermen all turned back when the storm struck. Yet you say you came all the way from Capernaum. That is right. You're lucky. What brings you to Garasa? We seek quiet. Is there a path leading to the cliff? Yes, to your right. You go by the tombs. Oh, yes, I see it now. We're coming up. No, no, wait. Don't take the path. Why not? There's a man possessed by an evil spirit who lurks in the tombs. He's broken his chains. He wanders about naked. He has the strength of ten. He'll tear you to pieces. Go back, Mr. Stradivar. 
Go back, go back. There he is. He's coming your way. Master, look. Yes, look. Defend yourself. He'll kill you. Master, run. He's coming straight at you. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, son of the most high God? Go out of this man. Thou unclean spirit. I adjure thee by God, do not torment me. Hast thou come here to torment us before the time? What is thy name? Legion, for we are men. What's happened? He seems all right again. Wait, the master is questioning him. We entreat you, Jesus, son of the most high God. Don't command us to go back to the abyss. Let us stay on earth. This is Jesus, of whom we've heard so much? Yes. Master, don't listen to them. Send them away. To the fire. We beg you, Lord. There's a herd of swine feeding on the heights. Command us to leave this man, if you will. But let us go to the swine. So be it done. What's this? I'm responsible to see that no harm comes to the swine. The master commands the unclean spirits to leave this man. And gives them permission to enter the swine. He can do this thing. What's that? What's happened to the swine? Look, they're running up to the cliff. Help me, we must stop them. There's nothing we can do. They're going over the cliff into the sea. They're falling into the water. They sink like rocks. What can I say to the elders? Two thousand swine gone. They'll hear about this. What kind of a story is this, Seth? I swear it's the truth. One moment the herd was grazing peacefully. The next they began to squeal and run about in circles. Then suddenly, as one beast, they ran to the cliff and fell into the sea. It was a terrible thing to watch. Those ahead tried to stop, but the onrush of the others sent them over. And where were you at the time? With some men from Capharnaum. I warned them against the man with the evil spirits. Even as I did, he appeared. He rushed at them. But then a strange thing happened. What was that? He fell down in front of their leader and crawled to his feet and did not try to harm him. What? Who was this man? Jesus of Nazareth. You are sure of this? There can be no mistake. He commanded the evil spirits to leave the man. And they obeyed at once. And the man was well. He then gave the spirits permission to enter the swine. That's when they bolted for the cliff. Come, we must investigate this story at once. Are you sure of the year, Simon? Yes. Yes, 785 by the Roman calendar. Then I've been possessed by the devil for three years. The last I remember was the day I... I came home from the fields and found my wife and children dead from the plague. And yet what you say must be true. My beard. I always kept it trimmed. Now it's almost to my waist. You were mad. You lived in those tombs. Who is he at whose feet I knelt? Jesus of Nazareth. He has made you well. Here comes the swineherd with others from the village. No doubt they can tell you more about what's happened to you. But that's Seth. I know him. Seth! Seth! Why, he's well. He knows us. Come, have no fear. The evil has been driven from him. I am Alexander, magnate of the village. I am Simon from Capernaum. Is it true Jesus is here? Over there. The man in the center. Will you tell these people what happened to the swine? They cannot believe me when I say the evil spirits drove them over the cliff. It is the truth. No, no, be calm. Simon, I... I wish to speak to Jesus. Come. 
We have heard of your leader, of miraculous cures and many wonders. Are these stories true? Yes. I can tell you of things he has done which are beyond belief and understanding. Have you come here to preach to our people? No. We came to get away from the crowds that besiege him. Master, this is Alexander, a magnate of the village. He would speak to you. What would you have of me? Master, we are greatly honored that you should visit our shores. We are greatly impressed by what we have heard this morning, but we are fearful, too. We don't wish to seem ungrateful or unfriendly, but we are not Jews. We are of Greek ancestry, firm in our beliefs and our customs. There is little to be gained for your religion in this section, and your presence will be a source of dissension and will provoke trouble for yourself and followers and for us. No. No, you must not send him away. Rather beg him to stay. I can understand your wish that he stay, but we must consider the welfare of all our people. But he cured me. If not for him, I would still... Such powers as Jesus commands are unknown to us. They do not belong rightfully to man, but to God. Unwisely used, the consequences can be terrible beyond contemplation. Are you saying he should not have cured me? Two thousand swine was the cost to us of your cure. Yes, yes. Though we cannot measure the value of man against animals, the destruction of so many is a case in point. Could the time not come when the sacrifice for the doctrines Jesus preaches will be men instead of swine? We beg of you, Master, don't judge us too harshly if we who believe in moderation in all things request you to return to Kefalam. Son, we shall return. Prepare the boat. We are grateful for your decision. In parting, let me say, I do not envy you and your great gift. Why say you thus? Long ago, Socrates said, Nothing great enters into a man without its curse. Master, Andrew is signaling. The boat is ready. Lord, Lord, what of me? Let me come with you. I shall be your servant. I will serve you with my life. Go home to thy relatives and tell them all that the Lord has done for thee and how he has had mercy on thee. I will obey you in all things. I shall go about in the Decapolis and tell them of thy great mercy. Cast off! Up sail! Can all this we've seen today be true? We have eyes to see. A man is well again. And the sea is covered with our dead swine. Could the God of the Jews have sent this man to us? They claim theirs to be the one true God of the universe. Yes, that is their belief. But what are we to believe after this? I don't know. I'm greatly puzzled. Did we do right? In sending him away. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No, there are swine. What about them? Consider them. them. Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. Listen. Listen when I tell you how the Lord has had mercy on me. You knew me once when I worked my farm. You chained me that I might not harm you and myself. You ran from me out of fear. Three years I lived like an animal. And then... Suddenly, I was well. I awakened at his feet. I was naked, my body beaten and bruised. But my soul and mind were clean. Think not you have traded a demoniac for a herd of swine. For I shall repay you manifold. For today, you have seen God's great mercy. And I will tell it throughout the whole land. North 
by west, across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus and his disciples sailed, on past the middle of the sea, on toward the spot where but the night before the waves engulfed the small boat. And they were reminded of calm, reproachful words heard above the dying wind. Are you still without faith? Where is your faith? And they looked not at each other, but turned their eyes inward to seek the answer to his question. They came to Capernaum, and the crowd, seeing the boat from afar, cried out their joy at the return of Jesus. But across the Sea of Galilee, he who was a demoniac stood among the crowds and testified to the great things the Lord had done. What is it? The demoniac's come back. He's cured. The evil spirits have left him. Look well upon me and remember what I was for three years. Now I can show myself to men and communicate with them. By command of him who cured me, Jesus of Nazareth, I come before you an example for all to see. The living example of the Lord's mercy to man. Thus at Gerasa, he began doing the bidding of Jesus. And then he moved on to Hippos, to Gadara, to Pella. And the evil spirits were driven from me and entered the herd of swine who were destroyed. But one man was saved, myself. I come as a witness to the great things the Lord has done. People of Philadelphia... Beyond the Sea of Galilee is one of whom all have heard, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. He came to us, and we turned him away. Only a few hours he spent with us, but what he did will never be forgotten. Let us pray that he will return someday, for he has the power to destroy evil. I bear witness to that. For I was mad for three years, and he cured me at a word. If he can save one man, he can save others. He can save us all. For he speaks as one who understands and delivers God's great mercy. The people of the half-pagan land beyond Jordan and Galilee listened to the former demoniac and were stirred by his words, some to doubt, some to fear, and some with the desire to believe. But none to whom he spoke was left untouched or indifferent. And he was like the sower in the parable who came sowing the word of God. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. This is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up it is larger than any herb and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and dwell in its branches. Give ear, O my people, to my doctrine. Incline thy ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth to utter parables. I will reveal the secrets of long ago. What we have heard and known, and those things which our fathers have told us, we will not hide from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the praises of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done.
Saturday Night Theatre. Don't forget the grocery list, Aaron. Sure. Make it a dead sir. Don't forget. So long, Georgie. Bye. Bye, sir. Who was that? What is this grocery list? Don't you know? That was Major Owen Evans. He only happens to be the son of the new Minister of Munitions. Well, cut yourself a slice of cake, Major. <laughs> <laughs> we present William Squire as the Minister in Storm Lantern. A play adapted for radio by Morris Mizeovich from the book by Richard Earl Lloyd George with Noel Hood as the minister's wife, David Buck as the minister's son, Lawrence Payne as the minister's secretary, and Ira Heath as the minister's statistician. The time is the First World War. Storm Lantern. Owen! Oh, Owen, darling, how lovely to see you. We sent the car to the station. I got a lift from London. Well, let me look at you. You're looking well, Mother. How long has you leave, darling? I've got a week, a whole week. It was supposed to have started at midnight on the 4th and I was tangled up with a whole mob going to Victoria when I saw a friendly face with a large, familiar cigar stuck in the <laughs> middle of it. So I got a lift down. Oh, that was nice of him. Well, the place looks wonderful. Oh, what a relief. Have you eaten, Owen? Well, I have, but I can always eat again, of course. <laughs> How's the old man? Your father's in great form. It started to rain, so he said he'd go out for a walk. But, of course, he's expecting you, and I'm sure he'll be back soon. Owen! Oh, hello, Jason. How are you? Oh, you're looking well. You've got that in first. Don't you think he's looking well? He's looking fine. Not too thin, but there are lines around there. Oh, I think it suits him. Um, Mrs Evans, the generals have arrived. I've told them the minister was expecting his son and asked them to wait in the study. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Two top brass waiting their turn after an infantryman. Now I know I'm at home. Darling, I think I'll go and arrange about a nice hot bath for you and tea. Ah. Scott, Owen. Ah, thanks, Jason. How is father? Are you keeping him in order? Oh, nobody can do that, but I'm very, very proud of him. Uh, this new job, munitions. Yes, he gave up the exchequer for a new ministry. An absolutely unknown quantity, can you imagine it? Giving up the most important post to that of the Prime Minister for a purely technical job which had to be built up from scratch. We started off with a desk and two chairs, but later in the day one of the chairs was requisitioned because they said it belonged to another department. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's it going out there? Well, I'm glad Father's taken over munitions. It's bad, is it, Owen? It just doesn't seem to make sense. We've got the men, of course, and we're supposed to be a great industrial power. But how can you explain the awful sense of inadequacy? We're absolutely outclassed. Everything's needed. Howitzers, grenades, machine guns, rifles, barbed wire, trenching kits, shells, landmines, lorries. But I, I've made a whole list here. Oh, splendid. Let me have that, will you? I, I can see different handwriting here. Oh, half the battalion had a hand in this. It's what you might call a petition... You'd better let me have it back. I'll make out a clean copy for you. This was written with a pencil stub in the dugout. No, 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 no. It's fine as it is. Owen, oh, my dear boy. Hello, Father. Oh, it's wonderful to see you. My word, but you've grown tough. Hard <laughs> as nails. A real man, Jason. Eh? How are you, Father? He's looking fit, isn't he, sir? Um, I've got the generals Brewster and Crump in the study for you. I've told them you'll be able to see them later on. Later, Jason, later. How long? A week, starting the morning of the fifth. Splendid. They'll give us a chance to have one or two talks. Are you feeling tired? Well, it was very noisy out there. And most of the noise was being made by them, I suppose. All right, you don't have to tell me. Uh, excuse me, sir. A special branch man to see you too, sir. Mm. I've, I've told him to wait. Mm. For the moment, perhaps you'd kindly leave us, Jason. Yes, sir. What's up, Father? Is it really difficult? And there are two wars, my boy. And as far as I'm concerned, the principal one is here in Whitehall. <laughs> General Red Hot Brewster. They get promoted not on merit, but on a basis of senility. <laughs> Seniority. <laughs> like cheese, the older they are, the higher. <laughs> That's Brewster. Crump. <laughs> well, Brewster promoted Crump as his second in command. It's been the most ridiculous appointment since Caligula made his horse a proconsul. <laughs> what seems to be the trouble? All the good generals in the past never had enough equipment. 
They're always complaining about shortage of armament and troops. Our generals are different. They tell me they don't need any more equipment. But do they believe this themselves? Can they possibly believe it? No, but the suggestion originally came from me, a civilian. What an insufferable nerve. What business is it of mine anyway? The job of government is to provide the war, isn't it? Do you mean to say that they actually refuse equipment? Well, can you imagine it, Owen? It's like a soldier refusing a free sample in a Maison Tolere. <laughs> Excuse me. You mean you can actually supply this stuff and they won't have it? It's absolutely terrifying. I have to think up schemes to outwit them into accepting more equipment. Well, they leave this to me. I can handle them. I'll be praying for you, Father. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir, but Mr. Owen's bath is now ready and Mrs. Evans says she will have tea for him as soon as he's had it. Hello, Jessie. Oh, welcome home, sir. Thank you, Jessie. I think you'd better go, my boy. No, don't worry about what we've been discussing. Uh, in fact, I think I've got a bit of news that might cheer you up. Good news? I think so. So does Winston. Oh, what have you two been cooking up together this time? It's top secret. I've given my oath of allegiance. Mm, but you talk in your sleep. If you let this one out, you needn't worry about the Germans. I'll personally conduct the firing squad. Well, it must be something. Well, uh, for security reasons, we call this thing a... a tank. It's a mechanized cavalry charger. Oh, no, that's been thought of before. It won't work. No vehicle on wheels can go through barbed wire past dugouts and pillboxes. It doesn't run on wheels. No? How, how's it mobile, then? <laughs> well, I can't play guessing games with you about our top-secret inventions. Now, go along and have your bath. i got a big meeting. Well, good luck, Father. Oh, yes, uh, shall I tell the generals you're ready, sir? Yeah. Oh, by the way, um, this is a, a grocery list the boy brought home. Mr. Yes, well, look. It's rather crumpled. Crumpled and not very clean. What's all this different handwriting? It was written in the dugout by several of Owen's comrades. I'll make a clear copy for the generals, shall I? No, 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 no. I want this particular piece of crumpled, grimy paper. I suppose this uneven handwriting can't be attributed to uh, shell shock, can it? Yes, Mud from the trenches, Jason, eh? No little red stains? Eh? I suppose it'd be going a bit too far to experiment with a little red ink. Eh? <laughs> well, perhaps not. However, I can trust you to hand it to me at the psychological moment. Indeed, sir. How long have they been waiting? About half an hour, but they're all right. I've explained about Owen, and they've got halfway through a bottle of brandy already. Yeah. Well, there's this other chap. He's from Scotland Yard, I believe. Any idea how long it'll take? Oh, well, perhaps you'd better see him first. The generals will take up the rest of the evening, won't they? Yeah, well, tell Chief Detective Inspector Taggart that I can give him two and a half minutes. He's just outside, sir. Come in, Inspector. Thank you. You have exactly two and a half minutes. Inspector Taggart, sir. Sit down, will you? Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, now, uh, what's this confidential matter you wish to see me about? Sir? How are you, Mr. Evans? Taggart. Aye. <laughs> Taggart? Do I know you? There's something familiar. Ah, you were a young MP and we were going on a midnight expedition into the underworld. Bless me, Jack the <laughs> Ripper. <laughs> That's right, you've got it now. And my <laughs> word, what a night. <laughs> Here, Inspector, have a cigar. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes, we never did catch him. I'm sorry it turned out to be a wasted night for you. Wasted? Well, we found no trace of the criminal. Mm, I found something all right that night, Inspector. It wasn't altogether a wasted evening. No criminal was caught, and you couldn't find clues of any crime. <laughs> what about the gin houses, the doss houses, the stinking alleys and grimy cellars, the rickety tenon, disorderly houses and thieves' dens? All this in the capital of the richest country in the world. I set out to investigate a crime that night. I found evidence of 10,000. Yes, sir. Well, I don't want to keep you. You must be a busy man, Inspector. Now, what do you want to see me about? It... This is a security matter, Mr. Evans. We're rather concerned about your safety. Yes, yes, yes. Now, what is it? There's a young woman on your staff, a Miss Caroline Bishop. You know her, of course. What about her? She joined your staff last March. If you say so. A statistical expert, I understand. Well? We've just discovered that she's in the inner circle of the militant suffragette movement. Caroline? Yes. Now, I don't have to tell you, Mr. Evans, what happened to you in the past. You'll dismiss the girl, won't you? It's dangerous to have her here where she can take a pot shot whenever the mood's on her. Mm, well, we'll see what a little finesse can do in this situation. A woman is a highly susceptible organism, Taggart. I don't know what you're up to, sir, but I don't like well, it. If you don't know what I'm up to, you don't know whether you like it or not, eh? Now, be a good chap and let me handle it my own way. Now, highly intelligent and capable statisticians are not to be dismissed lightly. Oh, please be careful. Capable 
statisticians are not to be dismissed lightly. Oh, please be careful, sir. Yes, it was very friendly of you to call, Inspector. Oh, good day to you, Inspector. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Jason, sir. Uh, before you call these chaps in, uh, have I got my production charts? Uh, they're in your desk, Minister. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. Now, two things. That little bit of paper. Do I hand it to you, or does Owen? Owen, brief him. Sir. Now, Jason, tactics. This is a crucial meeting. I'm going to use everything I know to break through their stonewalling tactics. Now, what have you found out? Uh, Brewster. Brewster. Nothing in his private life. No vices, no financial involvements. But there is one small thing of interest. Do you know he's afraid of spiders? General Brewster. It may sound incredible, but he'd rather face a rhinoceros at full gallop than a spider. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) All right, I'll try to remember. Now, you've got me the other material I asked for. Uh, Yes, I've put it on your desk. Brewster's second cousin married a man called Thomas Alfred Baverstock, who is a shareholder of Hamilton's The Small Arms People. And I've got the names of others. All right, fetch them in. Oh, I hate to use this sort of stuff, but heaven help us, what is there to do? I'm sure you're right, sir. Gentlemen, the minister will see you now. Uh, (coughs) Gentlemen, I'm sorry you were kept waiting. How do you do, minister? (coughs) How's your boy? Uh, Major Limbry. Splendid, sir. Mm, uh, sit down, gentlemen. Sit down. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. Now yes, then, sir. I take it we've left our revolvers <laughs> in the cloak room. Oh, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes, I've talked it over with my colleague, Minister. We're quite ready to settle our differences and start a fresh page. After all, there's teamwork called for. If we all pull together, we'll knock Jerry for six feet. Mm, die on, die on. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. Yes, I don't have to remind you, Minister, that we have our boys at the front, well, too. There's no need to make any protest about that, General. Uh, we would uh, like to speak very plainly, however. Splendid. Now, you've got some figures about equipment, Minister. Now, before you start firing the matter, say... <laughs> Let me give you just one statistic that we've computed while we were waiting for you in the study where you made us uh, so very comfortable. Very <laughs> <laughs> good. Between us, General Brewster and I have 67 years of military experience. Uh, what my colleague means to say is that we, too, have worked out certain figures of our requirements. Yes, you see, you must consider, Minister, the question of mobility. Now, in the old days, troops were strengthened with great quantities of protective armor, and armies vied with each other in providing heavier and heavier armor for their soldiers. And in the end, this defeated uh, the whole purpose of defense by slowing down maneuverability. Uh, now, gentlemen, I'm not dismissing mobility, maneuverability, and general agility. I don't want to bog you down with unnecessary material, but surely, surely this is not a proposal to equip your cavalry with 15th century armor. Oh. But gentlemen, this has become an engineer's war. All our national genius for inventiveness and organization in the machine age is at your disposal. More than 600 industrial firms have agreed to turn out weapons. Yes, sir. Here is the raw material of victory, gentlemen. And we offer it to you to hammer into practical military shape. But who are these firms, Minister? What do they understand about producing weapons? They're the top men in the country. Hard-headed manufacturers of commodities ranging from locomotives to sewing machines. Uh, uh, Yes, but they've had no experience producing arms, Minister. We are professional soldiers. We must know that our weapons are up to standard. Yeah, yeah. We can't equip our fighting men with machine guns produced by sewing machine specialists. Uh, This war isn't a sewing circle, you know. (laughs) Minister, Minister, you, you must appreciate that it is only a selected number of industrial firms who have had the experience to produce weapons to the required standard. Yes, yes. I, uh, I have a list here. Here, now, now, these are old traditional firms whose experience goes back some 200 years. But, General, they made javelins, then. If I needed pikes and bows and arrows, I'd be delighted to place an order for them with these fuddy duddies. Oh, oh, uh, what's going on? Hmm? A favoured firm policy? Hmm? Is there any nasty nepotism going on between the war office and these ancient armorers? If there is, I'll get to the bottom of it. Sir, are you suggesting that? No, no, no. I'm not accusing anybody. But every situation which encourages the favoured firm's policy spews out its opportunists, its adventurers and practitioners of corruption. Go look here, Dr. Ben! I've been accused of this sort of thing myself and through very ugly experience I've learned how these things function and create misunderstanding. I'm only telling you all this to explain the dangers of a favoured firm policy. It creates jealousy, and jealousy is the father and mother of scandal-mongering. 
When it rains, gentlemen, when the heavens open, we all get wet. I I think you're exaggerating the danger of this, Minister. Trust my experience, General. You're in my territory now. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to intrude. Well, that's all right, my boy. Your intervention might be quite timely. Come in, come in. Gentlemen, I'd like to meet my son, Owen. General Brewster, Lieutenant General Crump. Now, sit down, my boy. My son was in the tropics when war broke out, and he traveled three or four thousand miles to fight in your war, General. I know your reason well, young man. They're a credit to us. Mm, He's just come back from the front on leave, and by pure coincidence, he was telling me about the sense of insecurity he felt about German shell fire. Uh, Well, it's just that we feel we'd like to chuck just as much of the stuff back at them. Mm, When Owen heard that I'd been made Minister for Arms Production, his comrades um, made up a little grocery list. Am I right, Owen? Grocery list? Oh, you Minister. don't happen to have it on you, my boy, do you? Uh, uh, let me see, Father. Um, keys, lighter. Uh, oh, this <coughs> address is no, no, it's not it there. Ah, oh, there it is. Yes, I've got it, Father. There you are. Ah, yes. Yes, it's all that different handwriting. Mm. Oh. I suppose most of your comrades had a hand in this. Mm. Uh, yes. Some of this is almost undecipherable. <laughs> they were written in the front line, weren't they? Uh, yes. <laughs> The word howitzers is written with a very shaky handwriting. Uh, Jackson was suffering from a bit of shell shock, I'm afraid, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now, what are we going to do about this gentleman, eh? This crumpled bit of paper, grimy from the mud of the trenches, eh? written with a stub of pencil on a soldier's knee by the light of a guttering candle. Hmm? Look for yourself. Uh, uh, quite, yes, sir. Yes. I shall deal with it. No, 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 no. Don't file it. I want to keep this little piece of paper... I've got a meeting at the Albert Hall on Sunday, and I'd like to be able to tell the people in that audience that this is the order I've received and to say that the goods shall be delivered. Huh? Oh. They shall be delivered, gentlemen. I'll, uh, I'll tell Mother you're still engaged for the time being. You are doing. Well, gentlemen, shall we study these production charts? We've already seen them. How many machine guns do you think you need for each battalion, Brewster? Four as a maximum. I've marked 16. Now, do you seriously think that this is going to hinder your strategy? Oh, now, don't tell me. Before you present me with any arguments, I think I ought to give you the benefit of one piece of strategy that I have acquired in my experience. Now, draw closer, gentlemen. Closer, please. Now, this is what I want to tell you. You're doing this all wrong. Don't you see, if you put in an order for more equipment than I can supply you with, you can always blame me for your defeat. What? What? (laughs) I'm telling you something that you can use against me. Now, Brewster, how many machine guns do you want to order? We've based all our tactics on standard weights of equipment, Minister. Four. When you march, General, go forward, for God's sake. Yes, sir, we just don't trust those other firms. Do we trust them? No. For no, no, God's no, sake, man, you heard my son say we need more shells. Shells that may explode in our own trenches. Exactly. All right. I'm sorry to have to do this. Let me see that list of favoured firms, the old faithfuls. Well, we've given them to you. Uh, here, here's our copy. Now, Brewster, you yourself have no personal interest in any of these firms, of course, but uh, do you happen to have a relative called Batherstock? Tom! Oh, him! Oh, yes, yes. Relative on my wife's side. Oh, let's see, I, I don't, don't, don't suppose I've seen him for a couple of years or so. Mm, I see the name Hamilton's listed as one of the firms we've been placing contracts with. Don't you feel it a little indiscreet for your relative to buy shares in that company? Damn it, man! What's it got to do with me? How do you think it would sound if there was a rumor to the effect that you resolutely refuse contracts to other firms? Oh. The one in which your wife's relative invests his money is favored by the war office. You're a bloody That's a wicked shame. You're a damn a of a of shells in the Hamiltons. My sister's got shares in them myself. I'll deal with you in a minute. Now listen. I know there's not a shred of connection between your favored firm policy and your wife's cousin's husband. But even if you two beat me up so that I have to crawl on my hands and knees to get there, I'll still get up in the house and tear every stitch off your back. Stop! Uh, Apologize! Uh, don't move. Why oh, are you talking to me? Don't move. It might run up your leg. What? what? A spider. Oh, no! Oh, well, well. Uh, don't flap. It's gone now. Where, 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 where? Sit down, Sam, for goodness sake. Don't you see he's pulled a flanker? There's no spider. No, no, uh, crap. Uh, are you no, sure? Don't fool. Sit down, man. He's made a fool. No. Oh, I, I, uh, right. Gentlemen. <clears throat> You insisted on four machine guns, and I suggested 16. Let's compromise. 
20. Ah, I'm setting our production targets at the same ratio. 500% increases. You'll have fortnightly reports as to our progress. All right. But we're placing a firm order for this slot, and if you're late with delivery, we'll nail you to the poles. I said, don't bother to see me out. Thank you, Father. And good day to you, too. <laughs> Success, Jason. <laughs> Agreement. Oh, Jason, what a villain I am. Sometimes I succeed in frightening myself. <laughs> I worked the spider. <laughs> Poor old Brewster. <laughs> oh, they deserve it, sir. <laughs> Congratulations. Good. <laughs> now, another thing, Jason. Caroline Bishop. Sir. Why did you engage her? Well, she had first-class qualifications, sir. Is anything wrong? Do you know she's a militant suffragette? Lord, no. Are you sure about that? Good heavens, I'll have to get rid of her at once. You think she'll want to stick a knife in my back, eh? Or was it uh, Charlotte Corday who butchered Mara when he was taking his bath? Well, I don't necessarily see it taking place on quite such an intimate occasion. Touché. <laughs> Anyway, let me uh, have a look at the girl. I really think you shouldn't take such chances, Minister. Now, don't worry, my boy. I'll deal with her. Well, she's she's been waiting in the anteroom, sir. Mm-hmm. No. The uh, young lady, sir. Thank you, Jason. That'll be all for the moment. Uh, hmm. Miss Bishop. Mm-hmm. Well, sit down, please, young lady. Jason told me that you're uh, an excellent statistician. Yes, sir. Mm. Send an official memo to the Director General of the Arms Production Committee. Sir. I am pleased to inform you that agreement has been reached with the General Staff about our production targets. 500% increases in all categories of weapons to be delivered by yesterday. But earlier will be appreciated. Oh, congratulations, sir. Uh, thank you, my dear. It is exciting. All categories of weapons? Everyone. What about ambulances? Ambulances? Oh, we'll send those to Kaiser Willy. I'll settle for guns. No. There's something I'd like to ask you, Miss Bishop. What is your opinion of women's role in the war effort? You know, we've plans to have the young women and housewives working in the factories. Do you really want to know what I think? I think it's a very fine mess you men have got us all into. And now, I suppose, we're being asked to show our appreciation and and loyalty by doing work that we've never been trained to do for wages far below what would be paid to the men. And afterwards, when we've helped to get you out of this mess, we'll be bundled back into the kitchen and the nursery and told that we're not really fitted to have a voice in our future and the future of our children. And then the whole thing will start all over again. Oh, my dear, you'll see that it will not be the same. (laughs) Mm. You know, last week I visited the old village where I was brought up... I wandered through the woods familiar to my boyhood. Now I saw a child gathering sticks for firewood, and I thought of the hours I spent in the same pleasant and profitable occupation. For I also have been something of a backwoodsman. And here is one experience taught me then, which is of use to me today. I learned as a child it was little use going into the woods after a period of calm and fine weather, for I generally returned almost empty-handed. But after a great storm, I came back with an armful. We are in for rough weather now. We may even be in for a winter of storms. It will rock the forest, break many a withered branch, and leave many a rotten tree turned up by the roots. But when the weather clears, you may depend on it there'll be something brought within the reach of the people that will give warmth and glow to their grey lives. Something that will help to dispel the hunger, despair, the oppressions of the wrongs which now chill so many of their hearts. And women, who have so nobly rallied to our help, will share our right to lend their voice in the highest councils. Yes, Mr. Evans. And when women have the franchise, when that golden day breaks, I only hope that they will not lose their taste for wearing a pretty petticoat. Hmm? I hope you won't insist on the right of being a cement mixer. On the subject of femininity, some of my views are uh, decidedly old-fashioned. How are you going to do it? Mr. Evans. We're going to do it with a stiletto. Pills or a homemade contraption of glycerine and nitrates. I don't understand you. 
How did you find out? When were you going to time it for? Derby Day? Michaelmas or Halloween? You knew all the time. Why didn't you have me arrested? <laughs> oh, you're not oh. such a desperate character after all, are you? Oh. Here, give him a good blow. Oh, no, don't worry. Nothing's going to happen to you. You mean you, you won't arrest me? Mm, I suppose you were determined to prove yourself a heroine. <laughs> I wasn't really going to blow you up. It was to be a demonstration of a suitable occasion. <laughs> I was the inside woman. Well, why did you calmly send for me when you knew that... Are you really a dangerous woman, <laughs> Caroline? How fascinating. <laughs> Tell me, have you ever stood on top of Vesuvius? I was in Naples when Vesuvius started getting lively again. All my hotel friends made a beeline to the nearest railway station, but I climbed <laughs> to the top of Vesuvius and stood at the mouth of the crater, listening to the rumblings and watching the black smoke and little spurts of fire like a huge angry cat licking its lips. <laughs> I think you'd have enjoyed it too. It was one of the most exhilarating moments of my life. Standing there singing Welsh hymns. Clever girl. I suppose that's why you love storms. <laughs> yes, of course. I've seen you go out in the rain, waving your shepherd's crook, with your cloak flying in the wind, looking like some terrible villain from Italian opera. But that's exactly what I am. <laughs> you know what I think, young lady? Instead of some noisy mob demonstration, you should try to make your point with feminine strategy. Did uh, Cleopatra tie us off the railings, eh? Did uh, Pompadour go on hunger strike? No, they waggled their pretty bottoms once or twice, and before you could say alimony, they had their hot little hands on everything they wanted. This isn't a personal opinion. Everybody knows about Cleopatra. Yes, sir, but please... Oh, don't you think the role of Mark Antony suits me? But please, Mr. Evans. I have to go now. Mm, yes, of course. You know, perhaps I'd better have some figures from you. Come to my study after dinner. Yes, Minister. Hello, Morgan Evans here. Um, may I speak to Sir Beerbohm Tree? Uh, Herbert? Yeah. Look, I want your advice. I'm speaking at the Albert Hall on Sunday. You know that damned echo. <laughs> Well, I want to project my voice so the words going out don't hit the words coming back. Yes, it's a barn of a place, I agree. Well, how would you cope? Hey, what do you know? This is all our stuff. Hey, I What have we got here? And I step foot! Sir! Yes, Jason? We've had the phone call. Just this minute. Yes? It's all over, sir. The campaign worked. Oh, I knew it. News from the palace is that the PM's resignation was handed in early this morning. <gasps> Thank God. At last, my hands are free. I had to do it. You know I had to do it, Jason. Yes, that's true. You're the only man for the job. You mean that? I swear it. You had to do it. I didn't do it alone, you know. No, I had tremendous allies. I think I can say we're all entirely disinterested. The proof is that they were from every party, right, left and centre. We had to form a united front. Fleet Street, that's where the power is. Friends in Fleet Street. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's easier to get rid of a prime minister than a general in wartime. That's a lesson we mustn't forget. The real work is before us. <laughs> well... I suppose I shall get a summons to the palace any time now. Uh, I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, too. What is it? Uh, a newspaper man has got hold of the story of your affair with Caroline Bishop. Oh, damn and blast! Oh, never mind, it's not serious. Nobody will dare attack me now. I know, I know, but this newspaper man is stupid. He's a, a Welsh Anglican, and his editor is a Welsh Anglican. Oh, heaven help us! What am I to do? By the way, who is Caroline Bishop? You must remember, sir, 
Last year. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the suffragette. <laughs> Goodness, I took all the ginger out of her crusade in a knife. <laughs> yes, you're right. It's no laughing matter. <laughs> Did I tell you that story about my feud with the Anglican bishop? <laughs> One night our party planned a counterblast and I appeared on the platform and the chairman introduced me. He said, we all know that the bishop of St. Asaph is the greatest liar in creation. But thank goodness, yes, we have in Mr. Morgan Evans a match for him tonight. <laughs> oh, these Anglicans. What are we going to do? Who is this writer? I thought it best to let you see him. Have a personal word. He's just arrived. Well, how much can he prove? Well, I don't suppose he can actually produce a photograph of you in bed with him. That's it. Brutal, but true. Well, I had a word with him, and he's certainly got some proof. Enough to write a piece, anyway. Do you think he would really dare do this to me at the present time? Oh, don't forget, sir. There's a whole army of VIPs in your own party, in the Tories, among the Labour backbenchers, who would be delighted to see you embarrassed, to say nothing of the general staff. Scandal brought down Parnell, Dilk. You haven't forgotten. Oh, what a curious world we live in. Here am I, the foster son of a shoemaker who is about to become this country's war leader. I could only have achieved this on the simple grounds that I'm the only person fitted for this job. But because I relax after an 18-hour spell of work with a little slap and tickle in my study, social foundations tremble. The journalist, sir. He's 36, pompous, self-righteous and a bit of a fool. He works for one of the Cardiff dailies. He seems to be flattered to be summoned to see you, but he won't easily be shaken. Mm. Thirty-six. Mm. And if he's a reporter and able to travel from Cardiff, he's uh, able-bodied, isn't he? What does the army have to say these days about an able-bodied young man of thirty-six, Jason? Yes, sir. I didn't think of that. No, we'll have to do this very carefully. We have to cope with it with the hot and cold technique. You'll do the threatening, I'll do the bribing. I've got to be the hero, of course. All right. All right, that's one. Now, tell me as soon as there's any news from the palace. What else? Uh, oh, the generals are here, sir. Crump's brought his plans for the offensive. Yes, now, what's my opinion about that? Uh, well, I think it's a crackpot scheme, but then, of course, I'm only an amateur. Why do you say that? Well, he, he wants to attack through a reclaimed swamp. And in August... At the time when there's been regular monsoon weather for the last 30 years. Mm, he says that summer is the best time for an army to attack, and we're supposed to have the advantage of surprise by attacking through a reclaimed swamp. I mean, if you think it a crackpot scheme, then the Germans will probably think so too. Well, we've got the ordnance requirements all worked out in any case, haven't we? The departments have worked out all the requirements for supplies in every detail. Mm, now, uh, listen carefully. I want you to make a mistake in them. A mistake? Yes, an unimportant one, but a mistake. In what, sir? Anything. Gumboots. Hmm. How many pairs of gumboots have we on order? Whatever Very it is, stick a knot on it. Very well, sir. And uh, when we discuss the figures in your presence, you'll have to draw my attention to it. I see. Well, <clears throat> yes, sir. All right, that's all, I think. Now, we'd better deal with this young fellow. What's his name, the reporter? Uh, his name is Hughes. Mm, and his first name? Hugh. Hugh Hughes. No jokes, Jason. If there's any jokes to be made, I'll make them. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> Morgan, you know you have these visitors again, the generals. Shall I give them a meal, or are you going to be busy with them? Oh, Catherine. Uh, I'd like to have a chat, my dear. Uh, yes, later, Jason. Uh, let me know when you need me, sir. I have something to tell you, Cathy. What is it? What's wrong this time? My dear, there's nothing wrong, at least nothing serious. But there's something wonderfully right. The Prime Minister has handed in his resignation, and I expect a courier from the palace any time now. The Premiership? Darling, I think the King is going to ask me to form a new government. Oh, Morgan. You see, darling, all our years of struggle to be crowned, and I want you to know that I could not have done it without you. Morgan, my dear. Mm, it's not quite settled yet. You understand there are still difficulties and problems. I mean, some of the Prime Minister's friends in the Cabinet have sworn that they won't serve with me. What have they got against you? Oh, against me personally, nothing. But we come from a different background. I mean, these are all school friends of the Prime Minister. We are faced with jealousy and caste solidarity. But I can overcome it, and I shall. With your help. How can I help you? You can help. I'm going to be absolutely frank with you, Catherine. My enemies have tried to find every way to discredit me. They stopped at nothing, even to fabricated scandal about me. I mean, you know very well, my dear, how vulnerable a public man is. I mean, I've only got to exchange a polite word with a woman at the reception and tongues start wagging. I mean, how many times has that happened in the past? Oh, Morgan, not again. Now, don't misjudge me. 
You know, I only have to smile and those damned hussies start boasting that they made a conquest of me. What's happened this time? Oh, there was a young woman on my staff. I haven't seen her for months now. She left at the beginning of this year. In fact, I could hardly remember who she was, and I was told about it. What uh, are they saying? Well, they're linking my name with hers. They've absolutely no proof whatever. All that happened was that when I was working late, as you know I have to, my dear, she invaded my study one night on the pretext that she wanted some letters signed. I went through the correspondence with her, and then she had to check something in one of the letters, so I took a short nap. I mean, you know how it happens. I can sleep anywhere. Well, I just put my feet up for five minutes, and... When I woke up, I found my tie unfastened and my shirt unbuttoned. I mean, she said she was making me comfortable. Well, I'm afraid that's how we were found together by another member of the star. Oh, no, Morgan, what a terrible liar you are. Give me the Bible. No, no, I won't have you blaspheme. Give me the book. I shall swear by all that's holy. I won't have you adding any more sins to your conscience. All right, my dear, believe it or not, as you will. But I've been in the front line for two years now. I fought the battles at home as well as those in France. I've had to fight every kind of bitter opposition. I've worked 20 hours a day. I haven't slept. I've gone without rest and every solace. Why? Am I a war profiteer? Am I a poster hero who basks in his artificial glory? Others have made millions out of the war or live with the sound of perpetual applause in their ears. I've just done a job of work. The king wants me to form a government. Am I doing this for ambition? Was it ambition that prompted me to give up the chancellorship for a new unknown ministry and involve myself in technicalities for which I had to go to school all over again? But I willingly made this sacrifice, and I ask as my right for sacrifices from you. Yes, my dear, sacrifice your pride, stifle your jealousy, forget that I'm a husband, and remember that I'm a pilot trying to navigate a storm never before experienced in the history of our country. You don't have to make speeches to me, Morgan, spare me your eloquence. I'll do what I must for Owen's sake. He's told me what we owe to you. Oh, my dear. What is it you wish me to do? Well, nothing, almost nothing. Well, there's a young man waiting for me in the study. Um, after I've interviewed him for a few minutes, all I want you to do is to uh, well, come in with a tray of coffee. Hmm? No. Oh, no, Morgan. Please. Don't touch me. Mr. Hugh Hughes. Oh, sir. indeed. From the Cardiff Echo, Minister. How... Uh, how do you do, sir? Oh, busy, very busy, Mr. Hughes, as you see. <laughs> we have to keep the pipelines flowing, don't we? Still, I always have time for my friends from the press. What can I do for you? Uh, no, 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 don't go, Jason. Mr. Evans, sir, this may sound like impertinence, but my editor has asked me to interview you about a certain matter of importance... In connection with your own personal life. My editor feels that in these days particularly, our leadership shall give an example of righteousness and uprightness. So many of us forget today when our physical well-being is in danger that it is our immortal soul which is important. Mr. Evans, sir, have you always followed the true path? Mr. Hughes, the minister isn't here to protest his honor. If you know anything to suggest that he is not an honourable and upright man, it is for you to prove. Otherwise, you must understand that that question is a damnable piece of impertinence. No, no, Jason. The young man is earnest and zealous, and obviously he's only doing his work as a good journalist. <laughs> There's nothing personal in all this, of course, Mr. Hughes. Oh, of course not, Mr. Evans. But I have my duty as a citizen and professional man to ask you this question. Well, my young friend, as you ask me, on behalf of your Welsh readers, you obviously have a right to know these things. And the answer is that there is nothing whatsoever on my conscience. Come to the point, Hughes, of what are you accusing, Mr. Evans? I'm afraid it is immoral behaviour with a certain young lady formerly a member of Mr. Evans's personal staff. Have you any proof? I regret to say yes. We have corroborative information from another member of Mr. Evans's domestic staff. Oh, he's talking about Caroline Bishop, Minister. She was on our staff, that is true. Caroline Bishop? Mm. Uh, do I know the girl? Well, she left our employment almost a year ago, Minister. I doubt whether you will even remember her. Mm. Who's the other person? Oh, somebody else we had to dismiss. She was directed from a rather redundant sinecure post to uh, factory work. Well, Mr. Hughes, that doesn't amount to very much, does it? <laughs> How well do you know these people? Well, it is true I've, I've only known them a short while. Ah, you mean since they brought you the story? Do you know that that woman, Caroline Bishop, was a militant suffragette and a sworn enemy of Mr. Evans? Do you know that the suffragettes tried to murder Mr. Evans in his own home, that they planted a bomb? 
And as a result of this criminal piece of folly, members of their organization were sentenced at the Old Bailey to terms of imprisonment. Oh, but that wasn't Miss Bishop. I've checked her background and know nothing against her. She has no criminal record. Nor all. have many other sworn enemies and opponents of Mr. Evans. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't stoop to all sorts of devices to prevent him from doing his indispensable work effectively. You know, this matter is really more simple than it may seem. I have a large staff here. Because of the war, it is predominantly feminine. But Mrs. Evans has never seen fit to object to the presence of these ladies in my home. Oh, I think you'll have to find some rather stronger proof than what you've told us about. If you don't prove such an accusation up to the hilt, Mr. Hughes, I can promise you that both you and your paper will have the biggest libel damage claim in the history of Welsh journalism. No, no, Dresden, my boy, there's no need for any of this. I'm sure Mr. Hughes is a reasonable man. He's entirely disinterested. All he wants is to see that justice is done and the high standards that one expects from our leaders are maintained as an example to the community. I'd like to have it clear from you, Mr. Hughes. Mr. Evans has denied this accusation in respect of Caroline Bishop and this other person. Do you give us your assurance that you accept us? I shall report what you have said, Mr. Evans. But naturally... I am not authorized to give any assurance that my editor will not print my article. I understand, Mr. Hughes, that you are 36. Uh, yes. And you obviously seem to be able-bodied. Oh. What? Is there any particular reason for your military deferment? Jason. No, no. Really? Excuse me, Minister, but I must insist on this. Mr. Hughes has questioned your character. Mm, that's true. Well... What's your explanation, Mr. Hughes? I don't have to give an explanation about that. I've already appeared before an official tribunal and satisfied them about my objections to fighting in the war on, on certain religious grounds. Mm, yes. Let me see. Fighting in the war. Uh, Jason? Yes, sir. Aren't we forming a special corps of stretcher bearers? Oh, quite right, Minister. Brave fellows. Genuine pacifists, but honorably serving their country in an entirely non-combatant way there. Amid flying shrapnel and whistling bullets, they succor their wounded comrades in the heat of battle. Oh, no, no. That should satisfy your immortal soul, Mr. Hughes. No, 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 Jason. I think this must be left to Mr. Hughes's conscience. Nevertheless, I think I'll drop a line to Mr. Hughes' editor about this special corps. You know, Minister, how often you've been reproached about protecting young, able-bodied men when middle-aged family men have been called up. Mm. Yes, it is a problem. Nevertheless, if I have genuine proof of this accusation, Mr. Evans, I feel honour-bound to do my journalistic duty. Well, exactly, Mr. Hughes, if you have genuine proof, but what does that amount to? I mean... Are we going to take as gospel the gossip of two rather disgruntled females who've been directed from rather comfortable jobs to factory work? I approve of your high journalistic standards. It is a rare and refreshing thing these days. And I'd much rather see you carve an honourable career for yourself for the future. Oh, I don't want to send you into battle, Mr. Hugh Hughes. I'd rather have you in who's who. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Mum. Oh, Please don't get up. I am sure you would like a hot drink after your long journey, Mr. Hughes. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, my dear. Thank you, ma'am. I'll leave you, gentlemen. Uh, no, 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 Cathy, my dear, don't leave. Uh, I'd like you to stay and meet Mr. Hughes. He's from Cardiff. Oh, really? We have many friends there, Mr. Hughes. We always welcome our friends when they're in foreign parts. <laughs> Mr. Hughes has asked me a rather personal question, Catherine. It's in connection with a young lady who was on my staff about a year ago. Do you remember her? A Caroline Bishop. No. No, no, I don't. I, I'm afraid I know nothing about her. But Mr. Hughes seems to think that I do. Well, come along, Mr. Hughes. You had a certain accusation to make about this young lady. Well, would you kindly repeat it? I... Uh... Milk and sugar, Mr. Hughes? No. Uh, yes, two lumps, please. Well, Mr. Hughes? No, no, Minister, I, 
I've decided I, I, I've nothing to ask you. Uh, th thank you for granting me an interview, Mr. Evans. I have a long journey, and I, I, I think I ought to be on my way. Oh, I do understand. Now, look after yourself, young man. The slush on the roads is very treacherous. This way, Mr. Hughes. Oh, Catherine, uh, no, let me help you. No, I can manage. Uh, Leave me be, Morgan. There's nothing more for us to say to each other. Just open the door for me. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Evans. May I help you with that? No. Next case, Jason. Oh, don't forget, gum boots. Yes, sir. What are you grinning at? Mr. Hugh Hughes, I'd much rather have you in who's who. <laughs> yeah, all right, sir. Gum boots. Now, that's it. Now, one other thing. If the king's messenger arrives, interrupt us. And I want full drill with fanfares, general proclamation, and a ten-gun salvo. Yes, of course. You won't hear their groans for bursting rockets. This way, gentlemen. <coughs> Good day, Mr. Good, Good day, day, Minister. Gentlemen, gentlemen, now please be seated. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you. Now, I understand there's only one thing on the oh. agenda today. Crump's offensive project. It's about time we had your approval of that, uh, Minister. Yeah, well, well, I've given you the guns, and so now you're anxious to use them on me. Oh, we've got to get out of the doldrums, Minister. This stalemate must end, or we'll be defeated by sheer boredom. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I must tell you frankly, gentlemen, that I'm sceptical about our capacity to launch an offensive. Yeah. I don't like the idea of launching it in a reclaimed swamp where the irrigation system can be smashed up after a few gun barrages. Oh. We've been over all that, Minister. Yes, the yes, whole yes. beauty of the scheme, <clears throat> if I may say so, is that no one will expect us to launch our attack at that particular time and place for the very reasons you've given and we'll have the inestimable advantage of surprise. Exactly. Let's see, Brewster. As a matter of interest, do you recall how many machine guns you said you needed as a maximum? Oh, that's not oh that was some time ago. And I remind you, four, you said. Four. And I had to trick you into agreeing to 20. How many machine guns are we equipping our battalions with these days? Forty-eight. <sighs> Need you feel surprised, gentlemen, when I point out to you that I have good reason for thinking that you tend to underestimate your requirements, particularly for an offensive. And you, sir, are the better judge of military problems than we are. Do you really want me to answer that? Ah, uh, come, gentlemen, no, let's bicker about past differences. We've acknowledged our great indebtedness to your work in the arms ministry. All we're saying now is that the wonderful flow of arms has made it possible for us to crack down on the enemy and smash him. You sir. think that the Germans haven't been able to match our flow of arms? What assurance can you give me that we have an advantage in weight of armor? It is not necessary to have a total preponderance of weapons. Right, the whole sir. point about the strategy, if I may be allowed, is to have the initiative in attack. And for that, local superiority of firepower is all that's required. We don't have to break through the entire front, Minister. No. Look here, let me show you, sir. Now, now, look here. There, there, and there. Now, these three parts of the front are the only ones at which it is necessary to achieve a breakthrough. Now, in 48 hours, Minister. Hmm? Yes, that's what I said. In 48 hours, our concentrated bombardment and infantry attacks will achieve the rupture. Before the irrigation districts are churned up and before the weather bogs us down in the mud, our cavalry will be through and then... Havoc! Hmm? We will roll the Germans back into the North Sea. General, <laughs> if wars could be won by making speeches, then I'd be confident that with your assistance we could make rings around the Germans. Uh. But we are dealing with the lives of our countrymen. Oh. It's no good. I told you it was no good, Samuel. No, no. It has to sink in. Got to be digested. Digest is no good. You'll never agree. We're wasting our time. What's all this? Good day to you, Minister. This is the last you'll see of this little scheme. But I promise you it won't be the last you'll hear of it. What's up, General? What are you trying to say? Don't use tactics with me, if you please. You had several weeks to make your mind up about this. My view is that you are not able to make a decision. Not able to make a decision? No, Minister. Out with it. Out with it! What are you trying to say? I've said all I want to. What's he getting at? If I may speak plainly, Minister, this is no reflection on you personally. 
Please don't think that we're questioning your moral courage. But the general feeling at headquarters is that a war minister with your strong bias for peace and humane consideration will never give us our chance to launch a necessary offensive. Right. You mean my anti-war campaign doing the Boer War, is that it? Damn it, man, I took more personal risks to myself in my peace campaign than you're ever likely to meet in conducting your war. This is not a criticism of your personal courage. No, no, I'm not calling you a conscious, sir. All I'm saying is that you're so damn mixed up in your humane views that you're totally unfitted to make a decision which involves total war. You over-identify yourself with the man on the front lines, Minister, which may be damn good humanity, but is thoroughly bad soldiering. He's quite right, sir. At the back of your mind is the fear, the sensitiveness to loss of life. It's not that we don't personally respect you for this, but uh, as a war minister, we think you'd make a damn fine minister of health. <laughs> That's the best thing you said this week. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I'll put my cards on the table. I am afraid. I am frightened, I admit it. When this war started, I had a tussle with my conscience whether I should retire from politics altogether. I have imagination. I dream of bloodstains on my pillow. Is that bad? Is it bad to fear responsibility for millions of lives? Is it really better to be like you, to play with the lives of men like pieces on a chessboard? Which of us is better fitted to make a decision? The answer is very simple. It's a question of arithmetic, isn't it? Better to lose 30,000 men in a single, bold, constructive offensive than to fritter away a 100,000 lives in useless stalemate. Right, right, That's right. the decision you are faced with. But you can't stand up to its logic. Uh, well. well, there it is, Minister. I don't think there's any further point in staying. 30,000 men. Is that your estimate of our losses? It's not merely my estimate, Minister. 30,000. Three divisions given a ration, more or less. These are the pieces. And for that, a complete breakthrough. A couple of pawns for a queen, to use your comparison. There's no need to search your heart any longer in these circumstances. We've consulted every expert, Minister. Every field technician, eh? You give me your word that your statisticians are entirely in accord with this? Absolutely. I'll get the files. <sighs> Let's see the figures. I want everything. All the reports, every computation. Oh, certainly, yeah. I have the papers here. Now, Jason, <laughs> I want the ordnance and logistics file for General Crump's operation. Yes, sir. Uh, here you are, Minister. Yes, it's all very neat, very reassuring. I want to make one final appeal to you. For the sake of our men at the front, for the sake of their wives and mothers, I put to you for the last time, are these the true estimates of our requirements to achieve a victorious offensive against the Germans in France? I've given them you are assurance. No collective promises. I want yours and General Brewster's, and I want the signature of every man who had a hand in this report. You have my assurance, Minister, and you shall have all the signatures you ask for. A breakthrough in 48 hours and no more than a loss of 30,000 lives? I've already said so, haven't I? Brewster? Yes, I agree with that estimate. The file of the operation, sir. Mm. On the question of supplying your needs, gentlemen, we haven't been altogether indecisive, as you will judge for yourself. These reports have also been ready for several weeks. Ordnance, munitions, transport, kit, down to the last roll of lavatory paper. Oh, splendid. Jason, they've been checked, of course. Yes, sir. By you two. Uh, more than a week's work, sir, if you remember. No errors, no miscalculations. No, sir. Uh, well, there was, there was one slight error, uh, but it only concerned gum boots. Gum boots. <laughs> Uh, Gumbo? Yes, sir. A, a minor matter, a mere typing slip, which I've since corrected in ink, as you can see here. A typist made a mistake in the noughts. A mistake in the noughts? Yes, sir. In the noughts, Jason? Yes, sir. Fire! Uh, sir? Fire the whole department! Minister! Every able-bodied person to the front! But they're all over 50, including the women! I don't care if they're great-grandfathers! Do you know what it means to make a mistake in the noughts in time of war? Well, what do you suppose the Germans would do? They'd call it sabotage, treason! Yes. It would mean the firing squad! Yes. A mistake in the noughts? Yes, 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 yes sir. Uh, excuse that uh, touch of irritability, gentlemen, but I'm sure you'll agree that it was necessary. Uh, there is no margin for error in these times. 
Well, uh, we shall make a last uh, thorough check before we... Uh... You can pour me a stiff one too, Bristol. Yes, of course. For you, Minister? No, thanks. Now, have a quiet drink, gentlemen. I'm sure we have plenty to think about. I am compelled to interrupt you, Minister. Something important? Sir, will you be attendant on the King's messenger, if you please? Mr. Franklin Brown, courier of His Majesty. Gentlemen. Come in, sir. I am pleased to receive you. Mr. Morgan Evans, His Majesty has ordered me to hand to you this personal document and requested me to await your answer at once. Would you convey to His Majesty my compliments and inform him that I shall be privileged to attend on him at Buckingham Palace at 1 o'clock p.m. tomorrow, Thursday the 18th, as requested? Thank you, sir. Jason... Offer this gentleman the hospitality of my home, and when he is ready to do so, speed him on his way. I am obliged to you, sir. Well, of course, it's an open secret by now. You've heard that the PM resigned this morning. So that's it. That's it, gentlemen. I don't think I'm speaking too optimistically, but I think that next time we meet, it may be at number ten. You? Well, I... Yes. Well, we have plenty to do. Yes, you, know, you won't stay to dinner? Well, another time, if not now. Uh, goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye, right, sir. Mr. Ah, Owen! A drink on this. I've just heard that little reception. Our congratulations in order. How does it feel to be the son of a prime minister at a time when history with a capital H is being made? Well, it's... It's impossible to appreciate or, or believe that it's really taking place. Yes. Ah, oh, thanks. Better days. Better days. <sighs> Do you remember when we lived at number 11? I think so. <laughs> I was an engineer working at Tilbury in those days, remember? I do. I used to come back to Downing Street in my working clothes. And one day I was just turning up from Westminster Underground when I was confronted by a barrier of police. The whole of the traffic was held up because of some VIP do. I tried to get past, but the cops wouldn't let me through. But I'm Owen Morgan Evans, the son of the Chancellor. I live at number 11. <laughs> And I'm Mary Pickford, said the cop. <laughs> it was no use. No one would believe me. After a while, I began to doubt it myself. Mm. I always doubt it. I'm the son of a village shoemaker. I'm told that this humility is no good. Power, high office, should be ruthless, confident. What do you think? That it's only those frightened of power who are fitted for it. I suppose we ought to celebrate. After Thursday, that is. Yes, you ought to Invite one or two people. Yes, of course. A quiet at home, but a small circle of select friends. James Barry. Uh, Melba. Yes, of course. I suppose I could accompany her on the piano. And that lovely dancer they're all raving about. What's her name? Uh, Pavlova. Yes. yes. And Dan Lino for the fun of it. And Beerbum Tree. <laughs> Do you like power, Father? A little. No, a lot. But it frightens me, too. And that's good. I'll go and tell Mother. Or, or would you rather tell her yourself? You can tell her. But pretend that I don't know that you told her she'd like to hear it from us both. Uh, put your feet up while I go and tell her. Who's that? Oh, Mr. Evans, may I come in? Oh, who is it? Oh, it's you again, Inspector. What are you doing prowling about in the garden? Yes, come in, come in. Well, what is it? What is it this time? Sir, you don't happen to have on your staff a young female by the name of O'Connor. O'Connor? I only know their Christian names. What about her? Middle height, nice build, red hair, speaks with a slight Dublin accent. She's not. Sir, I have reason to believe that the IRA secret tribunal have sentenced members of the British <laughs> government to death by assassination, and it is my duty to warn you. <laughs> Janie, Janie, I'm here. Oh, 
know you're a brick to mix with this mob here. I could have met you at Scott's. Oh, I couldn't wait. Let's have a look at you. Oh, oh. kid. Will you be staying over in town before going to Checkers? I've got tickets for the show at Daly's and the table is booked too. First, let's take a quiet spin in Hyde Park. I'd like to get some London air in my lungs. Is it just bad out there, as they say? Then let's talk about it. I say, isn't that old Tom Williams on that soapbox? He's a dreadful man. He makes all those anti-war speeches. He was one of my father's staunchest chums in the old days. He used to face all the broken bottles on the platforms of the pacifist meetings. Oh, let's drive on, please. You must be tired of war and politics. Hello there, Jason. Owen! Where is everybody? Uh, well, your mother has gone for a short rest to Wales. We hadn't heard about your leave before she left. How are you? Where's the old man? Uh, well, he's having a short leave, too. Well, mother's away. And what's going on? Where is he? Oh, he's here, but I don't think it's possible to disturb him. Upstairs? Let's take it easy. Now, you can't make any rules about a man like your father. He... He's got to be a law unto himself. A fine bloody home, Cousin <coughs> Owen, sit down. Now, there's no point in wearing yourself out over this sort of thing. I'm not preaching. I'm, I'm just plain damn frightened. Does he know what's going on out there, the bloody mess we're in? Of course he does. Much better than you do. Well, then it makes it mucking worse. That's all I can say, mucking worse. Listen, listen. The old man's got everything under control, everything. He's been working 20 hours a day. He's not a machine. He's got to relax in his own way. How long has he been on leave? Two nights and a day. I suppose the traffic on the staircase has been worse than bloody Piccadilly. He can handle it. He's as strong as a buffalo, Owen, and you know it. He's seen Crump in a little while. He's due to arrive at any time, and I can promise you this. He'll be ready for him. This is the crisis. You say he's as strong as a buffalo. But a time will come when even his strength will pack in. These 40-hour jags of his would half kill a normal man. It's, it's frightening. Forget your blind love of the man and see it straight. I, I wanted to see him, to talk to him. I've been making up my mind what to say. Do you know what the men call it? Crump's flypaper strategy. We're up to our eyes in it, stuck there in the mud. Sitting bloody clay pigeons for everything Jerry can throw at us. Why don't they put a stop to it? We've been fighting 50 days and we've advanced two miles. At this rate, it'll take us 60 years to get to Berlin. We know all about that. Your father's been to France. He's seen everything. He's been everywhere. Talked to privates in the line as well as the French general staff. There's nothing he hasn't done. Has he got rid of Crump? That butcher's cost us the lives of hundreds of thousands of men. A year ago, I told Father to get rid of him. Don't you suppose he knows about Crump? Don't you know that he's fought everybody in the cabinet about getting rid of him? Everybody. But they're all scared stiff that it would, it would bring down the government and lead to a military junta. The press are behind Crump. Even the old man can't sack the whole of Fleet Street. And Crump's even got friends in the palace. How does one get rid of a, a soldier hero in wartime? What's your formula for that? Why, in God's name, are the press behind Crump? Don't they know what's going on? Are they blind? Are they no war correspondents? Crump has told them we are killing more Germans Trump than... Crump and his phony statistics. What's happened? Has he been able to arrange an exchange of chartered accountants with the Hun? How can anyone believe such bloody lies? Don't you see? They want to be blind. They have to be. This has got to be a victory. We can't admit all these sacrifices have been in vain. <laughs> well, that's it then. To maintain the bloody myth of General Crump, our boys have to drown in the mud, to get butchered on the barbed wire by the thousand every hour on the hour. Owen, Owen. I swear to you, the old man's doing everything humanly possible to put an end to it. Crump has been summoned here. There's going to be a battle royal. I don't know what your father has up his sleeve, but I know it's bound to be one of his master strokes. Don't take any notice of this, this interlude upstairs. 
He'll give General Crump the fight of his life. Yes, if he has any strength left. Well, this is fine. Wonderful. I'm famished. Jason, me drink for Jesse. Yes. Give me a good rare beef steak. Oh, in my boy, another leave, splendid. Take your coat off, Father. Good. Your jacket, take it off. I want to prove something to you. Ah, sit down. <laughs> now, give me your hand. You're going to put my hand down this time, eh? Well, maybe. Three years in the fighting services may well have put snap in your braces. Jason? Sir? Crump arrived yet? Not yet, sir. That's it, my boy. Press on. I want to see him directly he arrives. Yes, sir. Messages, phone calls? Uh, Northcliffe phone, sir. Mm. I told him you were resting. <laughs> oh, a grip of iron the boy's got. Infantry life, eh, son? But your strategy isn't much good, no. You never make your all-out effort at once whilst I'm fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I never been beaten at this yet. Winston was champion of the cabinet, but I was champion of the house. <laughs> Old John Burns, the docker, used to wrestle like a bear. Never did him any good. Oh, Jesse, uh, the master wants a good meal. Quickly, he's hungry. Uh, yes, sir. What will you have, Mr. Everett? Ah, now, let's see. Uh, one infantry general, well-grilled, <laughs> and a couple of ripe cavalry colonels, rare for entree. As for pudding... Uh, how about you, my dear? Oh, no. Yes, sir. I mean, no. <laughs> I mean, I'll get you something. Yeah. What did Northcliffe want, Jason? I, uh, I told him you couldn't come to the phone, and he said, All right, you'll do. Just give him a message from me. Say that I heard he's been trying to interfere in strategy. If there's any more of it, I'll break him. Damned insolence. <laughs> the king of Fleet Street. <laughs> Crump runs to him every time he's in trouble. Now, oh, in my boy, do you like to try again? Like a rock. Like a damned ruddy rock. Hey. Anyone waiting for me? Uh, Tom Richards is in the library. Oh, Tom. Wonderful. I thought he was in jail. Well, if you remember, sir, you told Tom when he was put in jail for his anti-war speeches that you hoped when he came out he'd have breakfast with you. I said that? Yes, sir. Well, there you are, then. Put out an extra plate. Got oh, you, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've pulled a muscle. Oh, it, it's a trick. No one can be as strong as that. How did I do it, then? Uh, I, th I think it's, it's the way you hold your arm at an angle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's it. So that the, the harder I press, the more firmly I push your elbow against the desk, the old cantilever principle. Good boy, you spotted it. <laughs> See, they always tire themselves out after a while, and then I make my counterattack. You seen Crump. Mm. What about a bit of psychology there? Put his hand down. <laughs> Challenge him to a duel across the desk with a jacket off. <laughs> what do you make of that, Jason, eh? If they stare on me long enough, some of it wears off on them, doesn't it? <laughs> I've got to take my bath. Uh... Stay for a while, my boy. Your uh, mother isn't here at present. You're not feeling lonely, father. Would it surprise you to know that I always feel lonely without your mother in the house? Uh, Minister, I, I think I'll go and get on with the paperwork. Yes, I guess. Well, Owen, I don't have to ask how you are. You've given me the toughest contest since old Docker Burns. Are you going to get rid of Crump? That's my contribution to the war effort, my boy. But can you, with, with Northcliffe, with the palace? I got rid of Brewster, didn't I? Yes. Father, why did Mother leave? Why did she go this time? Don't lecture me, for God's sake. Don't question the way I fight my own private war against tiredness and every bone in my body, against frustration and fear and sheer nausea. It's my way of getting drunk to forget. Besides, the temptation is rather too much for me. And wasn't it Oscar who said he could resist anything except temptation? <laughs> and if you protest, I think you're jealous. As they all are who vilify me. Is it my fault I'm absolutely irresistible to women? They're all jealous of my success with the ladies. Are you sure you're successful with women? Isn't it they who are successful with you? What do you mean? Now, what the hell do you mean by that? Is it you, Morgan Evans, the man they really fall for? Not the legend, the myth, the powerhouse of Whitehall and Downing Street? How long can you carry on like this? 
How much can your physique stand? Five years? Ten? You don't see me through for what I have to do to help win the war. And afterwards? It'll all be in the melting pot by then. You'll be needed. All your experience and guile and drive and imagination. Every man must fight his own private war with himself in his own way, Owen. That's what we have to do. We always have to fight on two fronts. On two fronts. Father, you look all in. Hmm? You're not worried about me? I'm going to have my bath. Mm. How are you feeling, sir? Mm. I'm all right. What's on your mind? Well, come on, let's have it. What trouble's been brewing whilst I've been away? What's the latest crisis? Yes. Oh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Just a moment, please. It's you know who. Hmm? Hello? Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, I'm offering you the post. No? <laughs> Not good enough, eh? <laughs> all right, I know it's a junior job. What can you expect? They're all dead against any sort of job for you. What? Look, if you take that cigar out of your mouth for a couple of minutes, I'll be able to hear it. All right, all right. Eh. What about the Ministry of Armaments? Will that satisfy you? Good. <laughs> Leave it to me. You meant to offer him that all along, didn't you? All right, Jason, let's have it. What's been happening? Just list the danger spots. Sir... I don't know if you're fully aware of the extent of the opposition to having our friend here back in the government. After the Dardanelles... Don't give me history lessons, I please. remind you that you've canvassed every member of the government. A coalition, sir, that includes all parties. And even your staunchest friends oppose the appointment. And within the last day or two, more than a hundred members have put questions on the order paper. The Albert Hall has been hired for a mass meeting of protest. Dozens of others are being organised all over the country. The generals and the admirals are also dead against it, sir. Dead against it. Now I know I must be right. Finally, sir. Finally? May I contribute my view to this? I don't see how I can possibly stop you. Besides, everyone else has. Well, may I say this then, sir? There's no one in the government who could possibly challenge your leadership. But if he joins the cabinet in your old job, armaments, you'll have a dangerous rival. I know that. Well, then, sir, if you know all that, then, for heaven's sake, why? For a very old-fashioned reason, but one for which I don't propose to apologize. He's a friend who's proved his friendship and loyalty to me. Mr. Evans. I see. Is that all, Jason? Yes. I suppose that is all. Oh, the, uh, the general has arrived, sir. Good. Show him in. Sir. Now, what is it? I've known you for more than ten years. And I realize that I've never really understood you. Till now. May I take your hand? How do you do, Jason? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. General Crump, sir. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. My apologies for the delay, but His Majesty was kind enough to ask me to uh, stay at lunch. Well, sit down, sit down. Don't fuss. I wanted you to see this. Latest reports from HQ. Mm, an expert sale executive general doesn't immediately produce his samples. A bad joke, Prime Minister. Not in the best of taste, if I may say so. Mm, you don't make me lose my temper so easily. I'll choose my own time to have a row with you. Sit down. You don't want to see these reports. I don't want to see your stories. I can read all the fiction I want in Lord Northcliffe's rags. You're being offensive, sir. In that case, I hope I succeed better than you do, General. I haven't come here to suffer your insults. Now sit down. Ah. I have something important to tell you. Uh, very well. 
Now, I sent for you, Crump, to tell you that the War Cabinet has approved my plan for a supreme Allied Council representing all our Allied nations. All strategy is to be coordinated by them in future. You, you are a supreme war command run by foreigners? Is that the idea? It will be run by generals best fitted to command, irrespective of their nationality. Has it been approved by the War Cabinet? Yes, it has. It will... And why the devil wasn't I told about this before? Aren't I entitled to know about such schemes? And why wasn't I invited to to give my views of the cabinet? You're not a member of the war cabinet. This concerns me, my work, my campaign in France. You're not a member of the war cabinet. You have deliberately gone behind my back, sir, and presented me with a fait accompli. That's typical, my goodness, typical of what I've had to put up with. A supreme command created over my head without my knowledge, without, without a chance of... Give my views. You're not a member of the war cabinet. So that's it, sir. Yes. You think you can you can build a pontoon over me and bypass all my efforts? Well, that's well put. That's very well put, General. And where does this leave me, do you think? I'm supposed to be head of the armed forces of the Empire. Are British fighting men to be at the mercy of foreigners and their schemes? If there's anything you seriously disagree with in the supreme Allied planning, you have the right to appeal to the British government. To you? A fact will help that be to me. I am the elected constitutional head, General. No, no I will not put up with it. I demand a right to sit on this council myself. Well, uh, that's possible. Mm. You, uh, you agree to that? Uh, then, then I don't want it. Oh, yes, I, I see it all now. If I, if I go and sit on the Allied Council, you'll appoint a new field commander, and he'll have the real authorities. And your approval to reject my strategy. If I remain in the field, then those damn frog eaters will clamp down on everything I want to do. Yes, that's it, isn't it? You create a, a special military house of laws to kick me upstairs into it. If I won't go... You'll give them the real authority. It's diabolical. That's what it is, sir. Diabolical. You're a schemer. Well, I won't stand for it. You may not be aware, but there are still one or two people who have confidence in me, sir. Two can play at this sort of game. Let me tell you this. At lunch today, the king said to me, Francis, he said, Francis, I was deeply moved by the press announcement of the latest success in the field. You dare threaten me? Threat, sir? I am merely reporting a private conversation about the latest communiques announced in the press. You think you can frighten me with your Fleet Street friends? How dare you? How dare you, I say, threaten the head of government? But you'll find that I, I, I don't make idle threats. Mm, one of your friends from Fleet Street was good enough to warn me not to interfere in strategy. I'll show you how I deal with threats. Jason! Now, what will you do to my friends, eh? Will, will, will you fire him, create a supreme ally editorial board, I suppose, for delinquent newspaper editors, eh? Or, or, or do you really think that you can fight the very public opinion which you were good enough to explain was responsible for your appointment as Prime Minister? Sir. Got your notebook, Jason? Hmm? Yes, sir. Hmm. General, your friend from Fleet Street left a message telling me that if I don't watch out, he'll break me. Such insolence, I think you'll agree, needs to be punished. Your friend must be taught a lesson in future, not to leave such messages. Jason, we won't be too severe this time. Six of the best will suffice to impress the lesson. I sent a memo to the Ministry of Supply. I think we've discovered that we need quite a lot of wood pulp for the war effort. What does one need wood pulp for militarily? Cartridge paper, sir. Splendid. That will do splendidly. Devil, you say you're a devil. paper. Mm. Tell the Ministry of Supply to divert half the tonnage that goes to the paper mills to the Ordnance Department. The gentlemen of the press will have to do with rather smaller news sheets from now on. I think this may have the unfortunate effect of cutting down their profits from advertising revenue. Mm. How much do you think Lord Northcliffe would lose by this general? Five million a year? Ten? No. An expensive message, wouldn't you say, Jason? Yes, sir. You were saying, General? All right. All right. You're strong enough to twist Northcliffe's arm, eh? You're head of the government. But but I would remind you that we are a monarchy. You haven't heard the last word in all this. Oh, no, Prime Minister. I seem to recall that Cromwell was a Welshman. Prime Minister... 
How you dare don't... you threaten me with your palace intrigues? Why in God's name don't you use some of that strategy of yours to fight the Germans instead of the French general staff and me? Do you think I'll be your Judas goat forever out there? 48 hours, you said. 48 hours and we'll break through the German lines and start rolling them back into the North Sea. That was more than 48 days ago. Where's your breakthrough? 30,000 men, you said. Less than three divisions will be sacrificed to achieve victory. We've lost 300,000 men so far, and we are still floundering in the mud. I remind you that two of the fighting men out there are my sons. A father is a tiger general. Victories. Victories. Lies. Lies. I warn you to speak softly and think carefully from now on. You've still got your job. You're still the great soldier hero. I won't take the glitter off your Wellington boots. But remember what I tell you now. When you go to war, General, pick your enemies very carefully. Someone you have a chance of beating. Because I fight dirty. I never went to Eton. My game isn't cricket. I know a few holes and low tackles you never dreamed of. Now pick up those papers and leave. The interview is over. I'll send you the war cabinet's new orders tonight. Damned upstart. Damned upstart. Minister? Minister? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, it's you just... Mm-hmm. He's gone, sir. Please don't stand out in the garden in your slippers. It's wet. It's all right. Just sit down and rest a moment. Must have been a tough meeting. Uh, your meal is ready. Shall I arrange for a tray here? <sighs> You're shivering. I'll fetch you a shawl, shall I? No, 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 no. You mustn't let them see me like that. that. Look, Mr. Evans, old Tom Richards is waiting to see you. Now, why don't you, why don't you have a drink with him for old Lang Syne, eh? He, he always had the trick of... Taking you out of yourself. I'll be all right in a little while, Jason. Well, if if you don't feel like eating now, how about a snort? Eh? Oh, you're a good fellow, Jason. I've I've cleared the decks. No more appointments at all for the rest of the day. I've stopped all incoming calls. After what you've been through today, there can't be anything important. How did it go? Crump looked as though he'd collided with a tank. I wanted to tell him to explain what I'd seen out there. What happened to me out there. But I was afraid to. Afraid I might lose control. Misery. Grey hell. Quicksand. The tattered, bleeding corpses on the barbed wire. Like bait on a hook. I said to the young soldier who was showing me the battlefield, Good God, can it be true? Is it really like this? And he said to me, It's worse further along. (laughs) It's worse further along. Sir, old, uh, old Tom has some very funny stories about his rest cure in Brixton. (laughs) How do they treat him there, eh? Good old Tom. We used to be on the same platform at one time. (laughs) Remember my pacifist days during the Boer War? The peace meetings, great stuff. Pitched battles in front of the town hall in Birmingham and Bristol. Broken bottles, knuckle dusters. (laughs) (laughs) But you beat them, remember? (laughs) Yes, I was a pacifist in those days, and the broken heads didn't matter because I believed in that fight with all my heart. Why are people like that, Jason? I wanted to save them, bloodshed in a useless war. Them and their brothers and their sons. And they turned on me like wolves. If only I could be sure. You're sure, Jason, that it is a threat to our homeland. and Not like the other one, for a share of empire loot. If only I could be certain... You see, Jason, there are always two conflicts, not one. 
Every man has to fight a war on two fronts, and the hardest enemy to defeat is the one you can't see. What's that? Sounds like gunfire. Another air raid on the coast, I should think. Yes, a raid, all right. Open the French windows, Jason. Mm. Funny. All that gunfire. And the birds are still singing. I can hear them still in the rook. Sir, I'd like to open the champagne. Champagne? You got champagne, have we? Yes. The French Premier sent us a case with his compliments after your last visit to France. Well, that's nice. That's nice of him. I'll open a bottle for you. <laughs> Give it to old Tom. He's earned it, I think. <laughs> they don't get very strong tea in Brixton, I'm told. That caviar for the Tsar of Russia. Ooh, it does sound formidable. For old Tom. <laughs> Shall I tell him you will have dinner with him later? <laughs> I'll prepare him for some blistering anti, anti-war arguments. <laughs> Splendid, isn't it, sir? Our French ally sends us champagne. Our Russian ally, caviar. And we dine on them with a pacifist. <laughs> I'll tell Tom it will be war to the knife and fork between you. Fine. Fine. <laughs> and now, uh, Jason, I'd uh, like to be alone for a little while. I understand. Father, I brought you this old lantern. Huh? I knew you'd want to go out and watch the raid from the hilltop. Uh. It's even more exciting than a storm at sea. You writing to your mother tonight? Mm, yes, probably. I'd write too, and it's been a bad black day, and she can always tell. Uh, send her my. Uh, send her a message from me to cheer her up. It's been a bad day, Father. I've had a theoretic success against Crump. Erected a war command to bypass his authority. Slung a pontoon over his head. History will know me as some sort of committee juggler, extraordinary, political chess grandmaster. But I know it doesn't always work. Trying to guide Crump from above is like backseat driving. He's still at the wheel. The murder will go on. On and on and on. Until they've all had enough. And all been drunk and sated. And sickened. And history will tell us it was a splendid victory. Mine and his. All right. The fever must run its course. There's nothing we can do but try to apply a few cold poultices. Look, I want to say this to you, Owen. You can come on my technical staff. You've had three years of it out there. I don't care a hang what anyone thinks or says. Enough's enough. Uh, no, thank you, sir. I'd rather remain with my friends. Oh. No, I didn't mean it like that, Father. I only meant just that. It was kind of you to suggest it. I understand. Well, well, it's a private battle. You must fight for yourself. Oh, it hasn't been all bad and black. You couldn't get rid of Crumb. Not altogether, and not yet. But you faced another storm bravely and well today, sir. You reached out a hand and helped a friend out of the wilderness. Someone with the sort of leadership people might need one day. And perhaps history will be grateful to you for it, if it remembers. Go up on the hill and watch the rain. It's better than Beethoven. Yeah. What's the lamp for? Have we no torches? Uh, I thought this would suit you better. It's a ship's storm lantern. It's rather old, somewhat battered. There are a few rents in it. But it will give enough light to show you the way. Yes. The road's steep and there are some treacherous places. But it might do. And the view from the summit... The view from the summit, Owen... Doesn't that make it worth a journey to the end of the night?
In Storm Lantern, which was adapted for radio by Modest Mazevich from a book by Richard Earl Lloyd George, the part of Morgan Evans was played by William Squire, Mrs. Evans, Noel Hood, and Owen Evans by David Buck. Jason was played by Lawrence Payne, Hugh Hughes by Hayden Jones, and Caroline Bishop by Ira Heath. General Brewster was played by Walter Fitzgerald and General Crump by John Justin. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in To Have and Have Not. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. We've had many premieres on the Lux Radio Theater. And tonight, on our 12th anniversary, we bring you one of Hollywood's most fascinating couples, together for the first time on the air. They are Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, co-starred in Warner Brothers' thrilling screenplay, To Have and Have Not. To Have and Have Not is a story of intrigue and action with Lauren Bacall in the sultry and romantic role that won her instantaneous acclaim. To bring the Bogart family to rehearsals, we had to lure them from their brand-new mountain home, where, along with a dog, 14 chickens, and eight ducks, they are still in the process of getting settled. No phone as yet, no tables, and no drapes. But if you should drop in on a friendly visit of inspection, as I did you'd find Lux Flakes doing their part in washing curtains, bedspreads, blankets, etc., etc., etc. When I commented on this fact, a bogey assured me that on his 54-foot yawl in Newport Harbor, which is the Bogart's home away from home, Lux Flakes are a standard part of the equipment, making this family loyal to Lux Flakes on land and sea. It's curtain time, and here's the first act, of To Have and Have Not, starring Humphrey Bogart as Harry Morgan and Lauren Bacall as Mary Browning. In 1940, following the fall of France, the rule of the new Vichy government stretched to a group of islands due east and south of the tip of Florida, the French West Indies, among them, the island of Martinique. It's early evening. At a little town on the Martinique coast, a boat has just come into port. All right, Eddie, tie her up. That's what I'm doing, Harry. Tying her up good. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Want to go out again in the morning? No, I'm fed up with this kind of fishing. Yeah, I can see how you would be. You hook a couple of marlin that any good fisherman would give his life to tie in when you lose them both. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, you're just unlucky. Shut up, Eddie. Uh, about my bill. Sixteen days plus the rod and reel you lost overboard. The fishing tackle's your risk. Not when you lose it the way you did. I paid for the rent of it every day. Now, look, if you hired a car and ran it over a cliff, you'd have to pay for it. Well, that's entirely different. Not if you was in it. <laughs> that's a good one, Harry. Yeah, that, that's a good one, Eddie. Now, look, I'm not trying to... I lost to... that gear through carelessness. It cost me 275 bucks. And then there's 16 days at 35 a day. That's a total of 835 bucks. Well... I'll go to the bank in the morning. I was figuring you'd pay me off tonight. I don't keep cash like that at the hotel. Okay. Well, let's go up and have a drink. Yeah, why not? All right, lock up, Eddie. You mean I can't go with you? That's just what I mean. That drunken old fool. Hey, look, Mr. Johnson, Eddie's my worry, see? Now, don't you worry about Eddie. Well, are you coming or not? Yeah, I'm coming. <laughs> Well, monsieur, what luck today? Uh, not so good, Frenchy. Couple of bourbons straight. What are you doing behind the bar, Frenchy? Oh, a small hotel like this, Harry. The proprietor does a little of everything. So, uh, the fish would not bite, eh? Uh, maybe tomorrow you do better, eh? Not me. I'm through. This is my last day. Oh, that's too bad, eh? Yeah. Well, here's to you. 
I'm going to wash up. Oh, uh, that bill was 800 and... Uh, 835 uh, bucks. 835. Oh, Johnson. Yeah? What time tomorrow morning? Oh, uh, after the bank opens, around 10.30. I'll be waiting. Harry, you are free after today? Uh, no more fishing parties? Why? There are some people who want to hire your boat. No, not a chance. They only want it for one night, Harry. They pay well. Well, I can't afford to get mixed up in politics. I would not speak it about nothing. Well, you better not speak at all. Company's coming. Company? Oh, good evening, mademoiselle. Anybody got a match? Oh, yeah. Here's a match. Thanks. Hey, who's that? She came in on the afternoon plane. Oh. Well, about my boat, I know what your sympathies are, and it's all right for you, but I don't want any part of it. They are coming here tonight, Harry, to talk to you. Well, then get word to them. They'd be wasting their time. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah, me too. Harry, Harry, I've been looking all over for What's you. What's doing, Frenchie? Those men wanted to see you. I was unable to reach them. Well, tell them when I get here. It is dangerous for them to come here at all, but to come here for nothing... Oh, you don't even listen. Well, I'm looking at my client, Mr. Johnson. What's that dame doing with Johnson? Dame? The one who was out of matches. Oh, 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 she's been with Johnson all evening. Her name is Browning, Marie Browning. Oh, she's leaving. Yeah, so am I. How are you? Who... Oh, hello. Going someplace? Just to my room, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind, but mine's much closer. It's right here. Say, mister, what's got into you? Come on, let's have it. Have what? Johnson's wallet. I want that wallet, Slim. I'd rather you wouldn't call me Slim. You see, Steve, I'm a little too skinny to take it kindly. I'll quit the baby talk and hand it over. I didn't know you were a hotel detective. Johnson's my client. He didn't speak so well of you. Well, he's still my client. Here. That's more like it. Johnson owes me money. You know, you ought to pick on somebody to steal from who doesn't owe me money. He dropped his wallet and I picked it up. And you were going to give it back to him? No. No, I wasn't. I don't like him. <clears throat> well, that's a pretty good reason. Besides, I need both there to get out of Martinique. That's another good reason. Well, what's in it? <clears throat> Sixty bucks, a plane ticket, and fourteen hundred dollars in traveler's checks. Did you expect more? Well, that bird owed me 835 bucks. And he said he'd have to go back to the bank tomorrow and all the time he's got a ticket on a plane leaving at daylight. Then I've done you a favor. That's right. And I'm entitled to something. See, what do you think is fair? 50-50? Well, or... company. Uh, please, Harry, I told him what you said, but I insisted on... It is not Gerard's fault, Mr. Morgan. I, I am Jean Beauclair. Come in, boys, and close the door. I told Gerard I wasn't interested. Wait a minute, this girl. I'd better go. No, stick around. It's all right to talk in front of you, isn't it, Slim? Go ahead, I don't mind. We'll give you 2,500 francs. We'd offer you more, but we haven't got it. Sorry, my boat's not available. I thought all Americans were friendly to our side, Monsieur Morgan. Yeah, well, there's a rumor they put fellas on Devil's Island for doing what you're doing. I'm not that friendly hey. to anybody. Hey, hey. Who's that? Relax. In here, Eddie. Hiya, Harry. See, I wanted to talk to you about the... Hey, who are these guys? I saw them hanging around the dock after you left. For one who drinks, you have a good memory. Hey, drinking don't bother my memory. If I did, I wouldn't drink. Forget how good it was. Say, was you ever bit by a dead bee? I have no memory of ever being bitten by any kind of bee. Were you, Eddie? Was I? <laughs> Say, you are all right. You know, you got to be careful of dead bees if you go around barefooted. Because if you step on them, they sting you just as bad as if they's alive. I bet I've been bit a hundred times that way. Well, why don't you bite them back? That's what Harry always says. <laughs> but I ain't got no stinger. <laughs> Please, must we listen to this? <laughs> All right, Eddie. <laughs> what do you want? Uh, huh? Oh, uh, I guess I forgot, Harry. Yeah, well, then I'll see you down at the dock later on tonight. Say, Harry, could you let me have a couple Here. of... Here. Uh, thanks. You're all right, Harry. Well, sir, so long. Now, look, Beauclair, I don't care who runs France or Martinique or who wants to run it. You'll have to get somebody else's boat. You're leaving? Yeah. Make yourselves at home. Good night, gentlemen. Sorry, Beauclair, but I got a client waiting downstairs. Come on, Slim. I want to see Johnson's face when you hand him back his wallet. Well, there he is, 
still sitting at the same table. Hey, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. You're a fine one, Morgan, running off with my girl. She's got something she wants to give you, Mr. Johnson. Go ahead, Slim. Hand it over. <laughs> That's my... my wallet. Yeah. Where'd you get this? I stole it. Stole it? And just what are you going to do about well, it? The question is, what are you going to do about it? Maybe you'd better look it over. Oh, uh, uh, it's all right, I'm sure. Oh, you better be sure the plane ticket's still there. Goodbye, Mr. Morgan. You're not staying, huh? No, we're not staying. Excuse the interruption, Mr. Uh, now, look, I was going to pay you off. Sure, you were going to sign some of those traveler's checks, weren't you? I wouldn't skip out on you. Yeah, well, here's a pen. Start signing. Uh, 835. That's right, 835. Oh, what's that? What's going on there? Police. Look, Steve, those men are just in your room. They're after Pipe down, baby, and duck quick. Harry, he, he's dead. Mr. Johnson is dead. Yeah, that's right, Frenchy. Stray bullet. He couldn't ride any faster than he could duck. How do you feel, Slim? Oh, I'm fine, Steve. Just uh, fine. Another minute and those traveler's checks would have been good. Has it struck you it might be an idea to get out of here? Oh, it is no use. The police are coming back. They were after your friends, huh, Beauclair? Yes. You, Zegla, stay where you are. Remember, you know nothing. Hey, they're, they're not regular cops. No, sur Ciudad Nacional. Gestapo, huh? Yes, yes, quiet now, quiet. What happened to this man on the floor? Uh, a stray bullet, monsieur. His name is Johnson, an American. Unfortunate. Take him away. Your attention, everyone. There is no cause for alarm. Inspector Renard is only interested in those persons who have violated regulations. Monsieur Gerard. Uh, yes? Headquarters for questioning. And you? Not nice to point, Lieutenant. The name's Morgan. Shut up. You, mademoiselle. Say, Steve, was you ever bit by a dead bee? You will come with us at once. Hello? No, I told you nothing new. Beauclair and the others escaped. I don't know. Yes, yes, later. Now then, you were saying, Monsieur Morgan, you did not know those men. That's right, Inspector. What was your connection with the dead man, Monsieur Johnson? He chartered my boat. But he was leaving Martinique in the morning, eh? Ah, oh, his wallet here. There is no money in it, only traveler's checks. Yeah, well, there was some money in it. Sixty bucks, I took it. Why? Because he owed me over 800. You will surrender it, please. Oh, wait a minute. And your passport. But do not be concerned. If your claim is just, it will be returned. That is all at the moment. Mademoiselle? Yes? Mary Browning, American, age 22. How long have you been in the city? I arrived by plane this afternoon. Residence? Hotel Marquis. Where did you come from? Trinidad. Alone? Yes. Why did you get off here? To buy a new hat. Why? To buy a new hat. Read the label. Maybe you'll believe me then. I never doubted you. It is your tone that is objectionable. I will ask you again. Because I didn't have money enough to go further. Where were you when the shooting occurred? I was in... You don't have to answer that stuff. Shut up, you. Don't answer it. I told you to shut up. Go ahead. Slap me. Monsieur Morgan, we wish merely to get to the bottom of this well, affair. you'll never do it by slapping people around. It's bad luck. We shall see. If we need to question you further, you will be at the hotel? Well, you've got my dough and my passport. I'm stuck. By the way, what are your sympathies? Minding my own business. May I suggest... I don't any... need any advice about continuing to do it either. Let's go, Slim. Oh, how do you feel? I'm breathing fresh air again, but I don't understand all this. What's it about, Steve? Well, you, you see that character Renard works for Vichy. You, you, you know what that is. Yeah, something you put in a drink, isn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's close enough. Well, well, the other fellas, the ones they were shooting at in the hotel, they're, they're free French. Most of the people on the island are, but they haven't been able to do much about it. You know, I could use a drink. Well, there's a cafe across the street. Let's... Uh-oh, I forgot. No dough. Those guys cleaned me out, remember? Maybe I can do something about that. Another Mr. Johnson, maybe. Oh, uh, any objection? Well, if you're that thirsty, go ahead. You don't mind? I'll wait out here. If I get tired, I'll be back at the hotel. You're not sore, are you? Oh, why should I be? I won't be long. Come in. You didn't wait for me very long, did you? No. 
You're sore, aren't you? Why should I be sore? Well, I didn't behave very well, did I? <laughs> yes, you did all right, I see. You got a bottle. There was a naval officer. I asked for a bottle and he gave it to me. Just like that? Yeah, he was feeling good, but you're not. Now, look, I don't give a... I know, I know. You don't give a hoop what I do. But when I do it, you get sore. After all, you told me to, you know. I told you. Oh, you said go ahead, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. I guess I did. Would you rather I wouldn't do things like that? Oh, why ask me? I'd like to know. Well, of all the screwy... All right, I won't do it anymore. Now, look, I didn't I say... know you didn't. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, well, as long as you do, sit down. How long have you been away from home? This is about the time for it, isn't it? The story of my life. Well, I got a pretty fair idea already. Who told you? You did that slap you took from Reynard, you hardly blinked an eye. It takes practice to be able to do that. The next time I get slapped, I'll be sure to do something about it. Hey, you forgot your bottle. I don't want it. Who's sore now? I am. Who is it? It's me. The door's unlocked. Here's your bottle. I said I didn't want it. Oh, you are sore, aren't you? I asked you a question, you didn't answer me. I said you're sore, aren't you? Look, I'm tired. I'd like to get some sleep. What's made you so mad? I've been mad ever since I met you. Well, most people are. One look and you made up your mind just what you wanted to think about me. Well, go ahead. Keep going. You don't know me at all, Steve. It doesn't work, Steve. I brought that bottle up here to make you feel cheap. And that didn't work either. Instead, I'm the one who feels cheap and I... I've never felt that way before. I I wanted to... Well, I thought that... Get out of here, will you, before I make a complete fool of myself. How long have you been away from home, Slim? None of... Home oh, about six months. Going back? How? Oh, what are you going to do here? I don't know. Get a job, maybe. Jobs are hard to get. Hmm. Nice perfume. Remind you of somebody, Steve? No, this is a brand new one to me. Would you go back if you could? I'd walk if it weren't for all that water. Good night, Steve. Good night. And quit worrying. You'll get back all right. Could I see you for a minute? What the... Oh, all right. Open the door. Here's that bottle again. Yeah, that uh, <clears throat> bottle's getting to be quite a problem, isn't it? Well... You want a drink? No. Well, I thought you were so tired. I am. But you gave me something to think about. You said you might be able to help me. That's right. You're going to take that job with those men Frenchy brought up here? Yeah, if I can find what's left of them. But don't get the idea I'd take that job just to help you. I need money, too. Wait a minute. Here, can you use this? Oh, now, that's great. She carries her dough in her shoe. And I thought you said you were broke. Oh, you're awful good, Slim. I'd walk home if it weren't for all that water. Who was the girl, Steve? Who was what girl? The one who left you with such a high opinion of women. You think I lied to you about this money, don't you? Well, there's $32 here. Not enough for boat fare or any other kind of fare. But you can have it if you want it. I'm sorry. I still say you're awful good and I wouldn't... I know. You wouldn't take anything from anyone. You know, Steve... You're not very hard to figure. Only at times. Most of the time, I know exactly what you're going to say. The other times. The other times, you're just a stinker. What'd you kiss me for? I've been wondering whether I'd like it. What's the decision? I don't know yet. Do you know now? Well, that was better. Uh, you're sure you won't change your mind about the money? Uh-huh. The money belongs to me, and so do my lips. I don't see any difference. Oh, I do. Okay. You know you don't have to act with me, Steve. You don't have to say anything, and you don't have to do anything. Not a thing. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. You just put your lips together and... Thank you. 
Since escaping the Vigie police, Jean Beauclair of the French underground has been hiding out on the outskirts of town, a bullet wound in his leg. It's early morning now, and Beauclair has two visitors, Gerard, the hotel proprietor, and Harry Morgan. Last night, Mr. Morgan, you definitely refused to have anything to do with us. Why have you changed your mind? I need the money. Last night I didn't. What's the job? You will talk, take your boat to Angela, about three kilometers from the point. The cove and little jetty. Uh, you know it then? Yeah. You will go at night. When you're off the jetty, flash a light. It will be answered. There will be two people to take aboard. I know the name of only one, Paul de Bissac. Uh, how about landing him back here? Oh, not here. Uh, you know Cape uh, St. Pierre, Harry? Uh-huh. I will have a rowboat and will meet you there offshore. Okay, I'll leave around noon. With luck and no patrol boats, I'll be back at St. Pierre a little after midnight. Oh, I won't be carrying lights, Frenchie, so keep your eyes open. If it weren't for, the, for this leg of mine, I'm glad you're on our side, Morgan. No, I'm not. I'm getting paid. Oh, uh, and I'd like my money now. There, that envelope. Thanks. How is the leg? Please, I'd feel better if you were on your way. All right, good luck. You need the luck now. You and de Bersac. Oh, that girl, Morgan. The one you call Slim. Well, she's leaving Martinique on the afternoon plane. We can both forget about her. Good morning, Steve. Have some breakfast? I had mine two hours ago. What have you been doing? Arranging so you could get on the afternoon plane. Can you make it? Sure. Frenchy here will see you get the ticket. Uh, gladly, if you wish. You took that job, didn't you? Yeah. I figured this way you wouldn't get your feet wet. You want me to go, Steve? Yes. I want you to go. Okay. Uh, help her get on that plane, will you, Frenchie? I will. Well, I've got to get down at the dock. I probably won't see you again. If I ever do get up your way, I'll... Yes, do that. I'll leave my address with Frenchie. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll know how to whistle by then. So long, Mr. Morgan. Well, it was nice while it lasted. Perhaps it is better this way, Miss Browning. A strange man. Very strange. Yeah. Come out of there. Come on out of there before I... Eddie. Put down the gun, Harry. It's just me. Well, now, how'd you get aboard? I thought I told I you to... I sneaked on at the dock while you was working on the engines. Oh, if I thought you could swim, I'd dump you overboard. You're an old joker, Harry. You and me's got to stick together when there's trouble. How do you know there's trouble? You can't fool me. Say, where are we going? Eddie, what would you do if somebody took a shot at you? Took a shot at me? With a gun? Who's going to shoot at me? Well, if you're lucky, nobody. Harry, where are we going? I'll tell you when the time comes. Uh, oh, uh, put on a sweater. It's getting cold. Say, what's going on? What's all the darn guns for? Two rifles and... In case we run into a shark or something. What do you mean, or something? We're going on a job. Can you shoot one of those things? Anybody knows how to handle a rifle. All you got to do is work the lever and pull the trigger. What do I got to work a gun for? <laughs> I just wondered if you could. Sometimes you act so stupid, Harry. Sometimes... Is it going to be that bad? It all depends. That's why you didn't want to carry me. <laughs> you was afraid I'd get hurt. You was thinking of me. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I was just wondering whether you're going to hold together or not. Well, I'm a good man, Harry. You know I am. Yeah, well, we're going to pick up a couple of guys, Eddie. Now take this gun and get aft. If there's any trouble, start shooting. Yeah, but don't shoot me. Yeah, but supposing something happens to you, what do I do then? Well, how do I know? You invited yourself on this trip. We'll make an angel in about 30 minutes. There they are, Harry. Standing on the jetty. I see them come out of the shadows. Turn off that flashlight. Yes, monsieur. All right, get aboard. There's a strong tide here. We are coming. Who are you, please? The Beauclair sent me. My name's Morgan. It's all right, Elaine. Quickly now. now. Wait a minute. Beauclair didn't say anything about a woman. Don't meet me, Captain. This is my wife. How do you do? Now, what do you want to bring her? Well, it's your funeral. All right, Eddie, let's get out of here. What happened to Beauclair, Captain? Well, he ran into a little trouble. Monsieur Morgan, who are you? I own this boat. Beauclair hired me to pick you up. You're on our side? No. I don't understand. Well, I don't understand what kind of a war you guys was fighting. Lugging your wives around with you. 
You're being paid for this. That's what I said. Then I suggest you stop talking and get us to Martinique. That's just where we're going, sister. We'll hit the cape pretty soon, Harry. You want I should store the rifles? I said you want I should store... Shut up. There you go again. I ask you... Turn them off. Huh? Turn them off. See anything? You hear anything? No. Nope. Listen. There's a ship out there. Patrol boat. Take the wheel, Eddie. Why did you shut off your engine? Keep quiet. What is it? It is a patrol boat, ain't it? Hey, give me that gun. You can't fight them guys. Oh, what's the matter, Eddie? This is where you ought to be telling me how good you are. Well, I can do it, but what do you want me to do? What does this mean, Monsieur Morgan? You and your wife get down on the deck and stay there. You'll try to resist them with a rifle? They've got a searchlight. They see get us. Get down on the deck. You save France. I'm going to save my boat. Stand by! Stand by or we'll fire! Harry, get their searchlight. Shoot it out. Well, I can try anyway. You got it, Harry. Hey, you want me to shoot too? Stay on that wheel. Full speed, Eddie. All she's got. Hurry. Oh, they're shooting at us. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Save your breath, mister. They'll run us down. They'll sink us. Yeah, they might. That's a chance we'll have to take. Get down. Duck. Oh, oh, oh. Got him, huh? Yeah. He should have laid down. Well, he's down now. Do something. Please do something. I am, lady. I'm getting us out of here. They're coming in on the Cape, Harry. Yeah, yeah, take over for a while and watch for Frenchy's boat. Well, how's your husband? Please, help me get him on the seat. Now, we'll leave him where he is. It's just his arm. Besides, I don't want him bleeding all over my cushion. How can you be so heartless? That's something I ask myself at least once a day. Well, we'll be picking up Gerard any minute. He'll take care of both of you. Where will he take us? I don't know. There he is, Harry. Okay, slow down and watch the drift. Can't I get a drink now? Just one. Sorry, Eddie. I need one worse than you do. Yeah? Hello, Steve. Huh. Ah. And all you got to say? Oh, what's the idea, Slim? What happened to that plane? I missed it. Why? Didn't you like the accommodations? Or I didn't just you... decided to stay. Oh, now look, well, I've, been I... to a... I've been to a lot of trouble to get you out of here and... That's why I didn't go. Not so, are you? Well, it'd be all right if I had any dough, well, but... I got a refund on the ticket. Here. Oh, that's going to help a lot. I'll be all right, Steve. I've got a job. Frenchy seems to think I can sing. Well, it's his place. Sometimes you make me so mad I Harry. could... You could what? Harry... Harry, I need your help. The Bursac is badly wounded. Well, the bullet hit the gun first and is practically spent. All you got to do is get somebody to take it out. We don't dare call a doctor. You could... Me? Do. I'm hotter than any doctor right now. Don't you think they recognize my boat? All I got to do is walk out of here. You don't have to go out of here. The Bursac is in the cellar. Oh, why didn't you put him in a goldfish bowl in the lobby? We had to do something. They're watching every road out of town. Well, Slim, you see what you got yourself into, sticking around here? I'm ready to leave any time you are. Oh, Harry, please. Not a chance. Uh, uh, Harry, uh, my wife tells me your bill is overdue. 6,356 francs. Oh. We will be glad to dismiss the bill if you will do this for us. You'll, uh, you'll throw her bill in too, Slim's? Yes, hers too. Uh-huh. Okay, you'll find a medical kit inside, Slim. Bring it down to the cellar. Sure. And bring some boiling water, too. Get away from him. You're not to touch my husband. Well, that's all right with me. Oh, Harry, please. She's not herself. Now, look, lady, they can't get a doctor without giving the whole show away. I won't let you do it. Well, he's not badly hurt. He's unconscious because he's... Oh, come in, Slim. Hello. Miss Browning, this is Madame de Boussac. Who are you? Nobody, just another volunteer. What'll I do with this water, Steve? I'll drop these instruments in it. You better get out of here, Mrs. de Boussac. You may not like this. I'll be all right. Well, then hold this can of chloroform. If he comes to while I'm probing, pour some on this cotton and give him a whiff. Uh, don't open it until I tell you to. His arm. Look at it. How can you... Oh, fine. Fine. She's out. Like a light. Uh, madame, madame. Oh, now, let her alone, Frenchie. Slim, any chloroform left? Some. Enough, maybe. All right, fan those fumes away or we'll all be out. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Not towards her. 
Well, keep your fingers crossed. Dressing, Frenchie. Uh, here, Harry, here. Bandages? Now, you and Frenchie can do that. Adhesive tape in the box. I'm afraid the patient's going to recover. Well, I better get Nursey up off the floor. She may catch cold. Oh, she's all right. Just fainted. <sighs> I've got her. What are you trying to do? Guess her weight? Well, she's heftier than you think. Maybe you'd better just look after her husband. He's not going to run out on me. Neither is she. Yeah, when you're finished, go upstairs and get some sleep, sleep, and thanks for your help. I'd rather stay here. You heard me. Oh, for the lover. Now, what did I do? You know, Harry, before I told Miss Browning, you are a very strange man. Now I tell you, she is a very strange girl. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. That is what she said. Yeah. How do you feel now? Very stupid. I'm not in the habit of fainting. Huh. Well, your husband's okay. I just put him to sleep again with a pill. I, I'll stay here with him. Tell me, uh, why did you tag along on a trip like this? I wanted to be with him. Well, that's no reason. I was also told to come. They said no man was much good if he left someone behind for the Nazis to find and hold. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes sense. I told them I'd be no good, but I was afraid. Now I've made Paul that way, too. Oh, he's afraid. Well, he didn't invent it. Invent what? Being afraid. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Mr. Morgan, I... Uh, you're not going to faint again, are you? No. I'm I'm just having a hard time trying to say something. Well, I won't bite you. I, I'm sorry for the way I behaved. You're just sorry you made a fool of yourself. You don't make me angry when you say that. I don't think I'll ever be angry again with anything you say. Another screwy dame. Now, how can you... Hello. I hate to break this up, but I thought you'd want something to eat. Thank you. How's the patient, doctor, or haven't you looked lately? He'll be all right. I hope you have everything you need here, Mrs. Tabersack. The eggs may be a little hard-boiled, but... Oh, they're but... fine. I like them that way. You're lucky, isn't she? Well, I'm going up and get some sleep. If you need me, tell Gerard. Followed you up here, Steve. Do you mind? Oh, suit yourself. Thanks. For what? I'd like a match. Here. Now I need a cigarette. I'll help yourself. Thank you. Uh, Steve, aren't you hungry? Nope. Let me help you take your shoes Look, off. Look, I'll take my own shoes off. All I want to do is get some sleep. Then I'll fix you a nice hot bath. You'll sleep better. Look, Junior, I'm not hungry. I'll take my own shoes off, and I don't want a nice hot bath. You mean there's nothing I can do? Uh-huh. You can get out. You know, Mr. Morgan, you don't make me angry when you say that. I don't think I'll ever be angry again at anything you say. <laughs> How am I doing, Steve? Does it work a second time? Uh, look, you want to do something for me, don't you? Yes. Okay, then, uh, try this. Walk around me. Hmm? No, go ahead, walk around me. I don't get it. You find anything? <laughs> no. No, Steve. There are no strings tied to you. Not yet. What do you mean, not yet? Come here. Mm, I like that. <laughs> except, uh, except for the beard. Why don't you shave, Steve, and we'll try it again sometime. Harry, Harry. Yeah, Frenchy? He's here. Inspector Renard. You better come right down. Oh, no, not now, Frenchy. I gotta shave. Harry, he's got your men. He's got Eddie. He's got... Eddie? Yes. He's giving whiskey. He's asking questions. Well, I'll be right down then. Oh, Slim, I've got no strings. Only a rope right around my neck. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
we'll bring you Act Three of To Have and Have Not, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in a moment. Being discovered by a talent scout doesn't usually mean immediate stardom. Months of training in diction and acting may precede a starlet's introduction to the public. Our guest tonight, lovely Miss Carrie McCord, is training at Fox right now. And it looks as though big things were in store for her. Do you spend much time on the sets, Carrie? Yes, indeed, Mr. Keeley. When I first signed, Fox was just finishing Daryl F. Zanuck's The Razor's Edge. And I watched Gene Tierney every chance I could. Mm, an excellent way to learn technique. Well, I liked her own powers, too. Well, they were both perfect casting for Somerset Maugham's novel. I'd love to be in a picture that called for a stunning wardrobe like Jean's. You're naturally interested in clothes. Oh, yes. I used to be a model. Fashion shows especially. Well, Jean Tierney was also a model. Oh, that's encouraging. We're alike in something else, too. What's that? Our clothes get the same kind of care. Lux flakes? Naturally. I found out from the wardrobe mistress that the beautiful blouses and sweaters Jean wears in the razor's edge were washed regularly with Lux. I've used Lux for my own nice things for years. You'll find Lux is the favorite of Hollywood studios, Carrie, because it takes such good care of colors and nice fabrics. Well, that's been my experience, Mr. Kennedy. Actual tests support that, too. Carefully supervised washing tests were made by a famous laboratory on dozens of different fabrics and colors. In case after case, those washed the Lux way were still lovely, when those washed the wrong way were faded and drab. In fact, the Lux ones stayed color fresh and new looking up to three times as long. With the high cost of clothes these days, keeping them attractive longer is important to any girl. And that's one of the reasons Lux is worth waiting for if you can't get it the first time you try. Just keep asking for it. More is on the way. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. After the play, we'll bring our stars back for their customary curtain call. Here they are in Act Three of To Have and Have Not. Humphrey Bogart as Harry Morgan, Lauren Bacall as Marie. It's a few moments later. In a corner of the hotel bar, Harry Morgan finds Inspector Renard and Sergeant Coy of the Secret Police. Seated between them is Eddie. We are buying your friend a drink, Captain Morgan. We find Mr. Eddie very entertaining when he drinks. You hear that, Harry? He called me Mr. Yeah, what were you boys talking about? Yeah, I was telling him about the big marlin you and me hooked onto last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, that fish was so big, it, me and Harry could hardly budge him. Yeah, that's right. Must have weighed a thousand pounds. Every time he takes a drink, the fish grows larger. Oh, judging from what's, from what's left in this bottle, he must have started with a mackerel. And how did you finally manage to land such a great fish? Oh, didn't Eddie tell you? We didn't land him. We ran into a German submarine. Oh? A German submarine? Well, whatever it was, it opened fire on us. I didn't stick around to find out. I do not think anybody could give a more logical explanation for refusing to obey the challenge of our patrol boat. Patrol boat? Oh, so that's what it was. Now, Eddie kept saying it was a patrol boat, but I wouldn't believe him. Now we get down to business, eh, Morgan? What about your passengers last night? What passengers? The ones you bought over from Angela. Would $500 refresh your memory? Oh, my memory's pretty good. For instance, I can remember you're the guy who lifted my passport and all my cash. And if your passport, the money will return. Including the 835 Johnson owed me? Why not? Now, where are they? Your passengers. Well, if these people are as important as you seem to think they are, they're going to be pretty hard for me to find. For a man of your resourcefulness? <laughs> not too difficult. Think it over. Let me know, Morgan. Come along, Coyote. Goodbye, Mr. Reddy. See me again when you get thirsty. <laughs> Them guys don't think that I'm wise, do they, Harry? They was trying to get me drunk. They don't know me, do they? Well, <laughs> what happened? What did they want? The Bersac. I heard you arranging a deal. And now thinks you will turn them in, eh? Well, that's what you want them to think, isn't it? What will happen? Well, uh, Renard hasn't searched this hotel yet, has he? No, not yet. Well, here's your answer. Renard doesn't want just the Bersac and his wife. He wants the whole setup. And what shall we do? Oh, it's not we, it's you. And you can't do anything until the Bissack is strong enough to move. Now, how about some breakfast? Sure, sure. I thought you didn't want any breakfast. Oh, how are you, Slim? I asked you before if you were hungry. 
Sit down. Hey, you know, Harry, them guys, they were trying to find out something. What do you suppose it is? <laughs> well, you don't know? No, I ain't got no idea. <laughs> well, that's a good way to leave it. Say, uh, you got the hiccups. Have I, Harry? <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't you think you'd better take a drink of water? <laughs> water? I'm getting out of here. <laughs> and don't you worry none about me, Harry. <laughs> yeah, well, you stay away from the police. You know, they're not going to believe that story you told them a second time. What story was that, Harry? I forgot. Well, just, uh, just beat it and keep out of sight. Sure, Harry, sure. Well, I'm starting work tonight, Steve. You're a singer now, huh? I'd be interested to know what you think. Uh, will you be there? I don't know, maybe. So you decided to drop in, huh? Yeah. I do my song in a few minutes. Like my dress. Well, you won't have to sing much in that outfit. You know, Steve, sometimes you make me so That's mad. That's why I do it. You haven't seen Eddie, have you? Not since noon. Why? Well, he left the boat and he hasn't come back. Anything wrong? Plenty. They don't look now, but that the guy with the door have been following me. Keep an eye on him, will you? I'll be down the cellar. Give Mrs. Debersack my love. I'd give her my own if she had that dress on. How's your patient? That's what I'm going to find out. Better, Harry, you see? There has been no bleeding all afternoon. I am very grateful, monsieur, believe me. Uh, well, you won't need me anymore, Debussac. Uh, Frenchie, I'm pulling out. Uh, when? As soon as I can find Eddie. Missing? Yeah. You wouldn't go without him? No, I don't think Eddie liked that. Now, look, Frenchie. As soon as I'm gone, Renard's going to turn this place upside down. You better start figuring how and where you're going to move our patient here. It would be best if my wife and I went with you. Oh, I'm still trying to get out of the jam I got into bringing you here. Just why would you come in the first place? Did you ever hear of Pierre Villemar? Villemar? Yeah. Hey, he was quite a guy. Vichy got him, didn't he? Didn't he? He's dead, isn't he? No, monsieur, he's not dead. He's on Devil's Island. They sent me here to get him. He's a man whom an oppressed people will believe in and follow. And just how are you going to get him off Devil's Island? You don't think much of me, do you, Monsieur Morgan? You are right. I am not a brave man. Well, I'd still like to know how you're going to spring Vilmars. We will find a way. If it fails, if I die, someone else will try again. There always will be someone else. Yeah. Originally, we planned to do everything from here, but now, because of my clumsiness, it is impossible. That's the reason we have to go with you. Well, they've got the docks covered. They're all over the place. How will you go? Well, they're watching me to find you. As long as I haven't got you along, I can get on my boat. There'll be a fog tonight. I can drift out beyond the breakwater before I start my engines. I'll have trouble enough without you. Harry, if only... No, Morgan is right, Gerard. This is not his fight yet. Oh, Gerard told me of your refusing Renard's offer. How do you know I won't take it? There are many things a man will do, monsieur. But betrayal for a price is not in your makeup. Well, good luck. I hope you find your friend. Thanks. Well, I'll be around, Frenchie. There are a few things I want to talk to you about before I blow. Hey, I'll be up presently. Any sign of Eddie? No. Your friend's still at the door. Yeah, so I see. I've got a hunch the whole thing's going to blow up, and soon. Any plans, Steve? A few. We're going to pull out of here tonight. We? Yeah. As soon as I can find Eddie, and don't look so happy about it. It'll be rough. I'm broke. If we do get out, it'll be with a couple of hundred gallons of gas and a few francs, just enough to get us to Port-au-Prince, maybe. I've never been there. I don't know when you'll get back home. It could be a long time. Could be forever. Or is that what you're afraid of? I'm hard to get, Steve. All you have to do is ask me. How long will it take you to... Oh, no. Way to break it up with being watched. I'd better give out with another song anyway. I'll see you later on. Yeah, later on. <laughs> Harry. Harry. She wants to see you. Madame de Bursac. Now, look, Frenchie, that's all over. I just took her to your room. Your what? Please, Harry. She has to talk to you. 
Okay. Tell Slim I'm... And I'll come to think of it, don't tell her anything. You shouldn't have come up here. It's too much of a chance. I had to see you. It's about this jewelry. I'd like you to take these. They're all Paul and I have left. Save them until we can come for them. What if they get me before I get out? And throw them overboard. At least they won't have them. Well, suppose I never see you again. Then let it be a part payment for all you've done for us. Miss Browning. I keep barging in, don't I? Renard just came in, Steve. He's on his way up. Did he see you? I don't think so. All right, get in the other room, both of you. Go on, hurry. But suppose he... And keep quiet. As soon as I get rid of Renard, take her back down to the cellar. Okay, Steve. Are you looking for me, Renard? Do you mind if we come in? No, not at all. And any friends of yours... Shut are... up. Search him. Keep your hands up, Morgan. Okay, relax. I don't carry guns. Now, what's on your mind, Renard? The whereabouts of Monsieur and Madame de Bersac. Well, how would I know? Well, I thought perhaps you... Hmm. Perfume. Very nice. You like it, huh? Yes. So do I. All right, Slim. Come on out. Good evening. Mademoiselle. Well, now we are all here, except your friend, Mr. Eddie. You've got Eddie? Yes, we've got Eddie. What are you going to do with him? Oh, if you will not give us the information we want, perhaps he will. We made the mistake this morning of giving him liquor. This time we will withhold it. Oh, he couldn't stand that. He'd crack wide open. All of which you could prevent. Yeah. Yeah, I could. Um, you got a cigarette, Slim? Here. Here. Thanks. Can't you make Eddie talk, Renard? When necessary. Uh, got a match, Slim? Sorry, I... Uh, there's some over in that drawer. You could save your friend a great deal of, uh, shall we say, discomfort? I don't see any matches, Steve. Well, there's a whole box of them. Uh, never mind, I'll, I'll get them. Uh, how much money did you offer me, Renard? Eight thirty-five and five hundred, wasn't it? Except now, I don't believe I will pay anything. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Eddie will talk. He'll have to talk. There's nothing else I can do but. But what? But this. Look out! He's got the gun. Oh. oh. Sorry, Renard. Coyo shouldn't have shot first. When somebody shoots at you, you got to shoot back. All right, Slim. Yes, dear. You know I'd. I'd forgotten all about the gun in the drawer, thanks. Listen to me, Morgan. I've listened to you long enough. Now get him up. You forget we still have that drawer. So you were going to drive Eddie nuts, picking on a poor old rummy that never... and slapping girls around. That's right. Go for your gun, Renard. Your boy on the floor needs company. No, no Harry, don't, don't. Get the gun, Frenchie. Uh, yes, Harry, yes. Now get over that couch, Renard, both of you. <laughs> don't bother me, Frenchie. I'm getting mad. All right, Madame de Bissac, come on out. Uh, let me introduce you, fellas. This is Madame de Bissac. The other one's down the cellar, her husband. Take her down, Frenchie. Get some help. Are them both ready to leave on the boat? Then come back here. Slim, you pack. We're shoving off as soon as we get Eddie out. And just how do you think you will get him Shut out? Shut up! There's a telephone in the hall, Renard. You're going to tell someone to let Eddie out? Oh, yes, you are. One of you. Because you're both going to take a beating until someone gets on that phone. That means one of you is going to take a beating for nothing. I don't care which one it is. But I'd like to start with you, Renard. Where? Where is the phone? I'll, sh I'll show it here just as soon as you tie up your partner here. Yes, you hear me? I said you will release him immediately. Tell him you'll explain later. I will explain it later. Do nothing till you hear from me. Then I'll take the responsibility. Goodbye. Thanks, Renard. Now back to my room. You've got some harbor passes to fill out. Everything is ready, Harry. The Bursac and Madame, they're waiting. Yeah, we'll take them down to the wharf. Here, these passes will get them through the guards. Where will you take them, Harry? Well, maybe Devil's Island. Huh? What? Well, it was just a short stop to pick up your friend Vilma. He's still there, isn't he? Oh, Harry, do not joke. Well, that's what you wanted, wasn't it? Oh, Harry, you see, tellement reconnaissant que tu fais ça pour moi. Well, that's all right. Just, just don't kiss me. Oh, now, Harry. Uh, uh, why, why are you doing this, Harry? I don't know. Maybe because I like you, and maybe because I don't like them. 
Oh, um, you'll have to take care of those guys. Renard and his pal, they're in my room. We will give you plenty of time. If you let them go, they'll come back here and burn this place down. It will be a very small fire. When Vilmar comes back, we will start a bigger fire. Okay. I'll see you at the boat, Frenchie. How's everything been going, Harry? Well, everything is all right now. You look glad to see me. You know, a funny thing. Yeah, uh, I know. At the police station. I've been at the police station. Yeah, we're shoving off, Eddie. Ready, Slim? All ready. They're down in your cabin. Hey, what is this? She going with us? Yeah, it looks like it. She and those people we picked up. But, Harry, you mean... Oh, what's she got to... Who are you? Was you ever bit by a dead bee? Uh, was you? Yeah. You know, you got to be careful of dead bees. They can sting you just as bad as live ones, especially if they was kind of mad when they got killed. I feel like I was talking to myself. I bet I've been bit a hundred times that way. Why don't you bite them back? I would, only I haven't got a stinger. Now I remember you. You're all right. She can come, Harry. It's okay with me. Uh, thanks. Now, I'll have the two of you to take care of, won't I? Yeah, that's right, Eddie. Throw off that line. Sure, Harry. All clear. Well, here we go, Slim. Yes, here we go. You don't have to act with me. That's what you said, remember? You don't have to say anything, and you don't have to do anything. Oh, maybe just whistle. Hey, well, I've been practicing. Oh? Listen. You're feeling happy, Slim. What do you think? Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Grandmother is sitting quietly in the living room. That is, until young Jane bursts in. Mother! Your mother's out, Jane. What is it? Oh, oh, hello, Grandma. Look what I just bought. A ducky new slip. Do you mean to say your mother allows you to wear things like that? Well, why not? What's the matter with it? Silk and lace. Why, in my day... But it we... isn't silk, Grandma. It's rayon. And I've looked all over town for a blue like this. We wore sensible clothes when I was young. Oh, but, Grandma, pretty undies make you feel so wonderful. Hmm. Sheer extravagance. <laughs> Not really, Grandma. I've got lots like this, and they wear and wear. You see, I use Lux. You take care of your own things. Well, I should say so. On my clothes allowance, I can't afford to have them wear out fast. With Lux care, they look simply swell. Sensible Jane. Lux Care really does keep pretty undies lovely longer. Up to three times as long, in fact, color tests show. I've seen identical slips. One washed the wrong way with the wrong kind of soap, and one washed the right way, the Lux way. And you'd be amazed at the difference after 30 washings. One was faded and drab. The Luxed ones were, were still lovely looking. So, if you value your pretty things, Lux them after every wearing. If you don't find Lux Flakes at your dealer's, try again soon. More is on the way to him. Lux Flakes are worth waiting for. We return you now to William Keeley. Back for a well-deserved curtain call come the stars of To Have and Have Not, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Lauren, all our heartiest congratulations on your first appearance on the air. I'm sure there'll be many more. Thank you, Bill. Hey, see, that wasn't so bad now, was it? What if you do make a slip on the air? There's only 30 million people out there ready to jump down your throat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Lauren... Oh, I... Just a minute, Bill. The name she answers to is Betty. You only call her Lauren when you're sore at her. <laughs> okay, Bogey. As I said earlier, Betty, we've had many premieres in this theater. But tonight, I'd like to bring our audience a world premiere, something never before heard on the air. But I'm not sure Bogey would approve. But think, Bogey, 30 million people waiting breathlessly to hear it. Yeah, but think of me, my nerves. Every time I hear it, I jump. Yeah, but in spite of personal sacrifice, the audience must come first. Now, how about it, Betty? Oh, oh shall I, Bogey? Okay, honey. Thank you, Bogey. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time on the air, you're about to hear an <laughs> instrument made famous by tonight's play. Immortalized by the line, whenever you want me, whistle. It's Betty Bacall blowing the special whistle which she carries for that special purpose. Ready, Betty? Ready, Bill. Blow. 
<laughs> well, Bogey, I, I can see how you'd find that whistle irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, Betty, I, I notice you don't use it in your current Warner Brothers picture, The Big Sleep. No, she doesn't need to. She has me hooked right from the beginning of that picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of you do a splendid job in bringing Raymond Chandler's mystery to the screen. Thanks, Bill. What do you have coming up on Lux next week? Uh, next Monday night, we bring our audience a household full of humor, drama, and romance. It's Paramount's recent screen success, Miss Susie Slagle's. Starring Joan Caulfield, William Holden, and Billy DeWolf. One of the newest and brightest stars of Hollywood, Miss Caulfield plays her original screen role, as does Billy DeWolf, in this poignant story of a group of students in pursuit of fame and happiness and love. Oh, that ought to make a great hit with your audience, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and many thanks to both of you. Our sponsor, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater brings you William Holden, Joan Caulfield, and Billy DeWolf in Miss Susie Slagles. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Suppose you had to do without a month's supply of soap. That could happen if used fats aren't turned in by the housewives of America. Scores of major industries need oils and grease, yet there's a shortage of oils all over the world. So if they're going to keep going, they must boost their supplies with used fats or cut into the supply of fine soap-making oils. And that would mean less soap for you. So don't throw a single drop of used fat down the drain. Your dealer will give you four cents for every pound. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Saturday Night Theatre we present the last production in the Flora Robson Festival. The villagers of Denzil St. David in Norfolk will not forget that night in February 1947. With the waters higher than for a hundred years and the increasing danger of the great dike collapsing, many were leaving their homes for the safety of Norwich, 15 miles away. Many others were beginning to trickle up to the high ground where stood the convent of Our Lady of Reims, a French nursing order. Bonaventure. The play by Charlotte Hastings, adapted for radio by Peggy Wells, stars Flora Robson as Sister Mary Bonaventure. The wind and rain beating upon the grey walls of the convent of Our Lady of Reims could be heard inside the great hall where the fading daylight shone through the stained glass windows of the great room, calm and somberly beautiful in the dim light. They're getting out boats and sandbags in the village, Phillips. They say the great dike may come down. Brett, for heaven's sake, stop talking. You're on duty in 19 and three-quarter minutes precisely. And do something about your hair. If Sister Mary Bonaventure sees you with it falling out of your cap like that... She won't be stuffy. She's got a sense of humour. You know, until I came to the convent, I thought all nuns were very calm and detached. I didn't expect them to laugh and be approachable like other people. I suppose it's because this is a nursing order. They're not out of touch with the world. There's not sufficient discipline here. Sometimes I'm really surprised at Sister Mary's attitude to the patients. A qualified woman with her authority. After all, she is matron. Now, when I was at the Memorial Hospital... Oh, in, uh... All right, all right, you've told us. Bless us. At this rate, you'll be mummified before you're 30. The prospect need not affect you. I'm leaving at the end of this month. But how silly. This is a grand place to train. Mary's a wonderful teacher and the food's superb. I don't like the lax atmosphere. 
And I object to that horrible Willie prowling about. Willie's all right. If you don't show your aversion, poor thing couldn't help being born. Ah, here's Sister Josephine with your supper. You'll have to be quick. I'm starving, Sister. And here you are, then. But what you want, young lady, are some hairpins. Which particular film star are you copying? <laughs> it was so windy. I've been to look at the water. Sister, what will happen if the great dike doesn't hold? Well, all the villagers will be homeless and crowding up here on the high ground. And where we shall put them and how we shall feed them, goodness only knows. Food's no problem to you. You're a genius. Look, Phillips, mushroom omelette and a heavenly savoury sauce. <laughs> Honestly, if I stay here long enough, I shall get fat. Ah, uh ah, -uh, no. Wait a moment. Wait? But why, sister? Well, no blessing, child. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Dear Lord, thank you for my most excellent supper and for making Sister Josephine such a divine cook. No, no, no. Let's have a little reverence. Benedictus. 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 Christum Nostrum. Amen. Now, savour every mouthful in the good Lord's name. My word, this wind and rain. A pity the poor souls on the road tonight. I think we should keep the place extra warm just in case. I must speak to Sister Agnes. Sister Agnes, is Willie around? Good. Would you ask him to bring some logs into the hall? I'm going to keep a good fire in. I as well be prepared. You're expecting trouble then, sister. You concentrate on your supper. Nurse Phillips. Sister, what is it? Just look at that newspaper. Have I not begged you girls to keep all the old newspapers and not to crumple them like that? You must have thousands stored. Aye, and a thousand and one uses for them. Never discard a newspaper, never throw away a piece of string. History might have been altered many times if a piece of string or an old newspaper had been lying handy. Sister Agnes, say you want a day's vlog, sister? Ah, good boy, Willie. Will you mend the fire, please? We're rather shivery. Ah, surely. <coughs> floods be out. Tis always cold when floods be out. Definitely. Are they out? Not yet. But you'll be here and later, right enough. What's happening, Willie? What are the people doing? <laughs> Bobbing about with lanterns, they are. Like as many ants. And the boats. <laughs> They're going too. Some they're making for Norwich. But they won't get there, they won't. Waters be terrible strong once they're out. <laughs> Smash a little boat in a minute, they will. Smash her into nothing. Now, now, Willie, <laughs> Willie. Have you seen Sister Mary, please? She promised I some sweet as she did. Out of the big brass box in her room. I've been polishing it. Are you sure you haven't taken a few sweets already? Why would I do that, Nurse Phillips? Why not? Because tis in the wise book that sister reads. Keep thy hands from picking and stealing. <laughs> have my hands been picking and stealing, sister? I'm quite certain they have, uh, Willie. But Nurse Phillips, she said they've been picking and stealing. Don't be quiet. And keep them away from my apron. They're filthy. They may be filthy, but they got no sin on them. Leastways, I can't see none. Can you see sin on my hand, sister? Tell her you can't see oh, no sin on my hand. Really? Really? No, 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 listen to she's me, She's really. down on me, she is. Why? Nothing of the kind. I never hurt her. I never hurt the littlest crawling thing. If I saw anyone hurting anything, Nurse Phillips, I'd crush them. So I would. I, I, I crush them. And oh, I, I get crush away them from me. Get away. <laughs> Forget the words again, Willie. Uh, I, I, I lost them, sis. They're in your head. Think now, think carefully. To everything. To everything. Mm, uh, there is to everything a, a season. Season. And a time. Mm. Uh, and a, a, a time to every purpose. Under, uh, uh, under the heavens. A time to plant. A time to... Uh, <laughs> I lost it, sister. I lost it. What comes after planting? A, a, a time... To, yeah. 
A time to, to pluck up that which is to be planted. Bravo, that was the hard part. A, a time to you kill. The rest. And a time to heal. Go on. A time to break down. And a time to build up. I, 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 sorry, Sister Mary. Good boy, Willie. Sister. Are my hands clean as sin? There's fire dirt there, and, and, and that's metal polish. And, and I, I mean, are, are they... Yes, Willie. Proper clean. Proper clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now, could I ha have the sweetest on the big brass box with the eagle on the top? Very well, you know where they are. Yes, sister. I have asked you all to use gentleness and tact with that poor mind. I'm afraid tact is not Nurse Philip's speciality. I told him his hands were filthy, which of course they were. I see you finished your supper, Nurse Bent. Will you go on duty now, please? Read the notes I've left about Mrs. Thomas. Read them carefully. We shall need your help. Yes, sister. Uh, one moment, nurse. Your hair is very soft and pretty, but while you are on duty, I think you should roll it back more neatly. Yes, sister. Thank you, sister. Nurse Phillips, I want you to remember you can always calm Willie with words, any words with colour in them, or even a verse. If you'll forgive my speaking bluntly, sister, I don't think he should be allowed so much freedom. He's so quickly roused. And with that mentality and his muscular strength, he could quite easily be very dangerous. That's for us to judge. He's probably better employed up here than at liberty in the village. But it's a question of... In this case, of tolerance. Tolerance undermines discipline. If you'll forgive my speaking bluntly in turn, nurse... I don't think you appreciate the borderline between discipline and severity. I... Uh, I'm sorry you're leaving us. You're an excellent nurse, and I'm sure you'll make your way in the profession. Only, if you could just realize humanity isn't ruled in straight lines, I think perhaps you would be happier. Thank you, sister. Will you excuse me? Run along, then. Nurse Phillips. Yes, sister. I don't mean to preach, you know. No, sister. There, Sister Josephine, goes the potential matron of a state institution. Mm. She'll run it most efficiently. With discipline. Discipline. Uh, it's a pity she's not staying. You wear them all down in time. Not at all. They merely come round to our way of thinking. <laughs> Look, I brought down that tapestry we found in the old cupboard... Such a pity. I'm afraid it's past repairing. Sister Agnes will tackle it. Now sit you down by the fire. You've had no sleep for nearly two nights. Even you can't go on forever. You promised me to sit there for a quarter of an hour, oh. and then I'll take a bowl of hot onion soup to your room. That'll put heart into you. Your onion soup would put heart into a graven image. Good evening, Sister Mary. Ah, oh. oh, good, good evening, evening doctor. doctor. Uh, tell me, doctor, uh -huh. as a medical man... Would you consider half an hour's rest a mortal sin? <laughs> I certainly should not. Then try convincing Sister Mary. That'll keep you busy. Well, that means you haven't been to bed since I left, Sister Mary. I've had all the rest I need. Ah, you've such a Spartan idea of your own needs. You can't go on giving yourself like this. I insist you rest. But, Doctor... No, that's an order, matron. Yes, Doctor. Thank you. But aren't you making rather a late visit? I'm staying here ready. That dyke can't possibly hold. Apparently we coped with the same thing 60 years ago. We can do it again now. <laughs> what you mean, sister, is that you'll cope and we shall follow. <laughs> well, I'm going to have a look at Mrs. Thomas. Very well, Doctor. Oh, good evening, Reverend Mother. I'm surprised to hear you felt so late, Doctor. I felt I must be on the spot in case the dyke comes down, Reverend Mother. Oh, Reverend Mother. No, don't get up, sister. I know you're off duty. I just wanted to check with you that we're ready for all emergencies. Yes, Reverend Mother. We've managed to clear those two large wards. We can put the men in one and the women and children in the other when they arrive. Good. They'll have to camp out for a little until we can get properly organised and they can keep control themselves. Sister Agnes is ready at the switchboard for messages. Uh, by the way, Willie's mother has come up. Their cottage is already gone, I'm afraid. Oh. She'll be very helpful. I expect you can find beds for them both? Yes, of course. You look tired. Very tired. I've been watching you for some weeks. When this weather clears, would you care to go into retreat for a little while? No, I, I would not. I'm sorry. If you wish to send me away... How long have you been here? 
Six years? Nearly seven. We've never had our hospital run so efficiently. No, I don't want to lose you. You're tired, and for the moment the world seems stronger than the spirit. It will pass. I'm sure it will pass. Thank you, Reverend Mother. If you want to rest later, it can be arranged. If you're happier working as I think you are, the work is certainly to hand. Reverend Mother. Yes, Sister Josephine? Uh, Reverend Mother, there's a man wanting to speak to you. Uh, they're travelling from London by car. He and two women and a driver. They're cut off by the flood water. Will you bring them in, Sister? Uh, yes, Reverend Mother. Be ready with your onion soup. Yes, Reverend Mother. <laughs> you see, Sister Mary, no need to look out for work. Would you be so good as to give Sister Josephine a little assistance? Yes, Reverend Mother. Sister. Yes, Reverend Mother. We need you badly. Don't be too kind to me. I find a few things harder to fight than vanity. Would you be pleased to come this way? Good evening, madam. Good evening. Come in. You must be nearly drowned. I'm sorry to arrive like this, madam. But we're traveling to Norwich from London, and I'm afraid the car is waterlogged. Oh, we should have many people coming here to the high ground tonight. Come to the fire. But I thought you had others with you. Yes. Two ladies. Ask them to come in. Come in, Miss Pierce. Good evening, madam. Good evening. Come in, both of you. Thank you. Your friend, she looks positively exhausted. Are you ill, my dear? No, I'm not ill. Thank you. If I might sit by our fire... But certainly. Let me take your wet coat. Leave it, please. We're very grateful to you, madam. I hope we're not uh, disorganizing things. Oh, not at all. One of our sisters is getting you something hot. Are you sure your friend uh, Madam, is... uh, could I have a word with you in private, if you please? I assure you we are quite private here. I think I ought to speak to you quite alone, madam, if you don't mind. Oh, very well. Will you come with me? Thank you. I'm going to take off my shoes and stockings. They're wet through. I should take yours off, too. You'll get a chill, Miss Khan. That would be very inconvenient, wouldn't it? Think how the calendar would be thrown out. Oh, please, it won't help In fact, the whole thing is very humorous, Pierce. A convent of all places. The holy woman is going to get an unpleasant shock in a few minutes. Your coat is soaked. Let me take it off. Take your hands off me, Pierce. I've told you that before. Don't be difficult, Miss Khan. It's my privilege to be what I can while I can. And get away from me, please. There's plenty of space here. Get away, please. Mm, very well. I'll sit over by the table. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. You must be very chilled. I can recommend this very excellent soup. Oh, some of us think our cook has missed her vocation. It looks and smells wonderful. <laughs> it tastes better. Will your friend come to the table, or would she like it there by the fire? I'll take it to her. Uh, no, no, sit down and drink yours while it's nice and hot. Here you are, my dear. Why, that wet coat, you poor child. Do let me take your coat. Thank you. That's right. And your shoes, they're wet through. Won't you take them off? All right. Let me take them off for you. No, get up. Get up at once. But why? Well, get off your knees in front of me. Now, steady. Take a grip on yourself. Oh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. I beg your pardon, sister. She, she's a little upset. She must be ill. Well, she's not ill. Just, just take no notice. There must be something terribly wrong. She is she's neither ill nor insane. Believe me, sister, the best way you can help is to be normal. If you assure me... It is the only thing. Very well. My dear, won't you at least come back to the fire? Very well. And have some hot soup to warm you. Here you are. Thank you. That's better. Thank you for humoring me. Now, I'll see if I can find you both some slippers. You're very good, sister, but don't bother. As soon as we can, we must be on our way to Norwich. I'm afraid you won't get to Norwich tonight. It wouldn't be safe to try. Oh. The great dyke may give way at any time, unless the men achieve a miracle of engineering. Then we might be here for some time. Some days, perhaps. Mm. You are right about the soup. My compliments to your cook thought they were. Oh, she'd be delighted. Nothing pleases her more than to have her work appreciated. Life must be very calm and pleasant here. Yes. Out of the world and away from temptation. I believe that is the popular conception. 
How does it really work? In work. No doubt you're filled with a sense of spiritual well-being, but are you happy? Are you? Oh, God. Oh, won't you tell me what is wrong? Mr. Mary! Sister oh, Mary! Something's happened. Sister! Oh, excuse me. Sister, the big dike has oh, gone. They just sent word. They're leaving the village. I got to ring oh, the great bell. Willie. Reverend Mother says to ring the warning bell. Willie, mm-hmm. come. I got to ring him loud and clear to warn the people. The floods be out! The floods be out! The floods be out! Can I do anything? No, we're prepared. Yes? Sister Agnes? Yes. Ring through to Norwich and let them know. What? Well, we all know what to do. Thank you. Miss Pierce, we can't get away tonight. We shall have to telephone. There's no outside communication. Oh? Reverend Mother, Sister Agnes has just told me the wires are down. We all know what we have to do, Sister. Sister, Sister Mary, can you come? The dike's gone. They're bringing in the casualties up. Sarah. <laughs> now, now, Miss Khan. Sarah Khan. Yes, that's my name. Does it mean anything to you? Think, sister. Sarah Khan. You'll have to know, sister. I'm afraid it will distress you. If she's to know, I'd like to tell her myself. No, no, come with us. There's a good girl. Be quiet. Sister Mary, my name is Sarah Khan. Three weeks ago, I was tried and convicted for the murder of my brother. We've just come back from London from hearing the appeal. It has been dismissed. Come in. Shall I put this armchair opposite the other one, madam? No. Here, please, officer, by the desk. Yes, madam. Officer. Yes, madam. Please call me sister. I have specially asked for this office and the bedroom adjoining to be put at your disposal. Because I want to be in touch with Miss Khan, I may be able to bring her a little comfort. The Reverend Mother gave me to understand that. Is there anything I ought to know? You do realise, don't you, that Miss Khan mustn't be left. Either Miss Pierce or myself must be with her day and night. Yes, officer. You will have no objection to my being here when I'm off duty. Certainly not. Does anyone else come in here during the day? Dr. Jeffries. Oh. We'll take Miss Khan into the bedroom when he comes. You see, it's rather unfortunate. He was chief witness for the prosecution. I see. Anyway, I'm hoping it won't be more than a few days particularly if the telephones are repaired. Now, if you'll excuse me, sister. Officer. Oh, oh come yes, and box your ears, Willie. I will. Oh, dear. What's Willie done now, Martha? Oh, that boy of mine's got above himself since he come to work here, sister. I still think to the pity they wouldn't take him in the army. Well, I'm sure he'll make himself very useful at this difficult time. Ah, their bedroom's near about straight, sister. Willie's put up another bed for Miss Pierce. Oh, just a and moment, then... Martha, please. Will you come back in a moment? Oh, I, I'm sorry, sister. I, uh, I'll be, be in the bedroom, keeping an eye on that boy of mine. What is your opinion of the verdict, officer? The jury were only out for 15 minutes. I'm not asking you as an official. I'd rather you didn't ask me at all. You see, there are some you feel are the type for it, and others... Well, it's not so easy to believe... When all is said and done, only Almighty God ever knows the truth. He and one other, sister. One other? The prisoner. Ah. Excuse me, sister. It's all right, Martha. Oh, uh, thank you, sister. Martha, you were Miss Khan's housekeeper, weren't you? Ah, surely. Right from the time she come to the village to do them big wall paintings for the church. We were at the grape house, the big cottage over to Denville, St. David. Mr. Fenning's old place, yes, I know. Took a good lease of it, she did, along with the old barn next door. Willie fixed that up for her like it were a proper painting place. And did you 
get on with her? You never found her difficult? Nay. She's an artist, of course. Up like the rocket and down like the stick. But leave her be and she mind her own business and yours too. Sweet as any bird. Uh, we were fine till Mr. Jason come along. Mr. Jason? That was her brother? Yes. Well, we'd been settled about a month. And he walked in on us at breakfast one morning, all smiles and as cool as you please. Ah, vicious bad he was, and no mistake. I'd have said his death were a proper blessing, if it hadn't been for poor Miss Carne. So you think she was responsible? Oh, I never said that, sister. And what's more, I never said it in court, neither. But by the time that lawyer gentleman had done asking me questions... You'd have thought I'd seen her do it with me own eyes and standing up there to tell him so. Sister, that were a terrible moment. Giving evidence? Nay, when the judge put on that little black cap and spoke them words. Do you know the word, sister? Yes, Martha, I do. Oh, I never looked up, sister. I never looked up. Till I knew they'd taken her away. You were called for the crown, Martha. You had to answer their questions. Uh, the lawyer gentleman said only to tell them what they asked and no more. Well, there was some things they never asked, so I never told them. Maybe there was something you should have told them. Oh, I don't suppose it were important. Just some funny words I overheard her say one night when he'd been rowing her worse than usual. Yes, she said, I should have thought that royal affair in Florida would have been a lesson to you. Oh, hmm, that's what she said. Sounded like he'd been playing round in higher circles than usual. Sister, I fixed them casters. Now then, big ears, don't stand idle. Get and fill that stove for sister. We can take another turn later. If you like, Pierce. That's Miss Sarah. Now, Willie. Miss Sarah, <laughs> I'm that glad I proper missed you when you're coming back to the great house. Oh, now, Willie. Willie, you haven't had any sweets this morning. Get the brass box. Yes, sister. <laughs> I could just do one right now. One of them big green ones that tastes like cinnamon. <laughs> There's the dust I've been picking out. Willie. Would you like one too, Miss Sarah? Sister wouldn't mind. No, thank you. Take a little lump, Willie, and go with Martha. Yes, sister. Goodbye, Miss Sarah. I see you when I make up the stove. <laughs> Look. <laughs> I get two, three sweets when they stuck, see? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm that sorry, Miss Serrat. He just doesn't understand. Come on now, Willie, will you? Come on. I got three that time. Come on, Willie. Are these your rooms? This one and the one through there? Yes, Miss Khan. And you've given them up to us. It's very comforting. With the warmth. And the flowers. I'm glad you like it. Spacious, too. One can move around. Whom do I know here besides Martha and Willie? Dr. Jeffries. Oh. Does he use this room? Occasionally. But if you'd rather... Oh, don't worry. I can go into the bedroom. Not having visitors for a couple of months has made me rather unsociable, hasn't it, Pierce? You could have had visitors. And flowers. No, thank you. It's the wrong atmosphere for both. Ah, oh, sister, have you got those slides... Oh. oh, sorry, I, I, I didn't expect you... To see me here? Well, now you have. Don't be uncomfortable about it. I, uh, I would have come to see you at the... at Norwich. Only I told you I didn't want anyone. Oh, don't worry, there's no ill feeling. You did your best for me at the time. Is there anything else I can do? Uh, whoever your church committee gets to finish off my murals, for God's sake, don't let them daub those angels on the left with gold leaf. It'll ruin everything. Right. Now, Pierce, I, I'd rather be in the bedroom. Yes, Miss Cowan. So, uh, you knew her before? Uh, uh, I'm on the uh, church committee. When they decided to restore those murals on the south wall, 
I recommended Sarah Khan because I'd seen and admired her work. It's good, then? Oh, first rate. She'd a picture in the Academy the year before last. What was the subject? Well, uh, rather unfortunate in the light of later events. Death of Lucretia Borgia. So it was poison? Yes, it was. I don't know the details. Uh, then I shouldn't bother to find out, sister. But I... Have you by any chance those slides we made for tests? Uh, yes, doctor. In uh -huh. the cupboard. Ah, thanks. Martha seems very concerned about Miss Kahn, Doctor. Just why are you so persistent? Because I want to know, and you're the one person who can tell me. What good can it do if you do know? If I'm ignorant of the facts, I may be tactless with every word I say. True enough. Very well. Where shall I begin? At the beginning. Well, uh, have you ever heard of, of David Kingham? Kingham? Um... Wait a minute. The right-hand politician, isn't he quite a coming man? Not now. He was so prominent in this case and fought for her so desperately that it's bound to have prejudiced his position. But why was he dragged into it? He and Sarrett were to have been married. Oh. He was away on a government mission for six months, and she wanted to finish the murals in our church before he returned. The trouble began when her brother Jason turned up out of the blue and settled at the grape house. If ever there was a rotten, corrupt swine, it was Jason Kahn. He was a confirmed alcoholic. Poor man. Poor. Sarah kept him for years. Well, some weeks after he arrived, he collapsed suddenly, and no wonder. A stroke? Yes, I'd warned him, but he was seldom sober enough to listen. He recovered his mental powers slowly, but he was partially paralyzed. Just punishment enough. Except that Sarah took the strain. Could he have been put in an institution? An inebriate home? Oh, yes. But these things take time. And one day, Sarah called me into the dining room and asked me frankly just how long he would live. Martha was in the room at the time. She remembers the conversation. The tragic thing is that these people drag on for years. Or, oh, as I told her, die quietly in their sleep. She said she was desperate. Her work was suffering... And that she'd written to Kingham, postponing her marriage. But why do that? Well, she rightly felt she couldn't saddle him with the responsibility of Jason. Of course, Kingham would have helped her, but she's very proud. So I've been told. Well, I promised I would try and arrange to get him into an institution, but I warned her such a life might affect Jason's sanity. I remember so well what she said. Yes? She said, while he's well, he's on my hands. And while he's ill, he's on my conscience. A terrible responsibility for the poor girl. I was able to ease her nights for her. We kept him under drugs. It was the only way to bring relief to either of them. No night nurse? No, not necessary. The day nurse left at six. At eight, Sarah gave him the drug. One tablet each night. No need for details. It was a narcotic, of course. One of the barbiturates put up in tablet form. Three weeks' supply was ordered at a time. That is, 21 tablets packed singly in a small glass vial. Where did they come from? Every three weeks, I collected these 21 tablets from Abel Harmer, the village chemist. We checked the number into the file, sealed it, and I delivered it to Sarah personally. I warned her not to give more than one tablet in 24 hours. I begin to understand. At the end of November, I went to Norwich for three weeks' vacation. I delivered the usual file the day I left. Twenty-one tablets? Yes. Four days later, Dr. Giles, my locum, telephoned me to say Jason had been found dead that morning. Will it shock you if I admit my first reaction was one of overwhelming relief? I think I might have felt the same. Until Giles told me that from the evidence of vomiting and so on, he suspected an overdose of the drug. So he checked the tablets in the file. Now listen carefully, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, have you got something? Ah, yes. Yes, this box of sweets will do. Uh, here it is, sister. Uh, 10, uh, 12, uh, 18, 21. 21 tablets. Now, one a night for four nights. How many left? Four from 21, 17. There were 17 tablets left in the fire. But I don't see... Neither Giles nor I could understand it either. So I took it on myself to get those 17 tablets analysed. And they found? Fifteen were correct. The remaining two were harmless aspirin. The police found a half-empty bottle of aspirin in Sarah's room. 
And Jason had had three sleeping tablets that night instead of one. Exactly. Now do you see why I don't want to be reminded of it all? But couldn't Jason have taken them himself, um, suicide and arranged things? He was paralyzed. Oh, yes, of course. And as I told you, Martha had been in and out of the room that time that Sarah spoke to me. At the inquest, they got that damning conversation out of her practically word for word. But this doesn't make sense. Miss Khan's a highly intelligent woman. She would have known you'd suspect an overdose and analyze the fire. Sister, if you had no medical knowledge and gave someone an overdose of a narcotic, how would you expect them to die? Oh, I don't know. I suppose quietly in their sleep. Mm -hmm. And I told her he might die that way. Yes, you did. I'd forgotten that. The prosecution didn't, I assure you. In fact, the defense wanted her to admit to a mercy killing, but she flatly refused. Mm -hmm. Well, now you must forgive me if I push off. Oh, very well, Doctor. I shall be around somewhere if you want me. Dr. Jeffries has gone now. Bess has an idea she'd like to explore your bookcase. It's a bit dull for her. You played cards at first, but it rather pours. Do have whatever you want. Those on the top shelf are mostly textbooks, but there's some fiction lower down. Mm. Thank you, sister. Miss Kahn, will you tell me something and forgive me for asking? Ah, surely. <laughs> Why wouldn't you let counsel plead a mercy killing? I'll answer you as I answered him. Because although I had often wished Jason dead, I had never felt called upon to do anything about it. Sufficient? Completely. Thank you. Good. Isn't this the tapestry you had in the hall? Yes, it's very old. We discovered it hidden away some weeks ago. Sister Agnes was going to try and repair it, but I'm afraid it's beyond her. If she's a good needlewoman, I don't see why. The design is lost. Well, how do you mean? May I take it to the window? Yes. Oh, I see. The pattern doesn't occur. Oh, what a pity. Oh, it's magnificently done. Look at the exquisite stitches. A reverend mother wanted it restored for the chapel, but we couldn't do it unless Sister Agnes had something to work from. What we need is an artist. You mean... Mm. Oh, no, Sister... But there isn't time. Would it take so long? No, sister. You see? A piece of plain canvas to back the missing strip with the design outlined, even roughly. I'd need materials. Colors. Oh, I'm sure we could supply most of them. Oh, no, sister. I can't. Besides, it would have to be on a proper frame. We might even have that. Sister Agnes teaches needlework. And think what we'd have to remember you by. Remember me? That would be wonderful. Every time anyone looked at it, and on the chapel wall of all places, what would they say? See that embroidery? Do you know who designed it? Sarat Khan, the murderer. The artist. Because it might be there for generations. And only the beauty would be remembered. Have you something I can measure with? Will this steel tape do? <laughs> Thank you. Now... We'll have to allow here and there for overlap. Mm -hmm. Say, ooh, two feet. No, 18 inches would do. Oh. And here again, two feet, three. Have you a pencil and paper, sister? Here you are. I've brought some coffee for Miss Carl and Miss Pierce. Thank you, Sister Josephine. Uh, it's good of you, sister. Thank you. Uh, may we have it in the bedroom? Certainly. We'll spread the tapestry on the beds. It'll be easier. If you want to help me, Pierce, I'll be grateful. Yes, Miss Carl. If we get that far, I might even let you mix the colours. Yes. Drink this coffee up while it's hot now. Thank you so much, sister. I wondered why that tapestry was brought up here from the hall. Sit down, Sister Josephine. Okay. I need your help. Oh, well, that's a reversal of normal procedure, I must say. I've been talking to Miss Kahn. Poor desolate soul. Nothing of the kind. Oh? She's a brilliant, sensitive woman. And from the moment I saw her, something passed between us. It was as if her tragedy, her agony of mind, entered into me. Oh, no, that was only because... Because I know she is no more guilty of this crime than I am myself. You can't possibly do anything. 
Don't, sister. I must. It's as if I were driven from within. But you're at such a disadvantage. I begin with one great advantage. A complete conviction of her innocence. What could you do against the whole process of the law? I want every possible detail of the trial. Somewhere there's a link, a little flaw. That's why I need you. Me? Those piles of newspaper you're always hoarding. Oh. Find me every scrap dated ah, but... January, particularly the local uh, but, paper. But I may have used them at three weeks ago. Go and look, Sister Josephine. Very well. It's a blessing I'm methodical. It won't take a second, provided they're there. The cupboard's just outside. But don't break your heart if they're not there. Uh. Oh, uh, Sister Agnes... Could we lay hands on some of the old school materials? Uh, no, poster paints for preference. Oh, good. Yes, urgently. Miss Kahn is going to do the design for your tapestry. Yes, I will list. I knew you'd help. Oh, that would be wonderful. And have we a tapestry frame? Well, Willie can mend it. He's an excellent carpenter. Thank you, sister. There's organization for you. Two bundles. Oh. Here, now, you take the London ones and I'll take the local ones. This is wonderful, Sister Josephine. Now, December, December, January. Here we are. First, seventh. No, no, not in here. January the 14th. This is it. Let's have a look. The case against Sarah Khan. Trial of noted artist opens at Assizes. Where's the local paper for January the 21st? We must have that. The summing up's bound to be practically verbatim. Uh, oh, it's not here, I'm afraid. It must be. It has to be. Why should that particular issue be lost or destroyed? Think, Sister Josephine, think. January, now, what happened here in January? Uh, I did all the cupboards. The linen cupboards uh. for the new year. Uh, we did your cupboard. That one there. Quickly. Now, now what have we got lying in the shelves? Uh, now, it's a local paper right enough. Though I don't remember using it here. You see, December, October previous, and December. Oh, it's not here. Oh. Then we must think again. Sister Mary, this parcel. Look at the paper oh. round it. January the 21st. Oh. Sister Josephine, what should I do without you? Bless your busy heart. Unwrap it quickly. Going to be a part in the big hall tonight, Miss Sarah. <laughs> Reverend Mother said so for us and the refugees. <laughs> Will it give me a dance like that time in the church hall when you're doing them big pictures? I'm sorry, Willie, but I won't be coming. Give me that paintbrush, will you? Oh. Thank you. Well, not coming? Well, Ted Newlands is fixing the wireless gramophone for real music. That's oh. enough, boy. You go along and help Newlands. Right smart with his hands, that Ted is, Miss Sarah. He was saying he might even get the telephone wires mended soon, <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Telephone? Downstairs, Willie, and jump to it. All right, then, since you be so sharp. Willie? Mm -hmm. Yes, sister? Will you take a message to Sister Josephine for me? Listen carefully now. Say I would like one of her special caramel custards, the ones with the cream on top, for Mrs. Grimes. Can you remember? Caramel custards with cream on top. Ah, surely. I know. Proper tasty. Thank you, Willie. You're very helpful. Uh, proper tasty, there you are. I'm sorry, Miss Khan. I'll tell him he's not to come up here again. And he's the one person who's at ease with me. Might sharpen that pencil, would you please? Hmm? What's this about the telephone? Just talk, I shouldn't wonder. If, by the grace of God and the genius of Ted Newlands, it is fixed, I suppose you'll get through to the governor. Miss Khan, 
You do realize this situation must end soon. We've already been here 24 hours. Yes, I realize. Uh, by the way, not too fine a point for this canvas, please. Uh, this do? Hmm, admirably. Thank you very much. Your work on the tapestry certainly does grow. I find things do when one is pressed for time. Not so pressed you can't take a little exercise. You've been working solidly all day. We might go up to the top of the tower again and have a look at the floods before it gets dark. I wonder you're not afraid I'll jump off. I'll have to risk that, won't I? Very well, then, if I must. Oh, sister, can you let me have a length of gauze? It's uh, only for my bag. Certainly, Doctor. I've got some in the cupboard. They're short of it in surgery. Fortunately, we've got a good stock of this gauze. You can have as much as you like. What? Oh, uh, thank you, sister. I was just admiring the work on that tapestry. Miss Khan has a great feeling for colour. Yes. Let's hope this doesn't remain like the murals. Unfinished. I have a feeling they may both be finished. Oh? Huh? Sister, surely you're not still trying to convince yourself. Perhaps something is trying to convince me. How much gauze do you want to hear? Mm, oh, a little more, if you can spare it. Yes, just like that. Thank you. You think I'm still taking too personal an interest? I do think it's a pity to cause yourself so much mental distress. What causes me real distress of mind is the way everyone is accepting the situation. Sister, has it occurred to you that instead of developing these, well, these fantastic ideas, you might be of some practical if use? only I could. There you are. I'll just roll this piece up. Uh, I'll do that while you put the other away. Very well. I, uh... I suppose Sarat hasn't mentioned David Kingham to you. Uh... Uh, no. Since the uh, verdict, she's refused to see him or even write. Why? She maintains she's ruined things for him, socially, politically, and in every way. Oh, I can understand how she feels, especially if she loves him. It's ridiculous. Stubborn to the point of madness. Sister Sarah will listen to you. Will you try and persuade her to see him before... Her attitude is causing them both unnecessary suffering. It's a very delicate and personal matter. I can't promise. You must leave it to me. Gladly. But do your best. For God's sake. You feel very deeply about this case, don't you? If only I hadn't taken that damn vacation in Norwich. If only I'd been on the spot instead of Giles. Excuse me. Mr. Bonaventure? Yes, he's here. One moment. Doctor, it's for you. Oh. Uh, hello? Yes, Vicky? What? Oh, all right, I'll come. Uh, they want me to look at the Grimes baby. I'll come. Uh, no, no, no. I'll ring down if I need you. Uh, doctor, if you hadn't been in Norwich when Jason died, would there have been a post-mortem? No. No, I would have signed a death certificate in any circumstances. Oh! oh. oh. Leaving me. I'm sorry, sorry doctor. Sorry, doctor. Sorry. Didn't see you. Uh, well, well, he's energetic tonight. Yes, he's been called up to the Grimes' baby. And I see you're still going through the records of the trial. They're all together in this clip. The evidence is so damning, it frightens me. How did Jason take those two extra tablets? Or could they not have been put in his food? No, that was established from the first. Sarah has never denied giving him the usual dose at eight o'clock. Remember... He couldn't have reached the fire himself. And Sarah was alone with him all that night. I Listen to this. This is the counsel for the defense. Members of the jury, you are asked by the prosecution to accept the fact that this woman deliberately and with malice or forethought administered an overdose of tablets. Yet the accused neglects the simple precaution of acquainting herself with the symptoms of such an overdose. You are asked to believe this extraordinary oversight on the part of an extraordinary intelligent woman. I submit to you that the idea is preposterous. Well, there is a the man of sense. Now this cutting. This is the prosecution. My learned friend has pointed out what he calls an extraordinary oversight on the part of an intelligent woman. The prosecution is concerned with plain facts, and the plain facts are these. 
Sarat Khan had every reason to desire her brother's death. She had the means to hand, and from the time the undoubtedly fatal dose was administered at eight o'clock, no one visited the house until the arrival of Martha Pentridge next morning. <sighs> Another man of sense. And you think you're going to beat them both? The impossible takes a wee while longer. Sister, what's it going to do to you if you fail? I daren't fail. Never in my whole religious life have I needed a sign from heaven more desperately than I do now. I daren't fail. And I can't waste precious time. Night Sister is waiting for her reports. I must put the cuttings away in this drawer. I ought not to have left them on my desk. My word, there's a gale up on that tower. <laughs> I didn't realize you were at such a height. Not been up there for years. What's the view like these days? A waste of waters. Nothing else for miles. It looks very desolate and yet very beautiful. Worst floods in living memory, I should think. Aye, so they say. Well, I can't stand here for level. Oh, neither can I. I must go and find night, sister. I'll go down to tea now, Miss Pierce. Right, Mr. Melling. Then you might like to go off till 10.30. Why not look in at the party? I might. Do you good. Newlands will be there, too. Oh, isn't their organisation incredible? Masses of people packed in, supplies stacked everywhere, the hospital full, and yet they arrange a party and allow the nurses to join in. It's the woman behind it all I find so incredible. Mm. Oh, shout when you come back. Right. Yeah, I like the music. I was always fond of a good tune. Yes, I, I'd like a walk. Oh, yes, Miss Khan. In here, Brent. Phillips. You shouldn't. We oughtn't to be here. We've got to give Willie the slip. But this is Sister Mary's room. That doesn't make it sacred. It's certainly comfortable. I thought they had to forswear physical ease. Ah, uh, so there you, Venus Phillips. <sighs> <sighs> Open that door at once and stop following me everywhere, will you? Nurse Phillips, why do you hate me so much? I don't hate you. But you do. Every time I smash spay, every time you pass me, I know you do. And Sister Mary, she say tis wrong to hate people. Sister Mary, I might have known. Open that door at once. No. No. Get away from me. Get away! Brent! Brent, don't leave me! Come back! I only want to be friends. Honest. I, I wouldn't hurt eh? I wouldn't hurt anyone. Oh, take your filthy hands off me! That's in the book Sister Reads. Something about if thy neighbour hate thee. But I don't hate you. You can't get the simplest thing right. There ain't no need to be frightened. I'm <sighs> strong right enough, but I'm gentle. I, I'm real gentle. Oh, stop it. Stop it, do you hear? No, don't eat. Don't <laughs> struggle. No, I, I'm going to give you a lovely kiss. <laughs> You hard witted beast! <laughs> Willie! Better go downstairs, Willie. Well, well, but, but, sister, I, I don't mean no harm. I know, Willie. I, I, I'll see to it. Go along downstairs. Well, but, he, he, well, like you said, I, I, I wanted to be friends, sister. Yes, all uh, right. Uh, Run along now. I, I only wanted to be friends. <coughs> I'm very sorry, Nurse Phillips. You're not hurt, are you? My God, he's got no right to be here. He'll injure someone, and when he does, it'll be your fault. Miss Khan, come back. You'll trade on your habit, standing there so calm and saintly. You're nothing oh, but a fiend. How dare you? How dare you? Oh. Now, Miss Khan, if you please. Come along now. Come along to the bedroom. How dare you? How dare you? Let me help you up, nurse. Touch me. Now, please go up to your room and wait there till I come. I'll do nothing of the sort. I'll... You are under my authority, nurse. You will do exactly as I say. Very well. But first, I'm going to see Reverend Mother. It's time she knew about you and your fine ideas. Sister Mary. Yes, Miss Khan. Come in. I want to say I'm sorry. 
so very sorry. You mustn't blame Nurse Phillips. She was badly frightened. I'm used to Willie, and I forget that other people are not. But to speak to you like that... Don't distress yourself. Perhaps you would like to try and rest until after supper and then go on with your work. Yes, Sister Mary. Poor unhappy child. No, I cannot let her go like that. Sister Mary, I just heard a very hurried and almost incredible account of events here. I should like to ask if this is correct. I have never found Nurse Phillips untruthful, Reverend Mother. She has been sent to her room. Until she leaves, it might be advisable to give her only light duties. And perhaps Willie should not be allowed so much freedom. For a little while, at any rate. I feel that is a pity. So do I, sister. But this is a dreadful thing altogether and is going to reflect on all of us. I now have to speak against my personal inclinations. I want you to understand and bear with me. Yes, Reverend Mother. Sister, you asked me to let you be in contact with Miss Kahn. Against my better judgment, I allowed it. But you were asked by myself and the warders not to raise unreasonable hopes. I assure you, I have not mentioned anything to her. You have raised your own hopes and allowed yourself to be carried away by personal emotion. Isn't that true? I suppose it is. Hasn't it occurred to you that matters reach a stage when they are in other and greater hands than ours? Reverend Mother... Can you possibly reconcile the fact that any god of any creed... Please. I repeat, of any creed, could permit such a cruel and terrible matter as this? Everything possible has been done in scrupulous fairness. I cannot agree. So you place yourself above the highest legal wisdom. Which is secular in approach and reasoning. I see. You feel you are in some manner blessed in your reasoning? I wouldn't presume so far as that. I only know that never in my whole life have I been filled with such strong, such complete conviction. Then you must destroy it. How? I can only suggest by faith and prayer. Remember, the whole foundation of our training is to accept. Blindly? We enter this life to do the work of God. We learn to subdue our bodies by labor and submit our wills to higher direction. I cannot think we should also subdue our intelligence. Even intelligence cannot always recognize divine intention. I will not believe this is divine intention. If it should be, then I have no use for such a doctor. Sister Mary, you cannot make that kind of bargain. Let me see those newspaper reports of the trial. So she told you that? I know about them. Where are they? In this drawer. Why are you so proud and obstinate? You are privileged to handle many lives, but you're not permitted to pass judgment. Here are the cuttings. So you think Miss Khan was responsible? I think there is nothing we can do to save Miss Khan, but I know I must try to save you from yourself. Take the cuttings and drop them into the stove. Oh, no! It's her life. Reverend Mother, her life may be in them. It is the best way, sister. Please, I beg of you, don't ask me. As your spiritual superior, I order you. Oh, I can't. Oh, I can't. I can't. We have heard a great deal about discipline, sister. But ours is a discipline of the spirit. Very well, then. I must burn them myself. Try to forgive me, Sister Mary. Sister Bonaventure? Yes, he's here. Yes, certainly. Newlands wants you downstairs, officer. Uh, thank you, Sister. Uh, I won't be long, Miss Pierce. I'll be here, Mr. Melling. How are you getting on, sir? What a lot you've done on that tapestry since yesterday. Sister Agnes is getting most enthusiastic about starting the embroidery. I should like to see it completed, sister. I've not finished my part yet. You will. How quick and sure your strokes are. It must be wonderful to be creative. Sometimes it's hell. Things just won't work out. 
And sometimes everything goes perfectly, and you feel your God. The newspaper report said you sketched every day throughout the trial. Mm, I must have drawn everything in sight. The judge, counsel, even the ushers. The trouble was, they all kept getting the same face. Whose? Jason's. Was he so much in your mind? I couldn't help thinking how he'd have enjoyed the situation. He could draw too, you know. The facile, showy way. He couldn't be bothered to learn properly. Poor devil. Made such a mess of his life. Things might have been so different. He made your life intensely unhappy, yet you have this... this depth of pity for him. People can't help the way they're made, can they? Poor Jason. I had some grim interludes. Such as the royal case in Florida. Who on earth told you that? No one knew. Martha overheard you talking. The words stuck in her mind. Martha? Would it distress you to tell me? No. About eight years ago, I was working on a commission in Florida. Jason followed me, as usual. He got mixed up with a girl called the Royal. Ah. Oh. When he let her down, as he always let everyone down, she gassed herself. Was there trouble afterwards? Jason didn't even appear at the inquest. She wrote him a pathetic, raving letter. But she also sent one to the coroner, saying she made no charges against anyone, but that the person concerned would be haunted by his conscience for the rest of his life. She didn't know Jason. I wouldn't have known much about it myself, but she sent me a letter too. Why you? She seemed to think we were of one blood and therefore one character. Actually, I only met her twice. For a man of his temperament, Jason knew how to be discreet. Oh, let's talk about something else, shall we? What are you making? A christening robe for the Grimes's baby. Poor Mrs. Grimes is so bewildered at having a boy that she hasn't the slightest idea what to call him. <laughs> Any suggestions? Personally, I prefer plain names. John or Charles would be nice. What's your choice? I, uh, rather like David. You've been asked to approach me, haven't you? Yes. And how do you feel about it? I'm divided between my desire to help you and my equally strong opinion that it's your own personal business. Oh, I wish I'd had you to talk to in the beginning. Talk to me now, Sarah. Why won't you see David Kingham or write to him? Oh, haven't I done enough? His career is spoilt. Probably the rest of his life affected. Just because he knew me. I'm sure he doesn't see it in that way. If you met just once. No, I, I couldn't bear it. If you must torment yourself, need you do it to him also? Well, he'll forget. Men do. Yes, they do. But women go on remembering. I hope he won't forget everything. I suppose everyone imagines her own love affair to be the most wonderful thing that ever happened. I know mine was. It was so mentally complete. Our minds struck sparks. Mm. I've lived it over and over again since. Particularly the little idiotic things. You know. I know. Uh, Miss Pierce, mm -hmm. I'd like a word with you over here, please. Ah, now, officer, we can't have you making overtures to Miss Pierce while you're on duty. Is there much more to do, Miss Kahn? Uh, not very much. Uh, why do you ask? Now, Miss Kahn... Why do you ask? I thought you'd like to finish, if you could. You've been very cooperative so far. For God's sake, come to the point. Newlands has made some sort of connection with the telephone wires. We contacted a nearby house and finally Norwich. I've spoken to the governor. They're sending out a police launch. I should say maybe another three hours. Thank you, officer. Uh, could you and Miss Pierce give me a few minutes with sister? Quite alone. We'll go out of hearing. I'm afraid we can't go out of sight. Uh, come along into the other room, Miss Pierce. All right. Oh, it had to come, of course. We knew that. Sarah. Would you let me be with you? 
You can do that without leaving here? Yes, if you wish it. I've been lucky to get this peaceful interval. I've had vastly different surroundings. I, I, I've, I've completed a piece of work which I think is good. I've known you. Believe me, that means a great deal. Thank you. I'll ask Pierce to let you know. Then if you want to pray or anything... Oh, God! Oh, my child. My dear child. Hold on to me, that's right. <laughs> There's something the chaplain reads, isn't there? I would only see him once. But he did tell me. And the words were like a roll of drums. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall... Go oh, on. Oh. Yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. It is like a roll of drums. I've never been... Religious. You mean you've never troubled about the accepted form? Mm, and I don't want them now. If this has to happen, why can't they just be businesslike and get it over? It is thought we need intercession. Sister. Dear Sister Mary, what is it? I would give anything to help you at this moment. But how can I when I'm full of doubts as yourself? You could make a pretense. You could offer prayers and platitudes. Instead, you give me this complete honesty. Oh, sir. Do you know what I've been afraid of all along? Of losing the only thing left to me. My personal self-respect. My pride. Is that wrong? No. To go to pieces at the last moment. Disintegrate. The others are scared of that, too. Melling, Pierce, even the governor. Well, they don't mention it, but... Each knows it's in the other's mind. Sir, you have so much courage. Don't be afraid anymore. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Since I've known and talked to you, I don't think I shall be afraid. Only, only stay with me till we leave. Please. I will. Oh, I must get on. Hands are shaking. You can't possibly work. Officer. Yes, sister? Uh, Miss Kahn would like to finish her painting. With your permission, I'm going to ask Dr. Jeffries to give her a sedative. Uh, would you like me to go and find him? If you would be so kind. Right, sister. I expect he's in his room. How do you feel now, Miss Kahn? What you and I need, Pierce, is a large brandy and soda. <laughs> we'll go into the bedroom, shall we? Very well. Is it right what they say? Do you mean, is she going back, Sister right. Josephine? Where? Well, they think in perhaps three hours. I'm sorry to fetch you down like this, Doctor. That's all right, Millie. I'm really surprised she hasn't broken down before. Has she broken down? No, she has more courage than we have. And in her own way, more faith. Oh, we, what we ought to do is put her right out for 24 hours. But she insists on finishing that confounded painting... There, my matter, Fina Barbiton. Got any in your cupboard, sister? Yes, Doctor. Bring it in to me, will you, please? Yes, Doctor. Fancy carrying an empty bottle around with him. Here, put this full one in his bag. Right. I'll take the other in to him. Dear goodness, the clutter the man carries about with him. It's a good thing I don't carry the tools of my trade. A fine sight I'd look with a couple of saucepans and my iron-bottomed frying pan. Oh, there's gauze mixed up with bottles and instruments. You just can't resist tidying people up, can you? <laughs> this gauze has got paint on it. It must have come off the desk when I took it out of the bag. I'd better cut off the end. Oh, mercy. Look what's fallen out of it. It's a cutting from the newspaper. Quickly. Put everything back into the bag. Wait. Uh, give me a newspaper. A any newspaper. Hurry. Hurry. That's it. Now, we put this back in the gauze in place of the other cutting. That's it. And now close the bag, sister. But, but what was it doing in his bag? I don't know. Wait a minute. 
He asked me for that gauze yesterday. The cuttings were on my desk when he folded it. Aye. He caught that one up and put it in the bag by accident. I suppose so. And yet, I had all the cuttings in a spring clip. I remember, I was at the cupboard. I turned round and he was standing here with the file in his hand, fiddling with the clip. He could have taken it off. Not by chance. He'd need to do more than fiddle. Then he must have meant to take it. Well, perhaps it's not one of yours. Yes. Look, there's the mark of the clip. Sister Josephine, just what does this mean? It means they didn't want you to study that one too closely. Which one is it? Uh, it's the report of his cross-examination. All my cuttings were burnt, or so I thought. There was nothing I could do but resign myself. And now, by some utterly unlooked-for incident, this is returned to me. Now, do you think you should hurry yourself all over again? It, it might be coincidence. Perhaps I've been working in the wrong direction. Perhaps this is an indication of the right one. But why should he bother to take one when, when the whole lot went into the stove together? He didn't know that would happen. It was Nurse Phillips who told the Reverend Mother about the cuttings. Who said she did? Why, no one. But she must have done. But when did she ever see them? They weren't in the desk last night. You put them in the drawer before Phillips came in. Yes. Who else knew besides you and me? The doctor. But surely he's done everything to help Sarat. Yes. And you've forgotten, haven't you, when it all happened? He was in Norwich. Aye, there's no getting over that. I want to think. Let me read this through thoroughly. No, I'll put it under the blotter till he goes. There. You know, sister, I may be wrong, but I feel as though... I've given her a grain and a half, sister. You'll let her have a warm drink in about an hour? Yes, doctor. What reason would he have for telling the Reverend Mother about the cuttings? Could it have been Willie? Willie? Oh, no, the poor lad. He couldn't read a newspaper well enough to know what it meant. All he worries about in here is whether the sweetness are sticky enough to give him two or three in one. Sister Josephine! What is it, sister? Quickly. I must read the cutting again. Sister Josephine. I must have been very stupid. Why, how nice and tidy the hall looks. We are nearly straight again, thanks to you, officer, and Mr. Newland. It's the least we can do for you, madam. Especially in the circumstances. And by the way, the governor will be communicating with you, but when I spoke to him, he mentioned the question of any payment or, or donation. No, officer. It is our work to help you. Your people will be here any moment? Yes. The doctor's coming with us, just as a precaution. I think you were wise to suggest it. It was Sister Mary's idea. Oh. And she also suggested we might wait here in the hall for the last half hour. Easier to get out. The last moments may be awkward. The water's still pretty high. Think we shall get into that launch without a ducking, officer? I've told them to try round where the main gate would be. Then we can more or less step down from the cloisters. I hope you're right. Good evening, Reverend Mother. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, please, uh, please, uh, Reverend Mother. If it's not important, Martha, I should prefer you to wait. Well, you see, tis that awkward about Miss Carr. Yes. Tis Willie. He knows she's going and he's got some flowers for her. And nothing will suit him but to give them himself. Come here, Willie. Yes, Mum? Your mother tells me those flowers are for Miss Khan. For Miss Sarah, Mum. Yeah, but they won't let me give them. Oh, here she is with Sister Mary. Uh, Miss Sarah, uh, may I, Reverend Mother? All right, Willie. <sighs> Miss Sarah, I thought you'd like these snowdrops. Uh, I've been growing an in kitchen window box, but Sister Josephine said I could pick them. Oh, Willie. Mm. Uh, no, they got no smell, Miss Sarah. Only just fresh and clean like. Miss, Miss Khan's very pleased. But we've got things to do. Say goodbye now, there's a good lad. Oh, goodbye, Miss Sarah. That'll be strange at the grape house without you sitting painting them big pictures. Willie? Yeah, Miss Sarah. Won't you shake hands with me? 
Oh, they're, they're, they're not very clean, miss. Uh, uh, thank you. Goodbye, Willie. G goodbye, Miss Sarah. That's right. That's right. God be with you, my child. Now, come along, Willie. Uh, perhaps we should... <laughs> not a very good conversational effort, gentlemen. But thank you for trying. You know, now that that design is finished, I feel strange with no brush and pencil. Uh, cigarette? Uh, not now, thanks. Well, I must go on with my sewing. Miss Pierce, in the sideboard drawer, you'll find a pack of cards. The night nurses keep them there for slack intervals. Yes, sister. Uh, oh, here they are. That's right. Give them to Miss Kahn. The night nurses think I don't know and I don't say anything because they'd only have to find another hiding place. It wouldn't surprise me to hear you'd taken a hand with them. Would it surprise you to know I used to play a very good hand at bridge? Not in the least. <laughs> Knave, queen, king. Didn't someone once say, all the human passions on bits of pasteboard? One doesn't imagine human passions quite so flat and abstract. No, considering the havoc they make of our lives. You know, we come in contact with much that is strange and disturbing. I myself was once shown most vividly just how far jealousy and frustration could go. Tell us about it. Don't you think we might talk about something, well, less... The weather, the floods, the politics? No, I'd like to listen to Sister. It's the oldest story in the world. The love of a man for a woman. A good woman, I hope. At the worst, a weak one. Through the influence of another man, she died. And the first man, who must have loved her dearly, allowed his grief and bitterness to drive him beyond normal control. He killed himself. He killed the other man. And then the law killed him, legally. Well, 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 how just and merciful. It's certainly an old story. We've heard it often enough, haven't we, Miss Pierce? Yes, Mr. Mary. It has an unusual ending. You see, the law didn't know. You mean he got away with it? He must have been very clever. He'd planned so carefully, detail by detail. I think he'd forgotten everything but his obsession for revenge. Uh, Miss Khan, what about three-handed whist? Don't sidetrack, officer. I want to hear the end. Probably a criminal lunatic asylum. If his guilt could be proved. Why couldn't it? The law can prove anything. I learned that at the assizes. Now, please, Miss Khan. Sister, what makes you think this man so, so safe? Well, obviously. He has the finest possible defense. And what would that be? A perfect alibi. No. A perfect alibi means perfect innocence. I see you are a purist, officer. Dr. Jeffries should have said, unshakable, not perfect. How? Ah. The murderer was some miles away when the crime was committed. Oh, <laughs> impossible. A mine may be exploded from a distance. Murder by remote control. Was this man by any chance a scientist? A specialist in his own profession. Sister. Oh, officer, how about going up to the tower, having a look out? I could do with a breath of air. Good idea, sir. Uh, Miss Khan, would you care... Oh! <coughs> the scissors. Oh, you cut your hand. Oh, it's only a scratch. Have you some plaster in your case, Doctor? Yes, yes, of course. Mm, it's a nasty deep cut. Yeah, let me see. Oh, no, nothing very much. I'll just cover it with surgical tape. What a lot of things in your bag, Doctor. Oh, please keep still, sister. Isn't this the plaster? Oh, chemist's sealing tape. Abel Harmer. That's the chemist in the village, isn't it? The one who made up the prescription for Miss Khan's brother? Yes. Uh, keep your hand still, sister. I think you told me you collected the tablets once every three weeks, checked them with Harmer, and took them to Miss Khan. You're not being very kind or tactful to mention it, are you? Uh, pass me the scissors, please. If you mean on my account... I'm past caring. Why do you ask, sister? Because I know how careful one must be with drugs. A five-grain barbiturate tablet may bear a fatal resemblance to a five-grain tablet of aspirin. Thank you, Doctor. That's comfortable. I use the word fatal advisedly. Oh, officer, I do think we should ask sister to stop this discussion, or as a medical man, I can't answer for Miss Khan's reactions. My reaction at the moment is avid curiosity. I wish you'd been a little more curious about that last file of tablets. It is just possible that one, the fourth, may have been a fraction larger than the others. Oh, why should that fourth tablet have been larger? 
because I think it contained the equivalent of three ordinary ones. Sister, you're talking absolute nonsense. In other words, the necessary overdose could have been put into one tablet. You see? Two or three in one, like Willie's sweets. The tablets were packed singly in a glass file. According to its position, the overdose would be given on a certain day during 21 days. 21 days during which the person who had prepared that overdose could be any distance away. Officer, for heaven's sake. Sarat, who first brought you down to Denzel St. David? The murals for the church. Dr. Jeffries. Who prescribed those tablets and delivered them to you? Dr. Jeffries. Who actually suggested those tablets should be analysed? Doctor... I won't stand by and listen to this. Sister, one moment. Are you making definite accusations against Dr. Jeffries? I am asking you to place certain information in the proper quarter for consideration. But, officer... Please, sir. Sister, will you be specific? I would like to suggest Dr. Jeffries brought Miss Khan to this village, knowing her brother would follow. Jason's high blood pressure and lack of self-control would make it easy for anyone with medical knowledge to induce a stroke. I myself am not altogether ignorant of certain drugs. I warn you to be careful. I further suggest Dr. Jeffries collected that file of tablets, emptied it, and refilled it so that the last two tablets were aspirins and the fourth the prepared one. He then resealed the file with Harmer's tape, delivered it, and went to Norwich, knowing exactly when the prepared tablets would be given. By me? By you. Oh, God! This is purely supposition, sister. But you better make out a statement in writing, and I'll take it with me. I will. Meanwhile, Miss Khan is entitled to see her solicitor at once. But this whole thing, it's fantastic. I'm inclined to agree, sir. But in a capital charge, the merest indication of doubt must be properly investigated. You do see that? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, I'll talk to the governor. He'll quite understand Sister Mary has allowed the emotional circumstances to carry her away. I think it's only fair to warn you that I'm not entirely relying on supposition or emotional circumstances. I did ask you to be specific. Officer, are you seriously going to listen to this wild story? Having gone so far, sir, we'd best get it clear, don't you think? But in fairness to Miss Carr, In I fairness th to yourself. Yes, sister? You may know I made a collection of cuttings about the trial. They were burnt. Afterwards, by chance, I found one. I knew it for one of mine because of the clip marks. It must have been taken from my file deliberately. Here it is, officer. Hmm. The report of Dr. Jeffrey's evidence. Where did you find it? In Dr. Jeffrey's bag. If you look, you'll find a cutting I substituted, wrapped up in some gauze. It's cut in the middle of two columns and makes no sense at all. Well, let's see, shall we? Uh, do you mind, sir? If you want to, but she just said she put it there. Here's the gauze. You're quite right, sister. Here is a cutting. But that doesn't prove much, does it? Not by itself. You might take out that little roll of sealing tape with Harmer's name on it. Here we are. That doesn't prove anything either. Uh, why do you suppose the cutting was taken from your file, sister? So that I shouldn't study the biographical details too closely and note two significant facts. Well... First that about eight years ago, Dr. Jeffries visited America. <laughs> What's so strange about America? There's a state there called Florida. Officer, will you ask Miss Khan what that conveys to her? Well, Miss Khan. My brother... brother. About eight years ago, my brother was responsible for the death of a girl there. What was her name? She called herself B. Royal. You knew her, I think, Doctor. But I've never heard of her. I've not the least idea what you're talking about. The second fact in the cutting told me you were once very prominent in your profession, that you are the author of a standard textbook on congenital diseases. I don't see what bearing my literary achievements has I to do I felt that a man of your former distinction might be mentioned in some book of reference. Sister. Miss Pierce. Yes? Would you fetch that book from the sideboard, please, and give it to Mr. Melling? Uh, That's the one. Thank you, Miss Pierce. You will find an entry under Dr. Jeffrey's name, officer. The place is marked. Please read anything relevant. Ah, uh, Jeffreys. Leslie Jordan Jeffreys, MD, FRC, PFRCS, Cambridge and London. 
Born 1900. This is ridiculous. It's a preposterous idea. Damn it, there isn't a sound argument in the whole thing. Dragging me in on the strength of some guesswork about tablets, which can't be proved medically, a cutting which doesn't mean a thing, and the fact that eight years ago in America, some hysterical redhead killed herself. How did you know she had red hair? Why, well, we, we, you just said so. I didn't mention it. I didn't know. Give me that book. <laughs> 1934, married Beatrice Royal. Dr. Jeffries, was Beatrice Royal your wife? Yes. Yes, until your damn brother came into our life. I must warn you, sir. Don't say any more. Bea had been restless for some years. I, I was absorbed in my work. I didn't realize she... She took a holiday alone in America. Look here, sir. I didn't know she used her maiden name there. She wrote me a bitter letter about you both. When I received it, she'd been dead some time. I went out there and checked. I watched you two. I've watched and planned for eight years. I was always too ambitious. I should have been content to let Jason suffer... Knowing I could let him linger or snuff him out just as I wished. Oh, don't, please. You were responsible for your own part, Sarrett. That day you appealed to me. Those damaging remarks you made with Martha passing in and out. <laughs> I remember wondering just how soon it would be all around the village. And then I saw the whole thing vividly. Because while you talked, you were turning an ordinary bottle of aspirin over and over in your hand. But why me? Wasn't it sufficient that Jason should suffer? Oh, men don't suffer like women do. I wanted another woman to suffer the torments she must have suffered before she died. Died alone. Don't. Don't. Doctor. But now, thanks to Sister Mary, just shows what can be done with a little lack and a lot of faith. Or is it the other way round? I did warn you not to say so much, Doctor. I'm not sorry. The main thing is that Jason's dead. And if your theology is correct, sister, in everlasting torment. Eternity is a long time, and I hope he burns through every endless second. The mercy of God is also eternal, and his compassion equally endless. Perhaps, because after all, Salad, you won't hang. And neither shall I! Here, come back. Oh. Lock the other side. I'll have to break it down. You can't, it's solid. Use the garden door. Miss Pierce, get Newland. Yes. He may be going up to the tower. Can you see anything, officer? He's on the long gallery. Yes, he's making for the tower. Oh. He's going to throw himself off. No. 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 Sarat. Come to me. Oh, sister. Magnificat anima mea, Domino. Et exaltabit spiritus mea. In Deus. In Bonaventure by Charlotte Hastings, Flora Robson starred as Sister Mary Bonaventure, with Monica Gray as Sarah Khan and Michael Spice as Dr. Jeffries. The Mother Superior was Dorothy Holmes Gore, Sister Josephine, Frida Dowie, Willie, Anthony Hall, Martha, Gladys Spencer, Melling, Dennis McCarthy, Miss Pierce, Diana Olson, Nurse Phillips, Maureen Beck, Nurse Brent, Jan Edwards. The radio adaptation was by Peggy Wells and the production by Graham Gold. This was the last play in the Flora Robson Festival, in which Dame Flora has been starring in some of her favorite roles. Flora Robson is now appearing in The Importance of Being Earnest at the Haymarket Theatre, London. The time now is 17 and a half minutes to five. At a quarter to five, it'll be time for home this afternoon. Meanwhile, some music played by Julian Bream.
The Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, presents Some Rain Must Fall, starring William Lundigan and Betty Arnold. Jimmy Gleason is your host. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Ever walk through the streets of a big city and notice how many people hurry along, wrapped up in their own thoughts? It leaves you a feeling a big city with millions of people around can sometimes be the loneliest place in the world. Yes, in the reverse of that picture, the most cheerful place in the world is a happy home. There's no word that means so much, so many things to each of us, as the simple word home. It means companionship and love and the kindness of those who love us. It means all the wonderful things of life, the beautiful things that we cherish, beautiful things like a mother and a father and little children who kneel and offer their simple prayers to him who gives mankind so many blessings for which to be thankful, among them the blessings of little children. To have peaceful, prayerful, happy homes, that is the purpose to which Family Theater is dedicated, dedicated with the hope that your home, your family, will enjoy all of God's wonderful blessings. The rain was over the city that night, the driving cold rain of October. The wind out of the northeast took the rain, took it and shook it like a wet scourge against the granite and steel of the city. Somewhere in that late October evening, there was a kind of sad sound in the world, as of wasted things, wasted life, and wasted dreams. And a girl walked slowly out of the rain, up the steps, into the old cathedral. And she knelt with the rain still on her, on her face and hair. And suddenly she was weeping. And this is the saddest of all sad sounds. The stifled pain locked in the throat of a girl who weeps in an old cathedral. Excuse me, miss. I saw you in there, and I waited for you out here on the steps. Really rain tonight, isn't it? Yeah. You you were crying, miss. I, I couldn't help noticing you. Oh, that's nothing. I Sometimes I do that. Cry? Yes. Is the subway near? Not far, a couple of blocks over. Well, I guess I'd better be going. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Please, don't walk away, miss. I, I just wanted to talk to you. All right. I have plenty of time anyway. More time than I can use. Why am I talking to you like this? <laughs> I asked you to, I guess. I think you're kind. You're the first person I've met in months like that. Don't ever stop being kind. Now it's time I got started. Where are you going? That's what I'd like to find out myself. Where am I going? Well, you're going somewhere. Bus terminal. I've slept in a bus terminal the last two nights. Oh, I see. Maybe you never thought things like that could happen. Yeah, but a bus terminal. I can't get a room. That is, with the rent I can afford to pay. It isn't good to be out and no place to go. Maybe I can get used to it. You can get used to anything if you try. I think I could find a place for you. You? Where? The house where I stay. Downstairs are Lolly and Kurt. They're friends of mine. You'd like them. They have a little room next to their place that they never use. You stay there. No. Oh, I just wanted to help. Now, wait a minute. It isn't much. It's it's warm. It's out of the rain. Well, they're strangers. They wouldn't want it. I... I don't know you, and what do you know about me? Nothing. That doesn't matter, does it? Yes. Yes, it does. You... You can leave after the rain's over if you want. They'd like to have you. I know Kurt and Lolly. They'll help. I don't know. Well, all right. I guess it's going to keep raining, and I'd better get along. It's pretty late. Wait. I, I, I think it's going to keep raining, too. I shouldn't be afraid. You've been so kind. 
Maybe you understand better than most. You could explain to them. You don't have to worry. I'll stay with... Lolly and Kurt. Until the rain's over. Okay. Okay. That's the way it'll be. My name's Jeremy Foster. Mine's Evie. Evie Morris. Here, I'll give you my coat to hold over you. It's cold. But you'll need your... I don't need a coat. Not now. The windows are clean, aren't they? Mm-hmm. My, three days is a long time for it to rain steady. <laughs> I should go. Three days is too long to impose on someone like this. Maybe it won't stop for a week. Don't worry about it, kid. I'm not worrying, Lolly. I'm not afraid. Not anymore. You've been so kind, letting me use your extra room and talking to me like this. And Jerry. He's so good, Lolly. Yeah, Jerry's a good boy, Evie. You, you say he's a writer? Oh, he does stories and poems. Uh -huh. Things that don't sell. If he didn't have that janitor's job he's got, he'd starve to death. I see. Well, I guess I gotta start cleaning. Well, I'm sort of in the way. Here. Oh, don't say that. I like people around. Jerry said he'd look, try to find something for him to do. I'd have to work, Lolly. Jerry's getting used to having you here. He'd want you to stay. <laughs> him coming down to talk to you every day is the most we've seen of him in a long time. Don't go. Right away, Evie. Evie, Evie, where are you going? Oh, I can't stay any longer, Jerry. You've been very kind, but, but I... But it, it, it's... It's still raining. Well, I hate to impose, Jerry. I think I should try to find some work in some other place to stay. We'll find something when the rain's over, Evie. And you aren't imposing. Don't think about that. Lolly likes you. She'd want you to stay, and... Well, I, I guess I do, too. Thank you, Jerry. You know, I've been thinking about how hard you work. Up there in your room all day writing, and at that office building cleaning. Well, someday I won't have to work at the office building. <laughs> Someday someone will like what I write. That'll mean a lot to you, won't it, Jerry? Life, Evie. And all the grand things you can do when you know you're on the way up. When you know you're you're saying something worthwhile. It makes a difference. It'll come soon. The stories you write, the poems. There must be someone who wants beautiful things like that. Why don't you write a book? No. Write a book, Jerry. <laughs> Look, Evie, you've got to be good to write a book. You can do it. Just put it together in, in the right way. Well, maybe I will. Someday. What time is it? I think it's about 11. I guess I should go. I wanted to see about getting half a day's work. Do you think you will? Oh, I asked Mr. Denton. He said he thought so. You look so tired, Jerry. You're doing too much. All morning now you've been writing, and I'll bet you were at it late last night. Yes, Evie, but I'm thinking now about a new story. Maybe a long story about... About rain and a girl and a cathedral. Oh, Jerry, that's just like us. Evie. Yes? Will you be here when I come back? I should go. I don't like to pose on you. Evie, when I come back. Yes, I'll be here, Jerry. <laughs> Howdy, Evie. Come on in, kid. Hello, Lolly. I don't want to bother you if, if you're working. Oh, it's nothing important, honey. Just letting out an old rag of mine. Got to make it last a little longer. Ought to be washing. It's a nice day. Yes, it's nice today. The sun's out. Mm-hmm. Getting along all right? Fine. Just fine, Lolly. Mm -hmm. Only I was wondering, do you think if I asked Mrs. Meacham, would there be any chance of getting something for new curtains? Curtains? And... For that little closet you're living in? Uh, no, no, Lolly. For upstairs in Jerry's room. Oh. I thought if I could get something, you know, fix it up a little. Yeah. Mm, that, that's an idea. And maybe a table. A little one to put a flower on. A flower? Here? I mean, a pot with a plant in it. Oh. And, and flowers on it. Oh. It, it'd be nice by his window. It gets lots of sun. When the sun shines. <laughs> yeah. I guess it would be kind of silly. 
Mrs. Meacham doesn't know me. Maybe she wouldn't like it. Mm, Mrs. Meacham wants permanent people here. She'll keep them if she gets them, even if it does mean a little table and a couple of curtains. Jerry's permanent. Been here three years. Well, do you think she will, then? Shall I ask uh, her? No, no, you leave her to me. There are ways of getting around, Mrs. Meacham. We'll get your table and curtains. Oh, if only you could, Lolly. Uh, what about the flower, that plant for the table? I'll get it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it somehow. Do you think Jerry will like it, Lolly? Oh, sure, kid, he'll like it. I was afraid changing things around like this, putting up new curtains and all, might make him... Oh, well, I've lived in this house since before Jerry came here. Kurt and I know him real well. He don't get mad, not at anything. I wanted to make it nice. Uh, where's your flower? Well, I haven't got it yet. Pot's no good without a flower, is it? They cost quite a lot. Uh, I suppose so. Well, you did a good job, Evie considering what you had to work with. Hard to do much with an old room. It was fun. Hmm, you're beginning to fall for Jerry. Oh, Lolly, don't be silly. I'm not. But I think I know love when I see it. Six weeks and you're in love with the guy. Oh, no, I'm not. You stayed, didn't you? Well, I didn't know where else to go, Lolly. Hmm. And you've been so kind to me. You and Kurt and Jerry. Jerry wanted you to stay and then... You found out that you wanted to stay. Yes. I knew it one day. <laughs> the day it stopped raining. Was he glad? I think so. He must have been, Lolly. He laughed and he said, The sun's out, Evie. The sun's out. Let's go down to an old cathedral. You're good for him, Evie. For Jerry. Mm -hmm. He needs you now more than his writing, even. Remember what I said. Don't go away. Hey, he'll like the way you fix things, Evie. It's wonderful, Evie, wonderful. I thought I'd done all there was to do to it, but I, <laughs> I guess I didn't know. I'm glad you like it, Jerry. Oh, I do, Evie, I do. It's funny what you can do with one room, isn't it? Mm hmm Only it isn't finished yet. There should be a flower for the little table by the window. A flower for the inside? With the sun coming in on it. Yeah. Something you can take care of and see growing every day when you put water on it. Getting tall in the sun and then... And full of color for a while. Yeah. Green. Cool, soft green with touches of flame in it. What kind of a flower, Evie? I don't know, Jerry. But it would be nice. Yeah. It'd be nice to watch it grow beautiful in the sun. Hello, Evie. I didn't know you'd be waiting out here. It's kind of late. Oh, it's nice and quiet out here on the porch. Uh-huh. And cool, too. I was waiting for you, Jerry. Is there something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. I wanted to see you and talk for a minute. Well, it's, it's pretty late. But it's real nice out tonight, isn't it? I've been sitting here watching the streetlight on the corner. <laughs> and dreaming? A little. Remembering, mostly. About the rain and... About cathedrals. That was a long time ago. I saw you walking up the street. You were just a tall shadow. I could tell it was you from the way you held your head and walked like you were glad about something. I am. I was... I was going to show this to you in the morning, but I, I want you to see it now. Here. Oh, Jerry, the flower. I'll turn the porch light on oh, so no, you can no. see it. Oh, no, no. I can see it. I can see how beautiful it is. I looked all over for it. What kind is it? <laughs> I didn't even ask. But it... Well, it made me think of the sky and stars at night. I thought of a name for it. On the way home, I called it Star Rover. And the leaves. They're the darkest green I've ever seen. And it's got flowers on it already. I know I can see them. Oh, Jerry, your room's finished now. It's got everything. Yeah. It's got everything now. Jerry? Hmm? You don't talk about your writing anymore. Oh, I don't know, Evie. I'm discouraged about the story. The story about the rain? Mm -hmm. And the girl in the cathedral? Yeah, I don't know what happens to them. Maybe they fall in love. Yes. Only, only they don't know it for quite a while, huh? 
They don't talk about it until... Until one night. And the girl waits for him and they talk. And... And he's been a dreamer while she'd gone through the sufferings that... that make people practical. And when they talked, the mist drifted away and his dreams became real. And she forgot all the dark, ugly things of the past. And she knew they were gone forever. And the boy knew he'd never be lonely again. He knew there'd be something besides words now to to fill the emptiness around him. They talked in the darkness, and suddenly the girl said, I love you. Evie. I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. Do you know what the boy said then? What? He said, Evie, honey, I wanted to hear you say it. I wanted to talk about it, but I I couldn't find the words, and I I was afraid. I kept thinking maybe I I wouldn't know how to take care of you. I didn't want to hurt you. I I didn't want to make you unhappy. I'd like to give you a home and everything, everything, Evie. But I'm not even a second-rate hack writer. I'd like to build a cathedral, and I get nothing but pasteboard bungalows. Jerry? Yeah. Jerry, I'll take a pasteboard bungalow. Tired, kid? Just a little, Lolly. Mm -hmm. You're not scared, are you? Jerry will be happy about it. But maybe it'll be trouble for him, Lolly. Mm -hmm. His job's only half a day, and he works so hard. If I know Jerry, he'll be glad. And why not? You both like kids? Sure, he'll be glad. He'll want to quit writing and work all day full time because he'll think he should. Look, if a man wants to write, he'll write, no matter how much other work he does. Now, don't worry about it. Well, he's worried now because he doesn't know how the story should finish, but I know he's got to keep on with it. Sure, honey, he'll keep on with it. I'll have to buy things. It'll take a lot. Well, there'll be a time later on to worry. <laughs> yes, I suppose I'm silly to think about it now. Sure, there's lots of time. And God always takes care of things. <laughs> Jerry, why don't you rest? You've been writing for hours. Well, I'm, I want to try and get this story finished, Evie. How's it coming now? I don't know. You haven't told me much about it, Jerry. Well, sometimes when I'm writing, it seems as though I I hear... Oh. What, Jerry? Well, as though I hear music. Real music? Outside somewhere? No. No, I know it sounds crazy, but it's here in the room. Yes. And I sit here watching the shadows on the ceiling, watching and thinking. About the boy and the girl in the cathedral. Yeah. About the boy and the girl and the baby. Go on, Jerry. It's beautiful. For him, it used to be an empty room with not a sound in it. And then she came. There was a violin playing somewhere at night. He could hear it like it was soft in the distance coming from downstairs where she was sleeping. But it was... it was far away and lost. I did that, Jerry? He loved her then. I guess that was it. I didn't know it was like that, Jerry. And then they were married, and he kept hearing it. But it had changed. It was all... all strings and reeds. Sweet, soft music, making a, a strange kind of beauty. And then? Well, then... The boy and the girl and the baby. Glorious music. Deep and soft and sweet like an organ in a cathedral. And it isn't far away or lost. And he hears it like it was a flood inside, tied up against his throat. And he wants it to go on and on because it's never happened to him before. And he's afraid. Afraid it'll go away. And he doesn't want it to go away. Oh, Evie. Evie, it's no use trying. I've got to get a job. No, Jerry. I've got to have things ready. Your work, Jerry, our book. I don't know if I can ever finish it. Right now, nothing is as important to me as my family. Oh, Jerry, I I didn't want it that way. I I didn't want you to think that way. Jerry? Yeah? Yeah. Soaking wet. 
Yeah, I know what I'll do. I'll change. Rain pretty steady all day. I knew you'd stay out in it, and you shouldn't have, Jerry. You'll you'll take sick. <laughs> I, I've got to find something, Evie. Did you, Jerry? Did you find something? No, I'm not experienced at anything. <laughs> oh, Jerry, you got a cold being out in the rain all day like that. Ah, uh, no, it's all right, Evie. Your forehead's warm too. Evie. <laughs> yes, Jerry. Evie, the Star Rover, the flower I bought to you. What's happened to it? I don't know. It was all bright and green a couple of days ago. The sun was shining on it. <coughs> well, it looks sick now. Did you water it? Every day, Jerry. But it has to have sun. It won't grow nice if it doesn't have sun. Is it sick, Evie? Is it dying? Oh, no, dear, it can't be sick. It'll be all right when it stops raining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's when it stops raining. Please, Jerry, not the book now. It'll wait. Don't start on it now. Yeah, it's nearly finished. I know, dear, but tonight, maybe. You can work on it tonight, after you get warm again. <laughs> All right. All right. I was just looking at it. It's going to be a beautiful book. Yeah. <laughs> a big one, too. <laughs> if it's ever finished. <laughs> It's late, dear. It's after midnight. It is? Oh, <coughs> I, d- I didn't know it. Tomorrow. Let it go till tomorrow. I can't. I can't. It's, it's got to be finished. <coughs> Jerry, what's the matter? What happened to you? Nothing. Nothing. <coughs> what can I do? Jerry, what can I, I do? Can't, I can't breathe. Evie, <gasps> Evie, help. I can't breathe. <coughs> The doctor wants you to go in now, Evie. Jerry's been that way so long, Lolly. I was just lying there, not saying anything. But he's fighting. He's fighting, Lolly. He wants to stay. Jerry's critical sick, Evie. He's, he's dying, Lolly. I know it, I know Evie, it. Evie, Evie, kid, don't say that. Jerry's been so good, Lolly. Surely God knows that. He can see, he'll listen. He wants Jerry to live. Evie, listen to me. The doctor says Jerry's reaching a crisis, and you want to be with him. I, I, I've got to be with him, Lolly. He won't be able to see you. Maybe he can't hear you neither, but you got to make him know you're there. He's got to know you're with him, wanting him to get well. It'll help him, Evie. Yes, I'll try. Jerry, I'll try. Oh, don't cry, honey. You can't let him feel you're afraid. Everything's just like it was. Uh, talk about something. Get to him somehow. He's good, Lolly. He's done so much. He, he said he hoped the baby'd be a boy. Talk about the baby, Evie. Everything has to do with the baby. He'll hear you. I'll make him hear, Lolly. I've got to make him hear. It's no use, Evie. Evie, I'm on the way out. (laughs) You need the sun. The sun's out again, Jerry. It's... It's cold. I know. It's... It's cold. Jerry, listen to me. It... It isn't cold anymore. There's music in the room. You heard it, remember? Try to remember. It was warm music. It made the room warm. You... Music? Oh, you heard. Oh, Jerry, you heard. Yes, darling, it was warm music. It was soft and deep, like an organ in a cathedral. You said it was like that, Jerry. Of, of violin, strings, and reeds. It, it was like... An organ, Jerry. Don't you remember, darling? Our room was a cathedral. It's in the room, Jerry. It's here. It's warm music. I can hear it, too. We can hear it together now. Oh, Jerry. Jerry. Oh. Oh. Evie. Evie. Yes? 
Yes, Jerry. I am. I'm all right. Don't cry, Annie. Oh. Evie. Yes, darling. Evie, I can finish that book. Yes, of course, darling. Evie, I can see it now. The story about the boy and the girl. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It's... Evie, it's our life. Yours and mine and the baby's. I can see people like us, millions of them. And the men and women and children laughing and crying, hungering for something. Reaching, reaching for something. Reaching out of their fevers and out of their sickness and weakness and loneliness. But reaching always out and up for something beyond the stars. It will be the world's most beautiful book. We could, we could never grow without the rain, Evie. Without the rain and pain. Oh, Jerry. Oh, thank you, God. The sun is out again. Like the people in tonight's play, we all pass through seasons of trial and suffering, seasons when some rain must fall. But most of us can gladly say that the joyful days outnumber the sorrowful. Yes, and we're always glad to remember the kindness, the thoughtfulness of those who help us over the rough spots. Why, when you think about it for a moment, you begin to see that the rain and the pain are all part of a wonderful plan, a plan that brings out the strength and goodness, the kindness and courage in the world and in us. Yes, and a happy family is part of God's plan. A plan that means a family living together in understanding and affection. A family where everyone is doing a little to make everyone else happy. That's the way it should be. The way it can be with God's help. So ask God for his help. Pray together as a family, and you'll be together in love and understanding. Because a family that prays together stays together. Before saying goodnight, I'd like to thank William Lundigan for his performance as Jerry, Betty Arnold for the portrayal of Evie, and Ann Morrison for her performance as Lolly. Our thanks also to Jonathan Goodhue for writing tonight's play, and to Max Terror for his music. Mel Williamson directed and John Ryder produced the program. Next week, our family theater stars will be Brenda Marshall and William Holden in Song for a Long Road. Your host will be Gene Lockhart. This is Jimmy Gleason saying... Good night, and God bless you. This series of the Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this kind of program, by the mutual broadcasting system which has responded to this need, and by the actors and technicians of the motion picture and radio industries. This program is heard overseas through the facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio Services. Dick Wynn speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.